Children of the Matrix by David Icke. Who are the children of the Matrix? We are. Life can take many forms. Look at the forms life can take on this planet alone. Here in this bush, there are insects you could easily mistake for rocks or for pieces of bark until one of them stings you, that is. Life does not have to consist of bipeds who move and breath and smoke cigars as we do. I have said it before and I will say it again. The universe is a gigantic chamber of possibility where everything has the chance and the right to happen and so we must not have cut and dry theories regarding just how life should look. Life could surprise us, Credo Mutwa. The official historian of the Zulu nation, in his book, Song of the Stars. Life beyond the bubble. There are two things you need if you are to uncover and communicate what is really happening in the world. One is to be free of any dogmatic belief system. The second is not to give a damn what people think and say about you, or, at least, not to let that influence your decisions. Without number one you will never go into the bizarre areas that are necessary to understand the forces that control this planet. Once you are faced with information that demolishes your belief system you will begin to edit what you have discovered and refuse to go where it is taking you. Without number two, you will never communicate what you have found because you will be terrified of the consequences for you from the reaction of your friends, family and the public in general. You are about to read a book by someone who will go wherever the information takes him and who, thanks to hard and extreme experience in the early 1990s, let go the concern for what other people might think of him. And so we are going to enter some apparently bizarre and outrageous areas of thought and documented evidence. If you have a belief system to defend, please don't waste your time and money. This is not for you. But, in truth, what you are going to hear is not outrageous at all. It just appears to be so because it is so different from the conditioned norm. Crazy and insane are words used throughout history to describe people and ideas that are simply different. And different does not mean wrong. So many condemned and ridiculed ideas in the past have later become conventional wisdom. First they ridicule you, then they condemn you, then they say they knew you were right all along. This book is designed to pull together the evidence and background of the extraterrestrial, interterrestrial, and interdimensional control of planet Earth for thousands of years to the present day. To do this, I have weaved together information in the biggest secret with a mass of new historical and modern accounts to present as clear a picture as possible of the forces that daily manipulate and direct the lives of the human race. This is not the whole story, however, just part of it. There is still so much more to know. Readers of my previous books will see information they already know fused with the latest knowledge and developments because it is important that my books are self-contained so that new readers will have all they need to follow the plot. I have endeavored to keep the book simple and to the point for those billions of people who have never had access to such information before. For more fine detail and sources on the various interconnected subjects, see and the truth shall set you free, I am me, I am free, and the biggest secret. Please remember that what you read here is simply information. It is not compulsory to accept it, and the last thing I am trying to do is persuade you to believe anything. What you believe is your business, not mine. Have I got all the answers? Of course not. Do I have some of them? See what you think. David Icke. The Matrix. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something very wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix? Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave Neo. Like everyone else you were born into bondage. Born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the matrix is, you have to see it for yourself. 
I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. Scenes from The Matrix, Warner Brothers, 1999. This is highly recommended along with the live, alive films, 1988, the movie by John Carpenter, The Arrival 1, Steelworks Films, 1988, and V, The Final Battle, Warner Brothers Television, 1984, and Warner Home Video, 1995. The Challenge. Don Juan, the Mexican Yaqui Indian shaman, tells Carlos Castaneda of the following. We have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. I have been beating around the bush all this time, insinuating to you that something is holding us prisoner. Indeed we are held prisoner. This was an energetic fact for the sorcerers of ancient Mexico, they took us over, because we are food for them, and they squeeze us mercilessly, because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in chicken coops, the predators rear us in human coops, human arrows. Therefore, their food is always available to them. No, 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 Carlos replies this is absurd Don Juan. What you're saying is something monstrous. It simply can't be true for sorcerers or for average men, or for anyone. Why not? Don Juan asked calmly. Why not? Because it infuriates you? You haven't heard all the claims yet. I want to appeal to your analytical mind. Think for a moment and tell me how you would explain the contradictions between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of beliefs or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of belief, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our hopes and expectations, and dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetousness, greed, and cowardice. It is the predators who make us complacent, routinary, and egomaniacal. But, how can they do this, Don Juan? Carlos asked, somehow angered further by what Don Juan was saying. Do they whisper all that in our ears, while we are asleep? No, they don't do it that way. That's idiotic, Don Juan said, smiling. They are infinitely more efficient and organized than that. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators engage themselves in a stupendous maneuver, stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist. A horrendous maneuver from the point of view of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. Do you hear me? The predators give us their mind, which becomes our mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. I know that, even though you have never suffered hunger, you have food anxiety, which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which, after all, is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them. And they ensure, in this manner, a degree of security to act as a buffer against their fear. The sorcerers of ancient Mexico were quite ill at ease with the idea of when the predator made its appearance on earth. They reasoned that man must have been a complete being at one point, with stupendous insights, feats of awareness that are mythological legends nowadays. And then, everything seems to disappear, and we have now a sedated man. What I'm saying is that, what we have against us is not a simple predator. It is very smart and organized. It follows a methodical system to render us useless. Man, the magical being that he is destined to be, is no longer magical. He's an average piece of meat. There are no more dreams for man, but the dreams of an animal who is being raised to become a piece of meat, trite, conventional, imbecilic. Castaneda, 1998. The Plot Many thousands of years ago, way back in prehistory, there was a highly developed civilization in the Pacific, which has become known as Lemuria, or Mu. These peoples and others also founded another great culture on a landmass in the Atlantic, which we know as Atlantis. The knowledge that created these advanced societies, the knowledge that built the fantastic and unexplainable ancient structures like the Great Pyramid and other amazing sites across the world, came from the stars extraterrestrials of many varieties. 
Some were tall blonde-haired, blue-eyed types, while others took a reptilian form, see picture section for artists' impressions of these beings. These and others came here from constellations like Orion, Draco, Andromeda, Lyra, and Boots, and other locations like the Pleiades, Sirius, Vega, Zeta Reticuli, Arcturus, Aldebaran, and elsewhere. Australian Aborigines, African tribes, the Babylonians, and South American Indians are just some of the diverse peoples who claim ancient connections with such places. The reptilians are a tall, mostly humanoid type race, with snake-like eyes and skin, and they are connected to the classic greys, with the big black eyes, which have become the very symbol of the Eastern time. Often these various extraterrestrial factions battled for supremacy in the legendary wars of the gods. These technologically advanced beings were believed to be gods by the human races because of the apparently miraculous feats they could achieve with their technology and flying craft. By the way, for those who find it impossible to conceive of intelligent life forms and humanoids taking a reptilian form, ponder on the words of the cosmologist, Carl Sagan. There are more potential combinations of DNA, physical forms, than there are atoms in the universe. On that basis, given the fantastic diversity of the reptilian species on the Earth alone, it would be more amazing if there were not reptilians of a humanoid and intelligent variety. These gods interbred with each other, and the more primitive Earth people and these unions are recorded in endless ancient accounts. These were the sons of God who interbred with the daughters of men to seed the hybrid race, the Nephilim, as described in the Old Testament book of Genesis. The most important interbreeding was between the reptilians and the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Nordic peoples, both of extraterrestrial origin, as an alliance was formed between factions of these races. The Union produced what has been called the Aryan or Noble Race, the master race of the Nazis. This is the fusion of the Nordic and reptilian DNA, the genetic code that decides physical characteristics, and, as the ancient records confirm, it was these royal bloodlines, the reptilian-Nordic hybrids, that were placed in the positions of ruling royal power in the thousands of years before known history. They were the kings and queens who claimed the divine right to rule because of their bloodline the bloodline of the gods. These ancient royal lines in places like Egypt, Sumer, and the Indus Valley, had a white skin and often blue eyes, yet they were known as the dragon kings or serpent kings, by those who knew the secret of their hybrid nature. Lemuria was destroyed by a staggering cataclysm that struck the Earth, maybe 11,500 to 12,000 years ago. Atlantis went the same way, in stages, over the thousands of years that followed. The universal stories of the Great Flood are related to this. When Atlantis came to an end amid more enormous geological upheavals, the bloodlines and their gods began again in the Near and Middle East, from about 4000 BC with an empire based in Sumer, in what is now Iraq, between the rivers Euphrates and Tigris. Sumer, according to official history, was the start of human civilization, but, in fact, it was merely the restart after the Atlantis upheavals. The seeding of extraterrestrial human bloodlines continued, and so did the policy of placing the purest of these hybrids, the reptilian Nordics, into the positions of royal and administrative power over the people in Sumer Egypt, Babylon, the Indus Valley, and, as the Sumer Empire expanded, much further afield. Similar seeding went on in other parts of the world, like the Americas and China, but the Middle Eastern area was the most important to these extraterrestrial factions, at least at that time. These factions were dominated by the reptilian or serpent race. Over thousands of years these peoples expanded out of the Middle and Near East into Europe, and the royal bloodlines of Sumer Egypt, etc., became the royal and aristocratic families of Britain, Ireland, and the countries of mainland Europe, especially France and Germany. Wherever they went, these royal lines interbred obsessively with each other through arranged marriages and secret breeding programs. We see the same with the ruling families of today, because they are seeking to perpetuate a particular genetic code, which can be quickly diluted by breeding outside of their hybrid circle. In the ancient world, one of the headquarters for the secret society network or Illuminati, through which these bloodlines manipulate humanity, was Babylon, also in the lands of Sumer. This Illuminati network then moved its headquarters to Rome, and during that time came the Roman Empire and the creation of the Roman Church, or institutionalized Christianity. The headquarters moved on into northern Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire, and for a period was based in Amsterdam 
the Netherlands. This was when the Dutch began to build their empire through the Dutch East India Company and they settled South Africa. In 1688, one of these hybrid bloodlines, William of Orange, invaded England from the Netherlands and took the British throne as William III in 1689. William ruled jointly with Queen Mary and alone after her death in 1694. From this time, the Illuminati moved their center of operations to London. What followed, of course, was the great and enormous British Empire. This vast expansion of the British and other European empires to all parts of the world exported these Nephilim hybrid bloodlines to every continent, including, most importantly today, to North America. When these European empires began to recede and collapse, especially in the 20th century, it appeared that these lands, like the Americas, Africa, and Australia, had won their independence. Instead, the Nephilim bloodlines and the Illuminati merely exchanged overt control for the far more effective covert control. While these empires apparently withdrew, they left out in those countries, including the United States, the bloodlines and the secret society network through which they operate. Ever since they have continued to control events in these former colonies as part of a long-planned agenda for the complete centralized control of the planet through a world government, central bank, currency, army, and a microchipped population connected to a global computer. This is the very governmental structure that is now staring us in the face. The bloodlines that control the world and our lives today are the same bloodlines that ruled Lemuria, Atlantis, Sumer Egypt, Babylon, the Roman Empire, and the British and European empires. They are the presidents of the United States, the prime ministers, the leading banking and business families, the media owners, and those who control the military. We have been ruled by the same interbreeding tribe of extraterrestrial or interterrestrial hybrids, the Nephilim, for thousands of years and we are now facing a crucial time in their unfolding agenda, the time when we, the people, either bring this hidden dictatorship to an end or face a future, very shortly, in a global fascist state. That's the summary of what has happened and is happening. Now consider the detailed evidence. Chapter 1, To the Prison Born. There are none so enslaved as those who falsely believe they are free. Goethe. When a few people wish to control and direct a mass of humanity, there are certain key structures that have to be in place. These are the same, whether you are seeking to manipulate an individual, family, tribe, town, country, continent, or planet. First you have to set the norms, what is considered right and wrong, possible or impossible, sane or insane, good and bad. Most of the people will follow those norms without question because of the Baba mentality, which has prevailed within the collective human mind for at least thousands of years. Second, you have to make life very unpleasant for those few who challenge your imposed norms. The most effective way to do this is to make it, in effect, a crime to be different. So those who beat to a different drum or voice a different view, version of truth and lifestyle, stand out like a black sheep in the human herd. You have already conditioned that herd to accept your norms as reality and so, in their arrogance and ignorance, they then ridicule or condemn those with a different spin on life. This pressurizes them to conform and serves as a warning for those others in the herd who are also thinking of breaking away. There is a Japanese saying that goes, don't be a nail, that stands out above the rest, because that's the first one to get hit. This creates a situation fundamental to the few controlling the many in which the masses police themselves and keep each other in line. The sheep become the sheepdog for the rest of the herd. Star it is like a prisoner trying to escape, while the rest of his cellmates rush to stop him. If that happened we would say the prisoners were crazy, how could they do that? But humans are doing precisely this to each other every day by demanding that everyone conform to the norms to which they blindly conform. This is nothing less than psychological fascism, the thought police with agents in every home, everywhere. Agents so deeply conditioned that most have no idea they are unpaid mind controllers. I'm just doing what's right for my children I hear them say. No, what you have been programmed to believe is right for them and the belief, also, that only you know best. I remember debating with a former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom at the Oxford Union Debating Society and he simply could not see a difference between education and indoctrination. It was a wonder to behold. 
We see this same theme in our daily experiences of people in uniform and others from the masses who are promoted to power over the masses. It's summed up by the satirical version of the British Labour Party song, The Red Flag, which goes, The working class can kiss my arse, I've got the foreman's job at last. This is all part of the divide and rule strategy so vital to ensuring that the herd will police itself. Everyone plays a part in everyone else's mental, emotional, and physical imprisonment. All the controllers have to do is pull the right strings at the right time and make their human puppets dance to the appropriate tune. This they do by dictating what is taught by what we bravely call education and what passes for news through the media they own. In this way they can dictate to the unthinking, unquestioning, heard what it should believe about itself, other people, life, history, and current events. Once you set the norms in society, there is no need to control every journalist or reporter or government official. The media and the institutions take their truth from those same norms and therefore ridicule and condemn by reflex action anyone who offers another vision of reality. Once you control what is considered normal and possible, the whole system virtually runs itself. The Illuminati. The elite families, no more than 13 at the peak of their pyramid, created and manipulate this system of control through a network of secret societies. This network and the bloodlines it serves have become known as the Illuminati, the Illuminated Ones. In other words they are illuminated into knowledge that everyone else is denied. The Illuminati is an organization within all significant organizations. It's like a cancer. All the major secret societies feed carefully chosen recruits into the Illuminati, and these are the ones you find in positions of power throughout the world. They infest all colors, creeds, and countries. Most Freemasons never progress higher than the bottom three levels of degree, the so-called blue degrees. They have no idea what their organization is being used for. Even most of those who make it to the apparent peak, the 33rd degree in the Scottish Rite, know relatively little. Only the tiny few, all from a particular bloodline, move through the top of their individual secret society into the Illuminati degrees above that. These are the levels into which all the major secret societies feed. Yet at least 95% of their members have no idea that these levels exist, never mind who is in them. The bloodlines. The Illuminati bloodlines are all genetically connected through hybrid DNA, a genetic fusion caused by the interbreeding of a reptilian race with humanity and the Nordic extraterrestrial race. This interbreeding began hundreds of thousands of years ago and continues to the present day. If you are hearing this for the first time, I know how bizarre and crazy it sounds to the conditioned view of reality. But you will see in the pages that follow the scale of the evidence to support this apparently ridiculous story and how it explains a stream of ancient and modern mysteries. So many things that later turn out to be true appear at first hearing to be impossible and insane. That's because people only hear the opening line and don't read on to see the detailed evidence to support it. When people first suggested the earth was round, they were called crazy because it was thought that those living on the bottom would have fallen off. The critics dismissed the idea at this point and walked away convinced that the earth had to be flat. Yet when you introduce the law of gravity, what seems at first to be crazy suddenly becomes far more credible. So it is with the truth that a non-human race is controlling and manipulating humanity through hybrid bloodlines, the same bloodlines that have been placed in positions of power since ancient times. The supporting evidence is there, if only people are prepared to open their minds, as you will see in this book and my others. It is these reptilian Illuminati bloodlines, manifesting as political leaders and administrators of government, that introduce the laws that will best serve their plan to keep humanity in ongoing servitude. These laws, which the masses have no say in creating, are then enforced by members of those same masses, soldiers, policemen, security guards, and so on. These guys, and many women today, are just system fodder. They are not encouraged to think for themselves, and it would not be good for promotion if they did. They are paid to do as they are told, carry out orders, and administer the letter of the law, the law of the elite families. My father used to say that rules and regulations were for the guidance of the intelligent and the blind obedience of the idiot. 
But how many of those in the peaked caps administer the law in a sensible, every case on its merits, think for yourself manner? A mere fraction. And often they are far from popular with those higher up the ladder. Soldiers don't ask for justification for blowing away men, women, and children they have never met and know nothing about. They don't question their superiors about why they have to commit genocide. They just do it, because they are told to do it, and those doing the telling are themselves carrying out orders from those above them. In the end, all roads of command lead ever upwards to the 13 family bloodlines and their offshoots that are orchestrating an agenda to take over the planet. That agenda demands a world government, central bank, currency, an army, underpinned by a microchipped population connected to a global computer network. A ridiculous conspiracy theory? Oh really? Well have another look around you, and you'll see that this is happening today, now. The Sheeple. The self-policing of the human herd goes far deeper than people in uniform or administrators of government. It starts with conditioned parents who impose their conditioning on their children and pressure them to follow their religious, political, economic, and cultural norms. There is no more extreme example than those who insist their offspring succumb to arranged marriages because of the rules of their ludicrous religion, or the children of Jehovah's Witnesses who have been denied life-saving blood transfusions because their brain-dead parents insist on conducting every aspect of their lives according to the contradictory dictates of a book purveying stories of pure fantasy. The creation of the mental and emotional sheep pen of norms, which imprisons 99% of humanity, goes on minute by minute in subtle and less subtle ways. There are children of Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or Hindu parents who don't accept the religion, but still follow it because they don't want to upset their family. Then there is the almost universal fear of what people think of us if we speak a different version of reality or live a different kind of life. Note that the fear for those who wish to break out of the sheep pen is not the fear of what the elite families, the Illuminati or Illuminated ones, will think of them. Most have no idea that such a network exists. No, the fear is for what their mother or father will think, or their friends and workmates the very people who are conditioned by the system to stay in the pen. The sheep are keeping the other sheep in line and making life unpleasant for anyone who tries to escape. It is so easy for a small group of interbreeding family bloodlines to control the lives in other words the minds of billions, once the key institutions of information are in place, as they have been for thousands of years in their various forms. There are not enough of these manipulators and their stooges to control the population physically, and so they have had to create a structure in which humans control themselves through mental and emotional imposition. Once you have the herd mentality policing itself, there is a third phase in this entrapment of human consciousness. You create factions within the herd and set them to war with each other. This is done by creating different belief systems, which are not different at all, and bringing them into conflict. These belief systems are known as religions, political parties, economic theories, countries, cultures, and isms of endless variety. These beliefs are perceived as opposites when, as I pointed out in my book, I am me, I am free, they are opposites. The vision of reality and possibility within the pen is so limited that it contains no opposites. So the elite have to create the perception of them to manufacture the divisions that allow them to divide and rule. I mean, what is the difference between a Christian bishop, Jewish rabbi, Muslim or Hindu priest, or a follower of Buddha, imposing their beliefs on their children and others? There is none because while the belief they seek to indoctrinate may be slightly different, often very slightly, the overall theme is exactly the same the imposition of one person's belief on another. Look at the opossums in politics. The far left, as symbolized by Joseph Stalin in Russia, introduced centralized control, military dictatorship, and concentration camps. The opposite of that was the far right, as symbolized by Adolf Hitler. What was he into? centralized control, military dictatorship, and concentration camps. Yet these two opossums were set at war with each other amid propaganda that claimed they were opposites. The only difference between the Soviet Union and the so-called West during the Cold War was that the Soviet Union was openly controlled by the few, and the West was secretly controlled by the few. And, when you get to the capstone of the pyramid, you find they were the same few controlling both sides. 
The same force operating through Wall Street and the City of London funded all sides in the two world wars and that's provable, see, and the truth shall set you free. So let us summarize the scam. A. You need to first imprison the human mind with a rigid belief and a fundamentally limited sense of reality, the sheep pen. It doesn't much matter what these beliefs may be, so long as they are rigid and discourage free thought and open-minded questions. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and all the rest, each make their contribution to human servitude while apparently claiming different truths. B. You encourage those who follow these rigid beliefs to impose them on others and make life very difficult and unpleasant for anyone who does not conform. C. You bring these beliefs into conflict, so ensuring the divide and rule you so desperately need for control by the few. While the masses are so busy fighting each other and seeking to impose their beliefs and views on each other, they don't see that the Illuminati have strings attached to all of them. Humans are like moths buzzing around a light, so mesmerized by their religious belief, the football scores, the latest row on a soap opera, or the price of friggin' beer, that they fail to notice the preparations being made to smash them on the arse with a swatter. Pyramids within pyramids. The Illuminati have created a pyramid structure throughout society that allows them to operate a global agenda that only a relative handful of people know exists. It is like those Russian dolls with one doll inside another with the biggest one encompassing all of them. The Illuminati replaced the dolls with pyramids, figure one. Every organization today is a pyramid. The few at the top know what the organization is really about and what it is trying to achieve. The further you go down the pyramid the more people work for the organization, but the less they know about its real agenda. They are only aware of the individual job they do every day. They have no idea how their contribution connects with that of other employees in other areas of the company. They are compartmentalized from that knowledge and told only what they need to know to do their work. These smaller pyramids, like the local branch of a bank, fit into bigger and bigger pyramids until eventually you have the pyramid that encompasses all the banks. It is the same with the transnational corporations, political parties, secret societies, media empires, and the military. If you go high enough, all the transnational corporations, like the oil cartel, major political parties, secret societies, media empires, and the military, via NATO, for instance, are controlled by the same pyramids and the same people who sit at the top of all the pyramids. In the end there is a global pyramid that encompasses all the others, the biggest doll if you like. At the top of this, you will find the most elite of the Illuminati, the purest of their bloodlines. In this way, they can coordinate through apparently unconnected, even opposing areas of society, the same policies. This is how they have created the explosion of centralization in every area of life, government, finance, business, media, military. It is not by accident or natural occurrence. It is by coldly calculated design. Jim Shaw, a former 33rd degree Freemason, exposes the craft in his book, The Deadly Deception, Huntington House Incorporated, Lafayette, Louisiana, 1988. He describes how Freemasonry is based on the same compartmentalized pyramids. At the bottom are the three degrees known as the blue degrees, and the vast majority of Freemasons never progress beyond that through either the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite or the 10 degrees of the York Rite. Star even at the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, you still don't know the real secrets unless you are one of the chosen few, bloodline. Shaw says he was surprised when a fellow 33rd degree mason said that they had told him he was going higher, and the guy left the temple by a different door. Point one there is, officially, no higher than the 33rd degree. But, of course there is. The top levels of the secret societies are only the top of their pyramid. They are also encompassed by a bigger pyramid, which includes all the secret societies and they feed their chosen bloodline initiates into the unofficial Illuminati degrees, where the real action and the real secrets are. But even at that level, the knowledge is still compartmentalized. So you have this vast web of secret societies with millions of members worldwide who think they know what they are involved in, but, in truth, only a tiny few have any idea of what is going on, and who, ultimately, is calling the shots. Albert Pike, who died in 1891, was one of the most preeminent figures in world Freemasonry. 
Among his titles were Sovereign Grand Commander of the Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree and Supreme Pontiff of Universal Freemasonry. In his book, Morals and Dogma, written for higher degree Freemasons, he reveals the way the lower levels are misled. The blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine that he understands them, their true implication is reserved for adepts, the princes of masonry. Exactly. Jim Shaw says that there are two kinds of Freemason. One just sits through the meetings and doesn't make much effort to understand the ritual, and the other does all the work but only keeps to the ritual and memorizes or reads the words without understanding what they really mean. That's correct, but there is a third kind, the very few who know the truth of who really controls Freemasonry and what the rituals and initiations are really designed to achieve. Shaw also confirms from his own experience how the Freemasons manipulate their own into whatever positions they choose. At work, his department director, a fellow Freemason, advised him to apply for a particular job. Shaw felt he was underqualified for the post and would fail the test paper. 3. Only through the urging of his Freemason boss did he apply. When he arrived to take the test he was amazed to see that there were only two other applicants for a job he believed would be keenly contested. When he turned over the test paper, he saw that the questions were very easy and he finished them quickly. His two rivals, however, were clearly finding the paper very tough and could not complete it in the allotted time. Shaw got the job. Why? Because he was not given the same paper as the other two. When he walked out of Freemasonry, the opposite happened. He found his bosses far less supportive to say the least. This is just one small example of how the Illuminati and their secret society web ensure that their guys are in the positions that matter. It is actually astonishing how few people you need to control to dictate your agenda through the whole system if they are, a, in the key positions of decision-making and, b, they have the power to appoint those in the important positions below them. An example, you control the chief of police who decides the policy and he can appoint the heads of the various departments in his force. He introduces Illuminati policy and chooses his major subordinates from the secret society initiates. They in turn, can appoint the people within their departments and can thus choose more secret society initiates for the positions below them. So it goes on. Once you have control of the top man in any organization, the pyramid is built in his, i.e. the Illuminati's, image. Governments are structured in the same way. Mind over masses. There are two techniques of mass manipulation that people need to understand if they are to begin to see through the game. One I call problem-reaction-solution, and the other I term the stepping-stones approach. These have been used for thousands of years to advance the agenda, and, together with fear, they remain the two most effective weapons of the Illuminati. The first technique works like this, you know that, if you openly propose to remove basic freedoms, start a war, or centralize power, there will be a public reaction against it. So you use problem-reaction-solution. At stage one you create a problem. It could be a country attacking another, a government or economic collapse, or a terrorist bomb. Anything in fact that the public will think requires a solution. At stage two, you report the problems you have covertly created in the way you wish the people to perceive them. You find someone to blame, a patsy like Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma, and you spin the background to these events in a way that encourages the people to demand that something must be done. These are the words you wish to hear because it allows you to move on to stage three, the sting. You then openly offer the solutions to the problems you have yourself created. These solutions, of course, involve the centralization of power, the sacking of officials or politicians that are getting in your way, and the removal of more basic freedoms. With this technique you can so manipulate the public mind that they will demand that you do what, in normal circumstances, they would vehemently oppose. The Oklahoma bomb at the James P. Murrah building on April 19, 1995 was a problem-reaction solution classic. In, and the truth shall set you free, I expose how McVeigh was set up by forces he did not understand, 
and how a fuel fertilizer device in a Ryder truck could not possibly have caused that horrific damage. 4. And what followed this death and destruction? Anti-terrorism laws went through Congress without challenge, that removed fundamental freedoms from American people. I have no sympathy with the political views of McVeigh and the Christian patriots in general, except to the extent that they seek to expose the basics of the global agenda. But that's not the point. Establishing the truth of what happened is the point, no matter what the views and attitudes of those involved. I think it is called justice. If you are wondering why McVeigh offered no defense and later asked to be executed, see the section on mind control. The two most effective problem reaction solutions in the 20th century were the two global wars. They changed the face of the world, as wars always do, and led to a massive centralization of power. The United Nations, like its predecessor, the League of Nations, was an Illuminati creation to act as a Trojan horse or stalking horse for world government. The media play their part to perfection in these PRS scenarios. At ownership level, People like Conrad Black at the Hollinger Group know what is going on and use their newspapers to pursue the Illuminati agenda. The key editors they appoint might know something of it, and also certain columnists. But most of the journalists will have no idea. The editor is always there to block anything they write that is against the interests of the Illuminati, and if they insist on pursuing an unwelcome story they find themselves looking for another job. And, anyway, most of what journalists write comes from official, Illuminati, sources. In the immediate aftermath of a major event such as Oklahoma, where are the reporters getting their information? From official sources. We are told that White House sources say this, and FBI sources say that. This is how the Illuminati transmit through the media the version of these events that they wish the public to believe. These reports are blazed across the front page of newspapers and the top of radio and television news bulletins throughout the world, and what they say becomes the norm. In the weeks and months that follow, researchers who are interested in the real truth begin to dig away. Over and over they establish and document the proof of how the official version was a lie from start to finish. But where are their reports published? in small circulation newsletters and on radio stations that operate with a fraction of the money and audience of the Illuminati empires. Years after the official version has been demolished it still prevails in the public mind. Stop people in London, New York, Cape Town, Sydney, anywhere, and ask them what happened in Oklahoma, the Second World War, or Kosovo. Every time they will give you the official story, because that is the only one they have heard. The bedfellow of problem-reaction solution is the stepping stones approach. You know where you intend to lead people, but you realize that, if you gave them the true picture you would, once again, face substantial opposition. So you travel to your destination in little steps, and each one is presented in isolation, and is unconnected to all the others. It is like a drip, 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 to global centralization. This technique was used most obviously with the fascist super-state now known as the European Union. If the politicians had suggested a centralized Europe with common laws and currency there would have been an outcry. People would have said they had been fighting Hitler to stop just such a European dictatorship, and there was no way they were accepting another. To overcome this, the Illuminati offered a free trade area, and even used the problem of their manipulated world wars to encourage more cooperation between the countries of Europe. Once they had the free trade area, however, the foot in the door, they began to expand its powers until it became the fully-fledged fascist political and economic dictatorship it is today. The same is happening with NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, the free trade area for Asia and Australia, Look at today's newspapers and television news bulletins, and you'll see problem-reaction solution and the stepping stones technique played out day after day. One extremely effective way to see through this scam is to keep asking yourself, who benefits from me believing this version of events or accepting the solutions and changes being offered as a result? The answer will be almost every time, anyone who wishes to centralize power and suppress more freedoms. Blind Faith over thousands of years, religion has best served this structure for human control, and I will highlight later in this book the historical background and present-day manipulation of these faiths. 
but, in short, they have created rigid belief systems that should never be questioned, imposed those beliefs through fear, indoctrination, isolation, and the mass genocide of non-believers, and fought each other for dominance of the human mind, thus producing an orgasm of opportunity for the Illuminati to divide and rule for millennia. Another question. Is it more likely that an Illuminati which has its origins in the ancient past, long before these religions were created, just happened to get lucky when such a perfect vehicle for human control independently emerged? Or is it rather more probable that these institutions of human enslavement were purposely created by these very same Illuminati to advance their agenda? But religion is not the conspiracy, and nor are economics, politics, and all the rest. They are part of a vast web of interconnected manipulation designed to persuade the masses to put themselves in prison and throw away the key. The Illuminati work through every belief system, religious, political, economic, racial, and cultural, and through every side in the major debates. The reason is simple, if you want to know the outcome of a game before the game has even started, you need to control all sides. The manager of a football team cannot dictate the result if he only controls one side. If, however, he is managing both sides, he can decide the result before a ball is kicked. So it is with the Illuminati, the hidden hand behind the events that affect our lives and our world every day. But, by the end of this book, if you are open-minded enough to complete it, the hand will be hidden no more. The truth is not only out there. A lot of it is right here. Chapter 2. Designer History. Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. George Orwell, 1984. History is the lie commonly agreed upon. Voltaire. To know where you are and where you are going, it helps enormously to know where you have come from. Indeed it is essential. The fix we have today on who we are and the nature of reality has been based to a very large extent on our belief in what has happened in the past. So if you want to manipulate people's sense of self and reality today, it is vital to rewrite what we hilariously call history. For example, if official history tells you from cradle to grave that the Second World War was fought between the good guys and bad guys, the Allies fighting for freedom and the fascists seeking a global dictatorship, you do not open your eyes to see the endless provable evidence that both sides were funded and controlled by the same people operating through Wall Street and the city of London. The story of Jesus is another outstanding case, probably the best. The Christian religion is based entirely on belief in the historical, literal, existence of a Jewish man who was born to a virgin mother, performed countless miracles, died on a cross to save us all, disappeared from his tomb after three days, and then ascended to heaven to be with his dad. Over the best part of 2,000 years, billions of lives on this planet have been controlled, limited, manipulated and directed by a belief that the Jesus story actually happened. Still today, vast swathes of humanity are obsessed with, and their every action based upon, this fairy tale being historically accurate. Just one story about one man has had that staggering scale of human consequence, ancient and modern. And yet, as we shall see, the Gospels are nonsense if taken literally, with no historical foundation whatsoever. They are merely the most exploited versions of a symbolic, not literal, story that you find all over the world in all its detail thousands of years before the name Jesus was first mentioned. A little quiz. Who am I talking about here? He was born on December 25 to a virgin mother, he was called a savior, the only begotten son, and died to save humanity, he was crucified on a Friday Black Friday, and his blood was spilled to redeem the earth, he suffered death with nails and stakes, he was the father and son combined in an earthly body, he was put in a tomb, went down into the underworld, but three days later, on March 25th, his body was found to be gone from the tomb, and he was resurrected as the Most High God, his body was symbolized as bread then eaten by those who worshipped him. Jesus, yes. No, no. All of this was said about the Savior Son of God called Addis who was worshipped by the Phrygians, one of the oldest races in Asia Minor, now Turkey, well over a thousand years before the manufacture of Jesus. It is just one of countless symbolic deities of whom the same story was told millennia before Christianity. Others are accepted to have been myths and not to have literally existed. But not Jesus. 
While Christians laugh at those pagan tales and condemn them as evil, they asked the rest of the world to believe, indeed have insisted on pain of torture and death, that their version of the same story is somehow literally true, while all the others are not. Yeah, right. To understand how the repeat of an ancient, endlessly recurring story could be transformed into the prison religion called Christianity, and to see the source of global control today, we have to research our ancient origins. When we do that with an open mind and without preconceived dogma, a very different human history emerges. One that is not taught in the schools and universities of the world or revealed through the mainstream media. It is a story that not only makes sense of the past, but opens your eyes to the staggering scale of manipulation today and the ancient background and ancestry of those involved. Contrary to conditioned belief, life on Earth has not evolved from a primitive past to the technological cutting edge of today. Many thousands of years ago, as detailed in streams of ancient accounts across the world, there was great technological knowledge on this planet, and a global society controlled by races of beings, which humans came to know as gods. It is a minefield to decipher which of these gods were flesh and blood real, and which were symbolic of the sun, moon, planets, natural cycles, and so on. Most were the latter, but there is substantial evidence to confirm that some of them, particularly the further back you go, were walking, talking, entities, who had, by human standards at the time, amazing knowledge of the solar system, the stars, the universal cycles, the effect of the sun, moon and other planets and star systems on the earth and its people, and technological understanding of such immensity that they were able to build the pyramids and other stunning structures all over the world that we would struggle to build even today. Just consider the scale we are talking here with the Giza pyramids alone. The Great Pyramid, which is nearly 500 feet high, consists of six and a half million tons of stone and around two and a half million individual blocks. Some weigh 70 tons, and in the other pyramids and walls are stones of 200, even 468 tons, and they are so perfectly cut and fitted together you could not get a piece of paper between them. There is enough stone in the Great Pyramid alone to build 30 Empire State buildings, and enough stone on the Giza site to build a wall around the entire border of France some 3 meters high and 1 meter thick. Some of these gigantic stones at Giza and numerous temple sites were apparently taken from quarries hundreds of miles away. And we are told that primitive people did this? Oh do come on! At Baalbek in the Lebanon are structures thousands of years old, which include three enormous chunks of stone known as the Trilithon, each weighing more than 800 tons. These had to be moved at least a third of a mile, and one of them placed 20 feet up in a wall. Another piece of stone nearby is a thousand tons, which, apparently, is the weight of three jumbo jets. We are asked to believe again that a primitive people did this. In Peru, you have ancient temples and other sites built with stones weighing 440 tons, and a Tayuanaco in Peru blocks weighing 100 tons are connected by metal clamps. This site is dated at some 11,000 years ago. On the Nazca Plain in Peru there are the massive and astonishing Nazca Lines. These are fantastic depictions of birds, insects, and animals, created by scoring away the top surface to reveal the white rock underneath. The images are made with one continuous line, and some were only seen in their entirety after 1939, when people began to fly over the region, because they can only be seen in full from 1,000 to 2,000 feet. Rock carvings dating back more than 10,000 years were found during an expedition to the Marcahuasi Plateau northeast of Lima, Peru, and these included sculptures representing people and animals, most of which are not native to Peru. They included a polar bear, walrus, African lion, penguin and the Stegosaurus dinosaur. But dinosaurs were unknown to science until the 1880s, and the Stegosauria was not identified until 1901. Talk us through that one. As other books and television documentaries in recent years have shown, these amazing structures, temples, stone circles, and standing stones were not only lined up precisely with certain star systems, they were aligned just as precisely in relationship to each other all over the planet, and the building techniques and designs were often the same on different sides of the world. Why? Because the official version of history is baloney. There were not isolated, unconnected, societies, which developed alone, if you go back far enough. 
There was a global society controlled by the gods and representatives of the gods, beings that were extremely advanced technologically compared with the mass of humanity at the time, and, in many ways, ahead of our society today. Or, at least, ahead of the technology we are allowed to see in the public arena, anyway. A precisely machined and shaped cube of metal was found in the center of a block of coal in Austria in 1885, and, based on the age of that coal seam, it must have been made some 300,000 years ago. A piece of gold thread was found embedded in 8 feet of rock in Rutherford Mills, England, in 1844, and that rock was estimated to go back 60 million years. Electric batteries have been found in ancient Egyptian tombs, and a massive slab of green glass weighing many tons was found in Israel. The prehistoric bones of animals have been discovered with bullets in them. As the brilliant author and researcher of far ancient history, Colonel James Churchward, wrote, Civilizations have been born and completed, and then forgotten again and again. There is nothing new under the sun. What is, has been. All that we learn and discover has existed before. Our inventions and discoveries are but reinventions, rediscoveries. The ancients across the world described a high tech golden age of human society, although some of it, especially towards the end, was anything but golden. These stories say that this age was ended by high tech war and a series of geological catastrophes that caused colossal earth changes through earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, magnetic pole shifts and tidal waves on a scale we could not begin to imagine today. The biblical Great Flood is a symbolic story of one such event, but there appear from the biological and geological record to have been several from about 12,000 BC up to around 5,000 BC, perhaps even later. As you can see in The Biggest Secret and the excellent book, The Day the Earth Nearly Died, by D. S. Allen and J. B. Dallaire, Gateway Books, Bath, 1995. The geological and biological evidence is supported by the ancient accounts with the most incredible synchronicity. Everywhere the ancients recorded the effects of these events. Professor James Demio writes in his book, Saharasia, Hidden Mysteries Texas, 2000, of vast changes in the Middle East in this same window of time. A massive climate change shook the ancient world when approximately 6,000 years ago vast areas of lush grassland and forest in the old world began to quickly dry out and convert into harsh desert. The vast Sahara Desert, Arabian Desert, and the giant deserts of the Middle East and Central Asia simply did not exist prior to, about, 4000 BC. The upheavals of the ancient world destroyed the advanced global society or golden age that existed before and this is recorded in the stories of Atlantis and Lemuria, or Mu. Humanity had to start all over again. If you believe that is far-fetched, think about today's society. It may be advanced on one level with power grids and computer systems, and all the rest. Such technology can perform apparently miraculous feats, like typing a letter onto this computer and having it read by someone on the other side of the world seconds later. But what would happen to this technological society if we were faced now with a global catastrophe that devastated the planet? Within seconds, we would be sitting in the technological stone age. It would be a primitive, everyone for themselves, find your own food, shelter and warmth, free for all. And as time and generations passed, the memory of the technological world we have today would fade ever more rapidly and only be preserved in stories and myths which would, more and more, be seen as wild tales and figments of the imagination. Most people would deny such a world ever existed because it would be so at odds with their daily experience. We would have the same we can't do it so it can't be done mentality that laughed at the very idea we could fly to the moon. The history in that post-cataclysmic society would only begin with the records left by humanity once they had re-advanced to a certain level. Only then would they write or symbolize accounts of their history, and this would be based on stories passed verbally through the earlier generations. Such a point could take hundreds, even thousands, of years after the global geological destruction. So it was after the cataclysms of our ancient past. Conventional history says that the cradle of civilization was Sumer, in the land between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates in what we now call Iraq and once known as Mesopotamia, between two rivers. The Sumerian period is estimated to have spanned the millennia between 4000 and 2000 BC. 
Historians say that other, independent, civilizations of great advancement also suddenly appeared in the same period in Egypt and the Indus Valley in what is now the Indian continent. But they are wrong on both counts, I would suggest. Sumer was not the start of what is called civilized society on this planet. It was the most significant one to emerge after the catastrophe that destroyed the global society of the Golden Age, Atlantis and Lemuria, or Mu. Sumer was not the beginning, it was the start over again which was to become the center of another virtually global empire. Indeed Sumer, Babylon Egypt, and the Indus Valley civilizations had actually begun tens of thousands of years before history records them. After the cataclysms, these advanced cultures in Egypt and the Indus Valley, which suddenly and unexplainably manifested at a very high level of development, were not independent of Sumer, as the historians claim. They were part of the same Sumer Empire and ruled by the same leader. The structure of administration, the foundation of law, building techniques, and so many other features of what we call modern society can be traced back to this ancient race that founded Sumer. Or more to the point, to those ruling bloodlines and gods that held the knowledge going back into prehistory. These advanced ancient post-deluge societies appeared with tremendous speed. Professor W. B. Emery writes in Archaic Egypt, Penguin Books England, 1961, at a period approximately 3400 years, B.C., a great change took place in Egypt, and the country passed rapidly from a state of advanced Neolithic culture with a complex tribal character to two well-organized monarchies, one comprising the Delta area and the other the Nile Valley proper. At the same time the art of writing appears. Monumental architecture and the arts and crafts developed to an astonishing degree, and all the evidence points to the existence of a well-organized, even luxurious civilization. All this was achieved within a comparatively short period of time, for there appears to be little or no background to these fundamental developments in writing and architecture. The question still to be answered is whether the incredible feats of building like the pyramids originate before the great cataclysms, which destroyed the legendary Golden Age, in other words, maybe upwards of 10,000 years ago and far longer, or were they built by the Sumer Empire which emerged when the world had again reached an advanced level of society after the upheavals. I have no doubt that it was a mixture of both. In the light of the rapidly emerging evidence and the fundamental reassessment of timescales in the wake of that evidence, at least some of the world's greatest ancient wonders go back to the pre-cataclysmic global society known in legends and accounts as the Golden Age. They are far, far older than previously imagined. Inca accounts, compiled by Fernando Montesinos, one of the earliest Spanish chroniclers in South America, say there were two Inca empires. The first established their headquarters at Cuzco in the Andes Mountains, and, after they fled to a mountaintop sanctuary, Machu Picchu, in the wake of devastating land upheavals, they returned to Cuzco to start a second culture. This would push back the original Inca Empire to the time of the Atlantean Lemurian cataclysms and before, and lead us to the true builders of the fantastic structures that conventional history cannot explain. All over the world in every native culture, you will find stories of a great flood and incredible geological upheavals. There is no doubt that an unimaginable catastrophe, or, more likely, catastrophes were visited upon the Earth between approximately 11,000 and 5,000 BC. The geological and biological evidence is overwhelming in support of the countless stories and traditions that describe such events. They come from Europe, Scandinavia, Russia, Africa, throughout the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, Asia, China, Japan, and the Middle East. Everywhere. Some speak of great heat that boiled the sea, of mountains breathing fire, the disappearance of the sun and moon and the darkness that followed, the raining down of blood, ice, and rock, the earth flipping over, the sky falling, the rising and sinking of land, the loss of great continents, the coming of the ice, and virtually all of them describe a fantastic flood, a wall of water, which swept across the earth. The tidal wave caused by the comet in the movie, Deep Impact, gives you an idea of what it would have been like. Old Chinese texts describe how the pillars supporting the sky crumpled, of how the sun, moon, and stars poured down in the northwest where the sky became low, 
rivers, seas, and oceans, rushed to the southeast where the earth sank, and a great conflagration was quenched by a raging flood. In America, the Pawnee Indians tell the same story of a time when the North and South Polar Stars changed places and went to visit each other. North American traditions refer to great clouds appearing and a heat so powerful that the waters boiled. The Greenland Eskimos told early missionaries that long ago the earth turned over. Peruvian legends say that the Andes Mountains were ripped apart when the sky made war with the earth. Brazilian myth describes how the heavens burst and fragments fell down killing everything and everyone as heaven and earth changed places. And the Hopi Indians of North America record that the earth was rent in great chasms and water covered everything except one narrow ridge of mud. Atlantis and Lemuria All of this closely correlates with the legends of Atlantis and Lemuria, or Mu. These were two vast continents, one in the Atlantic and the other in the Pacific, which many people believe were ruled by highly advanced races that originated from other worlds. The continents are said to have disappeared under the sea in the circumstances described above, leaving only islands, like the Azores and Polynesia, as remnants of their former scale and glory. Atlantis is said by some to have emerged after the sinking of Lemuria. Others say they were simultaneous, and that's my view. The most thorough and outstanding researcher of Lemuria Mu was Colonel James Churchward, who wrote a series of books in the first half of the 20th century. Churchward visited remote monasteries in Asia and saw the ancient records of the motherland of Mu or Lemuria going back between 12,000 and 70,000 years. He saw how it was the center of a global empire that included Atlantis. In his book, The Children of Mu, B. Books, Albuquerque, New Mexico, first published in 1931, he shows how the various racial types on Mu, including blue-eyed blondes, peopled the world. Point one five. These Lemurian races went east to become the Mayans of Central America and the other builders of the fantastic structures of the American continent. They went west to people Asia, China, India, and elsewhere, and created colonies in what became Egypt and Sumer. All genetic and cultural roads, he says, lead back to Lemuria Mu, the motherland, and the very advanced civilization that existed tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, of years before today's modern society. Churchward says that Lemuria was destroyed around 12,000 years ago. W. T. Samsel in his study of these ancient societies, The Atlantis Connection, Starfire Publishing, Sedona, Arizona, 1998, dates the end of Lemuria much earlier, but many of their basic themes are similar. Samsel's book is based on channeled information. Creation consists of an infinite number of wavelengths, or frequencies and the world we perceive with our physical senses is merely one tiny fraction of the frequencies that exist. Just as we cannot see the radio and television frequencies sharing the same space as our bodies at this moment, so we cannot see with our limited physical senses the other frequencies and wavelengths of creation that also occupy the same space that we do. I will go into greater detail about this later because it is crucial to understanding how we are controlled and how we can break free. But to channel is to tune our consciousness to some of these other wavelengths and access the knowledge and information that exists there. Samsel claims to be in contact with an entity formerly incarnate in Atlantis that now communicates from one of these other frequencies. Most channeled information, in my experience, is either nonsense or extremely limited, but many of Samsel's themes are supported by geological and biological record. He believes that it was about 100,000 years ago that the first examples of modern human forms appeared on the island of Lemuria in what is now the Pacific Ocean. These were intended to be perfected vehicles, he says. As they began to explore the Earth, they seeded the land, that is known as Atlantis, which is said to have been in the Atlantic on the geologically unstable Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Samsel says that early Atlanteans were a dark-skinned people, not unlike the Native Americans. He believes the Native American people are directly descended from Lemurians and Atlanteans who settled in the Americas before the first great cataclysm some 48,000 years ago, and Native American legends support this theme. His view is that in those earlier days of Atlantis and Lemuria the people lived under the law of one, the understanding that everything is the same energy expressing itself in different forms. The law of one is the knowledge 
that everything is connected to everything else, and ultimately all is an expression of the same whole or energy. Scientists call this the unified field theory. This is a common theme of Atlantean myths and legends, a civilization that began with positive intent and in harmony with the natural laws, but was taken over by forces that transformed it into a very dark place indeed. Samsel suggests that the war between the gods in ancient mythology was a war between extraterrestrial races over the question of intervention or non-intervention in Earth affairs. He says that midway through the early Atlantean age, extraterrestrials with a human-like appearance, very tall, light-haired, light-skinned, albino-like people, made contact with the Atlanteans. They began to manipulate Atlantean society, he says, and interbreed with humans to change the DNA and create hybrid bloodlines that became the royal lineage of kings and queens. I would include Lemuria in this same story also. The technology and physical appearance of these extraterrestrials led the Atlanteans Lemurians to see them as gods. Intermarrying with these beings to produce light-skinned offspring with godlike features became the goal of many Atlanteans, Samsel writes, and these crossbreeds became the dominant force. They took over the government, economics, education, religion, and communications. Sound familiar? Samsel says that the kings of the white royal lineage ruled Atlantis, and what he calls the sons of Belial controlled the Temple of the Sun, their religious hierarchy and ritual network. Today this Atlantean Temple of the Sun is known as the Illuminati. During this period, many Atlanteans of the Red Race migrated west to the Americas, which were then geographically different to what we see today. Samsel goes on, the age of the Atlantic Empire would prove to be a free for all for the sons of Belial and the followers of the Temple of the Sun. The dominant white tribe came to rule all aspects of Atlantean society. They disregarded the law of one, placed their faith in technology, and were driven by greed and the lust for power. The arms of the Atlantic Empire came to stretch nearly worldwide. The Americas and Africa, the European countries, the Middle East India and Tibet came under the control of the empire. The One Temple was divided and ineffective, the Sun Temple flourished and the sons of Belial prospered. During that time, One Law priests were leading migrations of the Red Race west to the Americas and east to Africa. They sought to preserve the law of one, and so they built new circles in the far lands. Samsel says that the second great cataclysm brought an end to Atlantis. He believes that they used their super weapons against what we now call China and they tried to utilize the earth as a great conductor through which to direct at their adversaries using the vast crystal, which is a common theme in Atlantean stories. But, he says, the earth hurled the force back upon them and the final, disastrous, cataclysm was triggered. Samsel claims that the white race is the force behind global control, throughout the history of the earth and mankind, it has been the white tribe that has consistently exhibited the characteristics of their ancestral heritage. It is these who openly display many of the characteristics of otherworldly or alien beings. They have embraced technology above spirituality, and have manipulated spirituality, to achieve their own ends. They traditionally display a little regard for the earth, nature or other species of living creatures. Throughout recorded history they have sought domination over all others and over the earth itself. They have been highly programmed and conditioned to be exclusive, aggressive and dominating. Presently, these lead humanity towards the new world order, consciously or unconsciously carrying out the agenda of the Illuminati, hence, the extraterrestrial manipulators. The themes of Samsel's research are supported by my own, although we differ in detail. My own view is that, what he calls the sons of Belial are what I call the reptilian bloodlines, the result of interbreeding between the white or Nordic race and a reptilian people. In the end, however, it's the theme that really matters in understanding the basic background to the world today. The tussle between the Atlantean advocates of the law of one and the opposing temple of the sun is highly significant. The Temple of the Sun has been the religion of the Illuminati from Atlantis Lemuria right through to the present time. In fact, today's world is the new Atlantis, a mirror of the obsession with technological dominance that led to the destruction of the first Atlantean civilization. Put simply, the law of one sees everything as connected, part of the same unified whole, and the Temple of the Sun represents the desire to present everything as unconnected and isolated from everything else. 
One seeks to unite, the other to divide, and, therefore, rule. You will see this theme throughout the book as I tell the story of how the Luminati, the Atlantean sons of Belial, or whatever you would like to call them, have sought to build the new Atlantis ever since the cataclysmic events that destroyed the original version. Atlantis was described by Plato, 427-347 BC, the ancient Greek philosopher. He was also a high initiate of the secret society, Mystery School Network. To this day this secret network has passed on advanced knowledge to the chosen few while denying that privilege to the mass of the people. Official history dismisses Plato's contention that such a continent existed, but there is vast geological support for such claims. The Azores, which some believe, were part of Atlantis, lie on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, a fracture line that encircles the planet. This line continues for a distance of 40,000 miles. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is one of the foremost areas for earthquakes and volcanoes. Four vast tectonic plates, the Eurasian, African, North American, and Caribbean, all meet and collide in this region making it very unstable geologically. Both the Azores and the Canary Islands, named after dogs, canine, and not canaries, were subject to widespread volcanic activity in the time period Plato suggested for the end of Atlantis. Tachylite lava disintegrates in seawater within 15,000 years, and yet it is still found on the seabed around the Azores, confirming geologically recent upheavals. Other evidence, including beach sand gathered from depths of 10,518,440 feet, reveals that the seabed in this region must have been, again geologically recently, above sea level. The oceanographer, Maurice Ewing, wrote in National Geographic magazine that either the land must have sunk two or three miles or the sea must once have been two or three miles lower than now. Either conclusion is startling. When European explorers first landed in the Canary Islands the people said they were descendants of the Atlanteans and were shocked to realize that other people had survived the cataclysm that destroyed their homeland. The geological and biological evidence also suggests that the widespread volcanic activity that caused the sinking of the land in the region of the Azores happened at the same time as the breakup and sinking of the land mass known as Appalachia, which connected what we now call Europe, North America Iceland and Greenland. Even their degree of submergence appears to be closely related. The so-called Bermuda Triangle, between Bermuda, southern Florida, and a point near the Antilles, has long been associated with Atlantis. It is an area steeped in legends of disappearing ships and aircraft. Submerged buildings, walls, roads, and stone circles like Stonehenge, even what appear to be pyramids, have been located near Bimini under the waters of the Bahama Banks and within the Triangle. So have walls or roads creating intersecting lines. Some other facts that most people don't know, the Himalayas, Alps, Andes, and at least most other mountain ranges, were only formed or reached anything like their present height around 12,000 years ago. Lake Titicaca on the Peru-Bolivia border is today the highest navigable lake in the world at some 12,500 feet. Around 11,000 years ago, much of that region was at sea level. Why are so many fish and other ocean fossils found high up in mountain ranges? Because those rocks were once at sea level, and recently so in geological terms too. How interesting then that Plato dated the cataclysm that destroyed the continent of Atlantis to around 9000 BC, and so do Allen and Dallaire in their superb work, When the Earth Nearly Died. They say it happened around 9500 BC. The American researcher Charles Hapgood claimed that the surface of the Earth had moved by some 3000 miles around 10,000 BC. Rocks that contain iron act like a compass. As the molten rock cools, the molecules align with the North Pole, and even if those rocks are moved they continue to hold that connection. This allowed Hapgood to establish that before about 10,000 BC the physical North Pole had been located on the land in the region occupied today by the Hudson Bay in Canada. But something happened around that time that moved the whole surface of the Earth 3,000 miles to the south, thus relocating the land of the then North Pole to the Hudson Bay area. This is not as fantastic as it at first sounds. The land surface, or crust, of the planet is only about 40 miles thick. It has been likened to the skin of an orange resting on a sea of molten lava. 
If a meteor or another major body impacted the Earth it could cause the crust to slide and, according to writer and researcher Colin Wilson, there is geological evidence that this has happened three times in the last 100,000 years. Measurements of the Earth's magnetic field have shown that the north and south magnetic poles have changed places at least 171 times in the past 76 million years, and imagine the effect of a magnetic pole shift on the weather alone. The Canadian writer, Rand Flemath, who has spent more than 20 years researching these subjects, is convinced that at least a large proportion of Atlantis is what we now call Antarctica, because of this 3,000-mile shift to the south. Hapgood, following up the work of Captain Arlington H. Mullery, studied hundreds of maps found in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., which proved that the world was mapped thousands of years ago with great accuracy. One, made by Arontius Phineas in 1531, shows Antarctica with running rivers and ice-free mountains. The famous map, drawn by the Turkish sailor, Piri Rice, in 1513, and found at the Palace of the Sultan of Constantinople in 1929, charts the South American coast with great accuracy and part of the coast of Antarctica, before it was covered with ice two miles thick some 7,000 years ago. Yet Antarctica was not discovered officially until Captain Cook arrived there in 1773, and it was not explored in detail until the 1950s. Some of the mountain ranges in the Piri Rice map were not even found until 1952. Rice said that he compiled his map from 20 older ones. Flemath has also found astonishing evidence to support the existence of a highly advanced society thousands of years ago. He found that if you draw a line of longitude through the Great Pyramid at Giza, it crosses more land than anywhere else on the planet, and this supports the ancient Egyptian belief that the pyramid was the center of the Earth. Flemath then realized that if the Great Pyramid is taken to be the center of the zero-degree meridian, the longitude and latitude locations of the world's sacred sites fit together in neat geometrical patterns. They appeared as a grid system, very much like the blocks in the street plans of U.S. cities. He found he could predict where a sacred site would be purely from this system. This geometrical perfection is not the case if you take the present Greenwich Observatory in London to be the zero-degree central point. It throws the whole system out. Greenwich was chosen by a committee only in 1884 despite protests by one prominent member, the Astronomer Royal of Scotland, Charles Piazzi Smith, that the zero-degree meridian should run through the Great Pyramid. Flemath has further established that some 50 sacred sites in Mexico are aligned to a North Pole located in the Hudson Bay area, as it was before the cataclysm. Even those built since the upheavals have been placed on older sites that aligned with the old North Pole. The same is true of Rosslyn Chapel near Edinburgh in Scotland. This is an Illuminati holy grail full of their ancient symbolism and built by the St. Clair Sinclair family, one of the foremost of the Illuminati bloodlines and one of the founding forces behind the Knights Templar Secret Society. Charles Hapgood, incidentally, had a meeting arranged with President Kennedy to discuss a project to find Atlantis, but Kennedy died in Dallas a few days before their appointment. Hapgood also told Rand Flemath that he was going to produce evidence in his next book of an advanced civilization on Earth 100,000 years ago. But Hapgood died soon afterwards and the book was never written. James Churchward, however, produces such evidence in his books, and he tells how he saw maps of South America and elsewhere in those remote Asian monasteries, going back tens of thousands of years. This evidence supports the view that the continent known as Muir Lemuria now rests on the bed of the Pacific. The Polynesian tribes and other related peoples retain many legends of their sunken land of origin and Easter Island natives in the Pacific claim their land was once part of a continent destroyed by cataclysm. A Chinese text found in a Buddhist cave called Dunhuang in western China in 1900 included fragments of a map that featured an island continent in the Pacific. South American legend tells the same story of their ancestors arriving from a lost continent, among them a guy called Aramu Muru, who carried the knowledge of the Lemurian Brotherhood or Mystery School. The Hopi tribe in Arizona remember Lemuria as a series of islands by which they traveled to the American continent. Why isn't the story of the Atlantis and Mu a key part of official history? Because the knowledge has been systematically suppressed and destroyed. The astronomer, Carl Sagan, 
said that a text detailing Atlantis, called the true history of mankind over the last 100,000 years, was destroyed with thousands of others when the Great Library of Alexandria in Egypt was destroyed in AD 391. Once we know of these advanced civilizations that lasted hundreds of thousands of years and the extraterrestrial involvement in their creation and demise, our whole view of the world and ourselves will change. So will our understanding of what is happening and who is controlling us today. The destruction of ancient knowledge all over the world in the name of Christianity was the Illuminati, or the Temple of the Sun, destroying the true accounts, not only of history, but also the law of one. So what happened to Mars? There is increasing acceptance that the Earth has suffered some colossal geological upheavals. The debate, and often hostility, comes with the question of when and why. These upheavals have obviously involved the solar system as a whole, because every planet shows evidence of some cataclysmic events, which have affected its surface, atmosphere, speed, and angle of orbit or rotation. The destruction of Mars and its relationship with this devastation on Earth is a subject occupying the minds of many researchers. There has been a much greater focus on Mars since the various space probes have been directed there and, of course, their rather unfortunate record of being lost or suffering technical problems, which prevent them sending pictures back to us. MMMM. These failures are the responsibility of the Illuminati-created and controlled NASA operation. The failures followed the photographs taken in an area of Mars called Sidonia that appeared to show non-natural rock formations. These included the famous face on Mars and various pyramids. The best-known writer and researcher on this subject is the American, Richard Hoagland, a science journalist and a former advisor at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. One of his team claims to have compared the relationship of the non-natural phenomena at Sidonia on Mars, such as the face and the pyramids, with the layout at Avebury in Wiltshire, England, with its stone circle, standing stone rows, Silbury Hill, the biggest human-made mound in Europe, and other ancient earthworks. He says he found that they are virtual mirrors of each other. The Giza Plateau in Egypt, home of the Great Pyramid, was formerly known as El Cahira. This derived from the Arab noun, El Cahir, their name for Mars. Ancient texts revealed that the measurement of time was much related to Mars, and March 15, the Ides of March, Mars, was a key date in their Mars-related calendar, as was October 26. The first marked the start of spring, and the second was the end of the year in the Celtic calendar. The name Camelot in the symbolic King Arthur stories apparently means Martian city or city of Mars. Of course, as we know, a connection between Mars and human society is impossible because Mars was destroyed millions of years ago. But was it? We only think it was because that's what the official version tells us and over and over, when you look at the basis for such scientific fact, you often find it is merely an assumption or an opinion, and not a provable fact at all. Just one example of this was confirmed by Dr. Frank Drake, the former chairman of the Cornell University Astronomy Department, when he said, We used to think of the universe as nothing more than abundant fields of stars arranged in galaxies, but we underestimated the variety and quantity of matter in space by a factor of about one trillion. Which means that we were about as wrong as we could be. But until they accepted they were wrong in the face of the evidence, they taught their monumental error as scientific fact. This is happening every day, and the media just repeats such nonsense because it must be true if a scientist says it is. There is a fast-emerging alternative scenario that is pretty much in agreement with the official story, except in one crucial area where they differ fundamentally. They both agree that Mars once had water, vegetation, and an atmosphere, which could have supported life as we know it. They both agree that this potentially human-friendly environment was destroyed by catastrophic geological events. The only serious area of contention is when that disaster occurred. Was it really millions of years ago, as official science contends, or was it merely thousands of years ago, as the alternative researchers suggest, a timescale that would fit perfectly with the devastation of Atlantis and Lemuria Mu? The gathering evidence is that Mars was destroyed in the same catastrophe, which, on Earth, brought an end to that golden age. In the 1950s, the Russian-born writer and researcher, Emanuel Velikovsky, suggested in a series of books, that the planet we now call Venus, then a vast comet-like body, 
was the cause of both the demise of Mars and the near demise of the Earth when it was hurled through the solar system. Velikovsky was ridiculed and bitterly attacked by the scientific establishment, and so he must have been saying something worth hearing. But his theme is now enjoying more and more sympathy. When the Mariner 9 mission took pictures of Venus, many of Velikovsky's earlier descriptions were proved correct, including what appeared to be a comet-like tail. Mariner's pictures of Mars also supported some of his theories. He pointed out that ancient peoples depicted Venus as a very bright object trailing smoke following a very different orbit and trajectory than we see today. The Chinese, Toltecs, and Mayans recorded this. The early Sumerian astronomical accounts did not include Venus, but the later Chaldeans in the same region did so. They described it as a bright torch in heaven that illuminates like the sun and fills the entire heavens. One of the major problems that people have in encompassing ideas about the planet's past is that they judge possibility on their present experience, which is a tiny, tiny fraction of the Earth's history. As Velikovsky wrote, traditions about upheavals and catastrophes, found among all peoples, are generally discredited because of the short-sighted belief that no forces could have shaped the world in the past that are not at work also at the present time, a belief that is the very foundation of modern geology and of the theory of evolution. Brian Despero, a friend of mine in California, has had a life experience that makes his opinion significant to anyone researching the material in this book. He is a scientist, an inventor of free energy technology that could transform life on Earth, and has been researching the Illuminati, their history, origin, and agenda for more than 30 years. This interest began when he set out to prove that Jesus really existed, but he soon found himself proving that he didn't. The Christian scam led him into the bigger scam, just as my initial investigation into the suppression of spiritual, not religious, knowledge did for me. Brian is no new age flyaway sitting in the clouds. He is a feet on the ground, give me the evidence, researcher, and writer. In the 1960s, he worked at the aircraft giant, Boeing, and he says that a group of Boeing physicists got together to launch a private study aimed at explaining the many anomalies of the Earth and other planets of the solar system that could not be explained by normal physics. What they concluded was to present staggering support for Velikovsky, although they differed on time scale by about 3,000 years. They said that around 5,000 BC a huge body, now called Jupiter, careered through the solar system. This threw the outer planets into disarray, so explaining their present anomalies of spin direction and speed. Jupiter crashed into a planet that once orbited between where Mars and Jupiter are today, and the debris from this planet, they said, can be seen as the otherwise unexplained asteroid belt that occupies the space between Mars and Jupiter. I saw some interesting channeled information about Mars in relation to the end of Atlantis. It said that one of the three Atlantean cataclysms, which destroyed the continent in stages, happened around 10,500 BC and was caused by a close pass of the Earth by Mars, which has been knocked out of its original orbit. The same theme keeps returning from many diverse sources, and, somewhere within this, the detailed truth is waiting for us. James Churchward has a more earthly explanation for the cataclysms. He says there are enormous gas belts and chambers under the Earth, and when these blow on a vast scale, the land above is destroyed. He says these gas belts ran under both Lemuria Mu and Atlantis. What caused the cataclysms is open to debate, but that they did happen, is a statement of fact. A similar theme can be found in the tens of thousands of ancient clay tablets discovered in Mesopotamia in the mid-19th century. These tell the stories and myths of the Sumerian culture that emerged after one of these cataclysms that sank what was left of Atlantis. Sumer dates from around 4000 BC, but civilizations existed in that region, as James Churchward documents, for tens of thousands of years before Sumer emerged. Central to these Sumerian accounts were the gods the Sumerians called the Anunna, sons of An. Their later Semitic names were Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came, and Dinger, the righteous ones of the blazing rockets. They are best known as the Anunnaki, and so I shall use that term in the book. The Anunnaki, as we shall see, were a reptilian race from the stars. The Sumerian tablets describe, according to the author and translator, Zechariah Sitchin, 
a collision between the moons of a planet they called Nibiru and one orbiting between the present Jupiter and Mars. The debris from this stupendous collision, Sitchin's translations say, created what the Sumerians called the Great Band Bracelet, the asteroid belt. The Sumerian accounts differ in detail, but again the theme is the same. In their version of these events, the Boeing physicists suggested that part of Jupiter broke away on impact with another planet. This is the body we now call Venus, they concluded. It was projected towards Mars, destroying the atmosphere and life on that planet. The Mars Pathfinder mission established that Martian rocks lack sufficient erosion to have been on the surface for more than 10,000 years. After devastating Mars, the Venus comet was caught by the gravitational pull of the Earth, they said. It made several orbits of the Earth, causing the tidal wave and devastation that ended the Golden Age and hurled vast quantities of ionized ice at the poles. Its momentum then hurled it into its present orbit as Venus the planet. Synchronistically, the most ancient Mesopotamian and Central American records don't include Venus in their planetary accounts, but the later ones do, and there was a focus on Venus with human sacrifices made to it. The biggest secret goes into this whole story in greater detail, and you will see that it explains so many mysteries. These include the sudden freezing of mammoths standing up in the process of eating, because the ice did not slowly develop, it arrived in an instant. The ancient legends and myths of how the Golden Age ended are confirmed in every way by the scientific explanation of the geological and environmental effects of this walkabout by Venus. Most important in relation to our story, these conclusions by people like Velikovsky, the Boeing physicists, and increasing numbers of other researchers today, bring the time scale for the end of life on Mars to within the period that saw the end of Atlantis and Lemuria Mu. Brian Despero suggests, along with many others, including myself, that the Golden Age was the result of many extraterrestrial and other dimensional races visiting the Earth and operating openly among the human population in a long period of at least hundreds of thousands of years. He believes, like those Boeing physicists he knew and worked with, that the Earth was much closer to the Sun before these events, and that Mars orbited in the area of the Earth now resides. Two independent scientists, Dr. C. J. Hyman and C. William Kinsman, suggested that the Earth once followed the present orbit of Venus and that Mars was located in the present Earth orbit. Ancient legends say that Earth days and years were once shorter than now and humans lived for far longer. If, as is claimed, the deep canyons on the Mars surface were caused by massive torrents of water, there had to have been a warmer climate there at one time because today it is so cold that water would freeze immediately and the vacuum atmosphere would make the water vaporize instantly. The closer orbit to the sun, Despero says, would have demanded that the first Earth races would have been black, with the pigmentation necessary to cope with the fiercer rays of the sun. Ancient skeletons found near Stonehenge and along the west coast of France have the nasal and spinal traits of many female Africans. Ancient artifacts, statues, and artistic depictions around the world also suggest there was an advanced black race of the Negro type. The Sumerian tablets describe how the Anunnaki gods left the planet to escape the devastation, even indicating that they had caused it. The only ones to survive the catastrophe were the extraterrestrials with the technology and foresight, perhaps prior warning, who left before the stuff hit the fan, and the people who sheltered deep underground or in the mountain ranges above the flood water which, according to the Boeing study, could have reached heights of 10,000 feet. The Earth is riddled with tunnels and caverns, natural and created, which date back into far ancient times. Many of these have been located, including an underground city that could house a population of thousands in Cappadocia, Turkey, one of the centers of the Phoenicians, and the origin of George of Cappadocia, who later became St. George of England. 36 underground cities have been discovered in Cappadocia so far, and some are huge complexes going down eight levels. The ventilation systems are so efficient that even eight floors down the air is still fresh. 30 vast underground cities and tunnel complexes have also been found near Derinkaya in Turkey, also. It was the floodwaters and the need to survive them which ensured that agriculture in the post-flood world began at altitudes above 10,000 feet and not as you would expect, in the Fertile Plains. A study by the botanist, Nikolai Ivanovich Vavilov, 
revealed that the 50,000 wild plants he examined from around the world originated in only eight areas, all of them mountainous. In James Churchward's view this would have been because the mountains were formed during the cataclysms, and therefore many lowland areas were raised to a great height. According to ancient accounts, supported by much other evidence, when the earth had settled down after the cataclysm, or cataclysms, the survivors began to return from the high mountains north of Sumer in Turkey and Iran into the plains of Mesopotamia. It was in the Turkish mountains, on Mount Ararat, that the symbolic Noah's Ark came to rest when the waters receded, the Bible claims. The Sumerian tablets also relate how the Anunnaki gods returned to rebuild and restore their devastated heartlands, and the civilization that emerged from this is known to history as Sumer. I think, however, that many parts of the Sumerian tablets are actually referring to events on Lemuria and Atlantis. Some researchers suggest that remains of the Anunnaki's pre-flood cities can be found today under the Persian Gulf, which became much wider and deeper after the upheavals. Depending on the location and the effects of the devastation, some of the great structures of the Golden Age survived and can be seen to this day. These could be anything from tens to hundreds of thousands of years old. Other famous sites and structures were built or rebuilt by the Sumerians from around 6,000 years ago. My feeling at the moment is that Stonehenge and Avebury were among the latter, but not necessarily the pyramids of the Giza Plateau, and certainly not some of the breathtaking structures of South America. They definitely appear to be Golden Age. You can read far more detailed evidence of these cataclysmic events in The Biggest Secret and When the Earth Nearly Died, together with a list of other books. Focusing on this subject Velikovsky's books are listed in the bibliography. The reason this information has been so suppressed in the mainstream of science, education, and media is because of the domino effect it would have on human perception. Have you seen those world record attempts for knocking down the most dominoes? They line them up so that by pushing down the first one they fall on each other and all of them go down. The system of control, the matrix as I call it, is like that. The Illuminati have to work furiously to keep every domino in their agenda from falling, because when one goes they all start to go. The control of what we call history is one of their most crucial of these dominoes. If we knew that there had been a highly developed technological society thousands of years ago, which came to an end with fantastic geological upheavals, we would see the world in a very different light. The whole official version of human evolution would crumble. We would ask who those people were? Where did they come from? Where did they get their knowledge and technology? Suddenly the mysteries of Egypt and Sumer, and the staggering structures left us by the ancients, would be far less mysterious. And if Egypt and Sumer were founded with this same advanced knowledge, it means that some of those pre-cataclysmic peoples must have survived. So what has happened to their knowledge for thousands of years, and what happened to their bloodlines? Once you allow a hole in your dike, the flood begins to pour through. This is why the Illuminati, through their vehicles of religion, and, more latterly, science, have made a prime focus the suppression of all knowledge and information that would reveal the true story of human history. Once we see that, the mist begins to clear. Chapter 3. Ruled by Gods. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. Albert Einstein. The ancient legends and accounts say, that the highly advanced cultures of Atlantis and Lemuria were inspired by the knowledge brought by extraterrestrial races from many parts of the galaxy and other dimensions of the universe. When we open our minds to the suppressed knowledge, we understand that the world we think we live in is only one frequency range of existence. As I mentioned earlier, creation consists of infinite dimensions of life vibrating at different speeds. Think of the frequencies of the countless radio and television stations broadcasting to your area now. They are all sharing the same space that your body is occupying. You can't see them, and they can't see each other, because they are vibrating to a different frequency. When you move the dial from one radio station to another, the first station does not suddenly stop broadcasting, because you are no longer listening. It goes on broadcasting, existing, just as before. The only difference is that you are no longer tuned to its frequency. All the infinite frequencies of life and existence in all creation are sharing the same space. Most people call these different frequency ranges dimensions, and that's fine, 
because people know what they mean. More accurately they are densities, because the slower that energy vibrates the more dense and solid it appears. The faster it vibrates the more ethereal and non-physical it seems to be. Eventually it is vibrating so quickly that it leaves the frequency range, the density, of our physical senses and we cease to see it. The frequency range we can see I will call the third density or third dimension. At the moment we are tuned to this frequency, the range of our physical senses, and so we can see it and touch it. When we die we leave this frequency range and our physical body and we continue our eternal journey elsewhere on another density or dimension. Our consciousness, the thinking, feeling us, is eternal. In the end all frequencies and all expressions of life are the same energy. We are each other. This is the law of one that the Illuminati Temple of the Sun has sought for thousands of years to suppress. Some extraterrestrial and other dimensional beings know how to change their frequency so they can move between densities, appearing and disappearing as they move frequency, much like a radio dial. This is why people have reported seeing entities disappear before their eyes. They have not, in fact, disappeared at all. They have left the frequency range that person can access. It's the same with UFOs. We are not alone. The three main physical forms from constellations, planets, and stars like Orion, Sirius, the Pleiades, Mars, and the others I have mentioned, appear to have been the white race or the blue-eyed blondes, a reptilian race of various expressions, and the so-called greys of modern UFO folklore, see picture section. Also there was the advanced black race and another, which, according to those who claim to have been abducted by non-human entities, has an insect-like form. In UFO research these have become known as insectoids. I can understand how difficult this will be to accept and comprehend from the conditioned view of reality. But first of all I am not asking anyone to accept anything that I say, it's just information, make of it what you will, and, second, the world is nothing like our conditioned view of reality. I would also stress that, like all of my books and talks, this text is presented in layers, each one adding to the ones before. So the detailed information, to support the existence of the reptilians, greys, and nordics, and their interbreeding, will be revealed as the story unfolds. Understanding the connection between the nordics, the reptilians, and the greys is to understand so much about the world today. W.T. Samsel, author of The Atlantean Connection, writes, During the first half of the Lemurian age, the involvement of extraterrestrial beings was simply in the role of the observers. That is to say, that they did not intervene, interject or become involved with the subjects of their study at that point in time. The development and progression of the human race on Earth was under the observation and study of these relations from the stars. In the Atlantis connection I refer to this as the Titan Project. The three main extraterrestrial groups, which comprised the Titan Project, were those from Sirius, the Pleiades and Orion, although there were indeed other extraterrestrial races, which also shared involvement. This is where the reptilian variety comes into play. As where Syrians, Pleiadians and those from Orion, did interact in cooperation with each other under the mutually agreed upon conditions of the program, I would have to classify the reptilians as a renegade or rebel element which did not adhere to the rules or doctrines of the Titan research project as set down by the three main project participants. These two races, the blue-eyed blondes and the reptilians, would seem to have been at war in many parts of the galaxy with factions on both sides also joining together to create alliances for their mutual benefit. This reptilian race is the dominating force behind the Illuminati, at one level anyway, but with considerable involvement from the greys and some elements of the extraterrestrial white race or Nordics as they are known in UFO research circles. The rest of the global population are pawns in their battles and alliances. The reptilians and Nordics interbred with each other to create hybrid bloodlines. There was also reptilian interbreeding with other races around the world, but the Nordic connection would appear to be the most important to them. Star this fusion implanted a reptilian genetic code into the DNA and these are the bloodlines that have ruled the world for thousands of years and are still in the positions of power to this day, as we shall see. Bloodlines that were once Egyptian pharaohs and European royalty are now presidents of the United States and leading bankers and media owners. 
A fundamental theme running from the golden age of Atlantis and Lemuria Mu to the present day is that of the snake or serpent. Both civilizations were known in legends as the Dragonlands and the Motherlands. The Greeks called Atlantis Hespera, a name for Venus, and they said it was guarded by a dragon. Native American records call Atlantis Itzamana, which means dragon land or the old red land. The Algonquins used the name Pan for the Atlantean continent, a name also given to the goat god of the Greeks. Pan was originally a dragon or goat god of the Atlanteans, some records of the early Egyptians and Greeks suggest. The very name, Mu, pronounced Mu, is close to the Polynesian name for dragon. An Indian Tamil text, Salapadikaran, describes a lost continent in the Pacific and Indian Ocean it calls Kumari Nadu or Kumari Kandam, which means the dragon land of the immortal serpents. You cannot be serious. These technologically advanced extraterrestrial and other dimensional beings created mystery schools and a secret society network in Atlantis and Lemuria to pass on levels of their knowledge to chosen initiates. Legends claim that a race came to the Earth from Sirius, the dog star and brightest in the sky, which is some 8.7 light years from here. The term dog star comes from its position in the constellation of Canis Major, and it is also known as Orion's dog. The legends and accounts say that the beings from Sirius brought an infusion of highly advanced knowledge to Atlantis and Lemuria Mu and founded the Atlantean Mystery School. According to Robert Temple in the Sirius Mystery, Destiny Books Vermont, USA, 1998, the Dogon tribe in Mali, Africa, claim that beings from Sirius visited their ancestors and gave them knowledge of the universe. He says that they describe the Syrians as amphibious and serpent-featured, a recurring theme as you will see. Temple suggests that the Anunnaki of the Sumerian tablets could be these beings from Sirius. He further proposes that the body of the Sphinx is that of a dog and not a lion, thus symbolizing the dog star, Sirius, and some researchers also suggest that the face of the Sphinx is that of a woman, not a pharaoh. The Egyptians certainly depicted their lion bodies very differently to that of the Sphinx, and the dog is a common symbol in ancient mythology. In fact, ancient Egyptians revered the dog and their dog symbol was a code for Sirius. The Sirius system was symbolized as feminine, and so a dog's body with a woman's face would make sense, although there is still a case for it to be a lion, also. Sirius is connected with the color red, because it looks red, when it appears over the horizon. Red is the color used for Sirius in ritual and symbolism. For a long period of its existence, the Sphinx was colored red. It was an obvious conclusion that this could relate symbolically to Mars, the red planet, but in the face of the other evidence, Sirius is perhaps more likely. The Queen's shaft in the Great Pyramid was designed to point to Sirius, according to modern researchers. Robert Temple presents a wealth of interconnecting evidence to support his belief that an amphibious race from Sirius came to the Earth in far ancient times and brought with them the knowledge that founded those advanced civilizations. The Sirius system is also depicted as a snake or serpent in a Greek representation in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Temple's research began when he heard that the Dogon people in Mali, northwest Africa, had told French researchers in 1931 some remarkable information about the Sirius system. According to these researchers, the Dogon also knew about all the planets of the solar system out to Pluto and of moons that have only recently been confirmed. They said that a star orbited Sirius and it was so heavy all the people of the world could not lift it. At the time, the star they were talking about, now called Sirius B, was not yet discovered by scientists. The Dogon are claimed to have said that it took about 50 years to orbit Sirius A and that it was infinitely tiny. We now know this is true. Sirius B is a dwarf star and fantastically heavy. The story goes that they said there was a third star, which also orbits Sirius A and takes 50 years to complete a circuit. Again this was undiscovered at the time, but its existence was confirmed by astronomers in 1995, and it is known as Sirius C. The Illuminati symbolism of three, the Trinity, appears to be related, at least in part, to these three stars of the Sirius system. The constant reference to the number 50 in ancient myth could relate to these 50-year orbits, 
Temple suggests, and they also symbolized Sirius B and C as the twins using their combined orbit periods of 100 years as a code for them, he says. Certainly there is endless reference to twin symbolism throughout the ancient world. The Dogen call Sirius B, Digitaria, and Sirius C, Sargon, or the female star. They also call it the Son of Women or Star of Women. To them, the most important star is Sirius B, which, they rightly said, was invisible to the eye. Still today their religious rituals and rites are based on the cycles of the Sirius system. The dog star, Sirius, or Sirius A, has two and a half times the mass of our own sun, and is 35 and a half times brighter. When you consider that our sun contains 99% of the mass of this solar system, Sirius is some baby. Sirius B contains 1.053 times the mass of our sun. It is incredibly compressed, however, and thus is very small. A focus on Sirius can be found at the heart of most ancient societies and secret societies. The heat in the summer months was believed to be, in part, caused by Sirius, and so they became known as dog days. The Egyptian calendar was regulated by the movement of Sirius, Sothis to the Greeks, and the Sothic calendar was founded on the rising of Sirius one minute before the sun, the so-called heliacal rising in the summer. The number 23 was important to the Dogons, as it was to the Egyptians and the Babylonians. Some researchers say this was connected to the heliacal rising on July 23rd when Sirius, the Earth, and the Sun are in a straight line. Others speculate that this could create a stargate connection between the two systems, a sort of interdimensional, interdensity, portal. This moment was the beginning of the calendar for the new year in many cultures. It is said that the eyes of the Sphinx, the dog, line up with the exact period on the horizon, where Sirius rises on July 23rd, and that the pyramids are also lined up to that point on the horizon. This, incidentally, is the time every year that the Illuminati elite gather at Bohemian Grove in Northern California wearing their hooded robes for their infamous rituals under a 40-foot stone owl, as detailed in The Biggest Secret. I will mention more about this later on. The Freemasons and other secret societies within the Illuminati web have Sirius as their focus. It is known as the Eastern Star, the very name for the Freemasonic organization that allows women to become initiates. Sirius is the first star to rise in the east in the latitudes of Egypt. The symbol of the Eastern Star is the symbol of Satanism, the inverted pentagram, and that is their symbol for Sirius, figure 2. The pentagram within a circle is used by Satanists in their rituals to draw other dimensional demonic entities into this world, or to draw down the kingdom of Satan into manifestation on earth, as one writer put it. The pentagram is symbolized by the goat head known as the goat of Mendes or Baphomet, the image the Knights Templar secret society was accused of worshipping when it was purged in France after 1307. The goat head is also associated with the Sirius system. The ancients designed massive temples to point directly at the spot on the horizon where Sirius appeared at the rising, and their key rituals were focused on Sirius, just as many of the Illuminati's are today. One example of these Sirius-aligned structures is the Temple of Isis at Dendera in Egypt. The goddess, Isis, is a symbol of Sirius in Egyptian myth. Robert Temple suggests in the Sirius mystery, that Isis is Sirius and the sister goddess of Isis, Nephthys, represents Sirius B. Isis was said to be visible and Nephthys invisible, just like Sirius A and B. Another Sirius symbol was Anubis, Anpu to the Egyptians, the one portrayed as the dog or jackal-headed god and associated with Osiris, the sun god of Egypt. There was also a goddess called Anukis who sails in a celestial boat with Sothis and Satis, again the three stars of Sirius perhaps, because they are associated with goddesses, and Sothis was the Greek term for Sirius. The symbol of the dog or wolf is often found in cults that worship the serpent or reptilians. Credo Mutwa, the Zulu shaman, says that their legends call Sirius the star of the wolf. The leader of the reptilian gods known as the Anunnaki is named in the Sumerian tablets as an later Anu. He was represented by the jackal or dog. Associated with Sirius in Egyptian belief was Orion, and, interestingly, modern UFO researchers connect the reptilians with both Sirius and Orion. Isis, Sirius, was the companion of Osiris, Orion, in Egyptian myth. Among the major Illuminati symbols to the present day are the eye, 
the triangular pyramid, the five-pointed star, the obelisk, and the dome. The Egyptian hieroglyph for Sirius was the obelisk, dome and five-pointed star. The Bozo tribe of Mali, cousins to the Dogon, call Sirius the eye star. An Egyptian hieroglyph for Sirius was a triangle, three points representing the three Sirius stars, and the triangle symbolized water in Pythagorean code. The eye was a symbol of Osiris in Egyptian myth. The bow and arrow is another symbol used by the ancients for Sirius and they knew it as the bow star. The Egyptian word meaning bowman also referred to a heavy star metal, Sirius B, and their word for heavy star metal was close to the words meaning dwarf and weight. The Sumerian account called the Epic of Gilgamesh tells of a star that is so heavy it cannot be lifted, Sirius B. This star was associated with an Uranu, the leader of the Anunnaki. The chief Egyptian god, Osiris, was also called An. In Sumerian accounts, An, the jackal dog-headed god, had a daughter, the goddess Bao, the goddess of the dog. It has been suggested that Bao is the origin of the term Bo Wow for a dog's bark. It certainly bears no resemblance to the sound a dog makes. In the Sumerian epic, Gilgamesh is given 50 companions, which could be symbolic of the 50 years it takes for Sirius B to orbit Sirius. What's for sure, the ancients perceived Sirius and Sirius B as very important to their lives. The Dogon are said to call these amphibious beings from Sirius, the Namo or masters of the water. The accounts of this extraterrestrial race are widely supported by ancient reports. The Sumerians claimed that strange beings from the sea founded their civilization. The historian, Alexander Polyhistor, born 105 BC, wrote that these beings were amphibious and were happier to go back to the sea at night. They are described as semi-demons, half-human, half-not-human, and animals endowed with reason. Other legends say that they were superhuman in their knowledge and their length of life. They were the immortals and returned to the gods in a ship, taking with them examples of the Earth's fauna. Interestingly, the Dogon call Sirius the land of the fish and the pure earth, and the day the Namo landed on our earth is known as the day of the fish. The Babylonian priest Barassus wrote that the origin of humans in Babylonian belief could be traced to the fish god Ons, who was known as Dagon to the Philistines. What they said about Ons, the Sumerians said about Enki, one of the key leaders of their reptilian Anunnaki. Enki was symbolized as closely connected with water, and it was said that he rode in a ship that could go under the water or fly in the sky. He was described as a giant who had scales like a fish or reptile. In the Babylonian legend, Ons was one of the Anadoti, the repulsive ones, who had the heads and legs of men, but the body and tail of a fish. This is the origin of the mermaid stories, no doubt. The Greek gods known as the old men of the sea were depicted as mermen. It was said that, if you fought with them, they changed shape and the legendary founders of Athens, Cecrops and his son, were said to be half-human half-serpent amphibians. The Greek god, Tython, was another half-man half-serpent figure with mythological connections to Sirius, and both Isis and Osiris were portrayed with fisher serpent tails in some effigies. Poseidon of the Greeks and Neptune of the Romans were symbols of the same theme. The Anunnaki, Anadoti, seem to be very connected to water, and their bloodlines use code names to this day that often relate to being of the water. The major bloodline families appear to locate either in very hot regions, like Texas, Arizona, Nevada, and California, or, more often, in cold damp places, where there is lots of water. The Netherlands is a major center for them, and that is one of the dampest countries in the world with much of it reclaimed from the sea. Also, the cold and damp castles and palaces of the aristocracy in Europe are their preferred habitat. The recurrence of Anu, as in the Anunnaki, Ananur Anu, their leader, is a common theme in ancient mythology. We have Anubis and Anukas, and in the ancient Sanskrit language the word Anupa means a watery country. The ancient legends and beliefs suggest that the Sirius system is very watery with dense vegetation, perfect for amphibians and the reptilian species. Chinese traditions claim that their civilization was founded by an amphibious being called Fu Shi or Fuxi in 3322 BC. One description says he had a serpent's body and a man's head, and he is said to have begun the repopulation of the world after the deluge with an incestuous interbreeding with a character called Nu Gua, who is also described as half-human, 
half serpent. Another ancient Chinese figure was Gong Gong, who was a horned monster with the body of a serpent. This sounds very much like set of the Egyptians and Ogo in the myths of the Dogon. Other amphibious entities in Chinese tradition are Emperor Yu, Yu relates to reptiles, and his father Gun, a name relating to fish, and Chinese drawings of their historical mythological characters are similar to those drawn by the Dogon. Today there are streams of reports across the world of people seeing UFOs flying in and out of seas and lakes, not least at Lake Titicaca in Peru, Bolivia, the highest navigable lake on Earth. The respected UFO researcher, Timothy Good, gives many examples of this phenomenon in his book, Unearthly Disclosure, Century, United Kingdom, 2000. He calls these craft USOs, or unidentified submergible objects, and includes the accounts of witnesses who have seen them around the world, especially in places like Lake Cote Costa Rica and the mountainous El Yunque rainforest in Puerto Rico. The Dogen described the arrival of the Namo in an arc that sounds very much like a spacecraft. Robert Temple says the Dogen indicate that the Namo landed in the region of Egypt and described the tremendous noise and vibration when the arc landed, causing a whirlwind of dust. They say of the Namo, a term they also use in the singular, he is like a flame that went out when he touched the earth. Dogen legend says the ship, or ark, landed on three legs, Temple writes. A larger craft hovered in the atmosphere. The Namo said that some of their number would be called the disruptors and one would die on the cross, the Dogen legends apparently say. Peruvian creation myths tell of a great disc that came out of the sky and landed on an island called the Island of the Sun. This is a place I have visited twice on the Bolivian side of Lake Titicaca. During the Great Deluge, the top of this island was the first piece of land to emerge as the water receded, they say. There are skeptics who seek to discredit the stories of the Dogon, the Namo, and their tales of Sirius. They say the French researchers who first published the information had simply invented everything. But Credo Mutwa, the Zulu shaman and that nation's official historian, says that his people have the same traditions. He says they call Sirius the star of the wolf and their ancient accounts say that a sea-dwelling fish people from Sirius came to the earth. They also speak of a gigantic war on Sirius in which the fish people drove out those who we now know as humans. Credo further confirms that the stories attributed to the Dogon are not the only ancient records of the Sirius system. The Zulus knew Sirius B as the pit star long before it was identified by modern technology. Credo wrote in his book, Song of the Stars, Station Hill Openings, Berrytown, New York, 1996, not only among the Zulu, but the Dogon, and many widespread African tribes, there are stories of the Namo, who resemble the king of the water people in our legend. They are said to be intelligent beings who have visited the earth several times. They are usually described as somewhat like human beings, but with skins like reptiles. I have heard them described as a cross between a little demon and a dolphin. The translations of the Sumerian tablets by Zacharia Sitchin claim that the Anunnaki came from a planet called Nibiru, which, he says, has a vast elliptical orbit that takes it way out beyond Pluto and back between Mars and Jupiter every 3,600 years. The idea of Nibiru referring to a planet has never felt right to me. A massive comet, maybe. But either way there is a fundamental connection between the reptilian Anunnaki of the Sumerian tablets and Sirius Orion. Researcher Mark Amaru Pincam says in his book, The Return of the Serpents of Wisdom, Adventures Unlimited, Illinois, USA, 1997, that the symbol of the Syrians in Atlantis was a triangle, sometimes with an eye in the middle. This pyramid with the capstone missing and or the all-seeing eye is an ancient symbol used by the Illuminati and can be found today on the dollar bill, the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States, and on a stream of logos used by Illuminati companies, figures 3, 4, and 5. You also find it on the logo of the British intelligence operation, MI5, figure 6. According to the story, the design for the Great Seal was handed to the founding father and Rosicrucian, Thomas Jefferson, by a mysterious stranger dressed in a cape with a hood that covered his face. After the end of Atlantis the survivors took this symbol to places like Egypt, and from there it continued to be used by the Illuminati Secret Society network that re-emerged after the cataclysm. 
The three-pronged trident was the symbol of the royal line of Atlantis, and this later became the three-pointed fleur de lis, a symbol of the Luminati bloodline to this day. The key Atlantean god was the fire god, Wotan who would turn up later in the Americas and Europe as Wotan and Wotan. The American organization, the Lemurian Fellowship, which researches the history of the lost continent, says that an extraterrestrial race from Venus, known as the Kumaras, were the leaders of the Lemurian civilization. The Fellowship says that the Kumaras created a mystery school to initiate chosen people into the advanced esoteric knowledge. It was structured as 13 schools, levels of initiation, they say, with each one more advanced than the one below. This is the classic structure of secret societies throughout history. Those who pass the initiation into the 13th school would then be allowed to teach the knowledge themselves as a member of the Order of the Serpents. William Bramley and the Gods of Eden. Avon Books New York, 1993, calls this the Brotherhood of the Snake. You can see snake and serpent symbolism in the logos of Luminati companies, and the logo of the leading UK communications network, British Telecom, is one example, figure 7. Lemurian kings and queens were 13th level initiates of the dragon bloodline, according to the Lemurian Fellowship. As I with the serpent cult or serpent brotherhood through the ages, the Lemurian initiated, were worshippers of the sun. But was it our sun, or was it Sirius, the brightest star in the sky? Records discovered in India by the leading author and researcher on Lemurian history, Colonel James Churchward, confirmed the sun worship. One of Lemuria's names, apparently, was the Empire of the Sun, and the sun symbols of I the Illuminati may also relate to that, and the Atlantean Temple of the Sun. Atlantis and Lemuria existed for hundreds of thousands of years and Atlantis broke up in stages over a long period before the final destruction. Both cultures expanded across the world with their priests and royal bloodlines or dragon kings, founding colonies in all parts of the globe. With them went their serpent symbolism which has survived to this day in places like China and, most certainly, within the Illuminati. It was during the Atlantean Lemurian era, that the same knowledge, stories, and symbolism were communicated all over the planet, and the royal bloodlines of the extraterrestrial races were seated everywhere. This explains how, after the cataclysm, when European races discovered the Americas Australia and other apparently unconnected regions of the world, they found the people telling the same stories and following the same basic religions as each other, figure 8. The common origin was Atlantis Lemuria. As they traveled and colonized the Americas, and what became Egypt and the Middle East, Europe, Scandinavia, and China, the Atlantean and Lemurian initiates used their advanced techniques to build pyramids and other vast structures that we would struggle to build even today. Researchers have established that these great structures were built in geometrical relationship to each other over fantastic distances in different parts of the planet. It appears to be a mystery how this could be done, but it's not. The sacred places of the ancients and the Illuminati today were invariably the vortex points on the global energy grid. This is a web of force lines, known as Lee lines or meridians, which encircle and interpenetrate the planet. I'll go into more detail about this later. When these lines cross it creates a spiraling vortex of energy, and the more lines that cross, the bigger the vortex, obviously. It was at these multi-line vortexes, like Stonehenge, that the Atlanteans and Lemurians built their temples, pyramids, and so on. The grid is geometrical, and the vortex points are in geometrical relationship to each other. Therefore, anything built on those points also have the same geometrical relationship with other structures on other points. Simple, once you have the knowledge to locate the vortexes, which the Atlanteans and Lemurians could. The famous ancient and modern sacred sites are invariably associated with the Atlanteans and Lemurians. Sedona in Arizona, famous for its massive vortexes to this day, is claimed to be an ancient colony of the Lemurians, as is Mount Shasta in Northern California. Sedona is also associated by researchers of UFO activity with a reptilian underground base, where members of the reptilian race work with their human or part human puppets in the Illuminati on the scientific and generic agenda. The base would appear to be under Boynton Canyon in Sedona. This is not far in American terms from the reservation of the Hopi tribe, which has Lemurian connections. The Atlantean Lemurian Colonies 
A branch of the Atlanteans and Lemurians who colonized the planet were called the Carians, Carian equals serpent sea people of the Atlantean fire god, the use Kara, same basic meaning, and the Tuarks, serpent people of the all-glorious fire god. The Tuarks became the Tuaraks, who settled in North Africa with their Atlantean knowledge, the use Kara became the Basques of Spain, and the Carians became known as the Phoenicians, a very important fact, as will become clear soon. James Churchward also documents the Carians in the Americas. The Tauric people of North Africa today, descendants of the Tuarks, have allowed some visitors to see their ancient cavern system in the Ahagar Mountains, where they have murals of their Atlantean ancestors holding snakes and swords with tridents on the blades. People invited into the underground temples of the Tuaregs claim to have seen green reptile monsters called Aurans, which the Tuaregs worship as the physical representations of their serpent goddess or grandmother. The Tuaregs also perform a dance in honor of the Atlantean fire god, Vulcan, or Votan. The Atlanteans and Lemurians established colonies in Egypt, then known as Camer Land of the Fire Serpent. The letter K, the sound used so often by these reptilian bloodlines apparently, was written in the form of a serpent in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Kem was the name of the deity, symbolized as a black goat and late called Pan. The goat is still a symbol of worship for the Illuminati and Satanists today under the name Baphomet. There are many surviving records that claim a lineage of Egyptian kings going back tens of thousands of years before the formation of the Egyptian civilization described by official historians. This supports the stories of an Atlantean Lemurian colony in Egypt long before the cataclysm. The colonization of Greece is also far older than officially claimed and this colony, called the Athenians, went to war with Atlanteans before the deluge. Plato wrote of this war and official historians have dismissed it because they say that Greece did not exist that long ago. They are mistaken. The classic Greece they focus upon was a later expression of that culture, not the first. The original Greece existed before the cataclysms that sank Atlantis. The Atlantean colonists of Greece worshipped a serpent goddess called Athene or Neith. The Greek historians, Jane Harrison and Robert Graves, say that this deity was symbolized as a serpent, snake, sphinx, or goddess covered in snakes. There are some people, myself among them, who believe that the face on the sphinx on the Giza plateau is a woman and not a man as officially claimed. Wherever the reptilian bloodlines have located, the worship of a serpent goddess has always been the center of their rituals under names like Athene, Bharati, Isis, Semiramis, El, Artemis, Diana, and Hecate. Other Atlantean Lemurian colonists were known as the Pelasgians, peoples of the sea, the Danans, and the female Amazons. The Pelasgians worshipped the serpent moon goddess Dana, later Diana, Artemis, and the Atlantean goat god called Pan. They first landed on the Peloponnese in Greece and settled in Arcadia, according to ancient Greek records. Arcadia has always been a sacred place to the Illuminati bloodlines and was apparently a name for Atlantis. The Danans left Atlantis to settle in Asia Minor, now Turkey, Greece, and the islands of the Aegean. They are claimed by some authors to descend from the Old Testament tribe of Dan, but so much in the Bible is symbolic rather than literal or downright untrue. The name Danans derived from their serpent moon goddess, Dana or Diana. The Danans made the headquarters of their serpent-worshipping culture on the island of Rhodes, a name that originates from a Syrian word for serpent. Rhodes was the home of the Danan Brotherhood of Initiates and magicians known as the Telchines. The Greek historian, Diodorus, said these initiates had the ability to heal, change the weather, and shape-shift into any form. Thousands of years later, one of the most important of the Illuminati secret societies, the Knights Hospitaller of St. John of Jerusalem, now the Knights of Malta, located on Rhodes, and for a while were known as the Knights of Rhodes. Ultimately, they came from the same source as the Knights Templar. The name Rhodes, which is connected to the German Rot, meaning red, as with Rothschild, Red Shield, became a code name for the bloodlines. Red equals serious? These guys don't use their locations or their names by accident. Malta, too, was an important center by 3500 BC and the home of a major mystery school. Under Malta is a vast network of tunnels and megalithic temples where secret rituals took place and still do. Malta's original name was Lado, 
named after Mother Leto, the serpent goddess. The Knights Templar Secret Society was formed in the late 11th century to protect the reptilian bloodline or Le Serpent Rouge, the Red Serpent or Serpent Blood, together with their associated order, the highly secretive Priory of Sion. The goals of the Knights Templar and the Illuminati were, and are, to place these serpent bloodlines in all positions of power worldwide and thus form a reptilian, centrally controlled, fascist state. We are now getting very close to that. The Danans also settled on Cyprus, later controlled by the Knights Templar, and in ancient times it was known as La Dan or the Isle of Dan. The name of the Isle of Man in the Irish Sea, a place so important to the Druids, has the same origin, no doubt. The Taurus Mountains in Turkey, the Balearic Islands, and Syria, Sirius, were among other Danan settlements and they traveled from Atlantis to Britain, where they became known as Tuatha de Danon, or the people of the sea. These carried the Anunnaki reptilian bloodlines. The female Amazons were another branch of the Atlanteans and Lemurians and myths say they came from a paradise called Hesperides or Hespera, a name for Atlantis. They too, followed the goddess Athene or Neith, and venerated her symbol, the double-headed axe. They founded shrines to the serpent goddess in many places, including the famous center for Diana worship at Ephesus and other locations along the Turkish coast. The Canaanites also descended from Atlantis Lemuria. Mark Ameru Pincam describes the migration of Atlanteans to Canaan in the return of the serpents of wisdom. One branch of these Atlantides were the Tyrrhenians, the people after whom the present Tyrrhenian Sea is named. The Tyrrhenians eventually split in half to become the Etruscans and the Carians or Phoenicians, a tribe which eventually migrated to Canaan, pronounced Canaan with the K sound of the serpents, a territory on the Asia Minor coast, which can be translated as the land of the fire serpent. Running for cover. As these colonies and settlements were established, the serpent bloodlines from Atlantis and Lemuria were placed into the positions of ruling royal power, just as they had been, at least in the latter stages, before those continents sank. These are the same bloodlines that run the world today. Just before each of the cataclysms, many Atlantean and Lemurian royal bloodlines and initiates fled to other parts of the world, heading mostly for high places to escape the impending flood. Atlanteans went to Britain, one of their colonies, to Europe, Scandinavia, North Africa, the mountains of Turkey and Iraq, and the Americas. All along the American continent are the ancient legends and accounts of highly advanced beings, the founders of their culture, arriving with great knowledge from the sunken land in the Atlantic. On the western seaboard of the Americas and in Asia, they talk of similar advanced gods arriving from a sunken continent in the Pacific. Polynesians claim that survivors from this lost continent traveled to India before returning to the remnants of their homeland, the Pacific Islands, and becoming the Polynesians. James Churchward says that these peoples also settled in Egypt via India. Chinese legend talks of a continent in the same area called Morigasima, which sank amid cataclysm, but its king, Peruun, escaped to mainland China and continued his bloodline there. This happened a number of times as Lemuria and Atlantis fell to cataclysmic events. I will focus from here on what happened after the stage-by-stage -stage destruction of Atlantis in the period from around 10,000 BC to 5,000 BC. When the Earth settled down after the incredible upheavals, the survivors from Atlantis and Lemuria began to recolonize the planet. And one of their key centers became known as Sumer, the cradle of civilization, in the eyes of official history. This was the restarting of civilization after the cataclysm. Sir Lawrence Gardner is the current front man of the ancient Imperial Royal Dragon Court and Order, which was originally created in Egypt about 2000 BC to support the agenda of the so-called Dragon Kings or Reptilian bloodlines. Gardner says that Sumer in the Old Irish language means dragon. He writes, it is also reckoned that the subsequent culture of the region, phonetically called Sumerian, pronounced Shumerian, was actually Sidmurian, Shemurian. In fact, the case for this is now considerable, since the early ring lords of Scythia, the Tuatha de Dan and King tribe, were actually called the Sumer. Another researcher, Franz Camp in the Netherlands, tells me that Sumer means land of the dragon in the language of the Scandinavian Vikings. The founders of Sumer were the same reptilian Anunnaki who had controlled Atlantis in its latter stages and led it to destruction. 
Their obsession with technology and control by machine, so characteristic of the final era of Atlantis, can be seen in the world today. There is a reason for that, the Anunnaki are still in control. One theme of the Atlantean and Lemurian legends is that, especially in the latter stages, there emerged a very dark force that took over the mystery schools and the seats of power and used their advanced knowledge in the most horrendous and malevolent ways. They manipulated people's minds and caused mayhem with the misuse of esoteric magic, the manipulation of energy. Massive conflicts erupted, and some accounts suggest that even the cataclysm itself could have been caused by the way they imbalanced the Earth's energy field. This was the Anunnaki at work, just as they are today. Chapter 4. Atlantis Revisited. Even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over, if you just sit there. Will Rogers. The survivors of the deluge and the upheavals re-emerged from the mountains and underground shelters and began to rebuild a shattered world. We are perhaps talking of around 7,000 years ago, when Atlantis was finally destroyed, although there are differing opinions on the precise timescale. Some ancient accounts say that the extraterrestrial gods, the Anunnaki of the Sumerian tablets, left the planet in their flying craft during the cataclysm and returned when it was over. Wherever the surviving bloodlines and descendants of the mystery school initiates of Atlantis and Lemuria resettled, advanced civilizations began to reappear. Egypt, China and the Indus Valley and India were among them, but the most significant became known as Sumer between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers in what we now call Iraq, figure 9. Lawrence Augustine Waddell, better known as L.A., is a forgotten and unacknowledged genius who lived from 1854 to 1938. He was a Scot who graduated from the University of Glasgow with the highest honors and went on to be professor of chemistry and pathology at the Calcutta Medical College in India. His highly decorated military career as a medical officer led him to travel widely across the Near and Far East and this fueled his passion to uncover the truth of ancient history. He became a fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute and produced many brilliant books and papers as he pieced together the evidence that demolished the official version of history. In the first 38 years of the last century, Waddell proved that the Sumer Egypt and Indus Valley cultures were the same empire ruled by the same leader, a fact very significant to the Christian story. But official history still says they were not connected, and this is taught in schools and universities to this day. Waddell proved that this Sumer Empire was also established in the British Isles and Ireland and introduced the same religious and cultural themes there. This was the inherited knowledge later administered by the Druids, successors in Europe to the Atlantean Lemurian Mystery School priests. These rulers of the Sumer Empire, he established, were what I am calling in this book the White Nordic Race, the Blue-Eyed Blondes. What Waddell did not realize, of course, is that these bloodlines were of extraterrestrial origin, and that their ruling bloodlines had interbred with a reptilian race to produce hybrid DNA. This is why these outwardly white bloodlines were symbolized by terms like the Dragon Kings. I know this all sounds fantastic, but stay with me, and you will see the evidence to support this apparently bizarre suggestion. South to Sumer at least many strands of this Nordic race traveled to Sumer from the far north, where we now have Scandinavia and northern Europe. These were the Norse people who came down into France to establish Normandy and became the Normans, or Norse, North, men who invaded Britain with William the Conqueror at the time of the Battle of Hastings in 1066. These regions of Scandinavia and Europe were colonies of the former Lemurian Atlantean Empire. With the cataclysms came the ice sheets and those who survived fled south to what is now France, the Netherlands, Holland, Belgium, and on down to the Mediterranean, the Middle and Near East, and India. Franz Camp is a Dutchman I met while researching this book, and we spent two days together in the south of the Netherlands swapping information. He has been investigating the reptilian story full time since he realized that his wife of more than 12 years was a reptilian hybrid. I'll explain more about this later. After their divorce, his experiences with her and his desire to understand what was going on fired his passion to unlock the secrets. When I met him, he was writing a book of his own, detailing his findings. Franz soon realized that to understand the world today, you have to research human history. You can't have one without the other. His research, 
particularly that of the Nordic peoples, led him to see that the white race of Sumer, or at least a significant part of it, had moved down from northern Europe after the upheavals. He says they came from locations called Friesland, Skansa, and Tula, which could be today's Greenland, he thinks. Certainly there is an Illuminati interest in Greenland that does not make sense when viewed simply from the perspective of a vast island covered in snow and ice. One of the key secret societies behind the German Nazis was called the Thule Society after Ultima Thule, one of the alleged origins of the master race in the far north of the world. This Aryan master race was said to be blonde-haired and blue-eyed. Franz Kamp says that the name Holland, a big region of the Netherlands, came from Halland in Scandinavia as those peoples moved south and settled new lands. He suggests that some of the leaders of these Scandinavian tribes were called Thun, which became Tunis, John, which became Iona and Ionian, Geert, which became Geertman and or Geertmen, later German, and Otto, which later became Ottoman. He says that the Illuminati Habsburg bloodline was Nordic or Viking originally, but they interbred with the reptilian race to form a genetic and political alliance. So did many others of the royal Nordic bloodlines. James Churchward, however, also documents the fundamental influence in the Sumer Babylon region of former Lemurian peoples via India. Franz Kamp came across a common theme I have found in reptilian research, they want something very badly that is contained in the Nordic and human genetic code. Interbreeding is their way to access it. The blonde-haired, blue-eyed, race and its connection to the reptilians is crucial to understanding both past and present, or, at least, what we call past and present. Sumer was founded by the reptilian Anunnaki bloodlines in league with factions of the Nordic Vikings and was thus known in the Viking language, according to Franz Kamp, as the land of the dragon. Sumer, a Celtic word for dragon, was a later version of this. I think the name Aryan is not so much a term for the white race as widely believed, but for the Nordic reptilian hybrids, the so-called master race or noble race. Whatever, I will use it in that context throughout this book. The very name Aryan comes from the word Ari, meaning noble one. The Illuminati refer to their bloodlines as royal and noble, hence nobility and aristocracy are Ari stock racy. The name Sumerian is, therefore, very appropriate. The Sumer Empire. L.A. Waddell's brilliant research really begins with the foundation of Sumer around 4000 BC. He was an expert in Sumerian and Egyptian hieroglyphics and the Sanskrit language of the Indus Valley. A rare gift indeed, and this allowed him to travel these regions, reading the ancient accounts and the stories on the temples and monuments, to show without question that Sumer Egypt and the Indus Valley were parts of one empire based on Sumer, figure 10. It should be emphasized, however, that before the cataclysm a high civilization had existed for tens of thousands of years in India, as a colony of Lemuria, and that Egypt, another Lemurian Atlantean colony, also went back long before the Sumer Empire. Sumer, too, had Lemurian Atlantean origins. Waddell's work is documented in detail in his book, Egyptian Civilization, Its Sumerian Origin and Real Chronology, available from Hidden Mysteries through the David Icke website. He discovered from the timelines and the descriptions of the leaders and their genealogy that the rulers of these three cultures were the same people under different names. It is the different names that have obscured the truth to a large extent. Historians have taken different names to mean different people. Not true. The endless gods in the various cultures also turn out to be different names for the same deities. Once you understand this, wading into the past becomes a lot less complicated. The advantage that Waddell had over conventional Egyptologists and historians, apart from an open mind, was that he could read Sumerian and could therefore decipher inscriptions in Egypt, which they could not understand. He could see that early Egyptian hieroglyphics were those used by their ruling culture in Sumer. It was only later that they evolved into an Egyptian system developed more locally. It is the latter that Egyptologists have been decoding. The earlier Sumerian hieroglyphics in Egypt flummoxed them. But not Waddell. Here is one example of how he proved his point. One of the best known kings of Sumer is called King Sargon. The Sumerians recorded that he had a son, who later became emperor, called Manus. At the same time, Waddell shows the son of the king in the Indus Valley was known as Manja, 
and in Egypt he was called Manj, abbreviated to Man, the guy known to the Greeks as Means, and to English Egyptologists as Mina. So we have the ruler's son, and later ruler, in Sumer Egypt, and the Indus Valley in the same period called variously, Manus, Manj, and Manja. The reason becomes obvious, it was the same fella. Even the title given to him was the same, or very similar in all three places. In Egypt he was known as Manj the warrior, in Sumer he was Manus the warrior, and in the Indus Valley he was called Manja the shooter. His father, Sargon the Great, is a Semitic name for the Sumerian Mesopotamian emperor, King Jin, Ghani, or Guni. He was called in the later Babylonian texts, the king of the four quarters of the world, because they knew, Babylon was also a Mesopotamian culture, that the Sumerian Empire was enormous. The Incas of South America used this term four quarters, also. In the Indian epics, Sargon's son, Manja, was called the royal eye of Gopta, and of the four ends of the earth when he became emperor. In the Indus Valley clay seal records, Sargon and Manja were means also called themselves, and their dynasty got or got, goth to the Romans, and used the titles bar or par which means pharaoh, according to Waddell. Got or got became god, a term used by the later goths. All non-Latin languages in Europe are derived from the Gothic, including English, and the ancient Swedish language is still called Suio-Gothic. The former name for Denmark was Goth land, and a derivative was Jutland. Gothic architecture, so beloved of the bloodlines and the Illuminati, comes from the same source and the horned headgear worn by the kings and leaders of European tribes and kingdoms, but these symbols, styles, and customs go much further back to Atlantis and Lemuria. The name Caddy for the ruling clan of the ancient Britons on pre-Roman coins is a dialectic form of Goti or Goth. When the Illuminati built the great Christian cathedrals of Europe, full of pagan symbolism on ancient pagan sacred sites, they used the Gothic style of architecture. The symbolism of the Eye of Goptima relate to the widely used Illuminati symbol, the all-seeing eye or eye, Horus, which you will find at the top of the pyramid on the US dollar bill, and on the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States. The same symbols used by this ancient Sumerian dynasty are still used by the Illuminati today because they are the same bloodlines and are working with the same knowledge, hidden away since ancient times within the mystery school and secret society networks. And the reptilian gods of Atlantis and Lemuria seeded these bloodlines. Waddell shows in his work, Makers of Civilization, Luzak and Company, 1929, that Sargon's Sumer-centered empire extended to the Indus Valley in the east, the British Isles in the west, encompassing much in between, and was larger than that of Alexander the Great or the Romans. The Sumer Empire included much of the world, and it is from this same knowledge and information source that all the religions have emerged, the continuation of the knowledge and bloodlines of Atlantis and Lemuria. They may interpret this base information slightly differently and emphasize different strands, but the core from which they have come is the same, the Atlantean, Lemurian, and Sumer empires and their belief system not least its focus on the worship of the sun. Where did Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and others like Zoroasterism, etc., etc., all emerge from? The Middle and Near East, the vast region ruled from Sumer at one time, and still dominated by that knowledge base and belief system in the thousands of years that followed Sumer's demise. The Sumerian story of King Sargon is a classic case. They said that his mother floated him in a basket of rushes on the river, and he was found by a member of the Sumerian royal family who brought him up as their own. The Hebrews, or rather their manipulating priests, the Levites, later stole this ancient story from the Sumerian accounts and used it in the fable of their invented character known as Moses. The Old Testament is founded on Sumerian accounts, edited and rewritten as required, to create a manufactured history and religion called Judaism. The New Testament is based on symbolic stories repeated over and over in the thousands of years before its creation and based on the Sumerian, and Golden Age, religion of sun worship. The New Testament texts, in turn, created a manufactured religion and history called Christianity. Two prison religions and two make-believe histories for the price of one book. What more do you want? Great deal. Sold by the billion. King Sargon was a major sun worshipper and these rulers of the Sumer Empire were given the title, Son of the Sun, as they were in Lemuria. 
Could this mean a son of Sirius? Or even Lemuria? To the Sumerians, like the Lemurians and Atlanteans, the sun was a symbol of God, and from this title son of the sun later came the idea of a son of God. Sumerian emperors were also often known as the One Lord. The Sumer Rule of Egypt and the Indus Valley The early official history of the Sumer satellite state called Egypt is largely based on king lists compiled by an Egyptian priest known as Manetho in the 3rd century BC for the Great Library of Alexandria. But this library was destroyed in AD 391 in the campaign to rewrite history, and only fragments of Manetho's lists have been retained in the works of classic writers. Waddell shows that Manetho's work, if indeed those writers have preserved it accurately, is fundamentally flawed and cannot be sustained in the light of the evidence. Yet so much of the early Egyptian history taught in the schools and universities is based on this very same flawed information. The span of the great Egyptian culture is broken up into distinct periods of kingdoms and ruling dynasties. King Sargon ruled Egypt from his Sumer base within the pre-dynastic period around 2700 BC. The right to rule in the Sumer Empire, again like Lemuria and Atlantis, was by bloodline, a fact fundamental to understanding how the world is controlled and who by today. The Egyptian inscriptions detailed here were discovered by Waddell to have been written in Sumerian hieroglyphics, not the much later Egyptian version with which Egyptologists are familiar. Sargon's grandfather, Ketan to conventional history, was known as Taku or Teki in the early Sumerian-style Egyptian hieroglyphs, as Tuk in the old Sumerian king lists, and as Vritaka or Dritaka in the Indian king lists. These are slightly different spellings for the same person who ruled all three. Sargon's father, Ro to Egyptologists, was known in Sumerian Egyptian hieroglyphics as Purujin, in the old Sumerian king lists he was Burujina, in Indus Valley seals as Buru or Buru, and in the Indian king lists as Puru, two dot inscriptions relating to King Sargon himself were discovered in one of the oldest tombs at Abydos in Upper Egypt, and Waddell established that the script used was early Sumerian. It was the same as the script he saw in Sumerian seals of the same Sargon period found in the Indus Valley. King Sargon, in this early Sumerian script, was known under his personal name of Jinyukus or Jinyukusi in Egypt, thus relating to his title King Jin or Guni, and the variant, Gani, in Mesopotamian inscriptions, particularly in Babylonian. The title Yukus or Yukusi in Egypt means that he was a descendant of the first Sumerian king, Yukusi of Uku, meaning Sunhawk City and also the first Aryan, hybrid, king in the Indian epics and their holy books, the Vedas, which use the solar title of Ikshwaku or Yakusi of Aku. All these kings of the Sumer Empire were given solar titles because of the obsession and emphasis on the worship of the sun and the symbolism of the sun as god. Indeed it is extremely likely that Horus or Heru, the Egyptian son of God and a mirror of the much later Jesus, came from the Sumerian word, hu or ha, meaning hawk. The hawk or sun hawk was a Sumerian symbol for the sun, as we see above in Sargon's very title. The Heru of the Pygmy people, Hulkin of the Indians, Helios of the Greeks, and Herky of the Akkadian Chaldeans of Mesopotamia, probably come from the same source and all relate to a sun god of the Horus mold. In the same way, the Mayans of Central America had a god called Hurican, and the Tibetans had the deity, Haruka, which later evolved into the Heracles and Hercules of the Greeks, a society that was founded on the Sumerian, Atlantean, knowledge and beliefs. Hercules fought a shape-shifting river god called Achilles. The word hurricane can be traced to the same storm god symbolism, as the writer and researcher, Acharya, points out in her superb work, The Christ Conspiracy, Adventures Unlimited, Kempton, Illinois, 1999. I know all this gets a bit complicated, but what I am summarizing here is just some of the fantastic wealth of evidence that can be found in great detail in Waddell's work, and elsewhere, that Sumer was the center of a vast empire that created, controlled, and instilled its belief systems into other great civilizations, which, the official historians tell us, were not connected. But it is clear that they were. More than that, they were ruled by one bloodline dynasty, the same dynasty, as I have established, that runs our world today. The expansion of this empire out of the Near and Middle East can be shown in the story of King Sargon's successor as priest king of the Sumerian Empire. This was his son, known variously as Manus, Manja, Manj, Mina, Manash or Minash, and to the Greeks as Means. 
as the latter is the most used name, that is the one I will use here. The Minan Expansion Means was the first Egyptian pharaoh of the first dynasty, which followed the so-called pre-dynastic period, between 3000 and 2000 BC. His Egyptian inscriptions, written in Sumerian, are in agreement with the accounts of his life in Sumer and the Indus Valley. He was the governor of the Indus Valley colony, where the first in line to the Sumerian throne ruled as crown prince awaiting the succession. They were known, according to surviving records, as under king companions, written as Shag Man, Shab Man, and, interestingly, Shah Man. But Means led a revolt against his father, Sargon, and took control of Egypt, declaring it independent of Sumer. As a result, Sargon disinherited him, and the succession went to his younger brother. But Means succeeded after a decade or so when his brother died, probably with Means' help. This story is told in the Indian epic chronicles and other accounts. Means ruled Sumer after the death of his brother, and this empire included another advanced culture that, again, the official historians tell us was independent of Sumer Egypt and the Indus Valley. This was the civilization on the island of Crete known as the Minan, figure 11 overleaf. The start of this advanced society is officially estimated at about 2600 BC, the same period, surprise, surprise, as that of Sumer, and it was said to have been founded by people from Asia Minor, now Turkey, which was part of the Sumer Empire of the Aryan race. Minan place names have been found all over the Mediterranean, from Sicily to the Syrian coast, including Cyprus. The Minan culture was the immediate inspiration for the classic Greek period, and the alleged founder of the Minan dynasty was King Minos, the hero of the later Greeks. But King Minos was in fact the same means, Manj, Manus, etc., the emperor of the Sumerian Empire and son of King Sargon. As Waddell says in Egyptian civilization and its Sumer origin, the identity of Minos with Means now becomes apparent, not only from the identity in their personal tradition and the equation in their names, but also in the essentials of their culture and civilization, and the Sumerian sign for the man element in Means name in the Egyptian and Indus Valley inscriptions, Manj and Manja, reads also dialectically Min. The Sumerians, Egyptians, and Minans also used identical systems for their calendars, and their concepts of astronomy were identical. The most famous story of Min in Crete is that of the son of King Minos. His son was said to be the Minotaur, the half-man, half-bull, which defended the labyrinth under the palace at Knossos according to legend. How interesting, therefore, that Naram, the son of Means, was known as the strong wild bull. His name, Naram, consisted of Nar, meaning strong or mighty in both Sumerian and Egyptian, and Am, meaning wild bull. Naram is also depicted in Egypt as a wild bull, and it could well be that it was this son of Means, the real King Minos, who inspired the symbolic legend of the Minotaur in the labyrinth at Knossos. The Minan culture was a mirror of the Sumerian and the period of Means in Egypt. The art was the same or similar, and so were the clay seals used for writing and recording events. The Sumerian Egyptian form of writing from the Means Sargon period, the funeral rites, and even the terracotta drainpipes used by the Minans were the same as those found in Sumer. Here are just some of the similarities listed by Waddell between the documented life of Means, the Egyptian pharaoh and Sumerian emperor, and King Minos of Greek and Cretan legend. Both were of the Bronze Age, replacing the Neolithic period. Both were known as sea emperors of the Mediterranean. Both were said to have introduced civilization. Both built a labyrinth. Both died on a sea voyage to the west. Both used seal impressions on clay, and both used a linear script of Sumerian type, or very similar. Both had the same physical Aryan appearance. Minos was said to be the son of Zeus, Means was descended from Zag, Zeus. Minos was a votary and priest of Zeus, Means was a votary and high priest of Zag. Minos was a giver of laws direct from Zeus, another story constantly repeated around the world, and used for the make-believe Moses, and Means established laws said to have come from Zag. The son of Minos was a bullman or minotaur. The son of Means was known as the strong wild bull. Can even the most padlocked of academic minds still go on ignoring the fact that Means was Minos? I suspect they can. In doing so they hold together the house of cards that scams people into missing a truth, as we shall explore, 
which is critical to understanding the so-called unexplainable mysteries of the past and, more importantly, to identify who has been controlling our lives over thousands of years to the present day. That truth is this, the astonishing cultures across the ancient world that suddenly emerged at the level of advancement far ahead of others of the time were not created by a series of unconnected, independent peoples who apparently developed precisely the same knowledge, artwork, building techniques, writing, funeral ceremonies, and stories, at the same time as each other. They were all aspects of the same culture and control, based on Sumer, an empire that not only extended to the Indus Valley Egypt, the Mediterranean, and the British Isles, but also across the Atlantic to the Americas, and quite probably as far as Australia and China. And the knowledge base of Sumer, and most certainly some of the identical knowledge, stories, and myths, found all over the ancient world, had their origins in the global society of the Golden Age before the upheavals, Atlantis and Lemuria. The Sumerian expansion to Europe, the Americas, and Australia. Various parts of this same Aryan Sumer Empire, and its later remnants and inspirations, were known as the Amorites, Hittites, Phoenicians, Goths, Hamites, Indo-Aryans, Nordics, Ancient Greeks, and many other names. Like I say, I think what we call Aryan are the Nordic reptilian hybrids. History records the existence of the Hittites and the Phoenicians, but as different peoples, not as different names for the same Sumerian and former Atlantean Lemurian Aryan race and empire. The Phoenicians were the Carian people from Atlantis and Lemuria and Carian means serpent sea people of the Atlantean fire god. James Churchward's research shows that the Carian people, originally from Lemuria, also settled in the Americas. Unmistakable Phoenician remains have been found in Brazil, and, according to a man I met who once worked in covert operations for the British government, similar Phoenician artifacts were discovered in the rainforests of Queensland, Australia, a few miles from where Captain Cook landed on his voyage of discovery. It was a journey of rediscovery and truth, and it was funded and organized by the Royal Society in London, a body created and controlled from the start by Freemasons. The Queensland find would help to explain why some Australian Aboriginal terms are the same as the Egyptian, although the Lemurian connection would do that also. Evidence of Phoenician activity has been identified in New England on the eastern seaboard of the United States, and unmistakable Egyptian Oriental remains were discovered in the Grand Canyon in Arizona in the first decade of the 20th century. Ancient Chinese artifacts have also been found in Mexico and California. We only know of the Grand Canyon find thanks to lengthy articles in the local paper at the time, the Arizona Gazette, because every effort has been made to suppress the knowledge, as with the discoveries in Queensland. The Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., the Smithson family is one of the bloodlines, was created for the very reason of suppressing archaeological discoveries that rewrite the manufactured history while emphasizing those that can be encompassed in the fairy tale. The accounts and symbolic religious tales were taken across the globe by the Sumerian seafarers like the Phoenicians, the bloodlines of Atlantis. They reinforced the stories and symbols that were taken to those areas thousands of years earlier by the Atlanteans and Lemurians. When the later Europeans landed in the Americas and other parts of the world with Columbus and his successors, they found to their astonishment that the native peoples were telling the same stories and myths that were told in Europe and the Middle and Near East. Their astonishment came from their belief that these cultures on different sides of the world had never met before. But they had. They were part of the global Atlantean Lemurian Empire and later the near global empire of Sumer. The leaders of the European explorers like Columbus knew the truth, however, because of their secret society background. The corresponding stories and customs on both sides of the Atlantic included the virgin birth, crucifixion, circumcision, and the Great Flood. The similarities were so striking, the Christian priests sought to keep this knowledge quiet for fear of undermining their unique religion. The key Central American deity, Quetzalcoatl, was Jesus under another name long before the Christian religion waded ashore with Columbus and Cortes. Quetzalcoatl was born to a virgin mother, fasted for 40 days, was tempted by their version of Satan, and left promising to return in a second coming. Indeed, when Cortes, the Spanish architect of native genocide, landed there in the years after Columbus, he was treated as a god because, with his European features, he was considered to be the return of Quetzalcoatl. 
Something similar happened in Africa, when the white Europeans arrived and the native people believed they were the return of the Nordic extraterrestrial beings of then legends. Cortes was obviously aware of the Quetzalcoatl story, because he landed near the point the legend said the deity would return, and he wore a plumed hat in line with Quetzalcoatl's title of the plumed serpent. Cortes even arrived in 1519, the time the native people believed that Quetzalcoatl would come back. Just one example of how easy it is to manipulate people through their beliefs. The travels of the Aryan Sumerians and their earlier Golden Age ancestors also account for the mystery of the countless legends in the Americas of the white gods who came from the sea bringing great knowledge and civilization. There was once a race of white men in Central South America who wore beards and looked like Phoenicians. The Central American culture with its incredible ancient cities and pyramids, attributed to the Maya people in the Yucatan, is one such example of this ancient interaction. The steppe pyramids of the Yucatan, which in fact, go back way before the Maya who inherited them, are so similar to the classic ziggurats built for the gods of Sumer. There are great similarities in art and language between the two, as there are between Central American religion and language, and that of the Hindus and the Middle Near Eastern Semites. The mother goddess, Maya, has the same name in the Maya culture as she does in India, and there are Mayan remains at an ancient Egyptian site I have visited not far from Giza. James Churchward shows in The Children of Mu that all these Maya peoples around the world originated in Lemuria Mu, hence the common connections. Also, the legendary founder of the Maya culture, called Wotan or Wotan, is the name of the Atlantean fire god, and also the god of the Teutonic peoples of Germany and Scandinavia. He was one of the gods of the Nazis and they were created by the Teutonic Knights Network, Illuminati, in Germany. The Teutonic Knights were formed in the same period and operated in the same Holy Land region as the Knights Templar and the Knights of Malta and they work to the same basic agenda right to this day. That part of the Sumerian Empire known as the Phoenicians, with their base in the Middle East, and what we now call Turkey, particularly Cappadocia, were very much involved in establishing Sumerian control of the British Isles. Under other names these peoples were known as the Hittites and the Goths. Once again L.A. Waddell has established that the Phoenicians were not a Semitic race as claimed by official historians, but another name for the Aryan race based on Sumer in the post-Atlantis period. Examinations of Phoenician tombs have revealed that they were of the long-headed Aryan type, as are depictions of the pharaohs and royal families in Egypt. This is also why the Egyptians and other cultures portrayed many of their gods, like Osiris, with white skin and blue eyes, that's what the ruling race looked like. The twist was that their royal and noble bloodlines had interbred with the reptilian Anunnaki. The very name, Iran, another part of the Sumer Empire, comes from the word Ariana or Aran, which means land of the Aryas or Aryans. There is still a race of white, often blue-eyed, people in Kurdistan. The Sumerian Phoenicians arrive in Britain and Ireland. The Phoenicians, Sumerian Empire, had landed in the British Isles by at least 3000 BC, figure 12 overleaf. This corresponds with the period when, it is claimed, the great stone circles like Stonehenge and Avebury were built with the same astonishing precision that you find with the Giza pyramids and other breathtaking structures across the Sumerian and former Atlantean Lemurian Empire. Whoever designed Stonehenge must have had a very advanced knowledge of mathematics and astronomy. Geoffrey of Monmouth, the 12th century historian, wrote in Histories of the Kings of Britain that the builders of the original Stonehenge were giants from North Africa. The Aryans of Sumer and Egypt were a tall people because they came from the very tall Nordics and the reptilians, which are almost always described as very tall. This fits with the emerging themes of this book, and certainly the official version of Stonehenge is utterly ludicrous. As John A. Keel points out in Our Haunted Planet, Fawcett Publications, USA, 1971. We are also asked to believe that they pushed and hauled these monstrous stones for 240 miles up and down hills, across rivers, through forests and soupy bogs on sledges and wooden rollers. Plainly the whole thing is quite absurd. And, of course, Stonehenge is just one of hundreds of stone circles and standing stones erected in Britain in the same period. We do have to be careful here as dates are increasingly, and often dramatically, reassessed. The Sumerians were heading back to where the pre-cataclysmic Atlanteans once had a major colony, 
and some of these famous structures of the British Isles and elsewhere may have already been in place long before they returned. Either of these explanations, the Atlantean builders or the Sumerian Empire, would account for where the knowledge came from to align them so exactly to the cycles of the sun, moon, and star systems, as well as in relationship to each other, via the geometrical energy grid. Waddell explains in his book, The Phoenician Origins of Britons, Scots and Anglo-Saxons, Christian Book Club California, 1924, how he found Sumerian markings on one of the stones at Stonehenge and on other stones around the British Isles, including some in Scotland. Professor Alexander Thorne, Emeritus Professor of Engineering Science at Oxford University from 1945 to 1961, discovered that the builders of Stonehenge knew of Pythagorean geometric and mathematical principles thousands of years before Pythagoras was born. The same was true of those who built the Giza pyramids. Now we can see why. The Greek genius Pythagoras, which means I am the python or I am the serpent, and all the famous Greek mathematicians, philosophers, scientists, doctors, and so on, inherited their knowledge through the highly secretive mystery schools from the Sumerians, Minans, and Egyptians, who were all the same peoples in reality. And they, in turn, inherited from Atlantis and Lemuria. History becomes much simpler once this sequence is understood. The Sumerian elite and their Golden Age ancestors also had the knowledge of how to throw a magnetic field around an object and disconnect it from the laws of gravity. They could make it weightless. Such a skill makes it so much easier to move and place vast stones for these mystery structures like Stonehenge and the pyramids. The Serpent Grid I cannot stress enough the importance to these ancient peoples of the global energy grid, and especially the major vortex points where many of the energy lines cross. This energy was often symbolized as a serpent. The more esoteric researchers who acknowledge the vast symbolism and references to serpent bloodlines, serpent knowledge, and serpent people, say these were merely codes relating to this earth energy grid, known as dragon lines or lee lines, hence so many British place names end in lee. The association of serpent symbolism with this universal energy and its most powerful centers is clear to see. But, at the same time, the evidence that there is a controlling force taking a reptilian form is so overwhelming that there is no way that the constant references to serpent or dragon bloodlines can be dismissed as simply code for this energy or knowledge of the grid. And what a coincidence that we have all the legends and accounts of a serpent race bringing and teaching knowledge about this grid, and the energy of that very grid becomes associated with the serpent. No connection? As I said earlier, these Lee lines connect to form a web or grid of magnetic energy, the universal life force, which flows along these lines that surround and interpenetrate the planet. The human body has a similar system, and the ancient Chinese healing art known as acupuncture works with the Lee lines, dragon lines, or meridians of the physical body. That's why they insert hair like needles. They are balancing the flow of energy. The ancients, including the Atlanteans, Lemurians, and the peoples of the Sumer Empire, used standing stones like acupuncture needles for the earth. They declared these major vortex centers to be sacred, and these are the locations of the standing stone circles, pyramids and ancient earthworks all over the world, figure 13. Also, the correlation between these sites and faults in the earth's magnetic field are obvious, and studies have shown that paranormal events and experiences, including UFO sightings, tend to happen mostly at or near these magnetic faults in her book, Where Science and Magic Meet, Element Books, Shaftesbury, England, 1991. Serena Roney Dougal points out that of the 286 stone circles in Britain, 235 are built on rocks more than 250 million years old, the statistical chances of which are more than a million to one. Robert Graves, the poet and writer on mythology and mysticism, said. There are some sacred places made so by the radiation created by magnetic ores. My village, for example, is a kind of natural amphitheater enclosed by mountains containing iron ore, which makes a magnetic field. Most holy places in the world holy not by some accident, like a hero dying or being born, there are of this sort. Delphi was a heavily charged holy place. Delphi in Greece, was the center for the oracle, a psychic woman or channel, who connected her consciousness with other dimensional entities, and spoke their words. 
They knew that the sites of magnetic faults act as doorways to these other dimensions or densities, and allow both interdimensional communication and travel to happen more easily. Satanists use these same locations around the world in their rituals, designed to manifest other dimensional demonic entities. The Roman Church insisted that its churches and cathedrals be built on former pagan sites, because these were the interdimensional doorways, gateways, or portals. Again, this is why Satanists seek to use Christian churches for their rituals, they want to access the energy in the vortexes on which the churches were placed. Freemasonic and other secret society temples are located on these points. The ancient Atlantean Lemurian Sumerian knowledge has been passed on through this covert network while being systematically suppressed among the people. Religion has condemned it as evil, and science has dismissed it as nonsense and the source of both religion and science is the same Illuminati network. Surprised? It is claimed by historians that British Druids built the stone circles, but they confuse using them with building them. Groups use them today for rituals, but no one is suggesting that these groups built them. Archaeologists find Druidic remains on these sites and assume they created them. They do the same with the later Mayans of Central America and the Incas of South America. The later Druidic religion and knowledge was brought by the Atlanteans originally, and reinforced by the Sumerians with their great understanding of astronomy, astrology, sacred geometry, mathematics, and the Leline system or energy grid. Both sources also knew of the cycle called precession in which the Earth's wobble slowly moves the planet on its axis, so it faces different star systems or astrological houses over thousands of years. It takes 2,160 years to cross one symbolic house and 25,920 years to complete the cycle of 12. We are, some believe, completing one of these great cycles now, and they are always periods of enormous change, it is said. Once again these ancient Sumerians, Atlanteans, and Lemurians, under various names, built their temples and sacred buildings in relation to, or in acknowledgement of, their knowledge of precession. Suppressing the grid. I have a rather controversial view, makes a change, of at least some pyramids, stone circles, and earthworks placed on the vortexes. From the start of my conscious journey in 1990, I have had a bad feeling about many of these constructions. New Agers see them as sacred places, and go to the stone circles, and pyramids for their ceremonies and so on. But just because the vortex points are power centers on the global grid, it doesn't mean, that the structures built at these places by the bloodlines have been designed and located with humanity's best interests at heart. I am not talking about all of them here, but I don't feel good myself about the Giza site or Stonehenge, among others. These locations are incredible centers of energy, and yet when we go there we feel a fraction of their true power, because the structures built on them are often suppressing that power. My own feeling is that they were part of a network designed to close down the true potential of the grid and disconnect the human energy field from the cosmic one. Every planet and star has an energy grid, and these connect with each other in a vast cosmic web. We in turn connect with this network through our human energy grid, the meridian system on which acupuncture is based. If you can disconnect the human energy field from the planetary, and cosmic grid you put people in a disconnected vibrational prison. Still today, the Illuminati place structures like nuclear power stations and motorway, freeway, intersections on the vortex points for the same reason. A busy road has been built through the center of the massive Avebury Stone Circle, Vortex, in Wiltshire, England. It is like throwing a spanner into an electrical system. It throws it into chaos. I'm not saying, that these places are negative in themselves. They are just energy. I am talking of the structures built upon them to manipulate the flow of that energy. I think people miss the point that you can program stones with their quartz crystal content and obelisks etc. to do a positive or negative job for you in these places. I think that many have been put there to disrupt and suppress. Just my view. The Illuminati keep their most powerful vortex points clean and secret, known only to themselves. Among the ancient landscape features still visible today in the west of England are the white horses scored from the chalk hillsides. The oldest, according to conventional archaeology, is the one at Uffington in the Vale of the White Horse in Wiltshire, not far from Avebury Circle. 
This has been dated to 3000 BC, the time when the Sumerian Phoenicians were introducing, or reintroducing, their culture, religion, and knowledge to Britain. Why White Horses? The basic religion of the Sumerian Phoenicians was the worship of the sun, and the white horse was one of their symbols for the sun. This white horse symbolism is also the source of the references to stories about white horses in relation to the Christian Jesus and Hindu Krishna. Jesus and Krishna are symbols for the sun with their origin in the Sumerian sun religion and its stories and symbols. Neither really existed. There are also people who believe that the Offington white horse is really a dragon, and, if that is so, it fits with the previous name for the Phoenicians, the Carrions or Serpent Sea people of the Atlantean fire god. The tin mines of Cornwall in the far west of England were first created by the Sumerian Empire, and this was known to them in their writings as the Tin Land Country. A Phoenician deity, later encompassed into Christianity, was Saint Michael, and so you have Saint Michael's Mount just off the Cornish coast near Penzance. The tin ships operated from here, and there are many other references to Saint Michael in that region. Other Phoenician Sumerian deities were Saint George of Cappadocia in Turkey, who defeated the dragon and became the patron saint of England, Barret, a male deity, who became Britain, and Barati, the female, who became the British heroine, Britannia, when these deities were brought to these islands by the Sumerian Empire, figure 14. According to Sir Lawrence Gardner, the spokesman of the ancient imperial court of the royal dragon and order, Barret Anna, great mother of the Firestone, symbolized the wife of Anu, the chief of the Sumerian reptilian gods called the Anunnaki. Names very similar to Barrett and Bharati can be found in the Indian holy books, the Vedas, because these accounts were inspired by the same Sumerian, Aryan, and Atlantean Lemurian sources. The later Romans, another empire based on the Sumerian Atlantean knowledge and bloodlines, knew Bharati as fortune, a reference to Bharati's legend as the goddess of fortune. They symbolized and described her in the same way the Phoenicians did with Bharati, and the British do with Britannia. The Egyptians had a goddess called Brith, goddess of the waters, another version of Bharati, and the Minans, Sumerian Egyptians, on Crete knew her as Brito Martis, who, in turn, is associated with the goddess Diana or Artemis, other versions of the same theme. All this information is one solution to the mystery of why all the major symbols of the British Isles came from the Middle and Near East. For instance, the flags of England, Cross of St. George Scotland, Cross of St. Andrew Ireland, Cross of St. Patrick, as well as the ensigns of Scandinavia, were all carried as standards of victory by the Phoenicians. The evidence of the Aryan-Sumerian connection to Ireland emphasizes the point. According to Arbois de Juvainville, the author of the work, Cowers de Literature Celtique, the Irish were known as Egyptians in the Middle Ages. Saint Patrick, of whom no literal evidence has been found, is claimed by some to be an Irish name for the Egyptian deity, Ptah, who was introduced to Ireland by Egyptian members of the Sumerian Empire. It is said of Saint Patrick that he removed all the snakes from Ireland. Here are just some of the connections between North Africa and the Emerald Isle, Ireland. The distinctive round towers in Ireland are of Phoenician origin and the Irish harp and Scottish bagpipes came from North Africa, as did the name of the classic Irish symbol, the shamrock. Any three-leaf plant in Egypt is known as a shamrock. The rosary beads, such a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church, created by the Sumerian-inspired Romans and based on sun worship, are from the Middle East and still used by the Egyptians. The word nun is Egyptian and their garb is Middle Eastern. The old Irish sailing craft called a pukin was designed in North Africa, where it was used on the River Nile. Old Irish books employ the same styles as those found in Egypt, and even the colors used in the Irish Book of Kells and Book of Duro are from Middle Eastern insects and plants. The famous ancient mound at Newgrange, north of Dublin, has a narrow passageway of some 62 feet that perfectly aligns with the sun as it rises on the winter solstice. It is so precise that at the solstice sunrise, its golden light shines directly through this narrow passage to illuminate the chamber deep in the center of the mound. Again the present dating of Newgrange and other ancient Irish standing stones and earthworks fits the period when the Sumerian Empire arrived and the dual spiral images found at Newgrange are identical to those found at other centers of the Sumer-Lemurian-Atlantean empires, like Malta. 
The entrances to many other great structures within that empire are the same as that at Newgrange, including the one at the Minin Palace of Minos, Means, on Crete. It becomes clear why I have noticed on my many visits to Ireland that so many of their old place names have a middle and near eastern feel about them. Indeed, as researchers have shown, the old Irish languages, like Gaelic, are remarkably similar to those found in North Africa. The reason is simple. They have the same base origin. As Waddell says in Phoenician Origins of Britons, I had recognized that the various ancient scripts found at or near the old settlements of the Phoenicians, and those known as Syrian, Charisan, Aramaic, or Syrian, Lycian, Lydian, Corinthian, Ionian, Cretan or Minon, Pelasgian, Phrygian, Cappadocian, Cilician, Theban, Libyan, Celto-Iberian, Gothic runes, etc., were all really local variations of the standard Aryan hitto sumerian writing of the Aryan Phoenician mariners, those ancient pioneer spreaders of the Hittite civilization along the shores of the Mediterranean and out beyond the pillars of Hercules between Spain and North Africa to the British Isles. In truth, this was the Nordic race and the Nordic reptilian Aryans returning to the lands from which many of their ancestors came after the Atlantean cataclysms. The evidence presented in this chapter, and this is a fraction of what exists even after thousands of years of suppression, supports Waddell's conclusion that means, Manus, Mange, the son of Sargon, ruler of the Sumerian Empire, and also known as King Minos to the Greeks, actually died in Ireland. This story sums up how ludicrous official history can be, and how one mistranslation can make a complete pig's ear of what really happened. According to the accepted story, Means died after a reign of some 60 years, when he was killed by a keb beast that came from the waters of the Nile. This keb beast has been translated as hippopotamus. But, as Waddell points out, the word keb in Egyptian also means wasp or hornet. Pictographs relaying this story portray an insect that looks remarkably like a wasp or hornet and very unlike a friggin' hippo, unless in those days hippos had wings and looked like flying insects. Accounts of Mean's death found in his tomb, in truth his memorial or cenotaph, at Abydos in Egypt, can therefore be translated as follows, another of his names, Manash or Minash, is used here, the King Manash, Minash, the pharaoh of Mushsur, Egypt, the land of the two crowns, the perished dead one in the west, of the, sun hawk race, Aha Manash, or Minash, of the lower, or sunrise or eastern, and of the sunset, or upper or western, waters and of their lands and oceans, the ruler, the king of Mushroom, the two Egypts, lands, the son of the great Shagana, or Shagunu, of the, sun hawk race, the pharaoh, the deceased, the commander-in-chief of ships. The commander-in-chief of ships, Minash, made the complete course to the end of the sunset land, going in ships. He completed the inspection of the western lands, he built, there, a holding, or possession, in Urani land. At the lake of the peak, fate pierced, him, by a hornet, or wasp, the king of the two crowns, Manchu. This board tablet set up of hanging wood is dedicated, to his memory. No one had previously connected the location of Mean's death to Ireland, not least because that country is not famous for the hippopotamus. As the account at Abydos reveals, Means died while inspecting the end of the sunset land. This was in the west, therefore, of the Egyptian Sumerian Empire at that time. Waddell suggests that this location was beyond the Sumerian tin lands, Cornwall, and can be identified as Ireland. He says that the name Urani is the original form of the word, Aaron, the old name for Ireland. Representations of Ireland as the end of the sunset land have been found at Irish sites, including so-called cup-marked inscriptions on stones at Newgrange, which are virtual replicas of those found in early Sumerian and Hittite seals. Waddell confirmed his theory when he found Sumerian inscriptions on prehistoric stones at a gravesite at Knock Many, Hill of the Many, near Clower on the southern border of County Tyrone. He found them to be virtually identical to those on the tomb of Means at Abydos. One of the stones even had the same monogram of the name Urani and a pictograph of the cause of death the hornet. Knock many would seem to be the true grave of Means, ruler of the Sumerian Empire, which included Britain and Ireland. Unfortunately, these inscriptions were destroyed at Knock many when they were cleared of lichen, with the use of corrosive chemicals, supported by vigorous scrubbing. 
Waddell records, however, that excellent photographs of them were taken by a Mr. R. Welch in 1896, and so somewhere, I trust, they are preserved. Waddell's work is further supported by evidence that Egyptians were shipwrecked off the east coast of Britain some 2,700 years ago and settled in the area now occupied by the city of Hull. Three wooden boats found in mutt on the banks of the River Hummer in 1937 were thought to be Viking. Now they are said to date from around 700 BC, and they are identical to ones that once navigated the Nile. I can understand the confusion with the Vikings, however, because the Scandinavian Nordics traveled south to Egypt and Sumer after Atlantis, and there would be many similarities and mutual origins. The Egyptologist, Lorraine Evans, also says in her book, Kingdom of the Ark, Simon and Schuster, London, 2000, that the ancient Egyptians established a colony in Ireland 3,500 years ago, after landing in County Kerry. She suggests that the invaders were led by Princess Skoda, the daughter of a pharaoh, and that she is buried in a valley called Skoda's Glen, about five miles from Tralee in County Kerry, where she died after a bloody war with indigenous Irish people. The grave is marked with a slab, but has never been excavated. Evans says that Skoda's descendants went on to become the High Kings of Ireland at Tara in County Meath, and then invaded Scotland or Skoda land. Evans says that she used old texts and archaeological, linguistic and DNA evidence to show that Irish and British people descended from Egyptians. She says that Skoda's real name was Meriditan, and that she was the daughter of the pharaoh, Akhenaten, and a half-sister to Tutankhamun. The Hill of Terra, not far from Newgrange, was the seat of the Irish King of Kings, equivalent of the British Pendragon, and it is worth emphasizing that the elite bloodlines of Ireland and Scotland are extremely important to the Illuminati. Bronze Age shields found on the Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry were identical to those discovered in Spain, which were identified as ancient Egyptian weaponry. Other archaeologists and Egyptologists have dismissed Evans' claims, but she says that her findings in Hull and elsewhere will revolutionize views about our ancestors. The simple fact that many peoples of Britain are going about their daily business unaware of their Egyptian heritage is astounding. But not quite so astounding when you realize that those in control don't want people to know that because it rewrites their official version of history. There are many key points in this chapter that are vital to understanding both the background to religion and the nature and source of the manipulation of the world today. Many thousands of years ago, there was a global society of great advancement that was brought to an end by a series of immense global catastrophes, and the world went back to the drawing board. After the planet began to recover, and up to the period of around 2000 BC, when the Sumer Empire began to dismantle, another near-global society was developed. It was controlled from Sumer and created from the advanced knowledge held by its ruling elite. This society was built on the same basic foundations of religion, knowledge, and culture that had prevailed in the pre-cataclysmic Atlantis Lemuria, although it did not advance to the same levels. The foundation religion of the Sumer Empire, and therefore all of its vast lands and peoples, was the worship of the sun, and many symbolic stories emerged to describe the cycles of the sun, moon, stars, and seasons. Another point to stress in the story so far is that the rulers of the Sumerian Empire were chosen by bloodline, an immensely relevant point as we shall now see. Given the origin of these bloodlines, we are about to enter a dogma-free zone in which it would be sensible to fasten your seatbelts and be aware of possible mental and emotional turbulence. Readers with closed minds and programmed beliefs, who have a fear of climbing to high altitudes, to view a much bigger picture of possibility, should venture no further. For those who will therefore be leaving us now, please make sure you take all of your baggage with you and have a safe onward journey. Chapter 5. Blood Brothers. Wisdom is knowing how little we know. Socrates. The same bloodlines have been installed in the positions of political and economic power for thousands of years, first as the royalty and nobility of the ancients, and now as the leading politicians, bankers, businessmen, and media owners of modern society. So what are these bloodlines, and where do they originate? A recurring story with these great civilizations, including Sumer, is that they began at the peak of their powers, and then gradually declined, thus indicating a vast input of knowledge at the start, which was later lost. 
the Sumerians had their own explanations, and their accounts were rediscovered thousands of years later. These are the so-called Sumerian tablets and we can now look at them in more detail. In the mid-1800s and later, tens of thousands of clay tablets were found in the former land of Sumer on the site of the Assyrian capital city of Nineveh, about 250 miles from what is today Baghdad and Iraq. An Englishman, Sir Austin Henry Laird, made this first discovery and others have followed. The astonishing accounts the tablets contain originated in Sumer, and not with the later Assyrian culture. I therefore refer to them as the Sumerian tablets. It is estimated that they were buried around 2000 BC, but they tell a story that goes back long before to Atlantis and Lemuria, or Mu. In more recent times, many books have been written translating their content. But although these accounts of Sumer and far ancient history before the Earth's upheavals demolish the official version of events, once again the same old story goes on being told to children and students by official academia. You do not have to delve into the translations for long to see that much of the biblical Old Testament is simply an edited rewrite of these Sumerian stories. The tablets talk of how King Sargon was floated on a river in a basket of rushes, as I mentioned earlier. The Bible tells this same story of Moses. The tablets describe a place called Eden, the abode of the righteous ones. The Bible speaks of Eden the garden of God. The story of Genesis is a summary of the same basic story that is told in the Sumerian tablets in far more detail. Interestingly, many of the terms translated into the English version of the Old Testament as God come from words that actually mean gods, plural, and the Sumerians said the founders of their civilization were a race of beings that came to this planet from elsewhere in the heavens bringing great knowledge and technology. As I have already indicated, the Sumerians called these beings the Anunna, and their later Semitic name was Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came, and Din.gir, the righteous ones of the blazing rockets. Anunna means sons of An, later Anu, another likely origin for sons of God is the reptilian Anunnaki interbred with the Nordics and Earth peoples. The name for Sumer in the tablets is Kai.en.gir which has been translated as the land of the Lord of the Blazing Rockets, and also the land of the Watchers. The term Watchers is often used to describe ancient gods. The Egyptian name for their gods, the Neteru, translates literally as Watchers. The Egyptians said that these Watchers came in their heavenly boats, and in ancient cultures across the world you have this constantly recurring theme of gods arriving in some kind of flying machine to found civilizations and bring knowledge and techniques that were light years ahead of what existed before. In the Indian culture they called these flying craft vimanas. There were several designs of these craft. Some were cigar-shaped, while others were described as double-decked with a dome and porthole windows. Both types are regularly described in UFO sightings today. The ancient Indian texts describe anti-gravity technology of the type used in flying saucers. So much so that when the Chinese discovered Sanskrit documents in Tibet and sent them to the University of Chandrigarh for translation, they were found to contain the knowledge to build interstellar spaceships, according to the university's drive Ruth Reina. Yet the documents are thousands of years old. Dr. Reina revealed, that these ships were known as astras, and it was claimed they could fly to any planet. Some texts talk about them flying to the moon. Details of building, flying, and operating the craft are all included. The Chinese, apparently, even used part of the contents in their space program. These were the craft used in the endlessly recorded wars of the gods. The same basic knowledge used to build anti-gravity technology can be employed to disconnect massive stones from the laws of gravity. Arab legends say that the astonishing blocks of stone at Baalbek in the Lebanon were laid together by a tribe of giants after the deluge. In the same way, British legends tell of giants coming from Africa to build Stonehenge. Was the golden age of Lemuria Atlantis before the cataclysms created by knowledge brought from the stars and or even other dimensions of existence far in advance of where the earth was at the time? This is what the ancient accounts say. These are the same accounts, which, like the Sumerian tablets, describe planets of the solar system in both number and environment in ways that were only confirmed in the 20th century. They describe how these beings, later called gods, the Anunnaki, created a culture of great advancement and technology 
that was destroyed by earth catastrophes and flood. The story of the Great Flood is told at length in the tablets. The Sumerian flood hero, Ernapishtim, was replaced by the name Noah when the much later texts of Genesis were compiled from the Sumerian records. If these Anunnaki or gods were indeed so advanced and able to fly, as all these various ancient stories either symbolize or openly confirm, it would be a further explanation for why there could have been a global society during the pre-flood golden age, and how the same building methods were used across the world by apparently unconnected peoples, how the Nazca lines in Peru were created and fantastic structures like the pyramids could have been built, while the general population was technologically primitive, how those breathtaking ancient structures could be aligned both with each other, and the cycles of the sun, moon, planets and star systems, how ancient peoples knew more about astronomy than even modern science did until recently, and in some areas, still so, how the planet was mapped so accurately thousands of years ago, as proved by the maps showing Antarctica before the ice camp, how peoples in every part of the world have the same legends, stories, and basis for their religions, and why, the further back you go, the more impressive are the temples and other structures that survive today. The Sumerian tablets suggest that the Anunnaki came to this planet hundreds of thousands of years ago. They would have been very much involved in Lemuria and Atlantis, leading up to great upheavals and the deluge. After the catastrophes, the Anunnaki returned, the tablets relate, and they supervised the rebuilding of another global empire, which we know as Sumer. But although this was fine for a while, the gods fought among themselves in the thousands of years that followed, the tablets say. This was especially the offspring of the earlier leaders, Enlil and Enki. They demanded that human nations fight for them against other peoples committed to a different Anunnaki god. Thus the Sumer Empire, although a wonder for its time, did not reach the heights of the Golden Age and eventually collapsed, breaking up into warring factions. Many of these wars are described in the stories of the Old Testament, when it seems everyone was fighting everyone else in that heart center of the Anunnaki, the Middle and Near East, from where the major religions have all emerged, including what is now Hinduism. This could also be the reason for the theme in the Old Testament of worship no other god than me. Some researchers have even presented evidence that high-tech weaponry was used in the Anunnaki conflicts, including nuclear warheads. The Sumerian and Indian accounts give support to this. It may be that the mist that poisoned the rivers and water supplies and left the Sumer region an uninhabitable wasteland for a long time was the fallout from this. It is believed that the Anunnaki eventually left the earth, but I suggest that, while some may have done so, pledging eventually to return, others stayed and have been the orchestrators of the manipulation through their bloodlines and secret societies ever since. The themes of this extraterrestrial involvement in human affairs can be found in almost every native culture. If anyone has a problem with the existence of life beyond this planet, by the way, consider this. Even according to conventional and desperately limited science, it takes a hundred years for light to travel from one side of this one Milky Way galaxy to another, and this at a speed of 186,000 miles a second. There are estimated to be at least a million galaxies in the universe, a billion planets, and a billion trillion stars. There are a hundred million planets in the visible universe with conditions very much like those on Earth, according to Dr. Melvin Calvin of the Department of Chemistry at the University of California at Berkeley. And that is only in this one density or frequency range of existence. Imagine the scale of what must exist in all the other frequency ranges beyond our physical senses. So given all this, do we really believe that life as we know it has only evolved on this one little planet in this one little solar system in one galaxy? We do. In that case I have some seafront property in the Gobi Desert you might like to buy. Very large beach, too. The Luminati Bloodlines. Through the 1990s, as I researched the way the world is controlled and manipulated today, it was clear that for some reason the ruling families and their offshoots were obsessed with interbreeding with each other. The higher you go in the hierarchy the more this genetic obsession prevails. When you follow these bloodlines back into history, you find that they have always interbred with themselves. The bloodlines of the 43 American presidents from George Washington to George W. Bush go back to European royal and aristocratic families who have famously interbred and still do to keep the gene pool pure. 
their genealogy, and that of today's key politicians, banking tycoons, business leaders, and media owners, continues back even further into the distant past through those European royal and noble, Aryan, families to the ancient kings of Sumer and its empire, not least Egypt. Hold that thought, because it is vital. Perhaps the most astonishing information in the Sumerian clay tablets are the detailed descriptions of how the Anunnaki interbred with human women to create a hybrid race, a fusion of the genes of humans of the time and the gods. Included in the term human are the white or Nordic race, which are also, originally, of extraterrestrial origin. Yet again, this is a constantly repeated theme in every part of the world and can be seen in the Old Testament narrative, taken from the Sumerian, of the sons of God, properly translated, the sons of the gods, who interbred with humanity and created a hybrid bloodline. Genesis recounts, when men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God the gods saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God the gods went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, the men of renown. The term Nephilim can be translated as those who descended or those who fell from the heavens. The American researcher, David Sialoff, emphasizes that the Nephilim or Nephilim are not the sons of the gods, Bini Ha Elohim, but the offspring of the interbreeding between the extraterrestrials the Bible calls the Elohim and the daughters of men. The Luminati bloodlines that rule the world today, therefore, are the Nephilim, the extraterrestrial human hybrids. They were also known in ancient times as the Rephaim, Emim, Zazumim, and Anakim, all very tall, or giant people in those days. The biblical Goliath was a Rephaim, and giant in Hebrew is Repha. This theme of giants is a constant one. Cave paintings found in places like Japan, South America, and the Sahara Desert depict giant people with round heads towering over human hunters. Bones of giant people between 8 and 12 feet tall have been found in mounds in Minnesota and other locations. The Delaware Indians speak of a race of giants who once lived east of the Mississippi in enormous cities, and the same descriptions of giants in ancient legends and lore can be found everywhere. Scores of giant red-haired mummies were discovered in a cave near Lovelock in Nevada, and some were seven feet tall. The Paiute Indian legends about these giants say they were cannibals. They would even dig up the Paiute dead from their graves and eat them, the accounts claim. Stories of Atlantis include tales of red-haired giants who acted like vampires, and the giant Nephilim were associated with cannibalism and blood drinking, just like the Illuminati bloodlines are today. Most accounts say that these giants were unfriendly, even hostile, to the rest of the population. Often associated with these giants are strange craft that sound very much like the flying saucers of modern UFO accounts. Genesis tells us that the sons of the gods married the daughters of men before the flood, as well as afterwards, and Numbers calls the Nephilim the sons of Anak, or descendants of the Anakim, Anunnaki. Hero Worship According to Zacharias Sitchin, who has written many books on the Sumerian tablets, the term men of renown in the Genesis passage should read, from its Sumerian origin, men of the sky vehicles. This puts rather a different complexion on the whole story and makes a great deal more sense of it. The reference to heroes of old is also relevant. The word hero comes from the Egyptian term, Heru, which, according to researcher Wallace Budge, was applied to the king as a representative of the sun god on earth. The precise meaning was a human being who was neither a god nor a demon. The term has the inference of a crossbreed race. The writer Homer, 8th to 9th century BC, wrote that the heroes were exalted above the race of common men. The poet, Pindar, 518-438 BC, a very relevant name for readers of the biggest secret, used the term, hero Heru, to describe a race between gods and men. At this moment I have the song playing in my head that goes search for the hero inside yourself. It is extremely likely that Horus or Heru, the Egyptian son of God and a mirror of the much later Jesus, came from the term Heru, which means the sun god's representative on earth, the hybrid or Aryan race. There is also the Sumerian word, Hu or Ha, meaning hawk, and the hawk or sun hawk was a Sumerian symbol for the sun. The term Nibiri or Nibiru, 
The alleged home planet of the Anunnaki according to the tablets is derived from the word found in Egypt, Nebheru, according to researcher and author, Robert Temple. He says that Nebheru is clearly described in the Sumerian, Enuma Elish, as a star and not a planet. Again could the serious sun or dog star be the true Nibiru Nibiru? Maybe, maybe not. Horus, the son of god of Egyptian myth, was strongly associated with Sirius, as in Heru September or Horus of the dog star. One depiction of Horus was as Heru Amiyu, a hawk-headed crocodile with a tail ending as a dog's head. He was also portrayed with a jackal or dog wolf head, as was an Uranu, the royal leader of the Anunnaki. Heru equals hero equals hybrid bloodline, and these heroes may be ruling the earth, at least in part, on behalf of the Sirius gods. Another definition of the term, hero, is a man sacrificed to Hera, which is again related to Heru Horus, etc. Biblical scholars and the dictatorships that control Judaism and Christianity have always avoided an explanation of that Nephilim passage in Genesis, because it is so difficult to encompass the contents into the party line. But, hey, they tell us that this is the literal word of God, and he's not going to make a cock up, is he? It's very clear. Some sort of beings, the sons of the gods, came down and produced children with earth women, and those children were therefore a hybrid race, the Nephilim. It's official. God said. Over to you, vicar. Or rabbi. Talk us through that one. Flavius Josephus, the first century writer and historian, did offer a comment on this Genesis reference to the interbreeding between gods and human women, for many angels of God accompanied with women and begat sons that proved unjust and despisers of all that was good, on account of the confidence they had in their own strength, for the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians call giants. The term angel, which simply means messenger, became associated with these non-human entities that interbred with humans. The Sumerian tablets go much further than Genesis in explaining this interbreeding. They describe how the Anunnaki systematically set out to create a slave race, later called Homo sapiens, to serve their agenda and how they began this quest, amid much trial and error, using what we call today test tube methods. This is described in the tablets, and they tell of how the sperm of Anunnaki males was used to fertilize human eggs before they were transplanted to Anunnaki females to be birthed. All this appears to have first happened hundreds of thousands of years ago, but has continued ever since on various scales. I think many of the stories mentioned in the tablets refer to events in Lemuria and Atlantis. All this makes more understandable the countless stories told today by people claiming to have been abducted by non-human entities that forced them to have sex or took their eggs. The babies that result often disappear in early pregnancy with no medical explanation. Of course, there are many abduction experiences that are simply invented or have other, more earthly, explanations, but to dismiss them all, given their number and often consistency of detail, would be just as ridiculous as believing every word of every one. The Sumerian tablets tell of how the original breeding program was headed by the chief scientist of the Anunnaki, called Enki, or Lord of the Earth, Kai equals Earth, and their expert in medicine, Ninkarsag, also known as Ninti, Lady Life, Mesopotamian depictions, portray her holding a horseshoe-shaped tool used at that time to cut the umbilical cord. Another name later given to her was Mami, from which came Mama and Mother. Mama or Ma is a term for mother can be found in various languages all over the world. Ninkarsag would later be symbolized in part by the stream of mother goddess deities, with names like Queen Semiramis, Isis, Bharati, Artemis, Diana, and the biblical Mary. These were also used to symbolize the feminine principle as goddesses of the moon or waters, which are considered feminine in balance to the masculine sun. There are often two distinct camps in these areas of research. There are those who believe that these deities were only symbolic of astronomical and esoteric principles, and those who say they were originally flesh and blood, extraterrestrial gods or goddesses. My own view is that sometimes, not always by any means, it is a combination of the two, as some changed over thousands of years from literal descriptions of Anunnaki leaders to symbolic of astronomical and esoteric themes. After many failures and some horrendous creations, Enki and Ninkarsag produced a human hybrid that the Sumerians called Alu.lu, one who has been mixed, which appears to be the biblical Adam. 
This was the splicing together of the DNA of the reptilian Anunnaki with that of the human form known as Homo erectus. Also there was the interbreeding with the Nordics to create the Aryan reptilian Nordic master race, which was designed to rule as the middle men or demigods between the Anunnaki and the people. What the Bible calls Adam, the first man, is likely to be symbolic of the Adam, a genetic stream not an individual. The biblical Eve was supposed to have been created from a rib of Adam, according to Genesis, but the word from which rib derived was the Sumerian, T, which means both rib and life. To be created from the life or life essence of the Adamic race makes rather more sense than a rib. In the same way, the dust from the ground from which the Bible claims that Adam was created really translates as that which is life from the Sumerian term, t.it. As I detail in The Biggest Secret, many investigations into human origins, using the DNA of people from different cultures, colors, and races, all point to a single source in Africa around 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. This is in line with the claims of the Sumerian tablets. Appropriately, the Sumerian name for humans was Lu, which has the root meaning of worker or servant, and also implies a domesticated animal, like a sheep. Look around you. Does that not describe the nature of human life today and for a long time past? My own research leads me to think that claims that the Anunnaki created the human form as we know it all over the world are seriously exaggerated. I think there were many examples of interbreeding between humanity and the gods of various origins and races, and not just the Anunnaki. It was more that the Anunnaki created DNA streams or bloodlines to suit their agenda, and they have continued to infuse their DNA into human bloodstreams. They rewire the DNA to close down humanity's interdimensional communication and telepathic powers. This puts us in a vibrational prison in which we can perceive only the very narrow frequency range accessed by our physical senses. The suppression of our telepathic powers is symbolized in ancient accounts all over the world as the gods dividing human peoples by giving them different languages. I will discuss this further a little later. Official history says that certain human forms died out to be followed by new ones, and thus Neanderthal man was followed by Cro-Magnon man, and then Homo sapiens or modern man. And yet I archaeologists working in the Middle East discovered evidence to show that all these physical forms existed during the same period. The missing link that would connect them and explain the sudden and dramatic changes and appearance of their physical forms has never been found because the establishment of academia would rather stay ignorant than utter the e-word extraterrestrial. The themes of the Sumerian tablets are supported by Credo Mutwa, one of only two surviving Sanyuses left in southern Africa. A Sanusi is the peak of the African shamanistic stream. Credo is 79, and the other Sanusi, his aunt, is in her 90s. He is the official historian and storyteller of the Zulu nation, and the very name Zulu means people from the stars because they believe they were seated by an extraterrestrial royal race. With no one for him to pass on his knowledge and the urgent need for everyone to know the astonishing information he has received in a lifetime of initiations, I produced two videos with him, The Reptilian Agenda, Parts 1 and 2. They last more than six hours, and still that is only a fraction of the knowledge he holds. In the videos he reveals what he once pledged in his initiations never to reveal. But he says that the situation for humanity is so perilous that it is far more important for them to know what is going on than for him to keep such vows of silence. This information went underground when the Europeans invaded Africa, and their Illuminati leaders, in Credo's words, milked the minds of the shaman, and then killed them. It was suicide to talk openly of such things, and secret networks of initiation were formed to keep it alive. Credo, who has become a close friend, tells the same story of the interbreeding between the extraterrestrial Anunnaki and humans to produce a hybrid race. He also has artifacts like the Necklace of the Mysteries, which confirm this story, see picture section. It is an extremely heavy copper necklace that actually rests on the shoulders, and it has been mentioned in records 500 years old. Credo says it goes back at least 1,000 years. The large symbols that hang from the necklace tell the story of humanity. In pride of place at the front are an extraterrestrial with a big copper willy, in come and get me mode, and an earth woman into whom the ET fits, if you follow me. This is symbolic, Credo explains, of the union between the people from the stars and humanity, 
which you find recorded in virtually every ancient culture. Significantly, he says the copper willy was once made of gold before it was stolen and replaced with copper. This mirrors the ancient Egyptian story about the golden penis of their key god, Osiris, which is symbolized by the secret societies today, especially the Freemasons, as an obelisk. The way the extraterrestrial is portrayed on the necklace, Credo says, is merely symbolic, because these gods were of a very distinct and unhuman form, reptilian, and they warned the people of instant death if they ever depicted them as they really looked. Thus the gods were portrayed symbolically. Hanging from the necklace of the mysteries is a large hand, full of symbols. Among these are the all-seeing eye, symbolizing, Credo points out, the watchers, the same as the Illuminati image on the US dollar bill. Also there is the constellation of Orion, which modern researchers have constantly connected with extraterrestrial activity on Earth, especially the reptilians, and a star of David, which is not, contrary to accepted belief, an ancient Jewish symbol at all. As some Jewish historians have stated, it is a far ancient symbol found all over the world and only became associated with the Jewish faith when the banking and Illuminati bloodline dynasty, the Rothschilds, began to use it in the 18th century. A researcher who saw the symbols on the necklace at one of my talks also saw the connections with the star, Sirius, from which, according to ancient accounts, a reptilian race came to the earth. He wrote, I noticed that the South African shaman necklace with the carved hand had a picture of Orion on it. Orion's belt points to the binary star Sirius. On the carved hand, the belt of Orion points directly to the eye in the center, suggesting a link between the eye cult and Sirius. Indeed, throughout the history of occultism, Sirius has been seen as very important, indeed it was a most sacred location throughout the ancient world. It is the star card in tarot, the silver star of Aleister Crowley's A. A. Organization Crowley was a Satanist, the star to which the Queen's shaft and the Great Pyramid points, and the star from which the Dogen of Mali say their alien visitors the Namo came from. The necklace of the mysteries includes a very clear flying saucer which, the legend says, the extraterrestrials flew from their giant mothership to land on the Earth. They say the mothership continued to orbit, and it was to there that the leaders sheltered during the upheavals. In France, cave paintings dated to between 10,000 and 30,000 years ago include oval and disc-shaped objects standing on tripod legs with ladders coming down from them. A drawing carved in a cliff at Fergania in Central Asia had a man who appeared to be wearing an airtight helmet with some mechanical device on his back. It was dated to 7000 BC. Whatever the origin and nature of flying saucers and other such craft, they have been seen and recorded for thousands of years. The Genetic Obsession The Anunnaki leader called Enki, the lord of the earth and chief scientist, was not the top man in the Anunnaki mission to this planet, the Sumerian tablets say. He was the eldest son of the Anunnaki's overall Mr. Big, and her Anu, who made only rare visits to the earth, we are told by translations. But Enki's younger half-brother Enlil was made commander of the mission because his mother was considered more genetically pure than the female with whom Anu conceived Enki. This, the accounts reveal, was to be the cause of ongoing conflicts between the half-brothers, which were to erupt in the wars within the Anunnaki that stimulated enormous conflict between their factions within humanity, as described in Old Testament texts. It is well known by researchers that, although the Illuminati agree on the overall agenda of global control, they too, are constantly at war within themselves as different groups, and families seek to be at the top of their greasy pole. This is no surprise when you consider that the Illuminati is a front for the Anunnaki, and the secret society network is their means of covertly manipulating humanity and introducing their agenda for a planetary dictatorship via a world government, world central bank, world army, and a microchipped population. All of which are getting closer by the hour. These factions within the Anunnaki, and therefore the Illuminati, are still at war with each other today. One researcher described the Illuminati to me like this, they are like a gang of bank robbers. They all agree on the job, but they argue over how the spoils will be shared out. This is the Anunnaki and their bloodlines to a T. Something happened that led the Anunnaki to withdraw from overt control and to manipulate through certain bloodlines from behind the scenes and the cover of human form. It is likely that there were so few of them 
as human numbers began to soar again after the catastrophe, that covert control became the only option, especially when their own internal strife, described in the tablets, led to a period of utter chaos. The accounts confirm many times, according to Sitchin's translations, that the commander of the mission Enlil was alarmed at the rapid expansion of human numbers, and it is even suggested that one major geological catastrophe was manufactured by the Anunnaki to dramatically reduce the population, just as the Illuminati seek to do today with war, famine, and disease. The decision by the Anunnaki to withdraw to the shadows could even have involved an outside intervention of some kind, because it is clear that there are many extraterrestrial groups with varying agendas at work who find this planet of great interest. Whatever the cause, the Anunnaki went underground, literally and symbolically, and used certain hybrid bloodlines to do their dirty work in the human arena. The divine right of kings, and presidents, and bankers. You can appreciate from the genetic reason for Enlil's elevation over Enki, that the Anunnaki are fiercely hierarchical, and that hierarchy is decided on the basis of bloodline and genetics. Exactly the same theme is followed by the human bloodlines that have held the reins of power since the days of Sumer. Throughout history the right to rule has been decided by bloodline. For thousands of years it was done openly, and today it is achieved through covert manipulation and the secret society web I call the Illuminati. As humanity interbred, the traits of the Anunnaki were diffused into the overall genetic pool. But certain bloodlines were specifically seeded by the Anunnaki royal leadership to be their front men and women who would rule humanity on their behalf and to their agenda, the accounts reveal. This is the reason for the obsessive interbreeding of the ruling families over thousands of years. The Sumerian texts call these Anunnaki royal bloodlines the Abgal, the masters of knowledge and the seven elders, and they apparently go back to ten priest kings before the deluge. Atlantis and Lemuria in other words. They were depicted with fish-like bodies, as was Enki himself under another of his names, Ones. The fish symbolizes the amphibious nature of the gods, and that is right in line with the apparently amphibious extraterrestrials from Sirius. These royal bloodlines have worked to maintain their Anunnaki genetics through interbreeding, and others have continued to be seeded for this purpose ever since, hence the stories of humans forced to have sex with, or being artificially impregnated by, non-human entities. The Sumerian records say that the crossbreed hybrids of the Anunnaki were placed into the positions of royal ruling power during the Golden Age and throughout the Sumer Empire. This happened, the tablets document, when Anu bestowed Anu ship, later called kingship, on humanity by creating the bloodlines to rule on behalf of the gods. Kingship is really kinship, bloodline. This is also the true origin and meaning of the ancient theme of the divine right of kings, the right to rule, because of your genetic history. It is not the diviner god, at all. It is the right bestowed by the gods, the Anunnaki, to rule according to their agenda. In reality, most of the battles between kings and queens of various bloodlines to rule various countries were a continuation of the internal tussle for supremacy within the Anunnaki. This applies to the Stuart and Tudor dynasties in England, for instance, the battles between bloodlines in England and Scotland, and those today within banking, business, politics, and the media. Researcher John A. Keel wrote of these themes 30 years ago, in all these legends there is another persistent theme, that the god kings mated with mortal women, impregnated them and thus started a royal lineage. Tradition claims that the blue bloods of royalty actually had blue blood in their veins in early history, perhaps as a result of this crossbreeding. Even today some royal families suffer from hemophilia and other rare blood diseases, this ownership of the planet was passed on to human heirs, and for thousands of years a few dozen families literally owned the entire planet. They intermarried and managed to keep the system going until modern times. Although the king's system degenerated slowly, it did not really collapse until 1848. But control by these bloodlines only appeared to collapse. They just moved from overt power through royal rule to covert control through politics, banking, business, and media. In Appendix I at the back of this book, you will see just some of the famous rulers and influences on the world over thousands of years who come from the same bloodline, starting with the rulers of Sumer Egypt, Babylon, and Greece. These were all part of, or the successors to, 
the Sumer Empire and based on that same knowledge, culture, and bloodline hierarchy of the gods. As we follow this bloodline through the millennia we find that all 43 presidents of the United States to George W. Bush, the royal families of England, including the House of Windsor, and those responsible for the creation and imposition of Christianity and other religions, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. Of those 43 U.S. presidents since the first in 1789, some 34 are connected genetically to Charlemagne, the most famous monarch of what we now call France, and a major figure in the Illuminati and its bloodlines. In the last weeks of the farcical year 2000 presidential election campaign, that blue blood bible of royal and aristocratic genealogy, Burke's peerage, confirmed the themes I am highlighting here. Four years earlier, when Bill Clinton faced Bob Dole, Burke's peerage said that the candidate with the most European royal genes had won every single presidential election in U.S. history. Clinton and George W. Bush have since continued that unbroken sequence. In a Reuters report of October 17, 2000, Burke's peerage confirmed that both George W. Bush and opponent Al Gore were of royal descent with Bush the bluer of the two. Purely by knowing his bloodline and watching the behind-the-scenes developments, I was able to predict three years before the 2000 election that George W. Bush would be the next president of the United States. Bush is closely related to every European monarch on and off the throne including the King of Albania, and has kinship with every member of Britain's royal family," the report said. He is a thirteenth cousin of Britain's, seriously reptilian, Queen Mother, and her daughter Queen Elizabeth, and is a thirteenth cousin once removed of the heir to the throne, Prince Charles. Bush has a direct descent from Henry III and from Henry V's sister Mary Tudor, who was also the wife of Louis XI of France. He is further descended from Charles II of England. Harold Brooks Baker publishing director of Burke's Peerage, said, It is now clear that Mr. Gore and Mr. Bush have an unusually large number of royal and noble descents. Only unusual if you don't know the story. He added, In point of fact, never in the history of the United States have two presidential candidates been as well endowed with royal alliances. Brooks Baker said there had always been a significant royalty factor in those who aspired to the White House, with Presidents George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Franklin, and Theodore Roosevelt, and Ronald Reagan, among others, all boasting blue blood links. He said that Al Gore, a cousin of former President, Richard Nixon, was a descendant of Edward I and has direct links to the Holy Roman Empire through emperors, Louis II, Charles II and Louis I. This, therefore, makes him a direct descendant of Charlemagne, the 8th century emperor. Point two four. these Charlemagne links make Gore a cousin of George W. Bush. The Merovingian bloodline. Charlemagne, in turn, takes us into the Merovingian dynasty in France, which founded the city of Paris, and to whom all the royal families of Europe are related. Other highly influential figures of their time, like the founders of the Mormon religion Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, and Brigham Young are from this Merovingian line. There have been a number of best-selling books written over recent years about the Merovingian bloodline, and the France-based Priory of Sion, a secret society through which this bloodline manipulates. These books have presented some interesting and important information, but they claim that the Merovingians are the bloodline of Jesus and the children they say he conceived with Mary Magdalene. The story goes that she fled with them to southern France after the crucifixion. But there was no Jesus and there was no Mary Magdalene, a fact that will become obvious. How do two people who did not exist conceive children who became the Merovingian line? Beats me. This is a vitally important bloodline, yes, but not because of Jesus. The Merovingians are Anunnaki hybrids. It is one of their key bloodlines. Interestingly, Mag is apparently a code for the reptilian DNA passed on through the female line, and it appears to relate to Orion from what I understand. The Dan Winter website at www.danwinter.com has a lot of background information to the reptilian human genetics. The Merovingian bloodline is a constant theme in my research of the ruling families. It goes back to the ancient middle and Near East during the Sumer Empire, and almost certainly even further to Atlantis and Lemuria. The people later known as Merovingians were involved in the Trojan War, c. 1200 BC between the Trojans and the Greeks in what we now call Turkey. 
Over time they moved out through the Caucasus Mountains in southern Russia under the name Scythians, and into Europe where they were known as the Sicambrian Franks, the source of the name France. They were named after Cambra, their tribal queen of the late 4th century, and Francio, their founder, who claimed to have been descended from Noah of the biblical Great Flood. Noah is a mythical name, but possibly based on a real character from the Atlantean period and an Anunnaki crossbreed. It should be stressed here that Noah and Abraham, had they actually existed, were not Hebrews, because there were no Hebrews in this period. The Hebrews were an offshoot of the Sumerian Egyptian cultures, as outlined by, among others, Professor Cyrus Gordon, in the common background of Greek and Hebrew civilization, W. W. Norton and Company, New York, 1965. To claim descent from Noah is used by Illuminati initiates to symbolize their genetic connection to the Anunnaki bloodline. The Sumerian version of the Noah story relates his close connection to the Anunnaki, especially Enki. The Franks called themselves the Numage, or the People of the Covenant and settled in Germania, possibly named by the Romans from a word meaning genuine ones, with their center in Cologne. Peoples of the former Sumer Empire moved into Europe over many centuries by land. As they traveled they were known by different names in different regions. Once more the changing names have obscured the fact that they were the same peoples from the former Sumer Empire and even further back to Atlantis and Lemuria. Some of the names by which these former Sumerian peoples were known are the Scythians, Saka, Saki, Saxon, Saxon, Goths, Gauls, and Sumerians. The Angles and the Saxons, who combined to form the Anglo-Saxons, once again had the same origin, the Aryan race from Sumer and its empire. This exodus into Europe included the people called the Sicambrian Franks. Interestingly these Franks also claimed to have lived in Arcadia in Greece, which is a name for Atlantis according to some researchers. The Danube, Danon, region was another area, where the Sicambrian Franks settled and this region has long been connected to the bloodlines and their interbreeding. From the time of their king, called Moravius or Merovi, who became guardian of the Franks in 488, they became known as the Merovingians. Legend says that Merovi was the offspring of a human mother and a sea creature called Quinator, who sounds very much like the reptilian Anunnaki known as Enki, E, or Ones, the fish god. Merovi, who was brought up by Chodio, the first king of the Franks, was known as the son of the sea, and this is the symbolic foundation of the Merovingian bloodline so crucial to the Illuminati. The Merovingians founded the city of Paris in the 6th century, which they named after Prince Paris, the son of King Priam of Troy. Prince Paris was one of the figures in the Trojan War story, which the Merovingians knew their bloodline had been involved in. The Merovingians were committed to the worship of Diana, one of the great goddess figures of the ancient world, who was also known as Artemis. This was the same goddess worshipped in Atlantis. The city of Troy, in Asia Minor, now Turkey, is in the same region as Ephesus, a place I have visited, which was the center of Artemis, Diana, worship. The Merovingians founded Paris on major vortex points on the Earth's energy grid and built underground chambers outside the original settlement to harness that energy in their rituals and sacrifices to the goddess Diana. That very site is still an underground chamber. It is called the Pont de l'Alma Tunnel where Princess Diana, named after the goddess, was murdered on Sunday, August 31, 1997. The goddess Diana was symbolically a moon goddess, and the name Pont de l'Alma means bridge or passage of the moon goddess. I tell the story of Diana's assassination in great detail in The Biggest Secret, where you will also see the staggering obsession that the bloodlines and their Illuminati network have with symbolism and ritual. Everything they do is symbolism and ritual, and when you study this subject, it is a very good way to identify their signature on global events. By the way, Paris and London are two of the most important global centers for the Illuminati, and both were founded by bloodlines from Troy. The connection between Britain and Troy goes way back, long before this bloodline became known as the Merovingians. It was a royal Trojan called Brutus, a relative of Helen of Troy, who sailed west to Britain after the fall of Troy and founded a city called Car Troia or New Troy in around 1103 BC. This later became known as Lugdunum, and today it is called London. 
This story was told by the 12th century chronicler, Geoffrey of Monmouth, and confirmed by the research of L.A. Waddell, as outlined in his books. Offshoots of the Merovingian line left northern France and Belgium for Scotland in the 12th century to become famous Scottish aristocratic families, some of whom were Princess Diana's ancestors. This is one reason why Scotland is so important to the Illuminati and why we have the biggest secret society in the world, called the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The House of Windsor, who were most certainly involved in the ritual murder of Diana, descend from the Merovingians. The three-pointed fleur de lis, formerly the trident of Atlantis and Lemuria, became the symbol of the Merovingian bloodline, and so you see it used profusely by British royalty, on official buildings, like a gate at the White House, and in churches, figure 15. The bee is also a Merovingian symbol, and this was associated with Artemis, see picture section, and many other goddesses, including Queen Semiramis in Babylon, who is symbolized by the Illuminati as a dove. Thus the dove is another theme of British royalty's ritual ironmongery, sorry sacred scepters. The reptilian bloodline is supposed to carry secret esoteric and magical powers, what the Nazis called the Vriller Serpent Power, and the Merovingians were known as Sorcerer Kings because of these abilities. Some of the more amazing of these powers we shall discuss later. Keep the seat belt on for that one. These guys and gals don't interbreed because they fancy each other there is a greater purpose and one on which their whole plan depends. The Windsors wanted Diana's genes for their own purposes because she carried a strong DNA connection to the Nordics, and the reptilian hybrids need to infuse their bloodlines with that from time to time, and therefore you have their obsession with blonde-haired, blue-eyed people. Once the offspring were born of Diana's union with Prince Charles, she was surplus to requirements and ritually removed. Christine Fitzgerald, her closest confidant on esoteric matters for nine years, told me that Diana called herself the Windsor's brood mare because she had realized the game. Now with Diana gone, and having fulfilled his bloodline duty, Prince Charles can be seen openly with the woman he was secretly with throughout his marriage, Camilla Parker Bowles. The Rothschild bloodline. The Merovingians were supposed to have died out, but in reality only the name disappeared, until recently, and not the bloodline. The genetics continued with the king of the Franks called Charles, more famously known as Charlemagne, to whom 34 of the 43 US presidents, and so many other key figures are related. He vastly extended the Frankish domains and ruled as emperor of the West in the Papal Empire created and controlled by the bloodlines descending from the Roman Empire. These in turn descended from the royal lines of the Sumer Empire, who descended from Atlanteans, Lemurians and the interbreeding of the Nordics with the reptilian Anunnaki. Another of the key names in Illuminati genealogy is Alexander the Great, an ancestor of Charlemagne and all the major Illuminati families today. See Appendix I. Alexander carried the strongly Nordic DNA and descended from the Viking peoples who settled the Mediterranean and the Aegean after the Atlantean cataclysms. Alexander ruled Troy at one stage and, before he died in Babylon in 323 BC at the age of 33, his army had seized control of a vast region once ruled from Sumer. This included Egypt, Mesopotamia, and into India. He founded the city of Alexandria in Egypt. He was known as the Serpent's Son and Alexandria was the city of the Serpent's Son. Once again we see the recurring theme. The legend goes that Alexander's real father was the serpent god, Ammon, and this mirrors the story of Mero V, founder of the Merovingian dynasty. Throughout history, the reptilians have perpetuated their purest bloodlines by marrying as closely as possible to their own genetics. It is vital to remember that these bloodlines do not just breed through their official partners. They have stunning numbers of children out of wedlock. These offspring are then brought up with names that are different to the major Illuminati families like Rockefeller and Rothschild. So when one of these children, called Clinton, Roosevelt, or whoever, enters a position of power, the people do not relate them to the Illuminati families because they have a different name. But, and I can't emphasize this enough, they are the same bloodline. This is how they hide the tribe, the Anunnaki genetic network. Philip Eugene de Rothschild, who now lives in America, claims to be an unofficial offspring of Philippe de Rothschild of the French Rothschilds, and worked within the Illuminati satanic network for most of his life. 
I give more detail about his background later. Philip told me that the key Nephilim bloodline is connected to a figure called Aeneas, the alleged head of the Roman Empire through his descendants, Romulus and Remus. The latter are code names for the bloodline and not real people and that may be the same with Aeneas. The names Noah and King David are also used as codes for the bloodline, but they did not exist in the way they are depicted and portrayed. The legends of Aeneas fit with the codes and themes of the Illuminati bloodlines, including his association with Troy. Aeneas is said to have been born in Troy, the city so sacred to the Merovingians and the Knights Templar. In the hymn to Aphrodite, the goddess proclaims that Aeneas, the son she has conceived by the mortal Anchises, will come to rule the Trojans, as will the generations upon generations that succeed him. The works of the Greek poet, Homer, who lived around the 9th or 8th century BC, is the main source of information about ancient Troy and the conflicts that led to its demise. The two epics the Iliad and the Odyssey are ascribed to him. Modern archaeological discoveries have confirmed the accuracy of Homer's work. In the Iliad, Aeneas recounts his birth and ancestry to his opponent Achilles on the battlefield at Troy. Aeneas says that he descends from divine and immortal stock through both his mother and his father. This connection between divine immortality and the Anunnaki under their various names constantly recurs in ancient accounts. Aeneas says that his mother is the goddess, Aphrodite, and his father is Anchises, and he can trace his lineage back to Dardanus, the son of Zeus and legendary founder of the Trojan race, Trojan race equals reptilian Nordic hybrids, the Aryans are master race. Other accounts say that Dardanus is the offspring of the union of Zeus and Electra, and his origins are in Samothrace, the sacred Aegean island dedicated to goddess worship, from where he migrates to Trode, Troy, in the period of the Great Flood. One of the outstanding characteristics with which Aeneas is endowed in the Iliad is a close relationship with the gods. The legends of Aeneas are peppered with references and codes about his genealogical relationship to the gods, and so it is no surprise that he plays such an important part in the codes and symbolism of the Illuminati bloodlines today. Philip Eugene de Rothschild told me that this Aeneas bloodline became what he called the Rothsberg dynasty, the union of the Bauer Rothschilds, same family, different name, and the Battenbergs. This is the Merovingian bloodline, and also the line of the Habsburgs, the leading family in the Holy Roman Empire for hundreds of years. This was the medieval state that embraced most of Central Europe and Italy from 962 to 1806. The Dutch researcher Franz Kamp suggests that the Habsburgs were Nordics who interbred with the reptilians in the ancient past. They were also connected to the reptilian house of Lorraine. Philip Eugene says, that this Rothsburg bloodline is known within the Illuminati as the Gens. This is a Latin word meaning race, tribe, or male line of descent and comes from the term Gignir, to beget. The late Lord Louis Mountbatten, a famous member of the British royal family, and his nephew, Prince Philip, are Battenbergs and Illuminati Satanists. This is why Lord Mountbatten became governor of the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England, an extremely important center for the Illuminati and its Satanists because of its position on the Earth energy grid. More about that in due course. It was Lord Mountbatten who arranged the marriage between Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth II, after which the royal line of the UK became known as Windsor Mountbatten. Both the Windsors and the Mountbattens are German bloodlines formerly known as the House of Saxe Coburg Gotha and the Battenbergs. They anglicized their names during the First World War against Germany for public relations reasons, but both of these families supported the Nazis, and Prince Philip was sent to a school in Germany run by the Nazi youth program, C, and the truth shall set you free and the biggest secret. Philip Eugene, the Rothschild offspring, says of this Aeneas bloodline, apparently Aeneas embodies all the various bloodlines that must trace their lineage back through Charlemagne, because in him is embodied the confluence of the lineage of both David, Jewish, and Alexander the Great, Arian. It is the modern-day representatives of these Roman gens or European monarchs that make up the ruling aristocracy of the revived Roman Empire. These royal families maintain their pedigree through endogamy, interfamilial marriages. The first prototype of the Antichrist the purest bloodline was Nimrod, founder of Babylon. The historical and seminal nexus of this last Roman Empire is Charlemagne and his descendants, people like Prince Philip Mountbatten, 
Rex Julius Alexander Battenberg, who is one of the ruling heads of the Julian Gens. The Keepers of the Secrets The Priory of Sion, an elite secret society created in the 12th century to serve the Merovingian bloodline or Le Serpent Rouge, the Serpent Blood, was very closely connected to the Knights Templar who were, incidentally, officially formed at the French city of Troyes, named by the Sicambrian Franks, Merovingians, after their former home in Troy. The Priory of Sion and the Knights Templar have had their feuds and breakups over the centuries, but, as with similar conflicts from time to time with the Knights of Malta, these were battles for supremacy within the bloodlines, not between the bloodlines and an outside force. Missing this point, I feel, has led so many researchers off the trail. They all have the same basic agenda of global control by the Anunnaki, but they each want to be top dog. The same is true with the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, two major expressions of the bloodline today. At the top level, the Priory of Sion, Knights Templar, Knights of Malta, Teutonic Knights, Rosicrucians, Freemasons, and a long, long list of others are the same organization, the all-encompassing network I call the Illuminati. This is not to be confused with a group called the Bavarian Illuminati, officially formed on May 1, a major ritual day, 1776. The Bavarian Illuminati is a strand in the web, not the web itself. Oh, any other point to emphasize, as we close this chapter is the constantly recurring theme in this story of the Caucasus Mountains in southern Russia. From the early days of my research this region has appeared again and again in relation to the bloodlines, particularly the Aryan race. Of course, the white race is known in North America as Caucasian. A Swedish contact had a long relationship with Russia's leading UFO expert, whom she later discovered had secret service connections. She said that he had spoken of the Caucasus Mountains as an interdimensional portal or gateway, through which other dimensional beings could enter this frequency range we call the physical world. This region was also a place where bloodlines from the Middle and Near East intermingled and no doubt interbred with those from the Far East and Northern Russia. Robert Temple highlights in The Serious Mystery the importance of the Colchis people at the foot of the Caucasus Mountains and relates them, with persuasive evidence, to the Greek myth of Jason and the Argonauts, a story which, as he points out, contains many symbolic codes for Sirius. In the myth, Jason steals the Golden Fleece from the king of Colchis. It is in this region that the Georgian people live their extraordinarily long lives by today's standards, and not far to the south is Mount Ararat, the place where the biblical Noah's Ark was supposed to have come symbolically to rest. The Greek historian, Herodotus, said that the people of Colchis, a dark race, were of Egyptian descent, and he was told that they were men from the army of the pharaoh, Sesostris, whom, scholars believe, was another name for Ramses II. This guy appears in the Illuminati bloodline that includes the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, Bushes, and the British royal family, etc. Et. The themes summarized here are supported by stories, legends, and accounts across the world, not only in the Sumerian tablets. Renegade insiders and former insiders of the Illuminati have also confirmed to me that humanity is indeed controlled by a tribe of interbreeding bloodlines that go back to the time of the Sumer Empire, Atlantis and Lemuria, where they were seeded by a non-human source. Chapter 6, The Unholy Alliance. Anyone who thinks they know it all is just confirming they do not. David Icke. Lemuria and Atlantis was a time of widespread extraterrestrial and interdimensional activity on the planet and many Earth races were seated in that period of hundreds of thousands of years. This was the source of the incredible and magnificent diversity of the human physical form and there are endless bloodlines among us. Not just those of the Anunnaki reptilians. From what I gather from my research and insider information, there has been a long battle in many parts of the galaxy between the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Nordics of Lyra, the Pleiades, all the Baron and elsewhere, and factions of a reptilian race based in the constellations of Draco and Orion and within the Sirius network. It is possible that at least some of the reptilians originated on the Earth and were driven out or, literally, forced underground at some point by the Nordics. This is not to say that all of these peoples are involved only that significant groups of them are. This battle on Earth is symbolized by stories such as the Phoenician St. George defeating the dragon and St. Patrick removing the snakes from Ireland. But there was also crossbreeding between the serpent race and the Nordics. 
which created the hybrid bloodlines that overwhelmingly became the ruling bloodlines of the Aryan dynasties. Brinsley Lepore Trench says in his book, The Sky People that the crossbreeding between the serpent race and the white race began on Mars before it was destroyed by cataclysm. Arizona Wilder, a victim of the Illuminati mind control projects and a conductor of their sacrificial rituals, told me that during her training she was told that the reptilians and the Nordics fought on Mars and crossbreeding took place there before they moved to Earth. She says that the reptilians have followed the Nordics around the galaxy for eons because the blood of blonde-haired, blue-eyed people is very important to them. As I said earlier, modern UFO research has suggested that three extraterrestrial groups fundamentally involved with life on this planet are the Nordics, reptilians, and greys, with an insectoid-type race also involved somewhere in this. It has been further suggested that the reptilians control the greys, who are also a reptilian form as we shall see, and that these groups have an alliance with a faction of the tall, blonde Nordics, so named because of their likeness to the Scandinavian race. Though much taller, whatever you may think about the extraterrestrial connection, one thing is for sure. The ruling bloodlines of Sumer and its empire were very tall, Aryan types, with blonde hair and blue eyes and throughout that same empire there was veneration of serpent gods. Is that really just coincidence? The Nordic Connection People all over the world and back into history have claimed to have been abducted by aliens of the Nordic and reptilian description. My great friend, Credo Mutwa, the 79-year-old Zulu shaman or Sanusi in South Africa, confirms this. When we first met back in 1998 he showed me a picture he had painted of the tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed beings that had been seen by black African tribes people throughout that continent long before the white Europeans arrived. Credo, the official historian of the Zulu nation, said that when the Europeans first came, the black Africans thought they were the return of these same white gods, which they called the Mzungu. As a result they called the European settlers by the same name. This was very much the same reaction as the Central American peoples when Quartz and his Spanish invasion party arrived in 1519 and they thought that he was the returning god, Quetzalcoatl. This was another god described as tall and white and portrayed with reptilian symbolism in his title of the plumed serpent. An American woman told me of an experience her father had in the early 1970s that strongly related to an extraterrestrial or other dimensional white race. They lived in Turkey at the time where he worked at a listening post for American military intelligence. He came home one night in a terrible state. When asked what was wrong, he just mumbled, the world is not like we think it is. Although he rarely drank, he asked for a scotch, and then another. As he relaxed, he told his daughter of a communication he had taken that day from the pilot of a plane that was stationed at the Turkish base. The pilot reported that he was flying near the North Pole when suddenly his engine stopped and all the electrical systems switched off. The plane then gently lowered itself vertically to the ground and to his disbelief a mountaintop opened up and the plane came to rest inside. What he saw was a scene straight from James Bond. He got out of the plane wondering what the hell was going on and he was met by tall, blonde-haired, people with pearl-colored skin and bluish-purple eyes that appeared to be electrically charged somehow, like laser eyes. The beings in the mountain all wore long white gowns with a Maltese cross medallion on a chain, the symbol of the Knights of Malta and widely seen in the symbolism of British royalty. It is also a symbol from Lemuria Mu, according to James Churchward, and I have heard beings of this description associated with Lemuria. The founder of the Mormons, Joseph Smith, a high-degree Freemason and Merovingian bloodline, said he had a vision on September 21, 1821 in which he saw a messenger sent from God dressed in a long white robe of the most exquisite whiteness. From this vision came the Mormon Church, and a stream of religions have been founded on stories, real or otherwise, of similar experiences. Mohammed in Islam is just one example. John Akil also highlighted the blue-blonde theme in our haunted planet. According to the traditions of many isolated peoples, the first great emperors in Asia were god-kings who came down from the sky, displayed amazing superhuman abilities, and took over. There was a veritable worldwide epidemic of these god-kings between 5000 and 1000 BC. The myths and legends of Greece, India, and South America describe their rule. They were taller and more imposing than the men of the time, with long blonde hair, marble-like white skin, and remarkable powers which enabled them to perform miracles. The ancients said they had marble-like white skin and a modern pilot describes these beings as having pearl-like skin. The pilot's memory was hazy about what happened after he first met all blue eyes in the James Bond mountain. But he remembered walking into a room and seeing a group of these beings sitting around a conference table. Eventually, he was taken back to his plane and as it rose from the mountain his engines and electronics were started. There are many modern reports of such beings living within mountains, including Mount Shasta in California, where it is said that Lemurians fled before the cataclysms. Now look at how the ancient Book of Enoch describes the Watchers, 
and there appeared to me two men, very tall, such as I have never seen on earth, and their faces shone like the sun, and their eyes were like burning lamps, their hands were brighter than snow. Some ancient gods were also called the Shining Ones, a theme of modern extraterrestrial research, and the reports of abductees, is that the Pleiades star system, the so-called Seven Sisters, is peopled by a blonde, blue-eyed race and once again a reverence for the Pleiades can be found throughout the Sumer Empire and beyond. The Pleiades, in fact, is a grouping of some 200 stars and not just the seven with which it is associated. Some suggest that Alcyon, the brightest star of the Pleiades, is the pivotal center of this part of the galaxy around which our sun and solar system orbit. Cherokee and Maya legend in North and Central America and the Greek historians, Apollodorus and Deodorus, are among those who refer to Pleiadians visiting Atlantis. The Greeks said that Pleiadians had mated with Poseidon, a king of Atlantis and the offspring populated that society. Theodorus said that two of the seven symbolic sisters of the Pleiades, Celon and Alcyone, had laid with the most renowned heroes and gods and thus became the first ancestors of the larger portion of the race of human beings. Nordic reptilian interbreeding. The Lyra constellation is widely associated in UFO research and the stories of abductees with a blonde-haired, blue-eyed race. Aldebaran, a giant red star with a diameter about 40 times that of the sun is another Nordic-related location, not least within the secret society network of the Nazis. It is in the constellation of Taurus and one of the brightest stars in the Northern Hemisphere. Many abductees tell of loving experiences with tall, blonde, beings claiming to come from the Pleiades, as they do with some reptilian, experiences, and it is important to stress here, and to keep in mind throughout this, book, that I am not suggesting for a moment that all of these Nordics or reptilians have a malevolent agenda for humanity, only that some factions of them do. These genetic streams appear to be vast and populate many parts of the galaxy, and so, as with humanity, some will have a positive agenda, some will be neutral, and others will desire to control. Researcher Franz Camp believes that the more positively motivated Nordic extraterrestrials fled from Atlantis to the Himalayas and have operated from there ever since. Certainly there are many legends in that region of the world of tall, blue-eyed, blonde-haired supermen, living under the ground or within mountains, very much along the lines of that American pilot's experience. Many of these entities may not even be of our density or dimension. As I've outlined, creation consists of infinite dimensions of life vibrating at different speeds. Some beings know how to change their frequency range and dip between these dimensions, appearing and disappearing as they move between frequencies much like a radio dial. This is why people have reported seeing entities disappear before their eyes. They have not, in fact, disappeared at all. They have left the frequency range that person can access. Credo Mutwa told me that the African accounts of the Nordic Mzungu say they hold some type of metal ball that seems to be related to their ability to appear and disappear at will. Time as we measure it is also an illusion that imprisons our minds. I know how hard it is to comprehend this, but past, present, and future are all happening together and thus some of the extraterrestrial visitors, by moving through the frequencies in which these various stages of time are unfolding, can literally come back from the future, or the future in relation to where we are now. Time travel is no myth, it's just that the elite don't tell us about it. There are people who suggest that in fact Atlantis and Lemuria were not third-density realities, but fourth-density and that, as a result of what happened, the frequency fell and everything became denser. Maybe. The fall of man, they say, was the fall of the frequency of the planet from the fourth to the third density as a result of the fantastic events that destroyed Mars and almost destroyed the Earth. There are so many maybes and possibilities once you free your mind from the prisons of conditioned reality. The Reptilian Connection The most prominent theme in this cocktail of extraterrestrial or interdimensional races in relation to human control appears to be a faction of the reptilian species. Many abductees who claim to have been kidnapped by non-human entities have indicated that there is a connection between the reptilians, greys, and Nordics. They suggest that these types of entities are collaborating on the same agenda. Others have said that the reptilians were seen masquerading as Nordics by using some type of hypnotic or holographic field to deceive abductees. One minute they look like blue-eyed blondes, the next they are reptilians. Once you can change form, or manipulate the way the observer perceives that form, who the hell knows what is, what and who is who. The Anunnaki of the Sumerian tablets were from the reptilian race, as widely confirmed when you read the ancient accounts. A Sumerian tablet dating back to around 3500 BC leaves us in no doubt as it describes. The arrival of the Anunnaki, the reptiles verily descend. In Hebrew myth, the biblical Nephilim, the sons of the gods, are called Oem, which means devastators or serpents. The Anunnaki interbreed with earth races, but especially the Nordics and their offspring, to create bloodlines through which they can 
manipulate the world while appearing to be human. Even academics like Dr. Arthur David Horn, former professor of biological anthropology at Colorado State University at Fort Collins, has concluded that humanity was seeded by an extraterrestrial race and that the Anunnaki were reptilian. He, too, believes that these same reptilians have controlled the world for thousands of years. As he explains in his book, Humanity's Extraterrestrial Origins A. In El Horn, Po Box, 1632, Mount Shasta, California, 1994, the reptilians, or this manipulating faction of them anyway, have an undeveloped emotional level along the lines of a crocodile or lizard. They don't feel in the same way as mammals. They have a sharp mind and an intellectual sense and that makes them very efficient in creating and using technology. The computer is a very good example of the reptilian mind at work. It operates very efficiently up to a point, but it does not have emotion and is therefore limited in its possibilities. It is the same with these reptilian manipulators. They cannot evolve without developing emotionally and they want the DNA of those who have that dimension of self. For some reason, the Nordic's genetic code is most important to them. Also, without the balance of emotion, the reptilian mind can do the most horrendous atrocities to others without feeling any compassion for their victims. This is how the Illuminati can manipulate wars that kill and maim tens of millions while being emotionally detached from the consequences for others of their actions. The same with scientists who carry out appalling experiments on live animals while feeling nothing for the suffering of their specimen. It's the reptilian mind. Franz Camp, the Dutch researcher, began his journey of discovery after his marriage to a reptoid hybrid. Woman ended after 12 and a half years. His conclusions about the reptilian Nordic connection mirror the themes of my own. The humanoid originates from extraterrestrials from the region of Lyra. But the Pleiades and Aldebaran are in the game, too. They had original human form in another density. They were peaceful and had blue eyes and white, blondish hair. By mixing up their DNA with the reptoids, as naive as they were, the humanoids' character changed and they got reptoid qualities of character. This was the fall of the human. It is a natural thing. It happens to this very day. But the former ancestors of humans knew. They forbid having sex with other entities or species. Without controlling the breeding process, the reptoids know the humanoid will prevail. Don't forget, reptoids are afraid of humans. Very afraid. They feel, the very little they do feel, inferior to humans. The reptoids are desperate. They are losing. The Third World War, if it comes, shall be a DNA war because the reptoids want human DNA. We can see the DNA genetic code agenda very clearly today with the cloning explosion and the way human genes are now being openly manipulated like never before, at least in known history. Human cloning has been going on in the underground bases for decades. When researchers said this some years ago, people just laughed. They have stopped laughing now because it is in their face. But such is the depth of human robotic conditioning. They now laugh at everything else that is different to their programming and will continue to do so until that, too is under their noses. In fact, I say cloning has been happening for decades. It is probably thousands of years. There are many ancient stories that indicate the existence of underground cloning laboratories designed to create a group of identical people. The Nordics were one of the key extraterrestrial races involved with Lemuria and Atlantis. And there are many stories that, way back, they went to war with the reptilians and forced them to flee underground to other locations in the universe and to other dimensions or densities. The reptilians have been working ever since to regain control of the planet they believe to be theirs and interbreeding with the royal bloodlines of. The Nordics was the most effective means of doing this for reasons we shall explore. T.W. Samsel, the author of The Atlantis Connection, has come to similar conclusions. When the gods began to physically interbreed with the Atlantean people, we see the introduction of the royal lineage, the royal bloodlines that were put into positions of power and rulership over the Atlantean people so long ago. Those of the royal bloodline were looked upon as gods by the general population of Atlantis of the time. These ruled Atlantis until the event of the first great cataclysm, which brought the Lemurian early Atlantic age to a close. That the reptilian influence over humanity in this area took place in a similar manner, at roughly the same point in time or shortly thereafter, is likely to be the case. The human race has been influenced and controlled since approximately 70,000 years BCE or midway through the Lemurian early Atlantic age. This involved several extraterrestrial groups and should not be attributed to a single group in and of itself. There were the three main participants in the direct contact program who initiated this type of manipulation and others. That the reptilians performed a similar research for their own purposes and even infiltrated the Federation's project security most likely did take place. My own feeling, however, is that the closer we have come to the present day, the more the reptilians have become the dominant force in this manipulation. 
Through their interbreeding programs they infiltrated the bloodlines of the Nordics and covertly changed their DNA and became their royalty. I found direct references to this theme in the Indian works, like the Book of Dizayan, one of the oldest of Sanskrit accounts, and the epics, Mahabharata and the Ramayana. The Book of Dizayan tells of how a reptilian race it calls the Sarpa or Great Dragons came from the skies to bring civilization to the world. The deluge that ended the Golden Age, it says, wiped out a race of giants but the serpent gods survived and returned to rule. They are described as having the face of a human, but the tail of a dragon. Their leader was called the Great Dragon and this is the origin of Pendragon the title of the King of Kings in ancient Britain. The Illuminati's Ku Klux Klan, created by that infamous Freemasonic god in America, Albert Pike, still uses the term Grand Dragon today. The Indian Hindu name for the Anunnaki hybrids was the Nagas and they were also known as the Dravidians so close to the Branch Davidians who died at Waco and the Dacius. James Churchward's research says the Nagas came from Lemuria, like the Namo from Sirius in the Anadoti of Babylonian legend. The Nagas were said to have a close connection to water and entered their underground centers through wells, lakes and rivers. The same was true in China of the Lung Wang or Dragon Kings who were described as part human, part serpent. The Nagas were described as offspring from the interbreeding of humans with the serpent gods. At first it seems this union happened with a dark race, the black, negro-like, earth people I mentioned earlier, because the hybrids were described as dark skin with a flat nose. This sounds very much like the faces depicted at ancient sites in South and Central America. However, the two Indian epics also refer to how the reptilian Nagas intermingled with the white peoples and although their relationship was often one of conflict and distrust, the two interbred, the epics report, to produce a reptilian mammal hybrid that became the Aryan kings. These are the divine royal bloodlines or demigods and they are the same bloodlines that ruled the Sumer Empire and to whom those in power today are related. In Media, now Turkey, the Iranians knew the kings as Mar, which means snake in Persian. They were called the Dragon Dynasty of Media or Descendants of the Dragon. In the late 19th century, Colonel James Churchward, an ardent researcher into the existence of Mu or Lemuria, was shown some ancient tablets in the secret vault of a monastery in northern India. They told the story of how the Nakals or Nagamayas from the continent of Lemuria Mu had traveled to India via Burma to establish a colony there. Churchward put the texts together in years of painstaking work and revealed how they described the destruction of Mu, the motherland, and how the Nagamayas or Nagas had traveled to India. The Vedic scholar David Frawley explains how the ancient Hindu holy books, the Vedas, reveal that the earliest royal bloodlines of India the priest kings descend from the Brigas who arrived from a place across the sea. The Brigas were an order of adepts initiated into the ancient knowledge. Frawley says in his book, Gods, Sages, and Kings, Vedic Secrets of Ancient Civilization that the monarchs of these bloodlines included the serpent king Nahasha. They expanded into the five tribes that populated a large part of the Indian population. James Churchward wrote a number of superb books on the civilization of Mu and he says the Nagas also populated China, Tibet, and parts of Asia. The Nagamaya, with their mother goddess religion, were also the origin of the Maya people of Mexico. Researcher Michael Mott writes in Caverns, Cauldrons, and Concealed Creatures, the Nagas are described as a very advanced race or species, with a highly developed technology. They also harbor a disdain for human beings, whom they are said to abduct, torture, interbreed with, and even to eat. The interbreeding has supposedly led to a wide variety of forms, ranging from completely reptilian to nearly human in appearance. Among their many devices are death rays and vimana, or flying, disc-shaped aerial craft. These craft are described at length in many ancient Vedic texts, including the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana. The Naga race is related to another underworld race, the Hindu demons, or Rakshasas. They also possess, as individuals, magical stones, or a third eye in the middle of their brows. Known to many students of Eastern mysticism today as a focal point for one of the higher chakras or energy channel points of the human nervous system. The chakra, associated with inner visions, intuition, and other esoteric concepts. The theme of ruling royal families and emperors claiming descent and their right to rule. From the serpent gods can be found across the ancient world. These bloodlines and connections were symbolized by royal emblems in the form of a dragon, snake, sphinx, plumed serpent, or the tree cross or ank. In Egypt they had an order called the Jedi and the DJ meant serpent. Thus we have pharaohs of the serpent line called Jur, Djoser, and Jedifra. In India, the Buddhist text, the Mahupati, lists 80 kings who descended from the Nagas or serpent kings. Hindu legend says that the Nagas could take a human or reptilian form at will. This is what is called shape-shifting. Across India the rulers claimed power because they descended from the Nagas. Buddha is claimed to have been of the royal line of the Nagas, but then anyone said to be of a royal line in India would have to be so. 
It was the Nagas who established what is now Kashmir and again the ruling bloodlines descended from them. The Chinese emperors were the same. They were known as Lungar dragons and many of the earliest emperors were depicted with reptilian features. Very much like the Nagas, one of them, called Huang Tai, was said to have been born with a dragon-like countenance. It was claimed that he was conceived by a ray of golden light that entered his mother's womb from the Big Dipper constellation. The Big Dipper includes the star Alpha Draconis, the star of Set in Egypt. Alpha Draconis is an alleged base of the Draco reptilian royalty. One Chinese legend says that when he died Huang Tai transformed into an etheric dragon and flew to the realm of the immortals. The priest kings of the Peruvian Incas were symbolized by the snake and they wore bracelets and anklets in the image of a snake. The earliest of the royal bloodlines of Central America claimed genetic descent from the serpent gods. Quetzalcoatl and Itzemna. In the Mycenaean age in Greece the kings were, in the words of author Jane Harrison, regarded as being in some sense a snake. Cecrops, the first Mycenaean king of Athens, was depicted as a human with a serpent tail. Another, Erechtheus, who founded the Eleusinian Mystery School, was worshipped as a live snake after his death and, according to legend, King Cadmus, shape shifted into a live snake when he died. The symbolism of the serpent lineage of the ancient royal bloodlines can be found on every continent. Iran is another example. The Arab poet Ferdowsi, in his Shahnameh or Book of Kings, the legendary history of Iran completed in AD 1010, tells the story of the birth of Zel, the demon or watcher offspring, whose appearance horrified his father, King Sam. According to Ferdowsi, this watcher hybrid called Zel married a foreign princess named Rudebe, a descendant of the serpent king, Zahak, who was said to have ruled Iran for a thousand years. Rudebe is described as tall as a teak, tree and ivory white. These are the familiar features of the Watcher offspring in this ancient period. The royal or tribal rulers of China, Africa, the Near and Middle, East, Europe, Asia, people of every color and creed, have claimed their right to rule by their descent from the serpent gods. As we've seen, Alexander the Great, one of the most famous monarchs and conquerors of all time, was known as the Serpent Son. Alexander is extremely important to the Nordic reptilian genealogy of the Illuminati bloodlines. The legend goes that Alexander's real father was the serpent god, Ammon, who had mysteriously slid into his mother's bed and conceived him fifteen the same story was told of the conception of Merovi, the founder of the Merovingians. This symbolism is supported by many ancient and modern accounts of virgin birth impregnations by reptilian beings. The stories of women being abducted by reptilians and then finding themselves pregnant are told today all around the world. Often, as the Zulu shaman Credo Mutwa reveals from the experience of African women, the baby disappears from the womb during the pregnancy. The Anunnaki interbred with all genetic streams and those were the people who ruled by right of their bloodline in their particular countries and communities. So while the people believed they were being ruled by their own race, they were ruled by the same tribe. The hybrid reptilian mammals ruled them all. Exactly the same continues to happen today with these hybrids in control of the white peoples and the Arab, Asian, Jewish, Chinese, Central and South American nations, and so on. I mentioned earlier that being descended from Noah is a code for the Illuminati bloodlines and when you scan the ancient books and texts you find some strange references to his birth. An Ethiopian text, the Kebra Nagast, is thousands of years old, and it describes the enormous size of the babies produced from the sexual union of human women and the gods. It tells of how the daughters of Cain with whom the angels had conceived were unable to bring forth their children and they died. It describes how some of the babies had to be delivered through caesarean birth. Having split open the bellies of their mothers they came forth from their navels. Another story relates to Noah, the Semitic name for the Sumerian flood hero, Utnapishtim. The ancient Hebrew text, the Book of Noah and its derivative, the Book of Enoch, refers to the birth of Noah and sections also appear in the Dead Sea Scrolls, found in Israel in 1947. The scrolls are connected with the Essene community in Palestine 2,000 years ago. Noah is the son of Lamech and he is described as unlike a human being and more like the children of the angels in heaven. And we know who they were. Lamech questions his wife about the father of Noah. Behold, I thought then within my heart that conception was to the watchers and the holy ones dot 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 into the Nephilim dot 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 and my heart was troubled within me because of this child. Lamech's child, Noah, was white-skinned and blonde-haired with eyes that made the whole house shine like the sun. The highest level of the reptilian royalty are known among UFO researchers and a number of abductees as the Draco after their home base in the Draco constellation. These entities are described as being albino, white and they project something akin to a laser-type beam from their eyes. Just like the pearl-skinned chaps in the James Bond mountain. And Lil was the leader of the Anunnaki on Earth, according to the Sumerian tablets, and they refer to him as the splendid serpent of the shining eyes. This is a common description of the hybrid. Babies in these times and I have heard the same story told today. Also, 
As I said earlier, Franz Camp, a Dutch music teacher turned full-time researcher, was married to a woman he later realized was a reptoid hybrid. He told me that he experienced the shining eyes of his former wife. One evening we had a disagreement. She didn't get what she wanted and got very mad. She smashed the door to go away to her own apartment. I followed her outside. At that moment it was already dark. I saw her walking to her car and she grabbed the car door and then it happened. Her eyes lit up. There came light out of her eyes. She went into the car and her eyes shone over the bonnet and even on the ground next to the car. I looked at it, astonished, but, strange, it wasn't a shock. More a confirmation, and I thought so. A you see, according to the book of Genesis, Noah got seriously drunk on wine and collapsed in his tent. Ham, his son, walked in and saw his father naked. He told his two brothers before finding a cover for his father and when Noah found out he launched into a rage and put a curse on Ham and his son Canon. Could the big deal here be that Ham saw something about Noah's body that indicated he was a child of the gods? It appears that some of the hybrids this far back in history still had clear reptilian features, especially some sort of scaly skin on the chest. In the Hindu classic, the Mahabharata, a demigod hybrid called Kama was born from the union between an earth woman and the sun god, Surya. The child is described as being clad in a coat of armor like a divine being. By the time of Noah, just before the final Atlantis cataclysm, Humans were rebelling against the control of the Anunnaki Nephilim and those of the hybrid bloodline were seriously unpopular. They were said to wear the badge of shame, which could have been a patch of reptilian skin, particularly on the chest. The Anunnaki gods began to hide their true nature for the same reason and operated behind the cover of the human reptilian priesthood who were the only people allowed to approach God. The gods, the Slavonic Book of Enoch says that when Noah's nephew, Melchizedek, was born. The badge of the priesthood was on his chest and it was glorious in appearance. I have heard the same phenomena described in modern accounts. Franz Camp's wife worked as a photo model. He told me that her skin took on a strange hide-like appearance. My wife had a skin reflection or should I say hide problem. The skin is extremely important for photo models. The first thing photographers look at is the skin. Now, this skin problem had the property that her skin got red spots and after a while, changed into horny-like slices. We went to the biggest professor in the university in Utrecht. He didn't know what it was. They did all kinds of tests, but they had no explanation of it. According to ancient texts, Noah said that the people must not know about the child Melchizedek, because they would kill him if they saw his strange appearance. The badge of the priesthood was the same as the divine right to rule. It was code for the reptilian bloodlines. The priesthood of Melchizedek became one of the most famous and powerful, and today the highest level of the hierarchy of the Mormon church is called the Melchizedek Priesthood. The Mormon church is a 100% owned subsidiary of the Illuminati Reptilians, and the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City, Utah, sits atop an underground reptilian base, say military insiders. The Mormon church is a front for widespread satanic activity and rituals among its ruling elite. Although the vast majority of Mormons have no idea that this is going on, they are just the sheep controlled by forces they do not understand, and who started the Mormons, Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, and Brigham Young. They were all high-degree Freemasons and from the Merovingian bloodline. This theme of reptilian-human hybrids can be seen in the story of Adam and Eve. In the Garden of Eden Eden to the earlier Sumerians the abode of the righteous. Once, in Jewish lore, Eve, who was tempted by the serpent, of course, was the ancestral mother of the Nephilim and associated with the Hebrew words meaning life and snake. Satan is described in the Old Testament and the Hebrew Torah as the old serpent or dragon and he was said to be the ruler of the Nephilim who fled within the earth after losing a cosmic battle for supremacy. The Hebrew name for Eve's tempter is Nahash, which besides its translation as serpent also reads, he who knows secrets, another theme of the reptilian gods. Enoch, like Noah, was said to walk with the gods, and the ancient book of Enoch says that a watcher who revealed secrets to humans was called Gadriel. This is a fallen angel who has been identified with the serpent who tempted Eve and he is. A blueprint for a number of later deities who took knowledge often symbolized as fire, illumination from the gods and gave it to humans. Adam and Eve As I've suggested, the biblical Adam and Eve were probably not individuals, but hybrid genetic streams, as in the Adam and the Eve. At first the interbreeding produced a very reptilian offspring. Thus God made man in his image. This is where the otherwise unexplainable reference in the Bible to let us make man in our image comes from. In this period, as confirmed in the Sumerian descriptions, the Adam and the Eve were cloned and could not reproduce. This caused problems for the Anunnaki because they could not create enough worker slaves for the agenda they had planned for the earth. Eventually the human slaves were given the ability to procreate and this involved an infusion of far more mammalian genes, according to Ra. Boulay in his excellent and highly 
Recommended Book, Flying Serpents and Dragons, Mankind's Reptilian Pasta, Book, Tree, USA, 1997. This change from clone to procreator is presented symbolically in the Garden of Eden story with Eve being condemned to suffer the pains of childbirth. Sex between their creations was the forbidden fruit symbolized in the Eden story, Boulay suggests. The god responsible for this development was Inki. He was the serpent in the garden tempting Eve and he was later to become extremely unpopular with the rest of the Anunnaki leadership because of the explosion in the human population that followed, the Sumerian tablets tell us. Incidentally, Inki, the expert in advanced science and medicine, was symbolized as two serpents intertwining around a staff that could well symbolize the reptilian DNA. We call this the Cajusius and it is the symbol of today's medical profession. No accident. This evolution from outwardly reptilian to outwardly mammalian is described in the ancient Hebrew work, the Haggadah, a compendium of Hebrew oral traditions going way back. It says, before their bodies had been overlaid with a horny skin and enveloped with a cloud of glory, no sooner had they violated the command given them that the cloud of glory and the horny skin dropped from them and they stood there in their nakedness and ashamed. This fits with the legends which say that before the fall, people or man, had, skin as bright as daylight and covered his body like a luminous garment. This, later disappeared, but there were remnants of it among the hybrids at the time of Noah and the Deluge. Still today, some people involved in government genetic experimentation tell me they have developed patches of reptilian skin. It was with the infusion of mammalian genes that the lifespans began to fall from thousands of years, claimed in the records of the pre-Deluge era, down to hundreds at the time of Noah with the reptilian appearance continuing to fade. The reptilian gods have always been associated with enormous lifespans and the serpent was a Sumerian, an Egyptian symbol of immortality. They are not immortal in physical form. It just seems like that to those who live much shorter physical lifespans. Another early figure of significance would seem to be a guy known as Jared, the father of Enoch, and the first of the patriarchs who did not marry his sister in the line with Anunnaki's recorded custom of producing children with their sisters and children. For genetic reasons, it was during the period of Jared, way back in the Golden Age, that the Nephilim, the so-called sons of the gods also angels of the Lord in other versions, appeared on the scene to marry human women. Today, in the United States, there is apparently an organization called the Sons of Jared who pledge an implacable war against descendants of the Watchers who dot 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 as notorious pharaohs. Kings and dictators have throughout history dominated mankind. Their publication, The Jaredite Advocate, condemns the Watchers as being, like, super gangsters, a celestial mafia ruling the world. The Anunnaki have been protected from exposure all this time by the middle, men they have placed between themselves and humanity. I call this the hybrid priesthood. In ancient times the hierarchy of the priesthood were the only ones allowed to see God. The Levite priesthood of the Hebrews is just one example of how only the priests were allowed to approach the deity. As outlined in the Hebrew Torah, according to various descriptions, even most of the Sumerian priests never looked the gods in the face. The priests controlled all the administration of the state on behalf of the unseen gods. What was Yahweh Jehovah? Always saying, He must not be seen, dot 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 you cannot see my face, for man may not see me in live. This was possibly one reason for the ban on the making of graven images of the gods. Yahweh Jehovah has also been associated with a reptilian in some versions. The Sumerian tablets describe how their cities were overlooked by a large step pyramid or ziggurat close to the temple and palace. At the top of the ziggurat, the tablets reveal, was the Holy of Holies or Chela where the gods lived. Here the humans chosen by their genetics were brought to have sex with the Anunnaki royalty and produce the bloodlines that became the kings, queens, and leaders of all sections of society. The same situation that we have today. The ziggurats were often referred to as mountains and this led to some of the gods being called so and so of the mountain. The layout of the ziggurat symbolized so perfectly the pyramid structure of our society in which the few at the top administer the global prison that the Anunnaki have created to control us. This is the structure through which their very existence is kept secret. Today's hybrid priesthood can be found throughout politics, business, banking, the media, and, especially, in the highest ranks of the secret society network. As there are not many of these reptilians and their purest bloodlines compared with the human population, they have had to work and manipulate to introduce a structure of society in which the key decisions are made by fewer and fewer people as power is continually centralized and humanity is manipulated to police itself and keep each other in a mental and emotional prison. The reptilians appear to take three expressions. There are physical beings who live mostly within the earth, physical beings that come from the stars, and non-physical beings, the real center of power which exist on other frequencies and use their hybrid bloodlines to manipulate unseen. The reptilians have worked this scam in many parts of the galaxy. 
it would seem. It all sounds utterly bizarre and ludicrous. I understand that reaction and yes it is bizarre. From a conditioned perspective, unfortunately, it is not ludicrous. If only it was. The Las Vegas-based John Rhodes, a longtime researcher into the reptilian phenomenon, summarizes his conclusions like this. From their underground bases, the reptilian military ETs, a network of human reptilian crossbreed infiltrates within various levels of the surface culture's military-industrial complexes, government bodies, UFO, paranormal groups, religious, and fraternal orders, etc. These crossbreeds, some unaware of their reptilian, genetic mind control instructions, act out their subversive roles as reptilian agents, setting the stage of a reptilian led at invasion. That last comment remains to be seen, but you will see revealed here the stream of evidence to show that the basis of what John Rhodes suggests is true. I had a strange meeting with him in Las Vegas and his family background apparently connects into the CIA airline during the Vietnam War. Air America. I am wary of his agenda to be honest, but his themes, as quoted, are supported by endless evidence. The Fairy Folk. The tales of underground worlds inhabited by fairies, elves, goblins, demons, dragons, and other non-human communities abound in folklore across the world and they were often known as the Shining Ones. The same as the Anunnaki and the gods under other names in ancient texts, even a brief glance at the basic themes of these stories confirms that they are talking about the same extraterrestrials that abductees and researchers of today's underground bases are describing. The name in Norse folklore for this underground world of caverns, tunnel networks, and even vast cities, is Niflheim. The close similarity to Nephilim is obvious and they were said to reside within the earth. The Norse people said that Niflheim was ruled by the death goddess, Hel. These subterranean networks could be accessed through the mounds and hill forts built by the ancients and the mountains, hills, and lakes they held to be sacred. These fairy folk and all their names and guises were said to interbreed with humans to create hybrid bloodlines, abduct surface people, drink human blood, and take human reproductive materials. Sound familiar? And the main form in which these fairies and elves, etc. appeared was reptilian. Elf or Elven is still one of the Illuminati code names for the reptilian bloodlines. The tales of non-human gods living within mountains or having their subterranean complexes entered through mountains is likely to be the origin of the endless myths about holy or sacred mountains. Mount Olympus, the home of the Greek pantheon of gods, is one example. Zeus, their king of the gods, was said to come down from the mountain to seed children with human women. Meetings between the mythical Moses and his god were often associated with mountains. I will investigate these ancient and modern connections between modern extraterrestrials and the folklore fairies later in the book. The Anunnaki Wars The Sumerian tablets, according to translators like Sacharia Sitchin, tell of wars between Anunnaki factions. The tablets say that the Anunnaki leadership, like Enlil and Enki, eventually gave much greater power to their children, who were assigned different parts of the world to rule and develop. Nanar, the eldest son of Enlil, ruled Mesopotamia, Palestine, Jordan, and Syria from the city of Ur. We are told, the crescent moon was his symbol and this was inherited by Islam. Nanar was known as Sin in the Semitic language and it is from this name of a reptilian god that we get Sinai and the Christian term Sinner or to Sin. The Christian cross was the symbol of U2 the Shining One and known to the Semites as Shamash. He was the grandson of Enlil and son of Sin, the tablets tell us. Shamash ruled the Lebanon, then a place of enormous forests, and his capital was Beth Shamash House of Shamash, which we know better as Baalbek. This is where a fantastic structure can be found to this day with its giant stones weighing more than three jumbo jets. And Lil's younger son was given control of Anatolia, now Turkey. This was Ishkur or he of the mountain land and he became the god of the Nordic Aryan Hittites. The Old Testament calls him a dad in the Hadad. Ra, Bule believes this is also the Hebrew god, Yahweh, Yahweh or Jehovah, the daughter of Sin, known as Inanna or Ishtar, was a warrior goddess deity of many lands under different titles. Ishtar's symbol was the lion and also the Pleiades and Venus. Together with Sin and Ishkar, she became part of another ancient trinity of gods under many different names. Sin was the father, Ishkar the son, and Ishtar the female. From Ishkar and Ishtar, we get the New Age myth of the Astra Command. Many New Agers claim this is a force of extraterrestrial saviors who are preparing to take the Chosen Ones off the planet when the brown stuff hits the spinning propeller, a sort of Jesus with a spaceship. Other frontline figures in this next generation of Anunnaki leaders after the deluge included Marduk, son of Enki. The tablets say, Marduk was the god of Babylon. The ancient texts, tablets, and legends describe how these gods embarked on a battle for power that brought the world to its knees. Some of these conflicts, with Humanity used as battle fodder are featured in the Old Testament. One defining event described in the tablets involved the Anunnaki god known as Sin. The name comes from the Sumerian SWN or ZUN, 
as Boulay reveals in Flying Serpents, and Dragons, and Sin clearly appears to be the villain of the Sumerian story called the Myth of Zu. In this, Zu, the evil dragon, tries to seize control of the earth and the Anunnaki leadership by stealing power stones, which the accounts refer to as the Mi. For some reason these appear to be fundamental to the Anunnaki control and could have been computer chips or programs, or some type of crystal. There are indications that they shone or emitted light in some way. Scholars translate the Mi as tablets of destiny or divine powers, and one wonder if these could be related to the Ark of the Covenant, a device for which divine powers are claimed. The Sumerian accounts say, quoting Zu, I will take the divine Mi, and the decrees of the gods I will direct. I will set my throne and control all the Mi. I will direct the totality of the Ijigi. He seizes the Mi with his hands, taking away the sovereignty of Enlil, the power to issue decrees. Zu then flew away, and retired to his mountain stronghold. The Ancient Nuclear Holocaust The story is told of how the Anunnaki god Ninurta volunteered to recover the Mi stones. Zu created what seems to be a force field to protect himself from attack. And the tablets say, while he controlled the Mi, no arrow could approach him. And Ki, the chief scientist and engineer, creates a new weapon to penetrate Zeus' defenses and he is eventually defeated. Other Anunnaki also made attempts to steal the Mi stones as the battle for power and control between them continued, just as it does today. Zu was put on trial, but the outcome is not known. It is obvious, however, that the origin of the term sin in the Bible relates to defying the will of I, God, the gods. The story of the battle between Zu and Ninurta describes the use of high-tech weaponry, and if anyone thinks that was not possible thousands of years ago, I am afraid the evidence suggests otherwise. At Rajasthan in India, radioactive ash covers three square miles not far from Jodhpur. This is an area of high rates of cancer and birth defects and it was cordoned off by the Indian government when radiation readings soared astonishingly high. An ancient city was unearthed which, the evidence indicates, was destroyed by an atomic explosion some 8,000 to 12,000 years ago. It has been estimated that half a million people could have died in the blast and it was at least the size of those that devastated Japan in 1945. Support for these modern finds can be found in the ancient texts. The Mahabharata epic tells of a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe, an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns, rose in all its splendor. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death which reduced to ashes an entire race. It talks of corpses burned so badly they could not be identified, how their hair and nails fell out, pottery broke without cause, and birds turned white. Within hours foodstuffs were contaminated. Is that the description of a nuclear explosion or what? This and a very long list of other texts, like the Ramayana, describe a horrific war between the Indian peoples and the Atlanteans. They fought in the sky using the flying vehicles they call Vimanas while the Atlanteans use their Valixi. The Indian accounts even describe a battle between them on the moon and this supports the claims of people like Arizona Wilder, a mind-controlled slave who worked for the higher levels of the Illuminati. She claims that the reptilians and the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Nordics, fought ancient battles on the moon and Mars, as well as the Earth. All this happened during the pre-cataclysmic Atlantean. Lemurian Golden Age and this underpins the stories of how the once great and mighty Atlantis came to an end amid high-tech war and catastrophe. But when the Anunnaki returned after the upheavals, the same mentality returned with them and the evidence shows that there were more nuclear holocausts. Archaeological discoveries in the Indus Valley show that cities were built there in the period between 350 and 3000 BC and they were destroyed about 2000 BC amid enormous violence. What's more, skeletons found at these sites record high rates of radioactivity. Around this same time of 2000 BC, Sumer came to an end with an evil wind, which has all the signs of nuclear fallout. This wind brought the sudden demise of Sumer and the neighboring Akkadians. Texts known as Lamentations tell of a calamity that befell Sumer. One unknown to man, one that had never been seen before. There was an evil wind, a battling storm and a scorching heat. Some kind of cloud shut out the sun by day and the stars by night. The texts continue. The people, terrified, could hardly breathe. The evil wind clutched them. Does not grant them another day. Mouths were drenched with blood, heads wallowed in blood. The face was made pale by the evil wind. It causes cities to be desolated, houses to become desolate, stalls to become desolate, the sheepfolds to be emptied. Sumer's rivers make it flow with water that is bitter. Its cultivated fields grow weeds, its pastures grow withering plants. Even the gods had to evacuate these lands, we are told and all the Sumerian cities were affected in the same way at the same time. Just as the nuclear devastation in the Indus Valley corresponds with the time period of this poisonous evil wind in Sumer, 
so it also corresponds with the timescale that saw the violent demise of the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah. Many sources point to these cities being located in what is now the southern end of the Dead Sea in Israel where unnatural levels of radioactivity persist to this day. They call this Lot C after the biblical character involved in the Sodom and Gomorrah story and for thousands of years it has been associated with the symbol of death. The story of Lot's wife says that she was turned into a pillar of salt when she looked back over Sodom and Gomorrah at the time of the destruction but the words translated as pillar of salt can also be translated as a pillar of vapor. This not only makes rather more sense than salt, it fits with the emerging picture here. The accounts of the devastation of Sodom and Gomorrah describe how God decided to destroy these cities and warned his friends to get out. What a coincidence, then, that the Sumerian tablets explain in detail how the Anunnaki leadership, led by Enlil and some of his offspring, decided to destroy those locations in yet another internal war, this time with the one known as Marduk the son of Enlil's half-brother and great rival Enki. Still today it is the Enlil and Enki factions of the Anunnaki that most divide the Illuminati and create the ongoing conflict. There is an enormous and unnatural scar in the landscape of the Sinai. Peninsula, which covers an area of 112 square miles, blackened stones blackened, only on the surface can be found over a large section of the eastern Sinai and two. Conventional history and archaeology, which finds the idea of ancient high-tech, weapons unthinkable, they remain a mystery. However, the scenes of these apparent nuclear explosions are to the west of Sumer and in the Sumerian. Lamentations we are told that the evil wind that poisoned the water and atmosphere and brought that civilization to an immediate conclusion was created in a flash of lightning and spawned in the west. Can the mystery of Sumer's sudden demise now be solved? Could the evil wind have been nuclear fallout? In around 1450 BC, the classic Minon culture was destroyed on Crete by another sudden disaster that archaeologists and historians can't explain. Once again all the cities were destroyed at the same time by some fiery holocaust. Amid this series of immensely violent events and the internal war within the Anunnaki, the Sumer Empire collapsed. Its domains around the world began to self-govern, at least for a while, based on the knowledge, structure, beliefs, and myths of their former controllers. Since then, the reptilian Anunnaki have been manipulating from behind the scenes and through their hybrid bloodlines and they are on the brink of replacing their formerly overt global empire with their covert global empire. They are the hidden force behind the introduction of the global centralization of power that is exploding all around us today. The Anunnaki, at least after the final Atlantis cataclysm, sought to hide their reptilian form by keeping out of public view as much as possible. Now you see them, now you don't. The reptilian bloodlines covertly operating within human society created many of the ancient mystery schools to hoard the knowledge of true history and the esoteric and technological expertise of Atlantis, Lemuria, and the post-cataclysmic world, especially the Sumer Empire. They also seized control of the other mystery schools, which were formed with a more enlightened agenda. This was one of the roles assigned to the Royal Court of the Dragon also known as the Brotherhood of the Snake from around 2000 BC when it infiltrated the more positive Egyptian mystery schools and made them vehicles of the reptilian gods. Manly P. Hall, the Freemasonic historian, summarizes what happened, although for black magicians of Atlantis also read reptilians. While the elaborate ceremonial magic of antiquity was not necessarily evil, there arose from its perversion several false schools of sorcery, or black magic, in Egypt. The black magicians of Atlantis continued to exercise their superhuman powers until they had completely undermined and corrupted the morals of the primitive mysteries. They usurped the position formerly occupied by the initiates and seized the reins of spiritual government. Thus black magic dictated the state religion and paralyzed the intellectual and spiritual activities of the individual by demanding his complete and unhesitating acquiescence in the dogma formulated by the priestcraft. The pharaoh became a puppet in the hands of the Scarlet Council, a committee of arch-sorcerers elevated to power by the priesthood. This is exactly what happened in the latter era of Atlantis and what happens today with the puppet politicians placed in power by those behind the scenes. The Illuminati, who dictate their actions and agenda, those who will not do as they are, told are assassinated, brought down by scandal, fall to ill health, or are subjected to a media campaign of abuse that persuades the people to remove them. In the Sumer Empire you had the reptilian gods dictating to their priesthood, who dictated to the administrators of finance and state. The same structure remains. The hidden Anunnaki dictate to their priesthood, the initiates and bloodlines of the Illuminati, who dictate to the administration of finance and state. Their agenda is to create a global version of that structure. The world government, central bank, army, and currency. The mystery school network of old, with its fiercely compartmentalized levels of initiation, has evolved into the global secret society network of today. This is topped or capstan by the Illuminati and, at the very peak, 
by the openly reptilian Anunnaki. It has had to be done in this covert way, because there are not that many of them compared with the human population and they would be overwhelmed if enough people knew what is really going on. Today's secret society network is simply the modern expression of the Atlantean, Lemurian mystery schools, which were taken over by a malevolent force. In the period before the cataclysms, those with a positive and negative agenda fought for control of the mystery schools restored after the deluge. Eventually, the malevolent force won that battle and began to expand its power covertly across the world again. With them they carried their own secret language, the language of symbols, which their initiates were taught to read and understand. I call this network the serpent cult, the serpent brotherhood, or the Illuminati. Those three are the same force. Their secret language includes the lighted torch, the pyramid and all-seeing eye, the lion, the snake, fish, and flying, reptile, and other reptilian symbolism, the hard K sound used in names and words, the red cross or fire cross on the white background, and the trinity, symbolized as the trident and later the fleur de lis in other three-pointed forms. The reptilian Illuminati know that the balanced fusion of male and female Energy create a third and immensely powerful force and this is one reason for their obsession with the Trinity. New Agers and others talk about the need to balance male and female and they are right. But we lose the plot if we don't understand that. There are different levels of this fusion. You can fuse the negative aspects of both energies to create a malevolent third force or you can balance the higher frequencies of male and female, so creating a positive third force. The world around us is, in fact, the manifestation of the negative balance and interaction of these energies. We are led to believe this is a male-dominated world, but that is only on the surface. Behind the scenes it is really controlled by the negative expression of female energy. The extreme male energy is out there in front of our eyes in the three-dimensional world. It is macho men with guns and uniforms, the leaders of the major banks, corporations, media empires, and the military. But they are put into power, the wars created, and the agenda advanced by the extreme negative aspects of the female energy, covert, behind-the-scenes manipulation. If anything, the Illuminati, at the real seat of power, are dominated by the female. The negative extremes of the female energy covertly manipulate events and the negative extremes of the male energy play them out before our eyes. This is why we think it is a male-dominated world. It looks that way, but that is not the whole story. Destroying the ancient knowledge. There have been two main thrusts of the reptilian secret society network since those ancient times. First, to pass on advanced knowledge only to their chosen few and control how much of this information each of these initiates will be allowed to know. And second, to manipulate events in the public arena to suck out of circulation all the advanced esoteric knowledge that survives. There, they achieved this by creating religions and a science that enforced a strict limitation of vision and possibility. These two apasamas, religion and science, then labeled the suppressed knowledge either evil or crazy. Their condemnations of astrology are only one example of this. The Illuminati, through frontmen like Columbus, Quartz, Cabot, and Cook, eventually returned to the former lands of the Sumer, Atlantean, Lemurian, empires. There, in the name of Christianity, they systematically destroyed as much of the ancient knowledge as they could. This was achieved mostly by genocide, especially of the holders of the knowledge, like the shaman. As Credo Mutt was said of the African experience, they milked the minds of the shaman and then killed them. Find out what they know and then make sure they can tell no one else. This is the reason why Credo's information about the reptilian Chitori has been out of public circulation for so long. It was vital for the Anunnaki Illuminati to destroy or marginalize the cultures of the Native Americans, Central and South Americans, Black Africans, the Australian Aborigines, and the pagan religion in general. This is what they did, of course, as even conventional history records, but it never tells you the real reason why or who was really behind it. By replacing these native cultures with imposed Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and all the rest, they could either crush the true knowledge with rigid dogma or imprison it in a gruesome hierarchical structure of genetic superiority, as with the Hindu caste system. Columba. The interconnections of the Illuminati web can be seen in the story of Christopher. Columbus. He sailed to the Americas in 1492 knowing basically where he was. Going because his father-in-law was a sea captain close to Prince Henry the Navigator, the Grand Master of a secret society called the Knights of Christ in Portugal. The Knights of Christ were another name for the Knights Templar who fled France for Portugal and Scotland after a purge against them in 1307. Through this secret society underground, Columbus had access to the ancient maps that charted the Americas. It is known that he had strange maps when he set out for India. Columbus was a secret society initiate and, according to the American Freemasonic historian Manly P. Hall, he was connected to the same secret network in Genoa, Italy, as the man later known as John Cabot. 
five years after Columbus landed in the Americas, Cabot sailed from the Templar port of Bristol, England, to discover what we now call North America. They could do this because they had access through the secret societies to the maps drawn by the Sumerian seafarers and even further back to Atlantis and Lemuria. Many ancient maps have been discovered that confirm beyond question that the world was charted thousands of years ago, but this is suppressed from the accounts of mainstream history. As I mentioned earlier, Piri Reis, an admiral in the Turkish Ottoman navy, produced a map in 1513 detailing what the land mass looks like under Antarctica. Modern surveys have confirmed that the map is extremely, and unexplainably, accurate. But, of course, it is explainable. As he said himself, he drew the map from far earlier. Once he had seen, maps compiled before Antarctica was covered in ice. Rise drew his map just 21 years after Columbus set sail. Columbus, like Cabot and the later, Captain Cook, had access to the same source material that Rise did. And more. All three were given maps and funding by the bloodlines and their network. Captain Cook was backed by the Freemasonic Royal Society in London, for instance, and... Columbus was sponsored by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of the land we now call Spain and the infamous Illuminati bloodline in Venice. The de Medici family, they all go back genetically to the kings of Sumer and beyond to Atlantis. And Lemuria, another key bloodline in the Illuminati to this day is the House of Lorraine in France. They employed Columbus, too, and there was another famous figure of history who worked for both the House of Lorraine and the de Medici family, Nostradamus, Mitchell de Notre Dame or Michael of Our Lady had phenomenal esoteric and healing knowledge for his time because he was connected to the bloodlines that held, and still hold, the ancient knowledge from Sumer, Atlantis and Lemuria in their secret society web while systematically removing it from public circulation. So we are looking at an unbroken theme and scheme through history of the same bloodlines and their secret society network controlling events in line with a specific agenda of global control by the reptilians. They have expanded their power out of the near and Middle East by sea and land over the centuries. They became the leaders in royalty, politics and finance, wherever they went. Then came a key period when they could begin to go global once again. When William of Orange, one of the bloodlines, crossed the English Channel from Holland in 1688, he was manipulated onto the throne of England to rule jointly with Queen Mary. This was the symbolic coming together of the bloodlines that had made their way into Europe by land with those that were taken to the British Isles long before by the Sumer Empire and even those who had survived the Atlantean cataclysms in Britain. William's invasion came ashore close to the same spot where Brutus landed, around 1103 BC with his Trojans to found his new Troy or London. Very conveniently two decades before William's arrival, London had been devastated by fire the Great Fire of London in 1666 and this allowed a whole new city to be built by high initiates of the Illuminati. These included, most notably, Sir Christopher Wren, who designed St. Paul's Cathedral at the top of Ludgate Hill. St. Paul's was built on an ancient site of worship to the goddess Diana and this where Princess Diana was married to Prince Charles. Incidentally, Wren's title of Sir, an honor awarded to this day by the Queen and the British government, often for services rendered, comes from an ancient reptilian snake goddess called Sir and relates to one of the Anunnaki. The new city of London was built after the fire in the knowledge that it was to become a major global center for the Illuminati bloodlines. So it was after the arrival of William of Orange, who became William III, and to whom all the royal families of Europe are related. In 1694, William signed the charter that created the Bank of England and the whole central banking system began to emerge with its masters dictating policy to all of them via organizations like the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland. What also followed the creation of the Illuminati operational stronghold in London were the British Empire and the other European empires, as these expanded across the planet to take over the Americas, Africa, Asia, China, Australia and New Zealand, they exported the bloodlines and secret societies and made every effort to destroy the native knowledge and culture. Also, within those countries were the hybrid bloodlines created by the interbreeding between the Anunnaki and selected families in those regions long before. And these were the people who were left in the positions of power after the colonial invaders from Europe withdrew and granted the country's independence. Credo Mutwa has identified many of the black leaders in Africa since independence to be from the same former royal bloodlines of Africa that claimed descent from the gods. When these European empires apparently collapsed or withdrew, this only happened on the surface, not in the fundamentals of control. There are two forms of dictatorship, one that which you can see, the overt tyrannies like communism and fascism, and the covert dictatorship, which you cannot see because it operates in the strictest secrecy. It grows like a hidden cancer, eating into the positions of power in every area of society. The obvious, open, forms of dictatorship have a finite life, because eventually there will be a rebellion against control you can see, touch, and taste. 
there is an identifiable target on which to focus. However, covert dictatorship, control from behind the scenes, can go on forever until it is exposed because people do not rebel against not being free when they think they are. When the British and European empires appeared to unravel, these powers were only exchanging overt control for covert. While they appeared to give independence to their colonies, the bloodlines and their secret society networks remained intact within those countries and they have continued to control them ever since. But, because no one knows this and the people see a president or prime minister of their own color or nation, it is assumed that the country is free and self-governing. I document in the biggest secret how the United States of America has never been free of control from London to this day and that the federal level of U.S. government is a private corporation controlled from Europe. The President of the United States is merely this corporation's temporary chief executive, the same role as the President of the former Virginia Company, which was formed in 1604 by the British Crown and aristocratic bloodlines to steal North America in the first place. And, extraordinary story, but true, at least 50 of the 56 signatories to the American Declaration of Independence were Freemasons and only one was known not to be. When the Grand Master Freemason, George Washington, became the first president, he nominated 11 Supreme Court justices, at least six of which were confirmed Freemasons. The same story has continued ever since. The inauguration of Washington in 1789 was a Freemasonic ceremony in which he swore the oath on a Freemasonic Bible. In January 2001 President George W. Bush took the oath using that same Bible, as did his father more than a decade earlier. It is the property of the New York Lodge, according to news reports. Washington, who commanded the American colonial armies against the British crown, was a knight of the Order of the Garter, one of the most elite Illuminati networks headed by the British crown. It seems to be a staggering contradiction, but when you know the scam it makes perfect sense. See the biggest secret for the detailed background to the American War of Independence. There is no better example of the point I am making here than South Africa. During the period of apartheid, it was an open dictatorship by the few of the many. As a result there was a clear target and so internal and external rebellion led to the removal of that regime. Along came the first black president, Nelson Mandela. He is probably a nice man, but a powerless puppet in truth. And since then Thabo Mbeki has replaced him. Black people now have a vote and so South Africa is free. Yippee. Oh really? The Illuminati global structure can be likened to a compartmentalized pyramid or a spider's web. The operational spider at the center is in Europe with London, Paris, Brussels, and Berlin the key cities. From Europe the agenda is dictated down the line to what I call the bloodline branch managers in the various countries of the world. These bloodline managers, like the Rockefellers in the United States and the Bronfmans in Canada, have a network of other bloodline families around them that control the politics, finance, business, media, and military, etc. In their particular country or domain within the web, much as the Anunnaki gods were given different regions to rule in line with the centrally dictated agenda, and just as the gods fought with each other and tried to muscle in on another's patch, so these Illuminati branch managers do today, hence the infighting and conflict between them. It is the manager's job to orchestrate the events and policies of their country to follow the demands of the centrally controlled agenda. This is how the same events and policies can be introduced. Everywhere, often at the same time. Now, South Africa is free, yes. The bloodline branch managers of South Africa are the Oppenheimer family and their network. Under the open dictatorship of apartheid, they controlled some 80% of the country's stock market, owned the gold and diamond mines on which the economy depends, and controlled the media through their various frontmen. Today, since the election of Mandela and Mbeki, th, apartheid dictatorship has been replaced by freedom. I know this is true, I heard it on the news. Under this freedom, the Oppenheimer family and its networks continue to control some 80% of the South African stock market, own the diamond and gold mines on which the economy depends, and control the media through their frontmen, not least an Irishman friend of Robert Mugabe and Henry Kissinger, called Tony O'Reilly. Isn't freedom just wonderful? And this has happened. Everywhere as the same forces have remained in control since the illusion of independence. But look at the South African experience. Under the overt dictatorship with apartheid there was widespread rebellion inside and outside the country. But now, under covert dictatorship, silence, everyone thinks South Africa is now free and independent. So you see that the hidden hand method is by far the most effective way of controlling people and dictating events. This exchange of overt for covert control has happened on every continent and this is how the Anunnaki and their hybrid Bloodlines manipulate the world today. Chapter 7. Serving the Dragon, the Past Great spirits have always experienced violent opposition from mediocre minds. Albert Einstein The ancient world abounds with stories of the serpent or dragon race and royal 
kings, queens, and emperors who claim their right to rule through their descent from the serpent gods. The Sumerian accounts tell of flying serpents and dragons breathing fire, symbolic of their aerial craft, and how the kings of Sumer, going back long before the deluge to some 240,000 BC, were changelings seated by the union of the gods and humans. Sargon the Great, that famous ruler of the Sumer Empire, claimed this genetic origin and the very existence of kingship is reported very clearly to have been a gift of these gods. Equally clear is that they were reptilian gods, as in the reptiles verily descend, and there are many references by the Sumerians to their gods as fiery, winged serpents. The term Yushumgal, often used to describe, in key, translates as flying, fiery, serpent, which would perfectly describe a reptilian, in a flying craft emitting a fiery exhaust. In fact the word Shum can relate to the term sky vehicle. There could be another origin for this fiery symbolism. Also, the Anunnaki, god Ninurta was called a Mushatur Galgal the flying serpent with the fiery glance and this fits perfectly with the descriptions by the Zulu shaman. Credo Mutwe in his stories of the reptilians in ancient and modern African legend. He says the reptilians have a third eye between the other two which opens from side to side instead of top down, the fiery, red eye in African tradition. From this, can be flashed a red, laser-like beam, he says, which can knock a person down and paralyze them. This is an origin of the phrase about giving someone the evil eye. In China the Lung Wang were said to have a magical pearl on their foreheads, a divine eye and mystical source of power. French stories from the Alpine regions speak of a dragon with a blood-red ruby eye in the center of the forehead that was so bright the creature seemed to be projecting fire. Sometimes this middle eye is called a draconcha, and the eye in the center of the forehead in the ancient stories of the beings called the Cyclops may well relate to. This, too, Credo Mutwa and modern abductees describe how the most royal and senior reptilians, the Draco, have horns. Some look like Darth Maul in the Star Wars movie with the nodules or horns around his head. So much truth is told as fiction through Hollywood movies, both by those trying to get the story out and, overwhelmingly, by those conditioning humanity for the open appearance of these beings in the years to come. In my view, George Lucas of Star Wars is among the latter. The Sumerians depicted their gods with horned helmets and other headgear that was later used by the hybrid bloodlines to symbolize royalty and kingship, and from this came the symbol of the royal crown. Look at Darth Maul and you will perhaps see where the crown comes from. Credo Mutwa says on the reptilian agenda, part 1, that he was amazed to see Darth Maul because of his likeness to the reptilians in ancient and modern African legend. The ram or goat's head, so widely used as a symbol of Satanism, is partly symbolic of the horned nature of the Anunnaki, royalty that Satanism was created to serve. Ram is a word or syllable, meaning fire and relates to the Atlantean god of fire, Vodun. From this we get, pentagram, pyramid, Semiramis, Ramses, Rama, Ramtha, maybe even program or program, a word at the heart of the Illuminati strategy. The Dragon Kings, the kings of the succession in the reptilian bloodlines were known as dragons. When many kingdoms joined together in battle, or as a group of kingdoms, they appointed a king of kings. These were known as the Great Dragon or Draco. The Celtic title of Pendragon, as another Pendragon, the father of King Arthur in the Grail stories was a version of this. In the legends, the symbolic Arthur was a descendant of the dragons and his helmet or elmet, named after a reptilian. Goddess called El carried a dragon motif. The red dragon symbol of Wales comes from the claim by Merlin, Arthur's magician, that the red dragon symbolized the people of Britain. Merlin was described as only half-human because he was the child of an underground being and a human woman. The Arthurian stories include all the classic elements of the story, including the creation of royal bloodlines through the interbreeding between humans and non-human entities, shape-shifting, the use of holographic images to hide a being's true form, and battles between competing dragons. Geoffrey of Monmouth, the 12th century historian, said that Merlin's earlier name had been Ambrosius, thus possibly associating him with the Greek term for menstrual blood, Ambrosia, which the reptilians love to drink. There is also the theme of the Lady of the Lake and this connects with the stories of goddess-worshipping serpent peoples like the Nagas living in underground, centers located under lakes and locks. Like the Celtic myth and folklore, the ancient Greek culture was inspired by the Sumerians and the earlier Atlanteans and Lemurians and was based almost entirely on their stories and myths under different names. All over the ancient world you find the same recurring stories of the serpent. Gods. Throughout the Sumer Empire the people worshipped serpent gods and s. The Reverend John Bathurst Dean wrote in his book, The Worship of the Serpent. One of the five builders of Thebes was named after the serpent god of the Phoenicians, Ophion. The first altar erected to Cyclops at Athens was to Ops, the serpent deity. The symbolic worship of the serpent was so common in Greece that 
Justin Martyr accuses the Greeks of introducing it into the mysteries of all their gods. The Hebrew Serpents I have mentioned that in Hebrew myth, the biblical Nephilim, the sons of the gods, are called Oem, which means devastators or serpents. Hebrew legends also describe the Eden serpent as a being who walked and talked like a human. The Hebrew Book of Ancient Oral Tradition, the Haggadah, speaks of this serpent as a creature with two legs that stood upright to the height of a camel. The Slavonic Apocalypse of Abraham says the serpent with Eve had hands, feet and wings. Just like many other ancient and modern descriptions of the Draco, the Hebrew stories came from the earlier Sumerian, Atlantean, and Lemurian accounts, many of them changed and twisted to suit the priesthood and to lose most of the direct reptilian references. These can be identified, however, by following the trail from which their terms and names derived. The name of the Hebrew winged angels, the seraphim, means serpent and they were described as having six wings, just like the one in the Garden of Eden featured in the Apocalypse of Abraham. Flying angels and religious texts are symbolic of the reptilians, some of which, according to ancient and modern descriptions, have wings and can fly. This is also symbolized in the flying reptilian. Gargoyle figures, which the bloodlines have on their homes, cathedrals, churches, and other buildings, including the British Houses of Parliament. Seraph and the King James version of the Bible is translated as fiery serpent and would seem to derive from the same root as the Sumerian, Seru, the name of a serpent in the epic of Gilgamesh and Sarpa, a Sanskrit term for the Indian reptilian gods, the Nagas. The Jewish Talmud forbids the depiction of the dragon, as it does the sun and the moon, both symbols of major Anunnaki figures. A fragment of the Hebrew Dead Sea Scrolls, translated by the Hebrew scholar Robert Eisenman, includes a description of a watcher known as Belial in origin of the sun god's bell and Baal. It calls him the prince of darkness and the king of evil and he is described as a being of terrible appearance, with a visage like a viper. The researcher and channel W.T. Samsel writes in the Atlantis connection that the force behind the spiritual demise of Atlantis was known as the sons of Belial. Interestingly, one of the key colleges at Oxford University, that education center for the Illuminati, is called Balyal and it has produced many significant politicians who have advanced the Illuminati agenda. It is named after its founder John Balyal who was married to a Scottish princess, Dervorgilev Galloway. Their son, another John Balyal, was king of the Scots from 1292 to 1296. The Balyal family were big-time bloodline and given the Illuminati's astonishing obsession with symbols and the sound of names and words, there may well be some connection between Balil and Balyal. Certainly there is in spirit because Balyal College, like Oxford University in general, is an Illuminati stronghold turning out future generations of placemen and women. Early accounts by the Gnostic sect, Gnostic equals knowledge, tell of the serpent, gods in a positive light. They claim that Lilith, Eve, was their first creation and then Adam followed as her partner. The Hebrew Talmud also claims that Lilith, a vampire, was Adam's first wife. This is symbolism, of course, but symbolizing what Lilith, also Lilibet and Elizabeth, is one of the code names for the bloodlines. On the female side to this day, she was known as Lil to the Sumerians and Lilith to in Babylon. Hebrew traditions say that Lilith rebelled against Adam and his god and fled to a cave after eating her own child. There she lived with the demons of the underground world and bred with them. She told Adam and Eve that she and her offspring would always abduct human children and take them to their subterranean world. The Roman church savagely suppressed the Gnostics, not least because they did not believe that people needed a middleman between themselves and God. Went down very well with the Christian priests. That one, Hippolytus, an early Christian father and historian, wrote that many of the first Gnostics in North Africa were known as the Nasini or serpents and they worshipped Nastan, the golden or brazen serpent, the image of whom they displayed on wooden crosses. The Nasini, Nagas, later became known as the Ophites, a Greek term for serpent. The Greeks said that serpents were creatures of great knowledge, which spoke through their oracles, psychic channelers. In other words, communications from another dimension, or density. The story of Moses contains much serpent symbolism, also. The Garden of Eden, Eden, Hedon. The serpent that tempted even the biblical Garden of Eden is the best known. Serpent symbolism of all. This was an edited rewrite of the far more ancient. Sumerian story of Eden the land of the gods or the righteous ones. There is, again a common theme of the serpent gods in a garden, and James Churchward suggests in the children of Mu that these gardens all refer to Lemuria Mu, the motherland. I think he could well be correct. The Persians spoke of a region of bliss and delight called Hedon, which was more beautiful than the entire world. It was the abode of the first men before an evil spirit in the form of a serpent tempted them to take the fruit of a forbidden tree. There is also the banyan tree under which the Hindu Jesus 
known as Krishna, sat upon a coiled serpent and bestowed spiritual knowledge on humanity. The ancient Greeks had a tradition of the islands, of the blessed in the Garden of the Hesperides in which grew the golden apples of immortality. The garden was defended by a dragon. In Chinese sacred books there is a garden that contained trees bearing the fruit of immortality. It, too, was guarded by a winged serpent called a dragon. The ancient people of Mexico had their version of the Eve story that involves a great male serpent and a Hindu legend tells of the sacred mountain of Meru, guarded by a dreadful dragon. This was said of so many ancient places. The belief in a serpent or half-reptile, half-human, giving knowledge to humanity is also a universal story. Asian serpents, the Indus Valley culture of the Sumer Empire and the Lemurians, and the Hindu religion and Indian mythology that emerged there, are full of references to the serpent gods and flying dragons who brought knowledge and fought with each other in the sky. They called them the Nagas, as we have seen, and they said they could take either reptilian or human form whenever they chose. The Nagas, who originated in Lemuria, seated the royal families, we are told, and interbred with the white peoples. It was said that the Indian serpent goddess, Kadru gave birth to all the Nagas or Cobra people and made them immortal by feeding them her lunar, menstrual, blood. The theme of the serpent goddess or serpent queen is everywhere, as we shall see in detail later. And in figure 17, you can see the symbolism of serpent maidens in Indian art. The Indian epic, the Ramayana, tells the story of the serpent god called Ravan who went to Ceylon. Ravan was said to feed on humans and drink the blood of his enemies. Ceylon was a major center for the serpent race. It seems, ancient Chinese sources say it was a home of the Nagas, the strange reptilian-like creatures. As they describe them, they are reported to have traded with the Chinese, but, interestingly it is said that they never revealed themselves. They left their products, and a price tag, but stayed out of sight until the Chinese traders had departed. The Nagas were reported to have a special weapon that paralyzed their enemies and drained their life force. Abductees have reported the same experience in modern times. Snake worship continues in India today, of course. Serpents of the Far East. The entire culture of China is based on the dragon and serpent race. Once again, here was a highly developed civilization thousands of years ago that was inspired by Lemurians and later influenced by the Sumer Empire. Even today their languages and writing are remarkably similar, as are their myths and stories. The Great Age of Chinese culture is reckoned to have begun around 28 BC when the Sumer Empire was in full swing. Chinese history says that the first humans were created by an ancient goddess called Nukua, who was half dragon and half human. The Yi King, a very ancient Chinese book, says that the dragons and humans once lived in peace and that they intermarried and interbred. Ancient Chinese emperors were described as dragon-faced and looking like the dragon gods. Japanese emperors claim descent from these same gods and their ancient legends say those islands were populated by beings that came from the sky again. James Churchward connects the Japanese race to Lemuria Mu. There are countless Japanese legends about serpents and dragons, and their marriages and sexual encounters with humans that produced reptilian human offspring. Shape-shifting, serpent people would change into beautiful men and women, and lure human warriors and leaders into sexual encounters. Michael Mott, author of Caverns, Cauldrons, and Concealed Creatures, tells of one story involving a maiden called Mimoto who was seduced by a member of the serpent race. Mimoto never saw her dragon lover again but she did give birth to a hybrid child, whom she called Akajai or Taro, or Chapped Son. This was due to the fact that his skin was cracked, creased, and scaled like that of a reptile. From here the ancient tale enters historic accounts for a direct descendant of Akajai or Yataro. As the son was, known in manhood, was a member of the Genji clan named Saburo Agata, who took pride in the fact that he had scales on his body as had his ancestors before him. He was the grandson of Yatero V. Again, a prominent family line seems to have been the desired target of the original, and perhaps repeated, genetic exchange. While, in the East, the influx of dragon blood is seen as a thing of great pride. In the West, such things are covered with an elaborate coating of fable and mist, becoming fairy tales about serpent or frog princes. Western sentiment, at least on the surface, is against such liaisons, often for religious reasons but not always on this basis alone. As the subterraneans have a track record of cruelty, selfishness, and malice, the Chinese calendar zodiac, dating to 25 BC, is symbolized by animals, all of which still exist, except for one, the dragon. Is it really likely that they would choose real, living, creatures for all their signs, except for just one? Again we see the theme of reptilian bloodlines in China. The ancient Chinese believed that a dragon fathered the first dynasty of divine emperors, and subsequently emperors claimed their right to rule because they were descended from the serpent gods. Their thrones, boats, and beds were designed with dragon symbolism. 
Today there are many Chinese bloodlines in the Illuminati, particularly some strands of the Lai bloodline, as identified by author and researcher Fritz Springmeier in his book Bloodlines of the Illuminati, Ambassador House, Colorado, USA. 1999, just as this book was heading for the printers in March 2001, Springmeier and his wife were raided by the U.S. agencies involved in the mass murder at Waco and their research was confiscated. James Churchward, who did so much extensive research into the existence of Mu, claimed that the ancient tablets he examined from an Indian monastery revealed that the serpent hybrids, the Nagas, had populated China, Tibet, and a significant part of Asia, including the Uyghur Empire, the Pamir Mountains or the roof of the world in Central Asia is one specific location, connected by legends to the peoples of Lemuria Mu and there you will find Lake of the Nagas or Lake of the Serpents. Among the descendants of these bloodlines, it is claimed, were the fair-skinned Aryans, again indicating the connection between the reptilians and the Nordics. As a serpent colony, you would expect to find pyramids in China, and you do. One was someone, feet high, twice the height of the Great Pyramid at Giza. This was encircled by others and some still survive today, including what is left of that monster structure. References to them have been found in Chinese texts dating back 5,000 years. The secret society initiate Georges Ivanovich Gurdjieff said that he had been part of an unsuccessful expedition to find a lost city of the Uyghur Empire under the sands of the Gobi Desert. He said he was initiated into the Sun, Moon Brotherhood of Central Asia and was told that the founders of this brotherhood had come from Mars in ancient times. James Churchward says that the Uyghur Empire were former Lemurians. Later a Russian archaeologist called Professor Koslov found a tomb of ancient artifacts in the same area of the Gobi Desert. These included a painting of a ruler and his queen and he estimated the work to be some 18,000 years old, at least. There was also an emblem of a circle with a cross, and at the center was a symbol similar to the Greek letter, Mu. An expedition by the American Museum of Natural History in 1993 found a mysteriously large number of dinosaur fossils in the Gobi Desert. They found 40 to 50 dinosaur skeletons in around three hours in an area no bigger than a baseball field. Researcher and author Mark Amaru Pinkham writes in The Return of the Serpents of Wisdom that a race of extraterrestrials called the Kumaras established a mystery school on Lemuria, Mu, and later relocated their operation to Mongolia, the Gobi Desert region of China, and to Tibet. Certainly Tibet is one of the most important depositories of the ancient knowledge and legends galore talk of underground cities and tunnel systems where the supermen continue to live. Agartha and Shambhala are the most famous of them. The Chinese invasion and occupation of Tibet is far more connected to this story than political acquisition. Tibet, that land of such ancient secrets and legend and still today very much connected with the Illuminati, is another home of the serpent symbol. So is the ancient, former Lemurian, culture of the Australian Aborigines that includes the rainbow serpent. The Chinese name for the ley lines or meridian lines of the earth energy grid is dragon lines, appropriate and understandable given that the reptilians exploit the energy in this grid and build temples and structures at the major vortex points. And ancient Chinese tale about the dragon kings also makes a clear reference to shape-shifting. This is the most amazing aspect of this bizarre story. The way these reptilians can change their appearance or shape-shift between a human and reptilian form. Evidence for which I will present shortly, a character called Liu Yi who wanted to marry a princess of the dragon race, was said to have seen the palace of the emperor change before his eyes and the quarters dissolve and then return to their original form. He saw the coils of dragon bodies, flashing wings, and dragon's eyes. The legend says that Liu Yi changed his earth form and became one of the dragon race that lived in the sky. With that, he became immortal, serpents of the Americas. The story is the same in the Americas with the serpent gods at the heart of the ancient myths and legends of North, South and Central America. The books of the Mayans called Chilimbalam say the first settlers of the Yucatan in Mexico were the chains or people of the serpent. They were said to have come across the sea, led by a god figure called Itzemna, a name that apparently comes from the word Itzem, which translates as lizard or reptile. Itzemna, the sacred city of the god, therefore, means the place of the lizard or iguana house. Itzemna's symbol was the Tau Cross also known as the T-Square in Freemasonry. Quetzalcoatl, the most famous Central American serpent god, also carried a Tau Cross. This cross, like the Christian cross, refers to crossbreeding and Illuminati symbolism and not polarity union as is often claimed. While excavating in Central America near a place, Paul Texcoco, the archaeologist William Niven discovered more than 20,000 tablets that included many symbols identical to those found on the Knuckle tablets which James Churchward had seen in India, and Churchward's tablets were connected to Lemuria, Mu, which was the origin of both these cultures. Itzemna was the Central American version of the creator god who breathed life into man and yet 
Another who was depicted as half-human, half-reptile, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered, serpent, was the major deity of this culture and he traveled, like all the others. In a flying boat, it is possible that Quetzalcoatl is another name for the Anunnaki, DNA wizard, and key. Aztec myth says that Quetzalcoatl created humans with help. From the serpent woman, Siuacotl, Ninarsag of the Anunnaki worked with, in key, according to the Sumerian tablets. There is serpent symbolism all over the ancient Central American sacred sites, and these were places of human sacrifice on a scale that beggars belief. Edward Thompson, the American archaeologist, was initiated into the Mayan Brotherhood of S. H. Tall, and he was told that the name of the ancient port city of Tamonchan in Veracruz, Mexico, means the place where the people of the serpent landed. They came in boats, he was told, which shone like the scales of serpent skins and they were clad in strange garments and wore about their foreheads emblems like entwined serpents. Another landing point for the serpent Atlanteans was Valum Vatan. Here, according to Spanish chroniclers, Pakal Vatan and his entourage came ashore. Pakal Vatan means he of the serpent lineage. He established the city of Palenque, the heart of the Mayan culture in the Yucatan. Palenk is the center of its geographic land mass, as is the Great Pyramid at Giza. The temple or pyramid of the sun at Teotihuacan in Mexico uses the royal cubit as its unit of measurement, the same as the Great Pyramid, and its mathematics conform to those used in ancient structures across the world. Why? Because they all originate from Lemurian, Atlantean, bloodlines and know-how. The Almec peoples of Central America base their whole culture on worship of the serpent. Excavations have uncovered representations of the Almex with serpent features, snake heads, and bodies like dragons. Native American culture in general is awash with reptilian imagery and includes many tales of the sky gods coming down to breed with their women. In Ohio, there is a mysterious and unexplained mound shaped like a serpent from a culture long forgotten. The Hopi Indians in Arizona have their plumed serpent god, Bahalinkinga. They talk of an underground world they call Sipapuni where they claim to have originated. They say that while they were within the earth they were fed by the ant people and they refer to their ancestors as their snake brothers. These descriptions sound very much like beings described in Sumerian accounts. The most sacred of Hopi underground rituals is the snake dance. This is very much like the dance rituals performed by Mayans at places like Chichen Itza in the Yucatan, Mexico. The Hopis believe they share the same ancestors as the serpent-worshipping Chimu people of Peru. Lemurians, the Chimu established a city, called Chan Chan or Serpent Serpent. Their temple of the dragon still survives and their priests would make snake hissing sounds and chant snake mantras to invoke their serpent gods. Significantly, the region where you find the Hopi and Navajo lands in Arizona, Utah, is also claimed by modern UFO researchers and abductees to be the site of a major underground reptilian base. This is especially true of Four Corners, where the states of Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico all meet at the same point. The Hopi Snake Clan, an ancient society of initiates, claims its origins from a Hopi boy who was taken into the house of snakes in a tunnel complex under the earth. Another Hopi legend speaks of a very ancient underground tunnel complex under Los Angeles, which was occupied by a lizard race some 5,000 years ago. In 1933, a mining engineer called G. Warren Schufeld claimed to have found this complex but the news of the discovery was immediately covered up. Today it is claimed by some people that highly malevolent Freemasonic rituals are held there. Geronimo, the great chief of the Apache, told legends of the dragon and the serpent people who ate children. He said his tribe was named after a boy called Apache who killed the great dragon. The story has the feel of David defeating Goliath and even George defeating the dragon. Mark Amaru Pinkham in The Return of the Serpents of Wisdom interprets the explosion of serpent symbolism as recognition of energy and spiritual initiates. I agree with some of that, but there were rather more literal reasons for these symbols, I would suggest. Anyway, he does a good job in detailing the symbolism of the serpent around the world, including that in America or Amaraca, according to the descendants of the early Lemurian record keepers. The Andean elders, the entire American landmass was anciently known as Amaraca, the land of the immortals or the land of the wise serpents. The title Amaraka is derived from the Quechuan Lemurian word Amaru, meaning snake or serpent. Quechuan, the language of the Incas, is derived from Ranasima, the primal tongue spoken on Lemuria, and ends in the syllable Ka, which denotes both serpent and wisdom, apparently echoing the recollections of the Andean elders. H.P. Blavatsky maintains, in the secret doctrine that America is referred to in the Hindu Puranas as Potala, the kingdom of the Nagas, serpents. Native Americans call America Turtle Island after their reptilian ancestors. The name of the founder of both the Inca empires in South America was Manco or Manco Capac, 
Kepek means serpent wisdom or spiritually wealthy. Some of the former Lemurian and Atlantean peoples who settled in the Andes migrated northwards to become some of the Native American tribes of what we now call the United States. The Mescalero Apaches of Arizona claimed to descend, via Peru, from a continent that sank in the Atlantic. This was documented by Lucille Taylor Hansen in her book, The Ancient Atlantic, Amherst Press. Amherst, Wisconsin, 1969, a saddle Ujo, the Mescalero Apache chief, told her that the ancestors of the Apaches were serpents from their sunken homeland in the Atlantic, which he called Pan in the Old Red Land. After being forced by conflict to leave Peru they traveled north where they fought with local tribespeople in North America. There, men were killed and the women went on to breed with the victors to form the bloodlines that became the Mescalero Apaches. Hansen identified significant connections between the Apaches and the peoples of North Africa who also claim descent from Atlantis. The Mescalero Apache crown dance is performed, with serpents painted all over the bodies of the participants. The chief wears a thirteen-pointed crown of the Atlantean fire god, Vatan, and other key performers wear the trident headdress. The trident is the symbol of Atlantis and Lemuria. Hansen established that the Tuareg people in North Africa, who claim to originate in Atlantis, perform an identical dance. She also saw an ancient Egyptian artifact that appeared to depict the very same dance. The Sioux tribe insists that their ancestors were from Atlantis via Peru, and again the serpent or reptilian imagery is extremely prominent in the story. Sioux means snakes, as another tribe. The Iroquois means serpents. The Sioux ancient records say that after the demise of Atlantis, their ancestors, who they call the turtles, traveled to the Caribbean islands from Carib, the Atlantean serpent people, and went on to South America before heading north. They say these turtle people became known as the Lakota and the Sioux or snakes. This story is apparently symbolized at the mysterious serpent mound in Ohio in which the turtle is depicted leading the snake. The original structure was vast, covering 14 acres and rising to 100 feet. The Lakota, Sioux and Peruvian native peoples share certain words in their language. A Sioux chief called Shooting Star said during a visit to Peru, This is the land of our beginning, where we went from the old red land even before. It sank, because this land is as old as the dragon land of the fire god, which was, of course, Atlantis. Other Native American tribes, many with the hard K sound in their names, say they descend from Atlanteans or Lemurians who fled directly to North America from the sunken lands. Oklahoma, a significant Illuminati center in the United States, means sun people of the Red Land. Lucil Taylor Hansen collected Native America legends, which say that some tribes came from Atlantis under the leadership of the prince grandson of Vaden III, who was alleged to be the last priest king of the Atlantean House of Vaden. Hansen says that this grandson of the royal bloodline of Atlantis wrote a book called Proof That I Am A Serpent, which survived in circulation among the Native Americans until the time of the European invasion when it disappeared. Prince Vaden's arrival in North America was celebrated with an annual ceremony known as Thanksgiving later stolen by the European pilgrims and still a major festival in the United States. A key area for Illuminati rituals and mind control projects is Mount Shasta in Northern California, and this is also at the center of many legends about serpents and Lemurians, settling before and after the cataclysm. As with all of these former Atlantean and Lemurian peoples, they were obsessed with building structures on the vortex points. Some 40,000 stone circles, pyramids, and mounds were built in North America. Burning flames were often placed on the top of the mounds and they were never allowed to be extinguished. These were the symbol of the Great Spirit or Serpent, a continuation of the worship of the Fire Serpent of Atlantis. The most used symbol of the Illuminati today is the flame or lighted torch. It is known as the Eternal Flame exactly the term used by the ancients. The Native American tribes form secret societies or serpent clans like the Snake Clan and the Thunderbird. Clans, the Thunderbird is a version of the Chinese Rain Dragon. Many of their leading initiates were believed to be snakes in human form, which, symbolically, is what the key bloodlines are. Author Mark Amaru Pinkham writes of these clans. They were reputed to wield the lethal power of a live snake and display both the intimidating temperament and appearance of the unsavory beasts. As a sign of their viperous power, snake initiates would often adorn their body with snake skins or snake tattoos and hang snake fangs from around their necks. They also conveyed poisonous snake venom within the medicine bag and or armed themselves with a serpent embellished rattle, which would hiss eerily like a coiled snake when shaken. The tendency of such snake initiates was to be secretive, like a stealthy reptile, and some even developed a penchant for seeking out dark secluded dwellings or living nocturnally. Initiations into these clans include being covered, often bitten, by live snakes. Sometimes the rites involve cutting off a finger or other part of the body and feeding it to a snake, don't say a thing, my eyes have just watered. The main deity of these snake clans is the great horned serpent. 
African serpents. Credo Mutwa, the official historian of the Zulu nation, has painted pictures from ancient and modern descriptions of these reptilian entities and describes the various levels of the fiercely imposed genetic hierarchy. The lower levels are the warriors, the poor bloody infantry as we say in Britain. They are ruled by the royal leaders, which have horns and tails, and at the very top are beings with a white, albino-like skin and not the greenish or brownish color of the others. Witnesses and abductees have reported seeing reptilian beings with albino-like skin and these descriptions can also be found in ancient texts. In Africa the reptilians are known as the Chitori or children of the serpent and children of the python. This is so close to the Central American term people of the serpent. Africa is another continent awash with the legend of the serpent race. 4. Anunnaki, Anatoti, Nagas, Dravidians, and so on. Read Chitori. Different. Names. Same people. Credo Mutwa talks for hours on the video The Reptilian Agenda. Part 1. About. The background and history of the Chitori, and he confirms the theme of shape-shifting and how the Chitori bloodlines can take either human or reptilian form. He describes how the earth was once encircled by a canopy of water vapor, the firmament that was destroyed in a cataclysm. This water vapor protected the planet from the harsh effects of the sun, and the whole planet was moist and humid, and had a constant temperature. It was a place of enormous abundance and vast forests. This is a common description of the Golden Age, the Lemurian Garden of Eden. But, he says, that when the Chitori destroyed this canopy symbolized by the biblical forty days and forty nights of rain the whole climate changed as the sun's rays baked once green and abundant lands like Egypt and began to form the deserts. Scientists agree that Egypt, now part of the Sahara Desert, was once a green and pleasant land. This could explain the water erosion found on the Sphinx. 2. Divide and rule the people, Credo continues, the Chitori scattered them across the earth and gave them different languages so they could not communicate with each other. This is another story repeated all over the world and not just in the Old Testament version of the Tower of Babel. That was a steal from many more ancient accounts. The Hopi say that when they came to the surface on the orders of Spider, woman, a mockingbird arrived to confuse their language and make the tribes talk in different tongues. Credo, repeating the information passed on to him in a lifetime of initiations into this underground knowledge, said that the Chitori, reptilians interbred with all races to create the reptilian mammalian hybrids, through which they rule. He said that in African culture a person's genealogy is very important and that the royal bloodlines of the kings of black Africa claimed descent from the same gods as the white peoples and others across the world. What's more, he said that these black royal bloodlines, like those in the countries of the white peoples, had largely moved out of the positions of inherited control, like kings and queens, where they could be identified. Instead they have taken the positions of appointed or elected control like government administrators, bankers, businessmen, and political leaders. He reveals, from his knowledge of black African genealogy, that the black presidents who came to power after independence from the white Europeans have been the same royal bloodlines as the kings and queens of black Africa. He cited Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe as an example, the same Robert Mugabe who was manipulated into power by the Illuminati's Henry Kissinger and Lord Carrington, as documented in and the truth shall set you free. Mugabe has brought poverty, hunger, and chaos to black and white alike in a country that should be one of the richest in Africa. At the same time, he has made himself a billionaire by winning rigged elections and stealing the people's wealth. Also in Africa, as we have seen, the African Dogon tribe of Mali, it is claimed, say they were visited by extraterrestrials from Sirius. The Dogon appear to descend from a Greek people who themselves claim descent from the Argonauts. The Dogon settled first in Libya and then further south in Mali, where they interbred with the Negro peoples. The Greys are reptilian. Credo also supports the view of many UFO researchers that the so-called Greys, that best known of extraterrestrial beings, are lackeys for the reptilians. But he goes further than that. He says they are reptilian. The control and focus of the world is based on Europe and North America and for far too long that has been the case in UFO research, too. This has blinded so many of those researchers to the staggering information available in the vast continents of Africa, South America and native Australia. While they are still arguing over whether gray aliens were found in Roswell, New Mexico, in 1947, black African tribes people have been finding these grays in the bush for hundreds of years right up to the present day. Black Africans call them the Mantindane, the Tormentors. Credo says that often when the grays die in the open, they are removed quickly by government agencies or their friends in flying craft. But occasionally dead greys have been found and removed by tribes people and he has witnessed them being taken apart and examined. He describes in the video, The Reptilian Agenda, Part 1, how he was once given part of a grey to eat, without realizing what it was, 
and the consequences were amazing in the effect on his mind and body, good and not so good. I won't spoil the story in case you want to see the video because he tells it so brilliantly he says that greys are not grey and do not have big black eyes, as it appears. The grey skin, he reveals, is actually a strange type of suit, which is astonishingly difficult to break through. In Credo's words, it requires not just a new axe, but one that has been sharpened to its fullest potential. When you finally breach the suit, he says, you find inside a pinkish, scaly, reptilian creature with pupils that go up down like a reptiles. Africans call them in this non-suited state, pinky, pinky. The big black eyes, he says, are not eyes, but very sophisticated goggles to protect the eyes of the gray from the sun. For some reason, the reptilian grays and at least some of the other reptilians cannot endure or do not wish to experience direct sunlight, and they have to either wear these suits and eye protectors or only go out at night. I know, it's serious, but I have to laugh at how bizarre it all is. Aliens walking around, in gray suits wearing big black shades, and others doing impressions of the Mario Brothers or Puff the Magic Dragon. Wake me up. Researcher Alan Walton also says that the greys have been described as having a reptiloid, amphiboid, or even saurian genetic base complete with scaly skin and webbed claw-like fingers. He says that people have reported seeing reptilian eyes with vertically slit pupils within the big black slanted eyes that seem in many cases to be some type of biomechanical covering. He says that they also appear to have an insectoid type infusion into their DNA. Franz Camp came across this same theme of an aversion to sunlight in his own research of the reptilians. Reptilians are intuitive or paranormal creatures. They live underground because of the sun. The radiation of the sun diminishes the production of serotonin and as serotonin is necessary for the stimulating of the pituitary gland or pineal gland to produce melatonin, they better stay underground. Melatonin is indispensable for life. The more melatonin, the more life. The more intuition, paranormal you are the higher. Production of melatonin. Draco equals Dracula. This is where part of the symbolism in the story of Dracula originates. It was written by the Irish author Bram Stoker and published in 1897. Stoker probably knew the score after years of research into the countless vampire legends. As a history channel documentary about Stoker confirmed, there is no part of the world and no era of history that does not have its myths and legends about vampires who feed off other people's energy and blood. Look at the main elements of that tale in the light of what you have read so far. His name is Dracula. The Draco constellation is the alleged home of the royal reptilian bloodlines. He is called Count Dracula, symbolic of the way these Draco bloodlines have been carried by human royalty and aristocracy. Dracula is a vampire, symbolic of the need of the Draco reptilians to drink human blood and feed off human energy. Dracula shapeshifts, appears, and disappears, symbolic of the reptilian shapeshifters and I will elaborate on this shortly. He cannot stand direct sunlight, exactly what Credo and others say of the reptilians and grace. He comes in through windows symbolic of the interdimensional portals through which reptilian entities enter our world. So many famous writers and artists were initiates or dogged researchers who told elements of the story through art and fiction. Stoker's character was largely based on a man called Dracula or Vlad the Impaler, the 15th century ruler of a country called Wallachia, not far from the Black Sea in what is now Romania. Rom equals reptilian bloodlines. This was the same region that was once called Transylvania, the home of the most famous vampire legends and the Danube River Valley, which runs from Germany to Romania and into the Black Sea, is a name that comes up very often in the history of the bloodlines. Vlad the Impaler, or Dracula, slaughtered tens of thousands of people and impaled many of them on stakes. He would sit down to eat amid this forest of dead bodies, dipping his bread in their blood. He was a great guy to invite home for dinner, apparently. He usually had a horse attached to each of the victim's legs and a sharpened stake was gradually forced into the body. The end of the stake was usually oiled and care was taken that the stake not be too sharp. He didn't want the victim dying too quickly from shock. Infants were often impaled on the stake forced through their mother's chests. The records indicate that victims were sometimes impaled so that they hung upside down on the stake. Death by impalement was slow and painful. Victims sometimes endured for hours or days. Dracula had the stakes arranged in various geometric patterns and the most common was a ring of concentric circles. The height of the spear indicated the rank of the victim, an excellent indication of the ritual-obsessed reptilian mind. The decaying corpses were often left there for months. It was once reported that an invading Turkish army turned back in fright when it encountered thousands of rotting corpses impaled on the banks of the Danube. In 1461 Mohammed II, the conqueror of Constantinople, a man not noted for his squeamishness, was sickened by the sight of 20,000 impaled corpses rotting outside of Dracula's capital of Turgovist. The warrior sultan turned over command of the campaign against 
Dracula to subordinates and returned to Constantinople. Ten thousand were impaled in the Transylvanian city of Sibiu, where Dracula had once lived. On St. Bartholomew's Day, 1459, Dracula had thirty thousand merchants and others impaled in the Transylvanian city of Brasov. One of the most famous woodcuts of the period shows Dracula feasting amongst a forest of stakes and their grisly burdens. Outside Brasov while a nearby executioner cuts apart other victims, impalement was Dracula's favorite technique, but by no means his only method of inflicting unimaginable horror. The list of tortures employed by this deeply sick man included nails and heads, cutting off limbs, blinding, strangulation, burning, cutting off noses and ears, mutilation of sexual organs, especially in the case of women, scalping, skinning, exposure to the elements or wild animals, and boiling alive. No one was immune to Dracula's attentions. His victims included women and children, peasants, and great lords, ambassadors from foreign powers and merchants. Vlad the Impaler was the son of Vlad Dracul, who was initiated into the ancient order of the dragon by the Holy Roman Emperor in 1431. Its emblem was a dragon, wings extended, hanging on a cross. Vlad II wore this emblem and his coinage bore the dragon symbol. All the members of the order had a dragon on their coat of arms, and he was nicknamed Dracul, the devil or the dragon. Son Vlad signed his name, Draculia or Draculia or the devil's son and this later became Dracula. A name that translates as something like son of him who had the order of the dragon. Most appropriate. This is the same dragon order that is today promoted by the British. Holy Grail author, Sir Lawrence Gardner. By the way, Queen Mary or Mary of Tech, the mother of King George VI and therefore grandmother to the present Elizabeth II, was descended from a sister of Dracula. Nothing like keeping it in the family. British and European serpents. In Britain and the rest of Europe, the stories of dragons and reptilian gods abound. Also, here are just some of the places in the British Isles that have dragon, serpent, legends, Aveberry, Bamberg, Baslow, Bettis Y. Coed, Bishop Auckland, Brent Pelham, Brett Fortin, Brinsip, Bromfield, Bures, Burley, Castle Narach, Cawthorn, Chipping Norton, Crocum, Darford, Deerhurst, Deanism Rise, Dronley, Dunstanburg, Durham, Gunnerton, Henham, Heichler, Horsham, Hewenden, Hutton Rugby, Kellington, Kermore, Kilve, Kingston, Lewinick, Linton, Landelo, Graben, Lynn Sinich, London, Longwitton, Ludham, Lymanster. Middlewich, Mortiford, Norton Fitzwarren, Norwich, Nunnington, Oxford, Penminid, Penshaw, Renwick, Saffron Walden, St. Leonard's Forest, Shervage Wood, Slingsby, Sockburn, Tanfield, Trull, Uffington, Wells, Westbury, Warncliffe, Wirwell, Wiveliscombe, Wormbridge, Wormingford, Wormhill, and Wormsill. Worm or worm means wingless dragon. All the legends of the dragons and serpents of the British Isles follow similar themes. The British Isles was an Atlantean. Lemurian colony before the deluge and the bloodlines returned there as the Phoenicians, Egyptians, and other names. When the Sumer Empire began to expand to the centers of its former motherlands, the carriers of the Atlantean, Lemurian knowledge in Britain and other parts of Europe were called the Nadrid or Adders, a Welsh name for serpent. They are better known as the Druids, a Gaelic word in Ireland meaning a wise man, sorcerer, or serpent, and they were called the snake priests. An Irish manuscript claims that the adepts of the druidic arts descended from the Tuatha de Danon the people of the serpent goddess Dana. Apparently the Tuatha de Danon were also called the Sumer. These were the former Atlantean peoples who settled in Asia Minor and then expanded out into Europe. It was they who called Britain Albion after Albina, the eldest daughter of Danaus, an ancient Danon priest. Danon is also so close to Canon, of course, and these two peoples came from the same part of the world. I think we will find that Danon and Canon are terms for the same people. It was one of their number, called Brutus, who led migrating Danons, Trojans to the British Isles and established the city of Kertroia or New Troy today's London. The legend goes that when the Danons were defeated by the later Greek Milesians of Asia Minor, the peace agreement involved the Danons, moving from the surface to live in an underground kingdom which could be accessed from hollow hills in Ireland. The Danons were said to be a giant race of warriors who became smaller through generations of living within the earth. The same was said in Ireland of the Firbolgs, Formorians, and Nemedians, who were also defeated and driven underground where, it is said, they lost their giant stature. This theme of giants forced underground where they dwindled in height can be found all over the world and, like the Danons, they are often described as having what I call the Nordic appearance. Another common story is that these people abducted surface humans and interbred with them. Michael Mott in his Hook, Caverns, Cauldrons, and Concealed Creatures also points out the close similarity of Tuatha and Tuat, the Egyptian name for the underworld, through which the pharaohs believed they would travel to immortality. 
The Druids, it is said, continued to use their Danon knowledge on the surface. After those peoples were forced underground, the highest level of the Druidic pyramid was the Arch Druid. They were located on islands because land surrounded by water is a particularly powerful energy center and if it also happens to host major vortex points on the energy grid that power is increased immensely. Arch Druids were based on the Isle of Man home of an ancient Danon. Mystery School in the Irish Sea, the Isle of Anglesey off the North Wales coast, and the Isle of Wight, the Dragon Isle as it was called, off the south coast of England, where I have lived for nearly 20 years. Researcher Mark Amaru Pinkham suggests that the Isle of Wight could have been the pivotal vortex in the northern grid of the planet. No wonder so much Satanism involving major Illuminati figures goes on there. Stonehenge, Aveberry, Glastonbury Tor, Bath, and Iona were other significant druid centers. Glastonbury Tor, hill or mound, was located in the Isle of Avalon and Avalon means island of the immortals a name that is common to many of these serpent centers. The island of Iona off the Scottish coast was formerly known as Inisnan Druidney or Island of the Druids. The arch druids were indicated by the seven serpent eggs displayed on their breasts. The goddess Artemis, Dana, Diana, was also depicted with eggs on her chest was the legend of the mythical St. Patrick chasing the snakes out of Ireland the destruction of the Druid or Adder network. If this was so, it happened for public consumption only as the knowledge was taken out of general circulation, but remained very much alive within the secret societies. Egyptian serpents, you find the same story of serpent symbolism in the country to which so many modern Illuminati symbols and codes relate. Egypt, the great temple of Amenor, Amen-Ra was placed on a massive vortex point at Thebes or Karnak. Amen or Amen is where the Christians get their term Amen. Under Thebes, Karnak are networks of tunnels known as the Serpent's Catacombs. As a result of the traveling Egyptians of the Sumer Empire, or the Nordics who traveled to the Sumer region, we also have Karnak in Brittany, France. There were once 10,000 standing stones here, arranged to form the image of a seven-mile serpent. Karnak means Serpent Hill. The ancient Egyptian accounts known as the Pyramid texts speak of the serpent being both subterranean and celestial. Stories of flying serpents can be found in Egypt, as you would expect of an important colony of the Sumer Empire, and, once again, they symbolized immortality. Flying serpents were pictured taking the kings to the land of immortality in a star constellation in the heavens. One serpent symbol was the divine asp on the headgear of Egyptian kings and they used the fat of the crocodile in their coronations. The great ancient Egyptian city of Alexandria was called City of the Serpent's Son Alexander the Great and there they worshipped the serpent god, Serapis. He was known as the Sacred Serpent or Fire Serpent and from this comes the biblical Seraphim, the serpents associated with YHVH or Yahweh, Jehovah. The Temple of Serapium in I. Alexandria was dubbed one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, as was the 400 feet high pharaoh's lighthouse in the city which was topped by the Illuminati's key symbol the lighted torch or eternal flame. In the temple, Serapis was portrayed as a massive statue standing on a crocodile holding a staff with a serpent coiling around it. At the top of the staff were the heads of a lion, dog, and wolf. All classic symbols of the serpent cult. Egyptian queens like Cleopatra were known as the serpent of the Nile and the Urius hieroglyphic sign for goddess was a serpent. Later Gnostic Christians adopted the name Urius as a secret name for God. Many Gnostic traditions also identify the serpent with Jesus. As with many other cultures of the serpent gods, they were seen in the earliest Egyptian records as either benevolent or partly benevolent and partly not so. This is what you would expect from any race of people that reflects all attitudes. However, there came a time which can be identified most clearly in Egypt. When this image changed dramatically, suddenly, they were the bad guys. In the earlier Old and Middle Kingdom, which ended about 1640 BC, the serpent was given a good press, but starting with the New Kingdom it was all very different, especially from the 18th dynasty, starting about 1546 BC. Serpents become the target of hatred and rituals were performed to exorcise them. This change of serpentine image in Egypt came in the period of chaos lasting hundreds of years, after the Middle Kingdom fell, and it was the kings of the 18th dynasty who removed the Hyksos, who invaded Egypt and ruled till around 1550 BC the Hyksos, which means princes of foreign lands, destroyed all places of worship of the old religion when they took over. And Ra, Bule writes in his Flying Serpents and Dragons that the Hyksos were known as the Amalekites by the Hebrews and were part of the Rephaim, descendants of the reptilian Nephilim. Apop was the first ruler of the Hyksos in Egypt and the name was used to symbolize the serpent when they took on their evil public image in Egypt. The serpent was known as Apep or Apop, Apophis to the Greeks, and Apop became the symbol of the serpent people who occupied Palestine and also Egypt at the time of the so-called Exodus. Rituals to destroy Apop in Egypt were very similar to 
Those in Asia designed to overcome the Nagas. For me the Hyksos were of the reptilian bloodline and played a major role in infiltrating the Egyptian mystery. Schools. It was around 2000 BC that the Royal Dragon Court, now the Imperial Royal, Dragon Court and Order was formed in Egypt by the priests of Mens to protect, advance, and serve the dragon bloodlines and 4,000 years later it is still in operation and promoted by Sir Lawrence Gardner in England. This is the organization, remember, that awarded the Dracula family its most prestigious title. Clearly the legends and accounts of the serpent gods, their royal hybrids, and their often grotesque activities abound throughout the ancient world. So does the most bizarre theme of all, their ability to change their form before your eyes. They can shape-shift. Chapter 8. The Shapeshifters. Whoever undertakes to set himself up as a judge of truth and knowledge is shipwrecked by the laughter of the gods. Albert Einstein. The accounts of the reptilian control of humanity are not confined to the ancient world, as we shall see very clearly as the story is revealed. Kathy O'Brien, a victim of the Illuminati's vast mind control program, wrote of her reptilian experiences in her book, Transformation of America. Reality Marketing, Las Vegas, 1995. I have told Kathy's story at length in my previous books and I will elaborate on the mind control programs later in this one. Understandably, Kathy believed her reptilian experiences with leading figures in the United States to be part of her mind control. However, as you will see with the evidence I shall present, what she saw and heard was not quite the illusion she thought it to be. She described how many leading U.S. politicians she worked for in her mind-controlled state appeared to take a reptilian form before her eyes and then return to human. These included President George Bush, father of President George W. of the Anunnaki, Merovingian bloodline. Father George told her they were an extraterrestrial race that had taken over the world, but no one realized it because they looked human. Kathy relates another important experience she had with Miguel de la Madrid, the president of Mexico during Bush's tenure at the White House. She writes in Transformation of America, De la Madrid had relayed the legend of the iguana to me, explaining that lizard-like aliens had descended upon the Mayans. The Mayan pyramids, their advanced astronomical technology, including sacrifice of virgins, was supposedly inspired by the lizard aliens. He told me that when the aliens interbred with the Mayans to produce a form of life they could inhabit, they fluctuated between a human and iguana appearance through chameleon-like abilities a perfect vehicle for transforming into world leaders. De La Madrid claimed to have Mayan, alien, ancestry in his blood, whereby he transformed back into an iguana at will. De La Madrid produced a hologram similar to the one Bush did in his initiation. His hologram of lizard-like tongue and eyes produced the illusion that he was transforming into an iguana. Remember that the Mayans say the first settlers of the Yucatan in Mexico were the chains or people of the serpent. They were led by the god Itzimna, a name that apparently comes from the word Itzim, which translates as lizard or reptile. The sacred city of Itzimna, therefore, means the place of the lizard or iguana house. What Kathy O'Brien reports there is an excellent summary of what has happened, except for the part about holograms and illusions. What she saw was not a reptilian hologram, but what is known as shape-shifting. If anything it is the human form of these people that is a holographic cover. Shape-shifting is the ability to change physical form, in this case between a human and reptilian appearance. The ancient Danon Brotherhood of Initiates and Magicians called Telchines on the island of Rhodes could shape-shift into any form, according to the Greek historian Deodorus. Shape-shifting is a common theme in tales of esoteric magicians and high initiates. I have been told by hundreds of people all over the world, from every walk of life, you can imagine about their experiences of seeing well-known and less well-known. People transform into a reptilian form before their eyes and then go back again. George Bush, Father George, is the name that recurs most often in these accounts. There have been reports of shape-shifting reptilians for thousands of years. In the Indus Valley and Hindu culture their serpent gods called the Nagas were one. Example. Interestingly, James Churchward established that the Meyer of Central America and the Nagas of Asia were the same former Lemurian peoples. You can see, in the videos, the reptilian agenda, the information and confirmation that the Zulu, Shaman Credo Mutwa presence of the shape-shifting reptilians, the serpent sea or fish gods of Sumer and Babylon were said to be able to change shape and look human whenever they chose. Another version of shape-shifting are the so-called men in black who appear and disappear according to witnesses. The story of Jekyll and Hyde is also symbolic of shape-shifting. The children of the shadows, ancient tablets, alleged to come from beneath a Mayan temple in Mexico, describe the reptilians and their ability to shape-shift. These accounts correlate remarkably with modern experience and reports. They are known as the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, who was a deity of the Egyptians. It is claimed that they date back 36,000 years and were written by Thoth, an Atlantean priest-king who, it is said, founded a colony in Egypt. 
His tablets, the story goes, were taken to South America by Egyptian pyramid priests and eventually placed under a Mayan temple to the sun god in the Yucatan, Mexico. The translator of these tablets, who calls himself Doriel, claims to have recovered them and completed the translations in 1925, but only much later was he given permission for part of them to be published, he says. You can read the whole tale and the content of the tablets on this website, crystallinks.com slash emerald.html. There is also a book, The Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean. However, you don't have to accept all the details of that story to appreciate the synchronicity between what these tablets say and what is now being uncovered. The following is the relevant section in the tablets to the subjects we are discussing. Speak I of ancient Atlantis, speak of the days of the kingdom of shadows, speak of the coming of the children of shadows. Out of the great deep were they called by the wisdom of earth man, called for the purpose of gaining great power. Far in the past before Atlantis existed, men there were who delved into darkness, using dark magic, calling up beings from the great deep below us. Forth came they, into this cycle, formless were they, of another vibration. Existing unseen by the children of earth men, only through blood could they form being, only through man, could they live in the world. In ages past were they conquered by the masters, driven below to the place whence they came, but some there were who remained, hidden in spaces and plains, unknown to man, live they in Atlantis as shadows, but at times they appeared among them. I, when the blood was offered, forth came they to dwell among men. In the form of man moved they amongst us, but only to sight, were they as our men, serpent-headed when the glamour was lifted, but appearing to man as men among men, crept they into the councils, taking form that were like unto men, slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms, taking their form and ruling o'er man. Only by magic could they be discovered, only by sound could their faces be seen, sought they, from the kingdom of shadows, to destroy man and rule in his place. But, know ye, the masters were mighty in magic, able to lift the veil from the face of the serpent, able to send him back to his place, came they to man and taught him, the secret, the word that only a man can pronounce, swift then they lifted the veil, from the serpent and cast him forth from place among men. Yet, beware, the serpent still lieth in a place that is open, at times, to the world. Unseen they walk among the in places where the rites have been said, again as. Time passes onward, shall they take the semblance of men, called, may they be, by the master who knows the white or the black, but only the white master may control and bind them while in the flesh. Seek not the kingdom of shadows, for evil will surely appear. For only the master of brightness shall conquer the shadow of fear. Know ye, O my brother, that fear is an obstacle great. Be master of all in the brightness, the shadow will soon disappear. Hear ye, and heed my wisdom, the voice of light is clear. Seek the valley of shadow and light only will appear. Within that passage, whatever its origin may be, you have the story of life on earth over hundreds of thousands of years and the source of those who control the world today. The leading politicians, banking and business leaders media owners, and heads of the military are the Anunnaki serpents in human form, staggering eye, no, and the minds of most people will be screaming nonsense because it is, so at odds with their conditioned view of reality, but it's true, and if you bail out, now, you will miss the mass of evidence I will present to show that it's true, the background presented in those tablets is confirmed by modern experience and rapidly, emerging information from the inside of the Illuminati, some examples follow, forth came they into this cycle, formless were they, of another vibration, existing, unseen by the children of earth men. As my research has revealed, the world is controlled by entities taking reptilian and other forms that exist on another dimension or cycle. We are in the third dimension or density, they operate from the fourth, a frequency just outside the present range of the physical senses. We can feel the fourth density as vibes around us, but we cannot see it unless we tune in with our psychic sight which can connect our consciousness with other vibrational levels. This is what psychics or channelers are seeking to do and the good ones can move their inner radio dial to access other frequencies. The headquarters of the serpent race I am exposing here is the lower end of the fourth dimensional frequency range, which vibrates very close to this one. It is on the very fringe of our physical senses. It is what you might call a parallel universe or a parallel earth. A mirror of the one we see, but vibrating at a different speed. Cats can see the fourth dimension and this is why they react to something in what appears, to us, to be empty space. The same with babies before their psyche is closed down by an ignorant world. To operate and manipulate our vibrational level of the planet, these fourth dimensional reptilians needed a third dimensional human form. They needed to create a genetic space suit that they could occupy and hide within. This, as President de la Madrid told Kathy O'Brien, was achieved by creating bloodlines that fuse their reptilian DNA with that of humans. These bloodlines have a genetic, therefore vibrational, compatibility between the fourth dimensional 
reptilians in their third-dimensional human forms. In other words, it makes their possession of these bodies far easier and more effective than with other human genetic streams that do not have that particular DNA combination. It is to retain this genetic structure that the Illuminati bloodlines have always interbred with each other and continue to do so. It means that if they can manipulate these bloodlines into the positions of power, they are, in effect, putting themselves into those positions through their control of these bodies from the lower fourth dimension. This is the reason that the genealogy of those in the major seats of global power today can be traced back to the royal lines, the Anunnaki hybrids, that ruled Sumer, Egypt, and so on. The ancient Book of Enoch, which covers the period before the final Atlantis cataclysm, says those born of Nephilim blood are, because of their ancestral spirit, reptilian possession from the lower fourth dimension, destined to afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth. The Nephilim are fundamentally associated with human sacrifice and blood drinking, just like the Illuminati today. The Book of Enoch describes the behavior of the Nephilim offspring produced with human women, and they became pregnant and bore great giants dot 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 who consumed all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind, and they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and drink blood. The earth laid accusation against the lawless ones, as then, so now, the blood drinkers. Only through blood could they form being, only through man could they live in. The world, insiders have told me that the reptilians need to drink human blood to maintain human form and stop their reptilian DNA codes from manifesting their true reptilian state. Accounts of the Nephilim also include references to their blood-drinking activities. As we have seen, all this explains why these bloodlines have always taken part in human sacrifice and blood-drinking rituals from the ancient world to the present day, a fact I detail in The Biggest Secret. This includes people of the bloodline like George Bush, Al Gore, Bill Clinton, Henry Kissinger, the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, British Prime Ministers like Ted Heath, and the British royal family. Yes, including, indeed especially, the Queen and Queen Mother. I have been writing for years about the ancient satanic rituals performed by the elite of the United States at a place called Bohemian Grove. This is 2,700 acres of secluded and guarded redwood forest in Northern California. Many people just laughed as usual. But, as I was starting this book, Alex Jones, an American journalist, documentary, maker, and radio presenter, managed to get into the grove during their ritual, disguised in one of the hooded robes the participants wear. He took video footage to prove that what I, and many others, have been saying about Bohemian Grove is true. His website is www.infowrs.com. Among the participants at Bohemian Grove past and present are George Bush, George W. Bush, Al Gore, Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter, Gerald, Ford, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Lyndon Johnson, Herbert Hoover, Teddy Roosevelt, Dan Keel, Robert Kennedy, Joseph Kennedy, Earl, Warren, David Rockefeller, Lawrence Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, Mikhail Gorbachev The Soviet Union and the West were always controlled by the same force, William F. Buckley, an American publisher and major Illuminati, operative, George Schultz, the former Secretary of State to Ronald Reagan, Walter Cronkite, America's most famous news reader, William Randolph Hearst, the American newspaper tycoon, Andrew Knight, a British media executive closely connected to the Rupert Murdoch empire. Edward Teller, Glenn Seaborg, who developed plutonium, Bert Bacharach, the composer. Singer, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, a British MI6 operative, Ray Kroc, the man behind the McDonald's fast food empire, author Mark Twain, and John Muir, founder of the Illuminati Environmental Front, the Sierra Club. That's just a few of them in there. Connection is their reptilian bloodline or their allegiance to the Illuminati. The Kennedys are a major bloodline family in the States, but no one is expendable if the Illuminati agenda requires action to be taken. Many recovering mind-controlled slaves have told me how they were brutally sexually abused by Senator Edward Kennedy and one former mind-controlled operative with the Illuminati. A mind-controller herself told me Senator Kennedy and the whole Kennedy family was part of this. I know that they are political icons in our country but they are in it up to their eyeballs. Philip Eugene de Rothschild says he is one of hundreds of thousands of unofficial Rothschild offspring. He stresses that often the most significant operatives in the Illuminati hide behind apparently ordinary lives while dictating the agenda and attending human sacrifice rituals. This is my own information, too, after talking to Illuminati insiders. But he says that there are many public figures who are very high in the Illuminati satanic pyramid and he highlights Prince Philip as a major player in the rituals he has attended. 
I can recall the Rockefellers and the Bushes attending rituals, but never having the supremacy to lead them. I still regard them as lackeys and not real brokers of occult power, except for Alan Greenspan. Most of these fellows were camp followers in the occult, primarily for the economic power and prestige. Greenspan, I recall, was a person of tremendous spiritual occult power and could make the Bushes and the younger Rockefellers cower with just a glance. Ex-CIA Director Casey Kissinger and Warren Christopher were in attendance at non-ritual gatherings and some occult rituals as well. But well back in the gallery, at the forefront of the rituals were Prince Philip at the pinnacle. He stands, like most of the contemporary European monarchy, in the Charlemagne, Merovingian, Enian bloodline. But he is its current head. I am certain that his maternal chromosomes are in the current Antichrist Nephilim. Prince Philip is the leading biological descendant of the reptilians, as you call them. Immediately below him are the males of my family line like a court of ministers in charge of logistics and operations. The current monarchs of the Netherlands, Spain, and some of the old Austrian nobility are next in cult power and in the conspiracy. There is a lot of background to Prince Philip and the Windsors in the biggest secret. Other information has come from the victims of the Illuminati mind control. Programs, like the one based at Montauk Point on Long Island, New York which has been the subject of a number of publications. Mind-controlled slaves are widely used by the reptilians and their bloodlines to advance their agenda. As I have exposed at length in other books, they have created a global army of programmed people to do their bidding, conduct their rituals, and do whatever they are told, without question or thought. Some have recovered at least part of their minds, escaped from the projects, and accessed the memories of what happened to them. They have become increasingly vocal in the last 10 years, although the mainstream media refuses to report their stories. One mind-control victim told me how he witnessed human sacrifice ceremonies at Montauk involving William F. Buckley, the well-known American publisher and Bohemian Grove member, who heads the elite Janus Mind Control operation based at NATO headquarters in Belgium, Arizona. Wilder says she has had similar experiences with Buckley. The Montauk mind slave claims that the knowledge he learned in these projects showed him how the reptilians shape shift. He said there are locked sequences and open sequences of DNA. Open codes manifest as a physical characteristic while closed codes do not. The reptilian hybrids, he says, have the ability to lock off certain genetic codings while they open others. When this happens, he says, there is a literal transformation of the cellular structure, which changes from a mammalian to a reptilian form. So, it's not like the human form goes anywhere, he told me, it just shifts. It changes into a reptilian form because those sequences are opened. They also have the ability to shift it back, however much your mind may be struggling to cope with that. 4. Sure what he says about DNA codes in general is correct. Did you realize that there are still people today who are born with tails? Yes, there are, and it is simply because codes from our reptilian past have opened in those people which, at this time in the evolution of the body, should have remained closed and dormant. As the human fetus forms into a baby it goes through many stages that connect with major evolutionary points in the development of the present physical form. These include those that connect with non-primate mammals, reptiles, and fish. At one stage, the embryo has gills and is very much like those of birds, sheep, and pigs, until the eighth week when it goes on its own evolutionary path. When a code opens that should not, babies are born with tails and these are known today as caudal appendages. Doctors usually remove them immediately, but in those areas of the world where that treatment is not available people live their whole life with a tail. You only have to feel the bottom of your spine to see where our tails used to be, and they do not manifest today, except rarely, purely because the DNA genetic blueprint has closed that formerly open code. This mind control victim is merely claiming that when you know what you are doing and understand DNA to a much greater level than human scientists currently do, you can make this process happen in an instant. He says that the reptilians need mammalian hormonal levels to hold the mammal codes open and maintain human form because their baseline state is reptilian and the mammalian codes would close if they did not consume frequent supplies of human blood. They also want an adrenaline that enters the bloodstream in large quantities at times of extreme terror. Hence they have victims who know they are going to be sacrificed and they use the ritual to build their terror to the point of death. This allows them to drink blood full of that adrenaline. Arizona. Wilder supplies precisely the same information from her own horrific experience. She says she conducted sacrificial rituals for the American elite and the British royal family at places like Balmoral Castle in Scotland, as revealed in The Biggest Secret and the video, Revelations of a Mother Goddess. Arizona adds that the blood type the reptilians most desire is that of blonde-haired, blue-eyed people because it is the most effective for the purpose of holding human form.
She, like almost every elite, mind-controlled slave I have encountered, is blonde-haired and blue-eyed. She died, her hair after escaping from her mental and physical slavery blonde-haired. Blue-eyed people are also the ones most often chosen to be sacrificed by the Illuminati. Red-haired people seem very important to them also and they most of all want the blood of prepubescent children and young women who have not had sex. This is too do with the purity of the blood and energy of children, and the changes that take place within the energy field once a person has experienced sex or puberty. Thus, the Illuminati sacrifice children and young women more than anyone and this is the origin of the stories throughout history of sacrificing young virgins to the gods. Scientists have discovered aspects of shape-shifting phenomena. Polymer gels, for instance, are remarkable, shape-shifting materials. When exposed to small, alterations in acidity or temperature they can dramatically transform their appearance and size. The different acidities and temperatures are simply different. Vibrational states. The changing vibration is the key. The forces between molecules in the gels are delicately balanced in a constant tug of war and sometimes one state wins and sometimes another, depending on the outside stimulus. Hiroki Misawa and colleagues at the University of Tokushima, Japan, focused a laser beam at the center of a cylinder of polymer gel and found that within an instant, the rods, middle shrank in diameter, turning it into a dumbbell. When they shut the laser off, the middle snapped back to its original width. The transformation of the gels are entirely reversible, the same as human reptilian shape-shifting. Arizona says she saw members of the British royal family, the Windsors, shape-shift into reptiles many times. Princess Diana's close confidant Christine Fitzgerald told me that the Windsors wanted to interbreed with Diana's genes, blonde-haired, blue eye, because they were in danger of becoming too reptilian in their DNA and would not have been able to maintain a human form for many more generations. You can see how different Prince William looks to the rest of them because he had an infusion of his mother's Nordic-dominated DNA. Christine Fitzgerald said that Diana's private name for the Windsors was the reptiles and the lizards and she used to say in all seriousness they're not human. It was the reptilian bloodlines and their networks that killed the princess in a ritual murder on an ancient site of ritual to the goddess Diana originally created by the reptilian Merovingians. This desperation for blood could well account for the mystery of cattle mutilations around the world in which the animal is bled dry and reports of the bloodsucking. Chupacabra in Puerto Rico, Mexico, Florida, and the Pacific Northwest also fit the reptilian description. Many of these reports and outbreaks of bloodsucking activity have coincided with UFO sightings in the same area. Another explanation for the descriptions of humans turning into reptilians is that the viewer's psyche tunes into the fourth-dimensional level and sees the reptilian form hiding within. The three-dimensional body, or the fourth-dimensional reptilian lowers its vibrational state to briefly enter our physical frequency range. I will go into this aspect of the story in a later chapter. Feeding off human blood is not the only desire of these vampires. The reptilians also feed off human emotional energy. The more emotion we can be manipulated to project through fear and all its manifestations, the more energy they can absorb and recycle against us. Researcher Alan Walton who writes under the name Branton, has uncovered the same themes, aside from any territorial paternal instinct on the part of the Draconians to reconquer their home planet. Some of the worst reptilian subspecies have an even more sinister motive. These are the vampirial types, who actually seek to feed off of human emotional energies and life force, essence in order to acquire the energy that they apparently need not only to infiltrate our world but also our dimension, having genetically engineered themselves along more warrior instinct. Lines, what little connection they might have had to a spiritual side has been all but eliminated, and they are motivated only by the predatory instinct of their collective, which apparently knows only one agenda, conquer, assimilate, consume. All this has been confirmed by many abductees, especially in more recent years. The silent invasion, back to the emerald tablets, in the form of man moved they amongst us, but only to sight, were they as our men, serpent-headed when the glamour was lifted, but appearing to man as men among. Men, crept they into the councils, taking form that were like unto men, slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms, taking their form and ruling o'er men. Only by magic could they be discovered, only by sound could their faces be seen, sought they, from the kingdom of shadows, to destroy man and rule in his place. That is a wonderful summary of what has happened and is still happening, as in Atlantis, so still today. The Illuminati manipulate their bloodlines into positions of power the councils and take over those bodies for themselves. It is what we call possession. The rituals conducted by the Illuminati-controlled secret societies, like the Freemasons, Knights of Malta, Knights Templar, etc., are one way. This is done. The top Illuminati bloodlines know who they are, but many of those lower down do not. These people, who unknowingly occupy a bloodline body, are invited into the secret society web and taken through initiation rituals that 
vast majority of them do not begin to understand. These rituals, especially the more advanced ones, are designed to create a vibrational environment in which the fourth-dimensional reptilians can possess the body. As the initiate progresses through the levels, he undergoes ever more powerful rituals directed by the black arts, which, step by step, give the fourth-dimensional entity more power over the person's thought and emotional processes until the reptilian is in complete control, in other words slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms, taking their form, and ruling or men. These are the people who become the presidents, prime, ministers, banking and business tycoons, media owners, and others who run or administer the Anunnaki agenda, although the most powerfully reptilian are those who dictate from behind the scenes, sought they from the kingdom of shadows, lower fourth dimension, to destroy man, and rule in his place, exactly, snake and sound. Only by magic could they be discovered, only by sound could their faces be seen. But, know ye, the masters were mighty in magic, able to lift the veil from the face of the serpent, able to send him back to his place. Came they to man and taught him the secret, the word that only a man can pronounce. Swift then they lifted the veil from the serpent and cast him forth from place among men. I have learned from a number of sources that the key to lifting this veil from the Face of the serpent is a sound frequency that disrobes the illusion of human form to reveal their reptilian nature. It resonates a vibration that prevents them from holding their human codes open. This same theme can be found in the movie. They live, the creation of director, John Carpenter. If you follow his movie making career it is obvious that this guy knows the score. They live, which I thoroughly recommend to get a visual feel for what I am saying, is about an extraterrestrial race that takes over the planet while hiding in human form. They control in exactly the same way as the Illuminati, through secret societies and mind conditioning. In the end, the heroes of the movie reveal the scam when they break the vibrational sound, frequency that is maintaining the illusion that those in power are human. Immediately that vibration is destroyed, the president and others in power and influence shift into their true form and the people can see who is really ruling them. They live as available through the book in section of my website. When we find the right sound frequency the same will happen among those in power today. When, it does, can I be wherever the Windsors are, please, seek not the kingdom of shadows, for evil will surely appear. For only the master of brightness shall conquer the shadow of fear. Know ye, O my brother, that fear is an obstacle great, be master of all in the brightness. The shadow will soon disappear. Hear ye, and heed my wisdom, the voice of light is clear, seek the valley of shadow, and light only will appear. Those who dabble in what has become known as the occult open themselves, to manipulation by the lower fourth dimension, that home for many misguided, malevolent, entities, and the origin of the legends and tales of demons and evil spirits. In fact, the word occult has been given an unfairly bad name. It merely means hidden and the same knowledge can be used for good or ill. Again, vibrations are the key. If you use the occult knowledge with love in your heart, and with positive intent, you maintain a high vibration and so connect with that level of consciousness. If you use it without understanding, like those who play with Ouija boards, or with ill intent, you connect yourself with the vibrational range that this represents, the lower fourth dimension. The emphasis in the tablets on living without fear is also a vital point. As I have been saying in my books, videos, and talks for many years, the world is controlled by fear. The fear of what others think of us, fear of death, fear of being alone, fear of poverty, fear for our families and children, fear of war. The list is endless. The emotion of fear resonates to the frequency range of the lower fourth dimension and so when we are consumed by fear we are much easier for the entities on that dimension to influence and control. So the Illuminati continually create situations, structures, and events, like wars, designed to keep the people in fear of so many kinds. Also, when we generate fear, that energy can be absorbed by the fourth dimensional entities, resonating to the same frequency and they use this increased power to recycle back against us in further control. Fear connects us to them and feeds them energy. In ages past were they conquered by the masters, driven below to the place whence they came, but some there were who remained, hidden in spaces and plains, unknown to man. Live they in Atlantis as shadows, but at times they appeared among men. I, when the blood was offered, forth came they to dwell among men. Out of the great deep were they called by the wisdom of earth man, called for the purpose of gaining great power. Some researchers suggest that this reptilian faction was banished from the earth in the far distant past by closing the interdimensional portals, which allowed them to move into this density very easily. These portals are points on the Earth's energy grid where the third and fourth dimensions can connect and these are often the places held most sacred by the ancients. The portals are similar in theme, if not detail, to the one featured in the film Stargate, which, you may recall, was the story of an ancient Egyptian people controlled by high-tech extraterrestrial gods. A hey. theme of the Atlantis legends is that groups with the advanced knowledge began to use it malevolently and it was then that they reopened the portals and allowed 
these fourth-dimensional beings to flood back into this reality. One major portal appears to be in the Caucasus Mountains in southern Russia, northern Turkey, a region that constantly comes up in my research. These important centers for the bloodlines and the Illuminati will also be connected to the underground settlements of their masters. Also, the Satanists and their rituals summon these lower, fourth-dimensional entities into their presence by creating the vibrational doorways that allow them to manifest. Words, colors, and symbols all vibrate. Energy, everything does, and the secret rituals use the combinations that have the required vibrational effect. This is why the Illuminati today conduct the same rituals to the same deities that the ancients did. They must do so because they include the necessary word-color-symbol combinations to unlock the vibrational door. Researcher Alan Walton writes, some claim that the Krolian rituals and Montauk projects have been very useful to them in tearing holes in the fabric of space-time that separates our dimension from theirs. I think that nuclear explosions since the 1950s have also had the effect of opening the stargates. As the emerald tablets say, yet, beware, the serpent still, lieth in a place that is open, at times, to the world lower fourth dimension. Access through the stargates, unseen they walk among the in places where the rites have been said. Illuminati rituals to open the stargates, again as time passes onward, shall they take the semblance of men which they have. The depiction of the devil is very like the descriptions of the reptilian royalty known as the Draco and in the biblical text the devil. Satan is clearly said to have been reptilian. One example is this description in the book of Revelation of St. Michael, a Phoenician deity, defeating the dragon. The second paragraph here could easily be describing the sealing of the interdimensional portals through which the reptilians enter this dimension, the same theme you find in the emerald tablets, or, just as easily, it could refer to the imprisonment of the serpent race within the earth. And the great dragon was cast down, the old serpent, he that is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was cast down to earth and his angels were cast down with him. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into the abyss, and shut it, and sealed it over him, that he should deceive the nations no more. There were, and are, physical reptilians and other entities also within the earth, as I outlined earlier, and this biblical passage could relate to the references in the emerald tablets to the reptilians being driven below to the place whence they came and out of the great deep where they called. It is said of the Nephilim, and the giant titans under their different names that they were banished into the earth and out of the sunlight. One mind-controlled survivor says he learned that the reptilians were the first to colonize the earth and that is why they consider it. Theirs, Credo Mutwa, from the African accounts, says precisely the same and I have heard this from many other sources. They suggest, along with other researchers, that another, more human group, arrived and won a surface battle with the reptilians who went underground to escape. This is one origin of the symbolism in the ancient theme of hell and Satan being located underground. This more human group was the blue-eyed blondes. The mind-control victim believes that this battle happened some 200,000 years ago. He adds, the original reptilians are coming back, they are here now, and the ones who remained on this planet developed their own little subculture, which went against what the overall plan was, and now they're afraid of their own people. There's a lot of scurrying around, if you want to call it that, to protect against the original population. That's coming back and there's going to be a gigantic battle on this planet in the next few years. I think there's going to be war and the human reptilian hybrids that are here are going to defend themselves against the originals the true breads. These claims and the themes of the emerald tablets point yet again to an ancient conflict between reptilians and the Nordics from various locations in the galaxy. More historial, who claims to have found the emerald tablets, said that after a lecture in California he was approached by two blonde-haired, blue-eyed men who invited him to visit an underground city under Mount Shasta in northern California. Researchers and informants have called this city Telos, a Greek word that means uttermost purpose. Doriel says that his visits to underground societies, especially a center for ancient records under the Himalayas, showed him the true history of this planet. He says that ancestors of the Scandinavians once lived in a tropical region that is now the Gobi Desert in China, Mongolia. They developed a technological society that included nuclear energy and the flying machines the Vedic records call Vimanas. These Nordics were constantly challenged by a race of reptilian shapeshifters based in the then subtropical Antarctica. Doriel says he learned it is certainly true that the Pleiades, Nordics, and Orion, reptilians, are said in ancient texts to be, at least symbolically, associated with death and destruction on Earth. Antarctica is where, apparently, some Nazis fled after the war and there are many tales of an underground base there. Doriel says he was shown how these chameleon reptilians infiltrated human societies in their battle for control of the planet. One way these shapeshifters were exposed, he says, is by a language test. 
it was discovered that the reptilians found it impossible to pronounce the word kin in Ijin. Go on, I bet you can't resist it. Doriel says that in a desperate effort to stop the reptilians, the Nordics launched a super weapon at Antarctica. He suggests that the enormous explosion shook the earth and made it wobble on its axis. The poles shifted in fantastic, cataclysmic events ensued. Other reptilian colonies survived underground. One location, according to researcher Alan Walton, could have been the caverns of Petalas. Hindu tradition says this is a seven-leveled underground society, stretching from Benares in India to Lake Manasar or in Tibet. Walton says that some local people have allegedly encountered the reptilian Nagas in this region and seen their flying craft entering and leaving the mountains. Morris Doriel says that the Nordics also moved much of their civilization underground, especially into the underground networks known in the east as Agharta. The conflicts have continued between them, but there has also been collaboration between these reptilian peoples and factions of the Nordics. Robert E. Dickhoff in his book, Agharta tells of a Tibetan monk who learned that in Alliance of reptilians and human black magicians were causing chaos and destruction in the surface societies by projecting malevolent energy fields into the people's minds, using what we call witchcraft, the manipulation of energy. Dickoff says that the monk led 400 warrior monks into the caverns to do battle with this serpent cult of humans and reptilians. This theme of a serpent cult battling with the Nordic humans can also be found in an ancient British work called the Edda, translated by La Wada in the first half of the 20th century. He knew nothing of extraterrestrial reptilians and Nordics, and yet his translations give much support to this ancient tussle for power on the planet. They also confirm another aspect of the Illuminati reptilian ritual, the worship of their goddess. Chapter 9. The Dragon Queens. If you tell the truth you don't have to remember anything. Mark Twain. The Illuminati appear on the surface to be a male-dominated operation, but, in fact, the high priestess is as important in their rituals as the high priest and at the heart of Illuminati symbolism is the worship of the goddess. The Serpent Goddess The New Age movement wants a return of the goddess because it is equated with female energy and releasing women from suppression. On that level, so do I but it is vital for New Agers and others to understand that this is not the goddess symbolism the Illuminati and their placemen talk about. They just want you to think it is. The Serpent Goddess is known under countless names around the world, including Diana, Artemis, Athene, Semiramis, Barati, Britannia, Hecate, Re, Persephone, First Serpent and so on. These same names have also been used to symbolize esoteric concepts like the phases of the moon and female energy. But at its foundation this goddess worship of the Illuminati would seem to relate to the DNA transmitted through the female and possibly originating in the constellation of Orion. I have heard this DNA source symbolized in various cultures as the Dragon Queens the Orion Queen or Queens, and the Snake Mother. From what I am told by insiders and serious researchers, the full-blown reptilian society has its own version of queen bees, which produce the eggs from which the bloodlines and their offshoots originate. Artemis, a key Illuminati goddess, is depicted with eggs all over her chest and she is associated with bees, one of the prime symbols of the Merovingian bloodline. So connected to Artemis, Diana worship is the bee in the hive. You also find this symbolism in Freemasonry. The reptilians and greys have been described over and over by abductees and experiences as having a kind of swarm or hive mentality. Very much like bees. And they have worked to make the human race a mirror of that. Researcher Franz Camp also came across this theme of the bee queen as a herd. The memories of the herd, swarm are transferred to them by the female, queen. A chemical substance, hormone pheromones is required. For this in the same way as melatonin is needed for more intuition. Interdimensional. Connection. The memories are the typical rules of behavior of the herd. An animal is pure subconscious. He lives on intuition. We call that paranormal. We humans use our brains. We think that brains do everything. The rest is instinct. Well, instinct is subconscious. Our DNA knows everything. Your DNA, subconscious, keeps you alive, not your brains. As the Orion people are still animals in the fourth density, they are, by their collective subconscious, connected with each other by their queen, the Orion queen. Every swarm has its own queen. She has the pure bloodline. Dot, dot, dot. The mitochondrial DNA is only transferred by women and is the strongest DNA there is. I have been told many times that the DNA carried by the female in the reptilian bloodlines is the most important to them and the symbolism of the goddess and the serpent have been linked since ancient times. Sir Lawrence Gardner is a spokesman for the Imperial Royal Dragon Court, an order that represents the interests of the dragon bloodline seated by the DNA of the dragon queens. He says that this symbolism and the theme of the Dragon Queens goes back to the founding mother of the Anunnaki he calls Tiamat, 
The sea dragon in Mesopotamian accounts, these queens, he suggests, were commonly represented as mermaids, and were often called ladies of the lake. Throughout the land settled by the former Atlantean Lemurian peoples you find the worship of the serpent goddess and her serpent son, who is often symbolized as a bull. James Churchward reveals from ancient tablets and artwork that Lemurians worshipped the goddess called Queen Mu, and that Lemuria, Mu was called the motherland. Around the Mediterranean the priest kings were known as the children of the serpent goddess. In this same region, temples and mystery schools were created in her name, most notably the Temple of Artemis, Diana at Ephesus in Turkey, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, Turkey, Greece, and the islands of Samothrace, Cyprus, and Crete were among the main centers of the goddess cult. Samothrace, the sacred isle, seems to have been the headquarters for this in the Mediterranean. Aegean region, here the rites of the sisterhood of daughters of the goddess Hecate were performed. She was depicted with snake feet and snakes for hair. Dogs, the sacred animal to Hecate, were sacrificed to her in these rituals during the dark phase of the moon. This emphasis on the dog and Hecate myth could connect her symbolically to the dog star Sirius. A base for the reptilians, in Colchis, that ancient Egyptian settlement at the foot of the Caucasus Mountains. There was a cemetery sacred to Hecate. Jason of the Argonaut legends was said to have offered a sacrifice to Hecate at Colchis. Colchis Tur is the oldest recorded town in England and its first Roman capital. The Illuminati Satanic Network continues to perform sacrifice rituals to Hecate and this goddess was massively part of the symbolism surrounding the ritual murder of Princess Diana. As explained in The Biggest Secret, indeed, Diana could well have been a sacrifice to Hecate, the triple-headed goddess with the symbolism of Sirius, Sirius B. And Sirius C. The name, Hecate, literally means 100. Both Sirius B and C take 50 years to orbit Sirius A and the symbolism of 100, the dual orbit of the twins was often used as code for the Sirius system, according to Robert Temple in The Sirius Mystery. It is also important to note that, as Temple points out, the ancient Egyptian word and hieroglyph for goddess also means serpent, and their hieroglyph for Sirius also means tooth. Thus the stories of the serpent's tooth can be read as the goddess Sirius. The Egyptian word for tooth also means dog and, more specifically, dog god. And 100, the Minoan civilization on Crete, part of the Sumer Empire was another serpent bull culture. They called its line of Aryan Minos, kings the sons of the serpent goddess, because, once again, the Aryan line is the purest of the reptilian hybrids. These were the serpent kings who ruled Atlantis and the later Sumer Empire. Ancient Crete, as with other connected centers, was famous for its labyrinth, a word meaning house of the double axe or house of the serpent goddess. Greece was another serpent goddess culture. They called her Athene and at Delphi, the oracles would speak the words of the serpent goddess. Known, there is Delphinia. The oracle would go into a trance state while staring into the eyes of a snake. She would also use cannabis and chew laurel leaves, the sacred herb of the goddess or pythoness. The laurel leaves are used by the Illuminati in the symbol of Freemasonry and the logo of United Nations, in which they frame an Earth broken into an esoterically significant 33 segments. Pythagoras, the famous Greek hero and mathematician, grew up in the mysteries of the serpent. Goddess cult and his very name means I am the python or I am the serpent. DNA of the Dragon Queens. The author, Sir Lawrence Gardner, says that the ancient imperial royal dragon court and order can first be identified as the dragon court of ancient. Egypt under the patronage of the priest Prince Ankh from Khonsu in about 2170 BC. It later became a pharaonic institution thanks to Queen Sopnifru and operated as a sort of royal academy, a unique assembly of science and scholarship. That's according to its official website. Anyway, the Dragon Court was relaunched in the 15th century as the Hungarian Court of the Dragon and was strongly connected with Dracula. Gardner calls himself Chevalier de Saint Germain and attaché to the Grand Protectorate of the Imperial and Royal Dragon. Court and Order, Ordo Dragonis, Sarkany Rend, 1408. He loves titles, Old Larry. He has written a number of books, including Bloodline of the Holy Grail Element. Books, Shaftesbury, Dorset, 1996, in which he claims that the Merovingians and their offshoots, like the British House of Stuart, were seated by Jesus and Mary Magdalene. This is not the case, as we'll see, although there could be some symbolic truths in the theme of a Jesus and Mary bloodline. Gardner, in my view, knows far more than he is telling, although, if you read between the lines, he's already telling quite a lot. He has been given great prominence by the Australia-based Nexus magazine, which claims to expose how the world is manipulated. Gardner says that bloodlines, the Dragon Kings, were specially conceived by the Anunnaki to rule on their behalf. He says that they drank menstrual blood, known as star fire, but he doesn't mention the blood they drink from the victims of human sacrifice right to this day. The drinking of menstrual blood, symbolized as red meat or red wine, 
goes back to the dawn of history and many ancient calendars were based on the moon menstrual cycle. The Greeks called it ambrosia, supernatural red wine of the goddess Hera, while in India it was soma, the food of the gods, and in Persia, Hayama. They believed the menstrual blood was sacred and the life essence that could bring immortality. Sir Lawrence Gardner calls the Anunnaki bloodlines the dragon bloodlines, but claims that this derives only from the use of crocodile fat in the royal ceremonies of ancient Egypt. Right, Larry, and I can hang by my willy from a hot air balloon. He dismisses any idea that these bloodlines are reptilian shapeshifters, although he acknowledges that such claims were made in ancient times. He said in a Nexus magazine article that he found it hard to imagine that anyone could still believe such stories in these more enlightened times. MMMM. The records of Sumer, Gardner says, reveal that the Anunnaki had a creation chamber to produce these royal bloodlines and he says that the senior line of descent was determined by the mitochondrial DNA of the Dragon Queens. Gardner talks of the blood royal or Sangral in the womb of the Dragon Queen. Other texts in France called this bloodline, Le Serpent Rouge the Red Serpent or the Serpent Blood 10 the female or goddess. DNA is most definitely the key here. Rens Le Shadow, the Cathars or Albigensians, who were slaughtered by the Roman Church in the 13th century, were supporters of the elven or dragon bloodline. According to Gardner, a female elf was called an Alba, he says, and this is the inspiration for Albi, the main city of the Cathars or Ligensians, in their stronghold in the Languedoc, region of southern France. Gens, as we saw earlier, relates to tribe and is used to. This day is a code for the bloodlines. The Cathars appeared to be close to the Knights Templar, who also had a major presence in that same area around the mysterious mountaintop village of Rens le Chateau. Could this mountain have been an inner earth entrance to a reptilian base? It certainly seems to be an interdimensional doorway. I have been all around there and the whole area has a very strange vibe. The horrific slaughter of the Cathars by armies of Pope Innocent III in the Roman Church ended with the siege of their mountaintop fortress at Monsiger in 1244. Gardner's contention is that the Roman Church destroyed the dragon succession when it removed the Merovingians from power in the 8th century and began to appoint its own monarchs, including Charlemagne. In what later became France, Gardner says that the Church also suppressed the female and worship of the goddess, dragon queen, with its male-dominated religion. I beg to differ. We shall see that while the Roman Church and Christianity in general is an outwardly male religion, it is secretly a continuation of pagan goddess worship. Also, the reptilian bloodlines constantly fight with each other for power. And the Roman Church, Charlemagne, and the Merovingians were different expressions of the same reptilian bloodlines battling with each other to be top dog, as usual. The British Edda, the story of a battle between the Nordics and a reptilian force for control of the planet is told in some considerable detail in the Edda. The epic ancient British account of the events in Sumer and elsewhere, translated by La Wado, the emphasis by the serpent cult on the female is also confirmed. The Edda text was found in Iceland in the 12th century and was believed by scholars to be of Icelandic and Scandinavian origin. Waddell reveals in his book, British Edda, Christian Book, Club, California, 1929, that it is actually written in Old Britain, a language closely linked to Old English, Anglo-Saxon, and Eastern Gothic. And Gothic came from the Sumerian, which came from Atlantis, Lemuria. The Edda is not of Icelandic origin but British. It was taken to Iceland, it appears, by settlers from Scotland, Orkney, the Hebrides, and North Britain. Among them were the Chaldees, who had their headquarters at St Andrews in Scotland, an area with strong Illuminati connections. To this day, the Chaldees came from Chaldees, a people who followed the Sumer Empire in Mesopotamia and worshipped the mother-son cult in which they claimed that God's son had died to save them. This was long before Christianity. And, of course, these northern lands of Europe were the realms of the Nordics who went south to the Near and Middle East thousands of years ago before returning as yes. the Sumerians, the Phoenicians, and the Egyptians. Scholars have misrepresented the Edda, not least because an Icelander called Snorri Sturluson, 1179-1241, included his translations of this text in his own work. This led to the erroneous idea that he had compiled it, but he merely used sections from it and mistranslated them to a large extent. He mistook the titles and personal names of the same person to be names of different people and the whole meaning was lost. Waddle again used his knowledge of ancient languages to retranslate the Edda and he says it tells the story of events in ancient Troy and Cappadocia, both now in Turkey and the Danube Valley in Europe. These events and their heroes and villains became foundations for myths and legends throughout the former Sumer Empire and later entered the texts that became the Bible. 
You are going to be hit by a stream of names, symbols, and connections in this chapter. You might get a headache in the next few minutes, but understanding how different names and titles refer to the same people can unlock so many mysteries. The themes running through this chapter and the names, titles, and symbols I will introduce are the battle between the Nordics and the Reptilians or Serpent, cult, the interbreeding between the Nordic and Reptilian bloodlines, and the fundamental importance of the goddess to the Reptilians. Le Waddell first began to see the connections between apparently unconnected people and events during his early days in India while studying Hindu history and mythology. He noticed that Eindri, the name used in the Edda text for the European and Norse god, called Thor, was remarkably close to the Hindu god, Indra. The Indian Vedas, which were inspired by the Lemurian and Sumerian legends and accounts, describe Indra as tall, fair, invincible, and armed with a bolt. This is how Eindri or Thor is described in the Edda and Waddell concluded from considerable research that the European god, Thor, and the Hindu god, Indra, were the same person, and that this guy was also the first Aryan king of Sumer. The Vedas connect Indra to the Greek, god Zeus, also known as Jupiter. Some Sanskrit scholars regarded Indra as the same as Jupiter and suggested that he was a heroic human king who had led the early Aryans or Nordics to victory against the serpent cult. Waddell produces a stream of evidence to show that the Hindu god, Indra, and the European, Thor, after whom we get Thursday or Thor's day, are the same person or deity. He also says that the legend of Thor is the origin of the legends of King Arthur. Thor is known in the Edda as her Thor, which became Arthur. Both her and Ar come from the same root meaning, Aryan. The mist began to clear even further when Waddell observed that the name of the first Aryan king of the Sumerians in ancient Mesopotamia had the name of Indara, Indur, Intur, or King Tur. This, Waddell says, later became Thor of Northern Europe and Prometheus of the Greeks. Indara was the traditional founder of civilization and was deified by the Sumerians. He was said to have defeated the demons and slayed the serpent dragon and the giants, and his Sumerian titles are identical in the Sumerian and the Edda, where he appears as Eindri or Thor. Like Thor, Indara was also portrayed with a hammer. By the Sumerians, the fairy story of Jack and the Beanstalk or Jack the Giant Slayer comes from the tales of Indara, Thor. A title for Thor in the Edda is Sig or Ig, which, in Sumerian and Cappadocian inscriptions, is spelt Zag or Zak. This is the origin of the modern name, Jack. Waddle writes of Indara. The Sumerian records regarding him date continuously back to the inscription on his sacred trophy bow, or holy grail by his great-grandson, about 3245 BC they contain fairly full details of the personality and exploits of himself, his queen and son champion knight, and his warrior clan of guts or goths, with their portraits chiseled on stone and engraved on their sacred seals, representing them as wearing horned hats. Like the European Goths, ancient Britons and Anglo-Saxons, and like the Edic heroes, in medieval art, the goat and deer metaphors, pictographic of his name, are freely applied to him by the Sumerians and the Hittites, just as they are to Thor in the Edda, and his capture and consecration of the sacred bowl or holy grail is in agreement with that by Thor or her Thor in the Edda, Indra's sacred rowan tree, guarded by goats, is pictured by the Sumerians and the Nordic Aryan Hittites and Cappadocians, and this is precisely described as Thor's Yggdrasil rowan tree in the Edda. Waddell presents more than 100 seals and sculptures from Sumer and the Hittites that portray scenes described in the British Edda. He says he could have published 300. There is no doubt, he says, that King Thor or Arthur were other names for the first historical Sumerian king, Indara. Later renditions of the King Arthur story lost these connections and became an invented, though highly symbolic, fable. In Egypt, Waddell says, Indara was known by the title of Asari, which became Osiris, the leading deity in the Egyptian worship of the sun. Osiris was often depicted as a blue-eyed Aryan. Just as Indara was, King Indara, Dura or Tur of Sumer, Indra of India, Thor or Indri or Anvara, of the Edda, Osiris of Egypt, and the original version of King Arthur, are all the same person, Wado contends. So, he says, is Dardanos, the first king of Troy in Homer's Iliad. Thor was known as Dan and from this same root you get Danub and Danmark, the Danish spelling for Denmark. The name relates to the Danons, who originated in Atlantis. The British Israelite movement claims that the lost tribes of Israel, especially the tribe of Dan, moved out of the Middle East and settled in the British Isles and Europe. This, they claim, led to the names Danub and Danmark and therefore makes the British and their genetic kin God's chosen people. They have, however, completely lost the plot, I would suggest. Not least, because they are obsessed with the idea that the Bible is accurate. It is not. The Edda says that Thor, Dan, and his Aryans went from Europe in the first place to settle in Turkey and Mesopotamia and found the civilization of Sumer. That is precisely what happened, 
as I indicated earlier. It also says that the Aryans of the Danube Valley were already well in advance of the rest of the world before they went down to Mesopotamia. The Danube Valley is very significant to the bloodlines. The Danube is the second longest river in Europe and runs from Germany through Romania, Dracula country, and into the Black Sea. The Edda says that Thor fought and defeated the serpent worshippers of Phrygia in Turkey, a word that comes from the Sumerian name Firig or Pirig, and it means literally land of the lions. Thor is depicted on ancient carvings symbolically fighting and taming lions in this battle with the Phrygians and so we have the symbolic Hebrew story of Daniel taming the lion. Thor was also Medes, the king who turned everything into gold with the Medes' touch. His victory over the Phrygians was commemorated in those ancient lands in a monument known as Tomb of Medes, although it is not actually a tomb. On it are nine enormous crosses of St. George, another name for Thor and Dara, and dates to about 1000 BC. The Red Cross, one of the common themes from Lemuria, Atlantis, through Sumer. To the present, De Illuminati is the use of the sun cross as a symbol. This cross is the origin of the Christian cross with Jesus, as we shall see, symbolizing the sun at the center. The sun cross, or red cross, was found drawn in red pigment in the alleged tomb of the Sumerian Egyptian emperor, means, Waddell says. This is the same symbol that became the cross of St. George and later the flag of England after Sumerian Phoenicians settled there. The red sun cross is also the symbol of the Knights Templar secret society which has played a major role in the story of the bloodlines over hundreds of years and, of course, it is the logo of the Red Cross organization, which, as I outline in The Biggest Secret, is an Illuminati creation to allow them to manipulate within countries during wars and other events behind the cover of humanitarian aid. The vast majority of genuine Red Cross workers are not aware of this. The Red Cross was also flown on the ships of Christopher Columbus, an Illuminati frontman, whom historians still insist discovered the Americas. The Red Cross or Sun Cross was originally written as a T and this became the T-square of Freemasonry, or the Tau Cross, displayed cross known as the Maltese Cross. So, the loved of British royalty was also found depicted in caves within this same Sumer Empire. This is today the symbol of the Knights of Malta, formerly the Knights, Hospitaller of St. John of Jerusalem and the Knights of Rhodes. The Knights of Malta are another elite and extremely sinister secret society, and they have been around for the same period as the Knights Templar. The ruling bloodlines and their secret society web, the Illuminati, are obsessed with symbolism and ritual and, as I have indicated, they use the same symbols and ceremonies today that their ancestors did who ruled the Sumer Empire, Atlantis, and Lemuria, the Serpent Trinity. The Edda tells the story of how Thor and Dara fought a constant battle with the Serpent Cult. The text equates Saint George, the Dragon Slayer of Cappadocia, with the European god, Thor, who was also a dragon slayer. Both were said to have fought the serpent dragons of the abyss their underground cavern, systems and bases. In the Edda, the serpent cult engages in human sacrifice and blood drinking. Same old story, and again we see the theme of the Nordics or Aryans in conflict with the serpent people. The Edda says there were three main leaders of this serpent cult. They were the serpent goddess known as El, her consort, the male entity called Wadden. Vatan was the Atlantean fire god and their son, Baldur or Baldur. This was the serpent trinity of mother, father, son. El was also known as Eldi or Fiery El, the hound, and, highly significantly, as Mary. From this cult and Fiery El came the term Hell, burning in Hell, and fires of Hell. El or Hell was the Norse queen of the underworld and her followers became known as kinsmen of Hell. In medieval times, this was symbolized as the harlequin, the lover of the maiden Columbine the dove. Columba, Columbine, and the symbol of the dove are all other names and symbols. For El, the serpent or dragon queen of the Edda. The more I research, the more the world that exists under our feet becomes increasingly significant. The underground hell is supposed to be the place of judgment and eternal punishment where the devil and evil spirits dwell beneath the earth. The longer we go on, the more you will see how relevant this is to the races and bloodlines that manipulate this world. El is the Hebrew name for God and she was also known as Heidi and Ida. The Elohim, the gods of the Old Testament, were the race of El, a dragon queen. The Greeks knew El as Artemis, the cruel mother goddess, who demanded human sacrifice. Artemis, also known as Diana, was the major deity of the Merovingians. Artemis was symbolized with bees, as is the Merovingian bloodline. It is the same with other versions of the goddess like Demeter, the pure mother bee, and a symbol of Aphrodite was a golden honeycomb. Her priestess was given the name Melissa, or Queen Bee. The word honeymoon comes from this. It spanned a lunar month, normally in May, which was named after the Virgin Maya, another version of El. The honeymoon would include the menstrual period of the bride and the combination of menstrual blood, and honey was once thought to be the elixir of life. El is also the inspiration for the children's stories of Mother Hubbard or Mother Huber, 
as she was to the Babylonians. Mother Hubbard was distressed because she couldn't find a bone for her. her dog, a domesticated wolf mother Huber, also Tiawat, was described as the plague, the fearful dragon, the dragon which shines brightly, the female spirit, who devours with a serpent's mouth, the other members of the serpent trinity in the Edda, Consort Wadden and Son Balder, were major gods of the reptilian-controlled Nazis. The Nazis were the creation of the Teutonic Knights Network. Illuminati, in Germany which has always been associated with the highly significant reptilian bloodline known as the Habsburgs. The Teutonic Knights operated in the same holy land in the same period as the Knights Templar and the Knights of Malta and they worked to the same reptilian agenda. Wadden and Balder were national deities of the Teutons. The legendary founder of the Maya culture in Mexico was also called Vatan or Wadden. The Amazons. The Edda refers to the serpent cult as the Amazons, the wolf tribe, and the Valkyrs, and here we have the meaning of the musical work called The Ride of the Valkyries, composed by Richard Wagner. Hitler once said that to understand the Nazis, you must understand Wagner. The Amazons in ancient myth were a tribe of warrior women who expressed the characteristics traditionally associated with men. The legend is rampant in Greek mythology, which was inherited from Sumerian mythology, and the Amazons were known as the Valkyries in northern Europe the warrior maidens from Valhalla. The Greek historian, Herodotus, said, the Amazons were enemies of the Greeks and he claimed that they lived in the steppelands of the Ukraine and southern Russia, once known as Scythia and Sauromatia. Soro equals lizard and Mater equals mother. Other areas claimed for their homeland are Lycia, Phrygia, and Cappadocia, all of which are named in the Edda, Accounts, and Taurus, Lemnos and Lebos, hence lesbian. The foothills of the Caucasus Mountains in southern Russia was a major location for the Amazons and this would seem to have been a major center for the interbreeding of the Nordics. With the reptilian bloodlines, Libya is another place of Amazon legend and in those days Libya referred to the whole of North Africa, except for Egypt. The Amazon River and region in South America was named after these women when a Portuguese explorer in the 16th century found fighting women there. Legends and accounts depict the Amazons as a nomadic people dominated by women and they appeared to be extremely ritualistic. Strabo, the Greek geographer, said they would only mate during a special two-month period, just like animals do. Sex was strictly for the production of children. Among the gods and goddesses they worshipped was once again Artemis, a later name for Elevieta texts, and Hecate, the dark moon goddess and goddess of the infernal arts. It appears that Amazon means moon woman and this again fits with the Edda texts about the serpent cult, a very important location for the Amazons was Sauromatia, or Lizard Mother. This is in the region of the Black and Caspian Seas and bordered the Persian Empire, the land of the Magi initiates. Sauromatia has been connected to European nobility and we can now see why. One theory is that the coats of arms of Polish nobility, for instance, developed from magical signs of the Sauromatians or Sarmatians called Tamgus. In fact, Poland was often called Sarmatia or Sauromatia. Historical accounts say that the Amazons in Sauromatia bred with Scythian warriors. The Scythians were a Nordic Aryan people who moved into northern Europe from the Near and Middle East through the Caucasus Mountains and Sauromatia, and they included the bloodlines that became the Sicambrian, Franks and the Merovingians. Once again we have the theme of Nordic reptilian interbreeding. The fusion of the Amazon and Scythian language became known as Sauromatian. The Scythians worshipped the same goddess as the Amazons. They castrated themselves and wore women's clothing as part of their ritual to the goddess known by the Greeks as Artemis. One location for the Scythians was called Parsha or Virginland in deference to their goddess and when the Illuminati moved. And on America they used the same symbolism in naming Virginia. The idea that it was named after Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, is ludicrous. First of all, she was no more a virgin than Madonna. The Scythians were governed by priestess queens, who tended to be older women. In 1954 five kurgans or queen graves were found, in southern Russia at Pasarik. These priest queens performed sacrifices and caught the blood in sacred cauldrons, and went with the men into battle and cast spells. For victory, this again fits with the Edda texts and is almost certainly the origin of the witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth. In the Celtic legends the cauldron is associated with the underground world and has been symbolically connected to the womb of the death goddess. Using this theme, children of the bloodlines come out of the cauldron the womb of the women who carry royal blood, the reptilian DNA, the moon sickle used by the Scythians, the mythical weapon that castrated the gods, became known as the scythe and was associated with the grim reaper. Yet again the grim reaper refers to a goddess, Re, who was clothed in a garment of blood and devoured all of her offspring. The gods, she became the Celtic, goddess Rhiannon. Era, the Celtic name for Ireland, comes from the name of the goddess Erin, a form of hero or Re. The Berber people of North Africa have been associated with the Amazons and still call themselves Amazig. The Amazons included a tribe called the Nuri, who 
turned themselves into wolves. The term wolf tribe is associated with goddess worship or the she-wolf. This is probably a version of dog star worship, Sirius. Credo Mutwa says that the Zulu peoples have long called Sirius the star of the wolf and their ancient accounts say that a sea-dwelling fish people from Sirius came to the earth. They looked pretty human, but had skin like a reptile he says. Interestingly, the Edda reveals that the forebears of the Nordic peoples under the leadership of Thor and Dara were also members of the, the seafaring wolf tribe, and Irish tribe and Ossery were said to become wolf people while attending the Yuletide feast or ritual, and they devoured the flesh of cattle as wolves before regaining their human shape. This could all be symbolic or it could be connected to the phenomena of the werewolf which, according to some former Satanists, do exist. The legends of the troll or trolley demons also appear to be associated with the Amazons or Valkyries. This is the root of the word, troll, which means loose woman and the troll could have been a pagan hag or earth priestess. Norse myth says that the trolls waited under bridges waiting to eat those who crossed without making an offering. The Valkyries were said to guard the bridge to heaven or the Bifrost. Angels of death were said to attend a ritual called the troll a thing. Woden's day. Woden was the consort of the dragon queen, El, according to the Edda and he is a major figure in ancient myths. One of the older names for Wadden, also Watanur, Woden, is Bodo or Bada. This corresponds with the Sumerian name of Budu, Budu, or Budun, which means the serpent-footed. In Waddle's translation of the Edda, Wadden was an aboriginal chief of a moon and serpent dragon cult seeking to defeat the Nordic Aryans of Thor and Dara. We find the same story in the Indian. That is attributed to Indra, their name for Thor and Dara, who was said to have battled with Budnir or the bottom. Budnia was known as the great serpent of the bottom or deep. This was the Puthon or Python of the Greeks, says Waddell. Budnia and Wadden are the same character. In India, Wednesday or Woden's Day is known as Bud. Interesting how close that is to Buddha. And, according to Waddell, Buddha is a derivative of Woden and Buddha claimed to have had several former births as a serpent. The Indian Brahmins adopted the moon and serpent cult. So too, according to Waddell, did the Semitic priests of the Nile Valley. He says that they replaced the original sun worship of Asar or Osiris and deliberately introduced the serpent and sacrificial cult to Egyptian culture. Balder, who is Elend, Wadden's malicious son in the Edda, corresponds with the green man of the king. Arthur legend and Loki, the original of Lucifer. According to Waddell, he says that Balder is also Lancelot in the Arthur stories from his title in the Edda of the Lance Bearer. Like his mother, El, Balder has been depicted with wings. The mother-son cult of the serpent. Scene 1 in the Edda portrays a world awash with the violence, human sacrifice, and blood-drinking rituals of the mother-son cult of the serpent dragon. Scene 2 sees the arrival of the great reformer, the tall, red-bearded, Eindri or Thor, Indara, who brought civilization. Watto believes that he is also the origin of Adam and this part of the story, he says, is massively misrepresented in the Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden story in the Hebrew Old Testament. I think there is a lot more to the Adam and Eve story and what it represents than this, however, and I think if Waddell had been alive today he would have accepted that himself. I feel the Edda accounts include symbolic, as well as literal, accounts and some originated in Lemuria. Adam, as Thor, Indara, the serpent cult of the Edenites, Waddell's translations of the Edda say, if the serpent worshippers were operating in Mesopotamia before the Nordics arrived, it would certainly explain why the Ubaid culture, which preceded Sumer in the same area, buried their dead with figurines of serpent humanoids. Waddell's translation of the Edda tells of how Thor, the dragon slayer, established his capital in Cappadocia under the name St. George of the Red Cross, and thus we have the origin of St. George of Cappadocia, later of England. This was Thor, Indara yet again, says Waddell, and so was St. Andrew, the patron saint of Scotland, which came from Invara or Invari, another name for Thor. The story of George defeating the dragon can be found all over the world in various forms. In Egypt, George was the sun god, Ra, Thor, Indara, says Waddell. In India it was Indra, and in the Hebrew Old Testament, it was Adam, under his title, Laor Ja, who slayed the serpent, Thor or Goer, George, killed El, the matriarch of the serpent cult, the Edda tells us. And she was symbolized as the serpent dragon. Thus George, Thor, defeated the dragon. The story of George and the dragon symbolizes the battles with the reptilians located under the earth. The accounts in the British Edda are confirmed in great detail by depictions all over the former Sumer Empire. In a Babylonian seal dated to around 33 BC, L is pictured with the crescent moon of the serpent cult and Wadden is given the body of a serpent. Satanists worship the reptilians and also the moon, and have always done so. The inscription behind L in this Babylonian seal reads Ildi or Il the Shining. Yet another confirmation of the portrayal of reptilians as shining or luminous in some way. El or Ida is given the title of Ran in the Edda and this is the origin of the nursing serpent mother and matriarch, Ran T. 
in Egyptian myth, or vice versa, serpent cult symbolism. The obsession with Troy and the Trojan War by descendants of the Merovingian bloodline can be understood when you read the Edda. It tells of how Thor's Troy was raided by the Edenite serpent cult led by Wadden. The Phrygians were serpent worshippers before their defeat by Thor, and totems of the serpent cult were the lion and the wolf. This is why Phrygia means land of the lions. Still today the Illuminati use the lion profusely in their symbolism. Look at Britain and the British royal family alone. This same serpent cult, described in the Edda continues to manipulate the world to this day. We call it the Illuminati. The British royal family are reptilian host, possessed, entities who work for the serpent cult, Illuminati and we can now see the true symbolism of the royal crest with the lion facing a chained unicorn. The symbol of Thor, Indara and his Nordics was the goat and this later evolved into the unicorn. Thus we have the symbolism of the lion, controlling and imprisoning the tethered human race and their great enemies, the Nordics. Notice also the great similarity between the royal crest and that of the house of Rothschild, complete with lion, unicorn and fleur de lis. The Greek hero Prometheus is a version of Thor, Indara, Adam, according to Waddell, and he is depicted in chains being tortured by the gods, reptilians, for trying to educate humanity and give them illumination. He is often depicted holding the flame of knowledge, the coat of arms of the city of London, one of the global centers for the serpent. Cult today is the St. George's Cross being held, owned, controlled by two flying reptiles figure. 22. When you drive into the city alongside the River Thames, you pass two flying reptiles, holding the cross of St. George. As I mentioned before, the reptilian Rockefeller bloodline has placed a gold statue of Prometheus in the Rockefeller Center in New York. The heraldry and coats of arms of Poland are another example. They include the images found among all European royalty and aristocracy, the openly reptilian serpent, griffin, salamander, and caduceus, plus the sphinx and unicorn. Rule Britannia, the accounts in the Edda of the battles between the Nordics of Thor, Indara and the serpent cult of El, Wadden, and Baldr can explain many ancient and modern mysteries, symbols, and biblical texts. The Edda tells how Thor, Indara and the Nordic Aryans came down from the Danube region of Europe into the domain of the serpent cult in the Near and Middle East, especially the place known as Eden. After many battles between the Nordics and the serpent, called a peace treaty was agreed between the entity known as Thor, Indara divided by Adam and the leaders of the serpent cult, El, Wadden, and Baldr, the Edda tells us. There is a portrayal of a meeting between Thor, Indara, and El on a Babylonian seal of about 3000 BC. The peace treaty also led to marriage between Thor, Indara, Adam and a priestess of the serpent cult known as Eve or Gunifa, the Edda says. The story of the marriage of her Thor and his queen Ginevri is a version of this. Waddell suggests, he adds that Eve, despite being the chief vestal priestess of the serpent cult of Eden, was, nevertheless, a Gothic Aryan. However, the Edda says that she was a ward of El and born of the sea froth or sea foam kin. She was later represented by the Greeks as Aphrodite or sea froth, and Aphrodite was said to be born from the sea, the amphibious Anunnaki. The constant connection of the goddess with the sea can be seen with the Phoenician Barati, who became the British. Britannia, the famous British song rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves, is not about Britain, but the ancient goddess, which, under different names, has been worshipped by the Illuminati since ancient times. The seafaring wolf tribe, from which the Edda says the Aryans were also descended, was the serpent cult. Eve herself is described in the Edda as an Amazonian and a Valkyr, the same as the other serpent worshippers. So could it be that this marriage of Adam and even the Edda was symbolic of the interbreeding between those of the Nordic and reptilian bloodlines that became known as the Aryans and the Serpent Kings. Their wedding procession described in the Edda can be seen on Hittite rock sculptures dating to around 3000 BC in King Thor, Indara, Adam's old capital of Tyria, which is now Bagaz Khoi in Turkey. Adam and Eve are depicted exchanging a cross-like emblem and a globe object, which Wado says is an apple from the Rowan or Mountain Ash Tree. This tree was Thor, Indara, Adam's symbol for his tree of knowledge, and the apple from this tree could be the one in the Garden of Eden story, the forbidden fruit, he says. Im, the Edda, the serpent leader, El, taunts Eve for changing sides and becoming a priestess of the Rowan. The Edda refers to Eve as Idun, who dispenses life-giving apples to the Goths from their sacred tree. Idun was a Duni or Atuni to the Sumerians and this later became Athene, mother goddess of the Greeks. The Levite fairy tales. Waddell says the Levite priests of the Hebrews took this symbolism and produced the make-believe story of Adam and Eve with the serpent in the Garden of Eden in which they were punished for eating from the Tree of Knowledge, the Rowan tree, symbolic of the Nordic religion. 
The Levites were serpent worshippers of El and the Old Testament gods, the Elohim, were the reptilians of the serpent cult. The Edda also refers to the serpent cult as the Valkyrs of Ur and the Levites made their invented character of Abraham Hale from Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldeans were serpent worshippers, the Valkyrs. El also came from Ur according to the Edda, and she was known as Hrimni in the Edda and Armin, or Great Serpent by the Persians. This is fascinatingly close to the biblical Abraham. They associated Armin with Ishma. He was the origin of Asmodeus, the Christian demon, accused of possessing nuns and young women to make them lustful. Asmodeus is also the devil character mysteriously placed at the entrance to the church at rennes le chateau in Provence, southern France, which is a mass of Illuminati symbolism and includes references to the Priory of Sion, the secret society of the Merovingians. The little church at rennes le chateau is dedicated to Mary Magdalene, a symbolic name for the reptilian bloodlines passing through the female line, the dragon queens like hell. I have heard that Mag is a code for the reptilian bloodlines passed through the female DNA and that Mag relates to Queen. The church at rennes le chateau was redesigned in the late 1800 seconds by the priest, Ab Saunier, who became extremely rich after discovering coded manuscripts and other artifacts. The story is told at length in the biggest secret, Cain and Abel. The Edda describes how Thor, Adam, Indara and Eve had a son, called Gun, Jin, or Khan. This is the biblical Cain and Gawain of the king. Arthur stories, Waddell contends, in Babylonian seals dated to before 25 BC. He is called Adama the son of the god Induru. Gun or Cain was attacked and wounded in the Edda narrative by Baldur or Baldur, the son of the serpent cult. Leaders, Wadden and El. Baldur is the same. Guy is the biblical Abel, Waddell says. And the Edda refers to him as Epli, which equates with the Hebrew Ebel, and his Sumerian title was Ibel or Baal, the Hebrew. Baal, says Waddell. Baal worship would, therefore be serpent worship. Another name for Baldur was Egil and this is almost identical to Egil, the Hebrew for a bull calf and the golden calf, worshipped in the Old Testament. Golden calf worship equals serpent. Worship, Baldur was symbolized as a bull or steer and became the steer god of Israel or Isra, El. He is referred to in the Edda as the steer of Eden. Baldur is also called the young Hydra. In Greek mythology, the Hydra is a nine-headed serpent monster with poisonous breath. And when one head was severed, two would grow in its place. It was killed in the second of the twelve labors of the sun god, Hercules. The Edda says that Thor divided by Indara, Adam called his Cappadocian capital, Himen or Heaven in that Baldur. Abel, of the serpent cult went to Thor's banqueting hall in Himen, Heaven. There he began a riotous quarrel and insulted Eve. With this, Baldur of the serpent cult was ejected by Gun or Cain or Miak, the son of Eve, and Adam. This is the origin, Waddell says, of Saint Michael casting out Satan. Lucifer. From heaven, the Battle of Eden. The Edda tells of a war between the serpent cult and the forces of Thor, Indara for control of Eden. As Waddell remarks, the whole feel of the wolf tribe, serpent, cult, offensive in the Battle of Eden, includes the anticipation of bombing by aeroplanes, red-hot missile projections, the belching forth of fire and poisonous clouds of smoke. He says it vividly, suggests the hellish methods of destruction in modern warfare and this is in line with Sumerian accounts of battles involving the Anunnaki. In parts of the Edda and in Sumerian and Hittite seals, both El and Baldur are given wings. In the Indian Vedas you have accounts of the gods warring in the sky. It suggests a credible explanation for the ancient ruins that indicate they were destroyed by some kind of high-tech, even nuclear weaponry. The Edda tells how Thor won the victory against the serpent cult and this is known as the harrying of Hell, El, in Welsh traditions. A key moment was when Prince Cain, Melchor, Michael, the son of Thor, killed Baldur or Abel, the son of El, and this is depicted in many Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Hittite, and Persian seals and sculptures. Cain, as Horus, is seen spearing Abel set, symbolized as a demon crocodile, in an Egyptian bas relief of around 1000 BC. This is a version of Saint Michael defeating the dragon. Saint Michael, the Sumerian Cappadocian deity, is portrayed as a dragon fighter. In India, Baldur is the great diva, Tiva, or devil, felled by Lord Gan. The stories of Saint Patrick in Ireland say that he was sent by Saint Michael the victor to expel the snakes from Ireland. When the Phoenicians and others from the Sumer Empire landed in Britain they named many places after Saint Michael, as with Saint Michael's Mount in Cornwall. When the Christians began to build their churches on the ancient pagan sites, they inherited the name St. Michael for many of their churches. The Edda describes how El, or Old Mary as it calls her, fled from the battle by boat on the Euphrates as the battle was lost, but she was caught and killed by Thor, Adam. El and her son, Baldur or Abel, are both represented as crocodiles in some depictions of their demise. The phoenix rises. After this defeat, 
The reptilians and their serpent cult went underground. In fact, they possibly came from underground. Roland's Ancient History, published around 1907, says that Eden was inside a mountain. It says that the two major rivers of Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates, have their sources on opposite sides of Mount Taurus. This was a region populated by the Amazons and the serpent cult. Rollins adds that these rivers flowed through the mountain of Eden, which, he says, was artificially constructed by the gods. These rivers, therefore, watered the Garden of Eden. That may well be correct, but I feel the original Eden was. Lemuria, Thor, Indara and his successors expanded what became the Sumer Empire. In the way I described earlier, as far as Britain, the Americas, even Australia. But the Hedda tells how the serpent cult returned to power after Thor's death and that she, L, still lives. It infiltrated the Nordic DNA in the royal bloodlines and possessed their bodies, as described in the Emerald Tablets. The serpent cult regrouped and eventually made its headquarters in Babylon. From there it began to infiltrate its agents and bloodlines into the positions of royal and religious power across the former Sumer Empire, not least in Egypt. These children of the serpent took control of the mystery schools and the state religion and turned them into vehicles of the reptilian agenda. How much of Waddell's translation of the edit is literal and how much is symbolic is difficult to tell. He thinks it is literal, but the use of symbolism was so fundamental to the ancients and it is unlikely that the edda would be an exception. My jury is still out on the precise meaning or meanings, of the Adam and Eve. Symbolism, for instance, and I think there are Lemurian tales woven into the story, just as there are Sumerian tales woven into British history. What Waddell's brilliance has done, however, is to confirm the Nordic reptilian theme of history, and the focus the serpent cult has with the female or the goddess. Chapter 10. The Many Faces of the Serpent Cult The serpent cult described in the Edda can be connected with Christianity. Satanism, the Nazis, Freemasonry, Hollywood, the death of Princess Diana, and even the true writers of the Shakespeare plays. Its web of influence is incredibly diverse because it has to work so hard to suppress human consciousness, which, in its true power, is far greater than the juveniles that seek to control. These guys know that humans are potentially far more powerful and so they have to hit us from every angle to keep us in comatose ignorance. One of their most effective weapons for this has been the pagan cult known as Christianity, the Christian Serpent Trinity. The Serpent Trinity of El, Waden, and Balder, the mother-father-son, has been repeated in many guises. The emphasis in the Serpent Trinity was on the mother and son. In Babylon, that major stronghold of the serpent cult, the son was Ninus, Tammuz, and the mother was Queen Semiramis. The Edda explains how one of the centers for the serpent cult during the conflicts with Thor, Indara was the Van, tribe of Lake Van on the western side of Mount Ararat in Turkey, the biblical resting place of Noah's Ark after the flood. The Van tribe was known as the children of Chaldees, Wado reports, and these became the Chaldeans of Mesopotamia and the Chaldees of northern Britain. Other offshoots were the Vandals or Hunnigan, reptilian bloodlines. Van Urbana was also the ancient capital of the matriarch queen of the serpent cult, Semiramis, and I guess this might relate to the Lady of the Lake in the King Arthur stories. The underground world is also symbolized as the Lake of Fire, the domain of the death goddess, Hell. Semiramis translates as branch. Bearer and her symbol was the dove, further links to the Noah story with the dove, arriving to Noah bearing the olive branch. I have seen Lake Van associated with the Garden of Eden by one researcher. So the Babylonian mother-son was Semiramis of the serpent cult and her son, Tammuz, the hero of their far earlier version of the Jesus story. We shall see later that this same serpent cult moved from Babylon to Rome and founded the Christian religion. As we know it today, the Christian mother-son combination is Mary, another name used for El and Jesus, Tammuz or Balder. Christianity, as created by the Roman Church, is another form of the ancient mother-son serpent cult religion. And there's more. Rome is said to have been founded by Romulus and Remus. These are mythical names, but highly symbolic. Watto points out that in the Edda text Rom is another name for Eden or Eden, the home of the serpent cult, and the wolf tribe of the Roms, wolf symbolism is associated with Sirius. These people were not Nordics, but similar to the aboriginal Dark Chaldeans, Lycians, and what is called today the Mediterranean or Iberian race. Rama Rama was also a title of the Set and Serpent worshippers of ancient Egypt. Muslims refer to Turkey, Asia, Minor as Rum, and Romania is the traditional center for the vampire legends. Fascinating, then, that Romulus and Remus, the mythical founders of Rome, were said to have been wolf-suckled and this is symbolic of the mother-son, cult of the wolf tribe of the Roms with its associated serpent. Worship, the names Romulus and Remus came from an ancient female clan called the Etruscan gens Romulia, the real founders of Rome. Again the female, Mother Mary is El, the dragon queen. It is no surprise, given its origins in Babylon, 
that the Roman Church would so emphasize the importance of Mary, the goddess figure, and its version of El or Queen Semiramis. El was also known as May or Mother May and so we have May Day, one of the most important ritual days of the year for the serpent cult. Illuminati. The Illuminati created Creed of Communism has its day of celebration and military parades on May Day for the same reason. See, and the truth shall set you free for the detailed background to the Illuminati origins of communism. On the night of April 30th, Satanists performed the ritual of Walpurgis to the goddess of Walpurgisnacht or May Day Eve. She was such a popular deity in Germany as the May Queen, Walpurga, that she was encompassed by Christianity under the name Saint Walpurga and a fictional story produced to justify this. Morgan Le Fay in the King Arthur stories is another version of El. As in Mare, Mary, Gin, Woman, of the Fay, Deadly Serpent, Mary Woman of the Deadly Serpent Mother Mary of Christianity. Morgans were known as sea women, as the same water themes continue. Balder, the son of God, the Edda's version of the death of Balder at the hands of Cain or Saint. Michael, is told in different versions in many cultures. The Hebrew Old Testament, as Cain killing his brother Abel and bringing the first death into the world. The New Testament has St. Michael defeating Satan, Lucifer, or the great dragon. In Egypt we have the wolf-headed Set or Seth killed by Horus, the son of Asar or Osiris. In India, Cain is Lord Gan who fought the great diva or the bull, one of the Balder titles in the Edda. The King Arthur legends have Sir Gawain, slaying the green man. As I have said, the Chaldeans called the Balder, Abel, character Tammuz. He was their established son and the son of God who died. For humanity, Tammuz was also closely associated with the theme of the serpent and the bloodline of the dragon kings. Hecate, another version of El or Hel, was symbolized as the mother of Dionysus, another classic son of God figure. Both Tammuz and Dionysus were mirrors of the much later Jesus myth. Lamentations of the Chaldees for the death of Tammuz, Balder, Abel are preserved in a large collection of hymns of the mother-son cult in Babylonian tablets from around 3000 BC they used to wail for Tammuz in certain rituals and the wailing of Jewish people at the western or wailing wall in Jerusalem is a version of this. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel describes the wailings for Tammuz by Hebrew women in Jerusalem. Legends also say that to reach the goddess El or Hel in her underworld, you have to cross a wailing river. Jesus is Balder. When the serpent cult moved its headquarters to Rome, it introduced the Jesus story as we know it today and symbolized Jesus as Balder, the crucified son of El, or Mary, the matriarch of the serpent cult, although there is other symbolism relating to the Jesus story. Also, he is a sort of composite character that pulls together a mass of mystery school symbolism and themes. Balder is one of them, but there are many others weaved into the gospel tales. On the cross, Jesus is made to say, My, El Lo I, Lama Sa, Bakthan Nai, which is translated as My God, My God. Why haste, thou forsaken me, Lauren Savage, the webmaster of davidick.com and longtime researcher into these subjects, once studied with the famous American scholar Dr. Fendel Jones, the man who originally inspired the movie character Indiana Jones. Lauren tells me that Dr. Jones has stated that those biblical words attributed to Jesus were from a South American language and that the translation into English had simply been a guess. Now if the grail is the womb of the dragon queens, that sacred symbol of the serpent bloodlines, and Jesus is symbolic of Balder, son of the serpent goddess, it suddenly makes symbolic sense of the claims by people like Sir Lawrence Gardner. He says that the Merovingian bloodline is the grail, bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, with his close connections to the ancient imperial royal dragon court and order, which serves the interests of the dragon bloodlines, Gardner would surely know the real symbolism of the grail. And Jesus, wouldn't he? Gardner says that the dragon refers to the fact that the Kings of this bloodline used to be anointed in Egypt by the fat of the sacred crocodile. El and Balder were symbolized as crocodiles and the crocodile was known in Egypt as the Messe, from which we get Messiah and Christ. The term Christ means the anointed one anointed with the fat of a crocodile. The Hindu god, Shiva, the lord of the reptilian Nagas, was also called the anointed one, or Christos to the Greeks, when he had his willy bathed in menstrual blood. I hope you're not eating. As Barbara Walker points out in the Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, many traditions of the early Gnostic Christians identified the serpent with Jesus. She says that some Christians believe that the serpent was the father of Jesus, having overshadowed the bed of the Virgin Mary and begotten the human form of the Savior. This mirrors the legends of Merovi, founder of the Merovingians, and Alexander the Great, both of whom were said to have been fathered by a serpent or sea creature. Jewish serpent worshippers, known as the Nazians, said the serpent was the Messiah. Writers who have misrepresented the Edda and other accounts, purposely and otherwise, have presented Balder as the good god. The Chaldeans, the children of Chaldees of Lake Van, who followed the serpent cult's mother-son religion, said that Balder, Tammuz was the good god, the beautiful benign and faithful son. 
He was a divine high priest who died for the salvation of the Chaldeans. His chosen people, he was sacrificed and descended into the underworld and he will return in, a second coming to establish a new heaven and a new earth. Almost exactly what the Christians say about Jesus. James Churchward says, incidentally, that the Chaldeans were a sect, not a people. The Scandinavian legend says that Balder had a spear of mistletoe thrust into him by Hod, a blind god. The Christians say, Jesus had a spear thrust into him by the blind centurion, Longinus. The Ides of March, or March 15th, was the day devoted to Hod by the ancients and this is the same day the serpent cult leaders of the Christian church chose as the feast day of the blessed Longinus. The obsession that Hitler and the Nazis had with possessing the spear of destiny relates to its association with their god, Balder or Baldir. Hitler thought that the true spear was the one owned by the shape-shifting Habsburg family in Austria, which had formerly been in the possession of Charlemagne of the reptilian bloodline. He believed that anyone who possessed it would be invincible, but it didn't seem to help him much after he stole it from the Habsburgs during the annexation of Austria. Also, the Holy Grail of the Arthur Stories is supposed to be the vessel that caught the blood of Jesus after he was pierced in the side by the spear, the serpent blood, in fact, of Balder, the legendary martyred hero of the serpent cult or Illuminati. The term Illuminati or illuminated one's links with Balder's name of Loki. This became Lucifer the Light. Bringer, Waddell says, Jesus is said to be the light of the world. The Jewish father-son was also depicted sometimes as an ass-headed man, crucified on a tree. Balder, Tammuz, and Jesus are the same entity. The Illuminati created Christianity to fool the people into worshipping symbolic reptilian deities, while believing they were worshipping the opposite. What was it that Alice in Wonderland said? Nothing would be what it is, because everything would be what it isn't. And contrary-wise, what it is, it wouldn't be. And what it wouldn't be, it would. You see, the Black Madonna. We can now appreciate why Illuminati placemen like George Bush, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, the British royal family, and others, profess to be such strong Christians, while taking part in satanic ritual. They know what it really means. To them, Christianity is the worship of the serpent gods, especially El and Balder and other Illuminati symbols and deities. The Knights Templar Secret Society funded and designed the famous Gothic cathedrals that became shrines to the serpent goddess. Between 1170 and 1270, some 80 cathedrals and 500 churches were built in France, alone and dedicated to Our Lady, El, Semiramis, Mary. The Knights Templar were controlled by the serpent cult, Illuminati, but many of their members would have not been aware of this, just like the vast majority of Freemasons today. The Templars used the Red Cross of Thor, Elendara, George as their symbol and to all appearances. They were worshippers of a Christian god, again like Freemasons today. But at the top level, they are both expressions of the serpent cult. Ayumanati, their Christian, churches and cathedrals are full of goddess, astrological, sun, and sexual symbolism, as is Freemasonry. Of course they are. They were both created by the same force. The great cathedrals are located on ancient pagan ritual sites. Notre Dame, Our Lady, in Paris was built on a site of worship to the goddess Artemis. Diana, L. The reptilian bloodline, the Merovingians, worshipped this goddess on that same location, and Notre Dame is covered in reptilian gargoyles. The great cathedral at Chartres, not far from Paris, was built by the Knights Templar on a sacred pagan ritual site. It was so important that Druids came from all over Europe to attend the ceremonies. Chartres Cathedral, like Notre Dame, was a center for worship of the Black, Madonna or L, the Dragon Queen. Until the late 18th century, pilgrims to Chartres participated in a Christian ritual that paid homage to L or the Black Madonna. After praying and taking Mass in the cathedral, they would descend through a northern passageway to an ancient subterranean crypt under the church. Here they would pay their respects to Notre Dame de Sous Terre, Our Lady of the Underworld, a black ebony statue of a seated woman holding a child on her knees. This again was Ellen Balder of the Mother-Son Serpent Cult. The child was invariably placed on the left knee because Satanism calls itself the left-hand path. On the black, Madonna's head at Charters was, as always, a crown and on the pedestal is a Roman inscription saying the virgin who will give birth. The crown is a symbol of the reptilian bloodlines and is used to signify high rank in Satanism. The black Madonna was called the Queen of Heaven and all these mother virgins were symbolized as a dove. The symbolism of British royalty with its crowns, doves, and lions, etc., are all symbolic of the serpent cult in power today. The man who did most to advance the worship of the Black Madonna was St. Bernard, 1090-1153, the abbot of Clairvaux in France, who founded the Cistercian Order. He claims to have experienced a miraculous religious illumination when the Black Madonna of Chatelain pressed her breast and squirted three drops of milk in his mouth. No, you didn't misread that. Bernard was also at the heart of the creation of the Knights Templar along with the Illuminati St. Clair family 
who later became the Sinclair family at Rosslyn, near Edinburgh in Scotland. When the Knights Templar were formed as a front for the serpent cult, they adopted as their official patroness the Mother of God or Queen of Heaven, the traditional names for El Semiramis. So did the Teutonic Knights, who are fundamentally connected to the reptilian Habsburgs. The goddess appeared widely on chivalric banners and when they fought in her honor, they would scream her name as a battle cry. They were fighting for El under the name of Mary and for Balder under the name of Jesus. This would explain why Christianity, which claims to be a religion based on love, has been such a vehicle for global genocide and torture. The Holy Ghost of the Christian Trinity is also regarded as feminine in Hebrew and the early Christian church considered it to be so. The very name Bible comes from Byblos, home of a shrine to an earlier version of Mary known as Astarte. This shrine dates to Neolithic times and Astarte was believed to be the true sovereign of the world. She is worshipped elsewhere as Mother Mary, Hathor, Demeter, Aphrodite, and, in India, as Kali. Another location associated with the start of Christianity is Ephesus in southwest Turkey. The mythical Saint Paul was said to have written a letter to the Ephesians, and Greek myth says that the Amazons founded the city. Ephesus just happens to have been the headquarters of worship to the goddess Artemis. Diana, a goddess of the Amazons. I visited Ephesus in the summer of 2000 and on a hill high above the ancient ruins is a building that is claimed to have been the home of Mary, mother of Jesus. Another goddess worshipped by the Amazons was Cybele, the mother goddess of all Asia Minor. She was taken to Rome from Phrygia, the land of the lions and the serpent cult. Rituals to her included baptism in the blood of the sacred bull, who represented her dying consortities of whom Jesus was a carbon copy. Her temple in Rome stood on the site of today's St. Peter's Basilica until the 4th century ad when the Christian church took over. In fact, a priest of Cybo called Montanus or Mountain Man identified the deities with Jesus. Some Montanists were locked in their churches by Christians in Asia Minor and burned alive. Cybele was the goddess of the caves, a location where many of the savior gods in the Jesus mold are said to have been born. The Reptilian Underground Network the Red Rose of El. The many versions of El are said to be goddesses of sexuality and fertility, and of the moon and Venus. The stone baptismal bowls found in every Christian church are symbolic of the magic stone bowl of the serpent cult or Illuminati described in the Edda. The Gothic Christian doorways and the ridges around them are depictions of the vulva and many even have a clitoris symbol at the top of the arch. The same is depicted in windows and especially the rose windows of the Gothic cathedrals. At Charters they have a window featuring the Rose of France with Mary in the center. Rose windows face west, the sacred direction of female. Deities. The red rose is symbolic of the goddess and so we have the Rosicrucians, with their red rose and cross symbols. They are a major strand in the Illuminati web, and claim a lineage to ancient Egypt and back to Noah. That symbol of the reptilian bloodline. Another elite network is the secret society known as the Order of the Rose, which includes the former Canadian Prime Ministers Brian Mulroney and Pierre Trudeau, both Satanists. Trudeau is famous for wearing a red rose in his lapel. Some branches of Freemasonry feature the rose and cross in their rituals. Once again, the Christian Mother Mary is associated with the rose because she is a symbol of goddess worship. The Romans called the rose the flower of Venus and this was a term used for the goddess, including Queen Semiramis. The red rose was symbolic of female sexuality and the white rose or lily is the virgin goddess. Christians associated Mary with both the rose and the lily and they called her the Holy Rose. This is the same title given to the Indian Great Mother. The rosary used so widely in the Roman Catholic mother-son cult was copied from the rosary of the mantras worn by the Indian destroyer goddess Kali Ma. Arabs called their rosaries Wadija or Rose Garden and the Latin version of this. Rosarium described the early rosaries in Mother Mary worship. In Satanism, one of the main codenames for babies bred for sacrifice is Rosemary's Baby. This was the name of a film by Roman Polanski, the husband of the actress Sharon Tate who was murdered with her unborn child by the satanic family of Charles Manson. Tony Blair's Labour Party introduced the Red Rose as its logo thanks to the Illuminati clone and later disgraced government minister Peter Mandelson, whose nickname is the Prince of Darkness. The other two major UK political parties have the logos of the Dove, Liberal Democrats and the Lighted Torch, Conservatives, both major Illuminati symbols going back thousands of years. Shakespeare was Lord Draconis. The works of Shakespeare are part of this story, also. The texts are awash with esoteric and Illuminati symbolism and codes. For instance, the Queen of the Fairies, Reptilian Bloodline, in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, is another version of the universal goddess called Titania. She was known in legend as the great goddess who ruled the god race, the Titans. Given the Illuminati's staggering obsession with symbolism, I feel there was far more to the sinking of the Titanic than ever we have yet realized. These goddesses are fundamentally associated with the sea and the underworld, the victims of the Titanic tragedy in 1912 went to both. I don't buy the hidden iceberg line myself. 
in southern Russia, Titania, known there as Re, was the red one and the Romans claimed her to be, the mother of Romulus and Remus, the mythical founders of Rome, Titania's king in, a midsummer night's dream is called Obron. He was based on a real-life character, an ancestor of the man who really put the Shakespeare plays together. Edward de Vere of Loxley, 17th Earl of Oxford, the American researcher Brian Disborough, among others, has established that the plays were the work of a syndicate of Illuminati initiates an Elizabethan society, headed by de Vere and including Sir Francis Bacon, John D., and Edmund Spencer. Elizabeth I was serious bloodline and known as the Fairy Queen. Bacon was a Knights Templar, the head of the Rosicrucian Order, and the man who oversaw the translation of the King, James Version of the Bible, see the biggest secret for more background. Bacon also wrote a book called The New Atlantis which described a society that later became the United States. He also wrote of an invisible college which covertly controlled events. One expression of this invisible college became the Royal Society in London, which was founded by Freemasons in 1660 to dictate scientific thought. The Shakespeare plays were encoded with esoteric knowledge hidden in symbolism and phrases that only an initiate would understand. Le Waddell points out that parts of the Edda, compiled at least six centuries before Shakespeare, are written in a very similar style to that later called Shakespearean. The de Vere family was so high in the reptilian bloodline that Edward de Vere carried the hereditary title of Lord Draconis, the same title awarded to the Dracula bloodline of Vlad the Impaler, by the ancient dragon order now promoted by Sir Lawrence Gardner. Edward de Vere was a Lord Chancellor of England and his ancestors included Albury, Prince of Anjou and Guise in France, who was known as the Elf King Dragon King in other words, the aristocratic Anjou line has appeared in my books many times. The House of Anjou is part of the House of Lorraine, one of the most important reptilian bloodlines to this day. The Plantagenet dynasty, which ruled England from Henry II to Richard II, were a branch of the House of Anjou and the senior branch was the House of de Vere. The royal historian Baron Thomas Babington Macaulay wrote in 1861 that the Veres were the longest and most illustrious line of nobles that England has ever seen with their Merovingian, Pictish, and Scythian ancestry. Lawrence Gardner calls them a true kingly line of the elven race, a code for reptilian shapeshifters. Freemasons are the serpent cult. Freemasonry is the biggest secret society in the world and a front for the serpent cult, although the vast majority of its members are oblivious to this. The hero of Freemasonry is someone called Higher Mabeth. His Freemasonic legend says that he was the Grand Master and Architect of Solomon's Temple who was killed for refusing to reveal the Masonic secrets. The story has many similarities with the legend of the death of Osiris in Egypt. Hiramai, the King of Tyre from 969 to 936 BC, is not considered the same person as Hiram Abif, although he, too, appears in the story of Solomon's Temple. Hiram Abif is also said to have come from Tyre, an old Knights Templar stronghold, and Ty is a name for Balder. Hiram Abif is the widow's son in Freemasonry and he is also known to Freemasons as the Tyrian architect. The code widow could represent El, the dragon goddess, and the son may well be Balder. One of Balder's titles was the illegitimate son of a widow. The code for distress in Freemasonry goes, is there no help for the widow's son? One of the tribes named in the Edda that fought for the serpent cult was also called Atrium and this later became the Germanic tribe, the Herman ones. The Roman historian Tacitus said that these descended from Herman whom Waddell connects with the bloodline of Wadden, the worship of the reptilians and their dragon, queens, and the placing of their bloodlines into the positions of power, is the secret of secrets held within all the secret societies. Jim Shaw, a former 33rd degree Freemason, was initiated into a long list of Freemasonic orders and offshoots. After reaching the highest official levels he saw what Freemasonry really was and wrote, an expose called the Deadly Deception. He was initiated into the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite at the Supreme Headquarters of the 33rd degree in Northwest 16th Street, not far from the White House in Washington, D.C. It is built as an Egyptian-type temple and outside are two Sphinx-like figures with women's faces. Could this be an indication of the truth about the Sphinx at Giza? One of the Sphinx figures at the Washington Temple has a cobra entwined around her neck. On the neck of the other one is the image of a woman, symbolic, says Shaw, of fertility and procreation. These are some of the gifts associated with goddesses like Artemis. Diana, behind the row of pillars at the front of the building is a massive depiction of the rising sun. Horus or, perhaps, the sun goddess known as Saul. Around this sun are six large golden snakes and inside this Freemasonic Holy of Holies the serpent theme continues. Shaw reports, the thing that is most noticeable is the way the walls are decorated with serpents. There are all kinds, some very long and large. Many of the Scottish right degrees include the representation of serpents and I recognize them among those decorating the walls. Secret Society, Serpent Cult, 
and goddess symbolism can be clearly seen in the founding of the United States. Queen Semiramis, meaning branch bearer was another name for El and she was symbolized as a dove. Le Waddle says that the Indian Vedic title for El was Sarama the bitch of the Pani or Vans. This was Queen Semiramis, the Amazonian queen of Lake Van and it was apparently the source of the tribal title of Sarmatian for the eastern Vandal Turanian hordes that ravaged the early western world. The Roman serpent cult worshipped Semiramis as Venus Columba or Venus the Dove. Columb is still the word for Dove in French. Columba became a symbolic name for El or Semiramis, the dragon, queen of the serpent cult. So we have Christopher Columbus, who bore the branch of the serpent cult to the Americas. We also have British, Columbia in Canada, the District of Columbia, the home of Washington, D.C., and a stream of Illuminati operations called Columbia Pictures, Columbia University, and Columbia Broadcasting. The U.S. network, CBS, one of the most horrific events in America in recent years was the shootings at Columbine High School and when you begin to appreciate the unbelievable obsession the Illuminati have with symbolism, down to the finest of details, that location is not a coincidence. The English Grand Lodge of Freemasonry is also located in London in Great Queen Street to symbolize its worship of the Serpent Queen, L. England, one of the headquarters of the Illuminati, is known as the Mother Country and its Parliament the Mother of parliaments, it is all goddess symbolism, as was Britannia, an earlier name for Britain derived from the Phoenician goddess. Bharati or Bharat Anna, Freemasonic heroes like Albert Pike, the Supreme Pontiff of Universal, Freemasonry in the 19th century, have said that Freemasonry is a revival of the ancient mystery religions of Babylon, Egypt, Persia, Rome, and Greece. Masonry is identical with the ancient mysteries, he wrote in his Freemasonic Bible called morals and dogma. So, of course, you are going to find the same knowledge and symbols used in Freemasonry that could be found in the ancient mystery schools. Pike tells only half the truth, however, because Freemasonry is not a revival of those mystery religions, it is a continuation of them. They never went away, only underground. Freemasonry is a wonderful example of how the Illuminati have always hidden the truth in a complex mass of degrees. Levels contradictions, mystique, and blatant lies, and no one has lied to more comprehensively than the Masons themselves. Jim Shaw confirms that lower-degree Masons, the overwhelming majority, are given false information and interpretations to keep them in the dark. Even at the 33rd-degree level, the official peak, most are told, nothing of the true meaning of Freemasonry, its symbols and agenda. Symbolism is the very foundation of the Anunnaki Illuminati secret language and codes. See the biggest secret, and Freemasonry calls itself a system of pure religion expressed in symbols. So misinterpret the symbols and you have lost the plot completely. Here, we have Albert Pike writing in Morals and Dogma about the Blue Degrees, the bottom three levels that feed into the Scottish and York Rite Degrees. The Blue Degrees are but the outer court or portico, porch, of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretation. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine that he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry, those of the 32nd and 33rd degrees. Meanings and meanings. Even those at the 32nd and 33rd levels are misled unless they are inner circle bloodline. Jim Shaw says there are two meanings given to Freemasons, the exoteric to the lower initiates and the esoteric to the higher ones. But there is a third, the truth, and that is given only to a tiny elite of bloodline initiates and those who progress beyond the official levels of the secret societies to the unofficial Illuminati degrees. Shaw says that Freemasonry worships nature, the sun and moon, through the symbol of the phallus. So does Christianity. The phallus, he says, represents the sun in sexual union with the female earth to bring new life. On one level that is true, but it is still a spin. Take the Freemasonic symbol of the square and compass. This is always placed over the chair of the worshipful master which is positioned to the east in Freemasonic temples. The direction of the rising sun. Christian churches face east for the same reason. Shaw says that lower degree Masons are told that the square is to remind them that they must be square or honest in their dealings with all people. Excuse me while I laugh hysterically. The compass, they are told, is to teach them to circumscribe their passions and to control their desires. Maybe the pedophile and Freemason George Bush missed that meeting. Shaw says that later they are told the real meaning which is that the compass is the male phallus of the sun impregnating the female earth, symbolized as the square. On one level, again, that's true, but to the highest levels of the Illuminati the compass and square represent the impregnation that perpetuates the bloodline. The V and a symbol of Queen Victoria and the German Prince Albert, both reptilian bloodlines, were designed to symbolize this also and so is the letter G in the Freemasons logo. Shaw says that, 
First, masons are told that G represents God, later that it represents deity and still later that it means geometry. But Shaw explains that it really means the male generative principle, the sun god or phallus, again, that is one level of its meaning. But to the Illuminati the G represents the generative principle of expanding and protecting their bloodlines. The point within the circle also represents the impregnation of the female circle, and with the male, point. On one level this is another sun symbol and can be found on the grave of President Kennedy as a flame and circle. But the real meaning is bloodline. It is the same with the ship symbols you see on Freemasonic buildings. The hull is the female, that's why ships are always she and the mast is the phallus impregnating her. Lower degree masons are told that the circle and the point represents the individual mason restricted by the boundary line of duty. The circle, what a hoot. All these secret society symbols and codes have a meaning for the lower initiates utter bollocks, the higher initiates, semi-utter bollocks. And for those who make it through to the highest levels of the Illuminati, the true interpretation, in the blood oaths, called the obligation, the initiate agrees to accept torture and death if he reveals the secrets. This maintains the compartmentalization in which the higher levels do not reveal their secrets to the lower levels. In truth, as Jim Shaw found out, even at the 33rd degree you are not told anything worthwhile. The real business exists only above the official levels, and only a handful of Masons ever make it there. Freemasonry is a cesspit of deceit and hypocrisy, and the oaths made to the secret societies and your fellow initiates override any oath you may have made to your country or people as a president, prime minister, congressman, member of parliament, policeman, or judge. Jim Shaw writes, The Mason swears to keep the secrets of another Mason, protecting him even if it requires withholding evidence of a crime. In some degrees treason and murder are accepted. In other, higher degrees, there are no exceptions to this promise to cover up the truth. The obligations, if the Masonic teachings are to be believed, may require a Mason to give false testimony, perjure himself, or, in the case of a judge, render a false verdict in order to protect a Mason. This has always been the way of the Illuminati serpent cult in all its forms, and the vast majority of the world's political leaders, high administrators of government, judges, policemen, and media owners have made that oath. Does anyone still wonder why the truth has never come out until now? The ritual death of Diana, the symbolism of the sacrificial murder of Princess Diana by the serpent, cult, Illuminati becomes clear from this background knowledge. L, the dragon, queen, was also known as Hell or Eight, Hate. Still today, Hell Eight or Hecate is a satanic deity associated appropriately with Hell, after her husband's murder in Dallas, Jackie Kennedy traveled to the Greek island of Delos in the southwest. A Gen C. This is the legendary birthplace of Diana and the traditional domain of Hecate, the goddess of the infernal arts. Delos is known for this reason as the Island of the Dead. Hecate was portrayed as both a virgin and a whore, and again, associated with the moon. Another version was the Egyptian, Hecate, who delivered the sun god every morning and her totem was the frog, symbolic appropriately, of the fetus. Crossroads are the sacred places of Diana and her satanic expression, Hecate. It is at crossroads that the witches and grand masters and sorcerers of Freemasonry perform their rituals. Crossroads are symbolic of the vortex points created where ley lines cross. In ritual sex magic the wearing of clothes of the opposite sex in the performance of bisexual acts are called crossroad rites. The women involved were called dykes. Remember that the Amazon manipulated. Scythians wore women's clothes in sexual rites to their goddess. Crossroads are also the places of human and animal sacrifice and Hecate. Hell is known as a sex and death goddess and the goddess of witchcraft and sorcery. The Illuminati symbolism surrounding Diana's murder is, therefore, simply stunning. At the spot where Diana died, the road that goes through the Ponte El Alma tunnel is crossed on the surface by another which leads onto the Ponte El Alma Bridge. In fact, this spot is a maze of crossroads. Diana died in the early morning of August 31st. Hecate's day in the Satanic calendar is August 13th. But, under the Satanic law of reverse symbolism and numbers, Hecate's day of sacrifice is August 31st. Outside the original Paris and now very much inside the modern city, the Merovingians established an underground chamber for the worship of the goddess Diana and the blood rituals and human sacrifices to her. This site dates back at least to add 500 to 750 and it was here that King's Inn. Dispute over property would settle the issue in combat. As I mentioned earlier, the location today of this sacrificial site to the goddess Diana, Hecate is the Ponte El Alma Tunnel. The word pont relates to Pontifex, a Roman high priest, and it means passage or bridge. Alma comes from Alma, a Middle Eastern name for the moon goddess. So Ponte El Alma translates as bridge or passage of the moon goddess and the adjoining place to El Alma is the place of the moon goddess. And the moon goddess is Diana, Hecate, El, the Amazon goddess Cybele, who was worshipped in Rome at the same time as Hecate, 
was also known as Alma. The reason Diana was held so long in the tunnel before being moved to hospital for treatment was that she had to die in that sacrificial site according to the sick ritual, and she was dead before she was moved. Princess Diana was buried in a tree grove, on an island, in a lake, all of which are associated with the goddess Diana in all her versions. Diana's brother, Earl Spencer, also had four black swans introduced to the lake after his sister died. Swans are yet more goddess symbolism and Scandinavian myths claim that the Valkyries incarnated as swans and wore magic swan feather cloaks to transform themselves. Swan knights and swan maidens were widely associated with the pagan religion. The story of the sacrificial murder of Princess Diana by the serpent cult Illuminati is told in over 60 pages in The Biggest Secret. Troy, Troy, and Troy again. The events of ancient Troy connect fundamentally with the death of Princess Diana and so much else besides. The Merovingian bloodline goes back to the Trojan War and beyond, and it was they who founded the city of Paris and named it after the Trojan called Prince Paris. The lover of Helen of Troy, according to Barbara Walker in the Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets. Helen was said to be an incarnation of the virgin moon goddess and daughter of Hecuba or Hecate. Helen was also known as Hel in Selene and was worshipped at a Spartan sexual festival called the Helenphoria that included sexual symbols carried in a basket called the Helene. Troy or Troia means three places in Greek and Hebrew and almost certainly relates to the triple goddess symbolism of Atlantis and Lemuria with one deity divided into the Trinity or three aspects. Hecate was known as Hecate of the three ways. Troy or Troia is also the origin of the name Tripoli the capital of Libya, which is so associated with the reptilian Amazons. The legends of Troy say that Helen married the moon king Menelaus, who was promised immortality because of this sacred marriage. When Helen went off with Prince Paris, Menelaus wanted to protect his immortality and the wealth the marriage had secured, and sailed with his army to take her back. This was the war between the male-led Greeks and the goddess-led Trojans. Many high satanic priestesses take the name Helen, Helena, or Elaine, Iain. It was under the name Elaine or Ellen that Helen of Troy became the symbolic queen of Britain in pagan times. As I outlined earlier, it was a relative of Helen, a Trojan called Brutus, who sailed west to Britain after the fall of Troy and founded a city called Kertroia or New Troy. Today's London. Other derivatives of El or Hel or Helenia, Helga, Hild, Helsinki, Holstein, and Holland, Helland or Halland, one of the major centers for the reptilian bloodlines to this day. Pliny, the Roman writer, said that all the people of Scandinavia, or Scandinavia, were children of Mother Hell and were called Helivianes. They believed that she lived in Elder or Hell trees, Alvin trees. Sir Lawrence Gardner, of the Royal Dragon Court in Order, says that his dragon bloodlines have been called the Elven race and that terms like Elf, Fairy, and Pixie all symbolize the representatives of various castes within the kingly succession. The reptilian hierarchy. So many fairy tales and other children's stories are encoded with the theme of the dragon bloodlines and their battles for power. The tales of princes and princesses turning into a frog is symbolic of shape-shifting. The same with dragon princesses locked in towers or giving birth to frogs. The set serpent cult is Satanism. The Satanists still use the deities, symbols, and rituals today that were used by the ancients because they represent the same stream of control and bloodline. In the United States we have the Temple of Set, an offshoot from Anton LaVey's infamous Church of Satan. The Temple of Set was formed in 1975 by Michael Aquino one of the most notorious exponents of the Illuminati's mind control network. As detailed in my other books, images of Set and the Set Wolf symbolism go back at least to 32 BC. The period of the battles between the Nordics and the serpent cult recorded in the Edda. The Temple of Set website tells us, the Great Pyramid of Giza is one of the last early monuments connected with the idea of a session afterlife as well as a solar one. The Great Pyramid had a special air shaft for the king's act to fly to the star Alpha Draconis which is the star of Set in the constellation of the thigh. Today's Big Dipper, Alpha Draconis, is the alleged base of the Draco reptilian royalty. It was known to the Egyptians as Thurban, an Arabic word meaning dragon, and the pyramid builders aligned their structures with Thurban, Alpha Draconis, which was the pole star around 3000 BC the Hyksos tribe, who invaded and ruled Egypt from around 1785 to 1580 BC, were Set worshippers and they placed their capital at Avaris on an ancient site of Set worship. They represented Set with an ass head. A line of Set worshipping priests from Tanis eventually became the royal line of pharaohs. People like Seti. Set's man, and Setnacht. Set is mighty. This was the serpent cult. Hallwood, the land of illusion. I can't emphasize enough that to understand. What we call the present we have to understand. The past. And this is why the Anunnaki Illuminati have concentrated so much effort on. Rewriting history. Even Hollywood is an example. The Druids were tree worshippers, especially the oak. The holly was their most sacred symbol because it was sacred to Mother. Hall or Hell, the goddess of the underworld. Thus we have Hall or Hollywood, 
Hellwood, the place of magic and home of the Illuminati's mass propaganda and conditioning machine in California. The Hollywood was a favorite source of magic wands. The Holly or Holy was associated with El or Hell's vagina, and the Germanic hole means cave or grave. The cave is the traditional birthplace of the Jesus-type deities. The red holly berries symbolize the female blood, and the white berries symbolize the male semen and death. The importance of the holly or holy tree can be seen in the Christmas pagan hymn sung today by Christians which says that the holly bears the crown. Interestingly, the official Scottish residence of the British royal family is called the Palace of Holly Root House in Edinburgh. Root is a name for the rowan wood featured in the Edda in relation to Thor. The new Scottish Parliament is also being housed in Holyrood Road. High above the Palace of Holyrood House, at the highest point in Holyrood Park, is a rock called King Arthur's Seat. If you are new to these subjects, I hope that you are beginning to appreciate how so much of what we call past and present are fundamentally connected, and how the calling cards of this covert force can be seen everywhere if you take the time to look. Chapter 11 God Save Us From Religion It has served us well, this myth of Christ. Pope Leo X Religion is the greatest form of mass mind control yet invented and it has been the most important weapon in the reptilian agenda for thousands of years. It has imprisoned the minds of the masses and kept them in perpetual fear and servitude. They accept their, often grotesque, plight on the word of men in long frocks who tell them it is God's plan. Take the shit today and you'll have paradise tomorrow. It's always tomorrow. Babylon to Rome. The blueprint for control by religion was honed and polished in Babylon. In the lands of Sumer and Mesopotamia, Babylon is also the location from where the global financial scam was foisted on the world. This scam involves lending people money that doesn't exist and charging interest on it. It just so happens that Babylon became the new headquarters of the Anunnaki bloodlines after the Sumer Empire collapsed. Their operational center later moved to Rome and it was then that we had the Roman Empire and the founding of the Roman Church, which, understandably, was a copy of the religion of Babylon. It uses the same methods, symbols, and stories. It is interesting to note that the word basilica, as in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, would appear to originate from a term relating to both a deadly serpent and royalty. A basilisk was a mythical serpent, lizard or dragon, the king of serpents, whose hissing drove away all other reptiles, and whose glance and breath were fatal, according to Norman Lewis in the Comprehensive Word Guide, Doubleday. New York, 1958. It was the king snake that all other reptiles feared. The American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, 4th edition, 2000, reveals that the name basilisk comes from the Latin. Greek terms basiliscus, basiliscos, and basilius, meaning king or little king. This evolved into the old French word, basilisk. Here we have the connection between royalty and the serpent yet again. The basilisk is mentioned in Psalm 91, but by the time of the King James translation, the reference has been changed to an adder. Later the basilisk became associated with the cock and became interchangeable with the term cacatrice. St. Peter of Basilica fame is connected to the cock, as we shall see. How appropriate should the centerpiece of the headquarters of the Babylonian church in Rome be named after a royal serpent? Rome to London. When the Anunnaki bloodlines moved their operational center to London after William of Orange arrived in 1688, we had the emergence of the British Empire. In fact, the empires of Sumer, Babylon, Rome, and Britain were all created and controlled by one force. In Babylon they used the same structure they had in Sumer with the priesthood acting as the go-between or middleman for the gods. And this gave them enormous power over the people. During the Babylon period the Anunnaki were seeking to rise from the ashes of Sumer and develop their strategy for taking over the world covertly through their bloodlines and front organizations. To do this, they needed to take out of circulation the true accounts of history, especially their own role in humanity's suppression and the esoteric knowledge that would allow the people to understand the magnitude of their own power and potential. John Akeel, in his book Our Haunted Planet says that they chose religion as the battleground on which to conquer the human mind. The pair of human serpent people of the past are still among us. They were probably worshipped by the builders of Stonehenge and the Forgotten Ridge making cultures of South America. In some parts of the world the serpent people successfully posed as gods and imitated the techniques of the superintelligence. God. This led to the formation of pagan religions centered on human sacrifices. The conflict, so far as man himself was concerned, became one of religions and races. Whole civilizations based upon the worship of these false gods rose and fell in Asia, Africa, and South America. Once an individual had committed himself, he opened a door so that an indefinable something, probably an undetectable mass of intelligent energy, could actually enter his body and exercise some control over his subconscious mind. The human race would supply the pawns. Each individual had to consciously commit himself to one of the opposing forces. The main battle was for what was to become known as the human soul. By choosing to give yourself to a deity or god, you open your psyche to possession by the force that deity, 
or God represents, and deities like Mary and Jesus represent very different forces to those perceived by their believers. It is so important for people to get out of religion and start recovering control of their own minds. There is an important point to make before we proceed because the symbolism of the sun is about to become very significant. There is a general belief that the sun represents the male and the moon the female. That's understandable because that's the way it looks and on one level it's true. But there's a twist. There came a time when the global religion of worshipping the goddess was replaced by the male god. However, that was only on the surface, for public consumption, control, and ignorance, to suppress the ancient, knowledge, not least that of true history, it was necessary to destroy the outward, expression of goddess worship while its initiates continued with business as usual. Therefore, religions like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam were created to give the appearance of being dominated by the male, while, in truth, being secret vehicles for the worship of the goddess. This involved taking female deities like Ellen, depicting them as male, the sun goddess. Way back in history the sun was portrayed as female. In Japan, a country with a long history of serpent worship, the ruling clans claimed descent from the sun goddess. Japanese tribes in Ad 238 were ruled by Queen Himiko, who was called the daughter of the sun. The goddess Aditi, the Hindu great mother, was depicted as the sun. She was said to be the mother of the Adityas, who was symbolic of the twelve signs of the zodiac. The sun was the garment of the goddess, who was clothed with the sun. When Christians made Mother Mary their version of the goddess, they said that Mary was a woman clothed in the sun. Tantric Buddhism had the goddess as the sun. The ancient Arabs worshipped the sun as the goddess at Har and referred to her as the torch of the gods. The Celts had a sun goddess called Sulis, a name that derives from Sul, meaning both eye and sun both of which appear on the dollar bill in the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States. She was also known as Sol, Sol and Sunna. One of her shrines in Britain is the biggest human-made mound in Europe called Silbury Hill, which is part of the complex of standing stones and earthworks at Aveberry in Wiltshire, England. Sol was worshipped from the high places, just as El and her derivatives were associated with mountains. Hills overlooking springs were the most sacred places in Britain for the goddess Sol. Places like Glastonbury Tor and Bath, Overlooking Bath, for example, is Salisbury Hill, and Salisbury in Wiltshire is another important sun goddess site and the location of a famous cathedral much beloved of Prince Charles. When the Romans came to Britain they worshipped this goddess as Sol Minerva. Her symbol was an owl, the symbol of the rituals at Bohemian Grove in Northern California. The road system around the Congress building in Washington, D.C. is also shaped unmistakably as an owl. See the biggest secret. The lion became the symbol of the male sun when the open became hidden but once again the lion had more commonly symbolized the goddess. The mother goddess Hathor was depicted as a lion-headed sphinx. Mystery Babylon. The Mystery School. Secret society network designed to advance the reptilian agenda expanded rapidly from the time of Babylon after 2000 BC. In this same period the royal court of the dragon was infiltrating the Egyptian mystery schools, the other structures of power. The Jewish historian, Eupolmus, said that giants built Babylon after the deluge. The usual story, according to a Babylonian text, these giants were the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki priesthood in Babylon began to invent a whole new history and religious truth, through which they could control the people mentally, emotionally, and, as a consequence, physically. In doing so, they replaced spiritual truths with fairy tales about mythical people, which the masses were told to take literally at this point. They were still referring to gods plural because the Illuminati's manipulation had not yet reached the stage where the Anunnaki and other gods could be transformed into one god. When that change came it would eliminate the more obvious records of their existence. The Hebrew priesthood would achieve this, together with the English translators of the Bible. The religion of Babylon created the mold, even the detailed stories, for those that followed. For example, where have you heard this before? In Babylon they worshipped a trinity of Nimrod, the father, symbolized as a fish, Tammuz or Ninus. The son, who was said to have died to save humanity on December 25th, and Queen Semiramis, the Babylonian Isis, who was symbolized as a dove. They said that Nimrod and Tammuz, the father and son, were one. When Tammuz died for the sins of humanity, the priesthood said he was put in a tomb and, three days later when they rolled back the stone, he was gone. All this was thousands of years before Christianity and it is just one of so many versions of the Jesus story that were told long before Jesus was supposed to have lived. Oh yes, in the spring rituals to mark the death and resurrection of Tammuz. Ninus, they offered buns inscribed with a solar cross, the hot cross buns of the much later Christian festival called Easter. Christianity is just recycled paganism that condemns pagans as evil. What hypocrisy. Even the term testament is the entomological confirmation that it is literally all a load of balls. Lauren Savage, the webmaster at davidick.com and a longtime researcher of ancient history, tells me that the root of testament is testes. Apparently, tradition says that the ancient Hebrews used to hold the other guy's balls. Sorry testes. 
while hearing an oath. Funnily enough, they do the same in some of the Illuminati rituals today. I am told. Lauren says that in the King James Version of the Bible, Abraham has his servant swear upon his thigh according to the translation when, in Hebrew tradition, it would have been his dangly bits. It certainly gives new meaning to the term, got you by the balls. Staring at a penis was another way to God in these times, I understand, and in some way this related to remembering the covenant. All it does for me is make me remember that I am not as young as I used to be. So the Old Testament means old balls and the New Testament means new balls. When we testify in court is the judge symbolically holding our testicles. You're right, don't let's go there. Good thinking, sons of God. Tammuz was a name for the Sumerian god Dumazi or Damu, the only begotten son or son of the blood, who provided the blueprint for all the later sons of God, including Jesus. The Hebrews inherited Tammuz, also known as Adonis. From the Babylonians and the Roman records refer to Tammuz as the chief god of the Jews. The Jewish calendar still has a month named after Tammuz, who was known as the serpent who emanated from the heaven god, Anu. And Anu was the head of the Anunnaki, the Sumerian tablets say. The Mesopotamian kings were said to be of the bloodline of Tammuz, just as Sir Lawrence Gardner claims that the Merovingian true royal line is the bloodline of Jesus. It was said that the land was given life by the blood of Tammuz and he was a healer savior, and a shepherd who looked after his flock of stars. He died wearing a crown of thorns made from myrrh. Tammuz was symbolically sacrificed on the Day of Atonement in the form of a lamb. He was worshipped in Jerusalem where his exact story would later be retold using the name Jesus. And, take a deep breath here vicar, the cave in Bethlehem where Jesus is said to have been born. is the same one where the ancients claimed that Tammuz was born. The Bible translator, Jerome, admitted that Bethlehem had been a sacred grove dedicated to Tammuz the fertility god or spirit of the corn. Bethlehem means house of bread or house of corn. Horns, the Egyptian son of God, was born in the place of bread and Jesus said he was the bread of life. The priesthood took the ancient Sumer sun religion, esoteric, astrological and astronomical knowledge, and the stories of their reptilian gods, and buried them in symbolic fables. This hid their real meaning, except to initiates, while introducing the rigid beliefs of the prison religions. Every major religion, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, and Buddhism all had the same basic origin, the knowledge and beliefs of Sumer, which inherited the knowledge and beliefs of Atlantis and Lemuria. The major religions were all founded in the lands once occupied by the Sumer Empire. They may have emphasized different elements of the Sumer beliefs, but that was the mold from which they all came. The priesthood's job was to withdraw the true knowledge from circulation and they twisted their manufactured religious texts until the knowledge that would set the people free was portrayed as evil. Look at Christianity. Another goal of the priesthood, or the long frocks as I call them, was to develop stories and themes that made the people feel powerless, insignificant, and in awe of invented religious deities. By being the middlemen to the gods, later God, and interpreters of the law laid down by these make-believe deities, they could control the people for their masters the reptilian and other demonic entities, to stop the people rebelling against this suppression, control, and poverty. The priesthood stories had to promise a paradise in the afterlife for all those who obeyed God's law. In other words, their law, the law of the Anunnaki. And for those who did not obey this law, eternal hell and damnation. Even the term sin, as I have pointed out, comes from the name of an Anunnaki god. Out of Babylon, 1. Judaism. The texts that form the Old Testament of the Bible, a foundation of Judaism and Christianity were written after the Levite priesthood of the Hebrews were held in captivity after 586 BC in. Here we go, Babylon. I think the term captivity is less than appropriate. Also, the early Hebrews worshipped the serpent god of the Sumer Empire and the Levites were called sons of the great serpent. Their god YHVH was depicted as part human, part serpent. And their sacred book of esoteric, hidden knowledge, the Kabbalah, means serpent wisdom. The Levites or sons of the great serpent worshipped YHVH as a dragon called Leviathan hence Levite. YHVH's serpent form was also known as Nehashtan or brazen serpent by the Levites and they placed golden and brass images of this deity on the altars of Hebrew temples. Excavations have discovered bronze and copper serpent symbols in former Levite temples. The mythical story of Moses and the brazen serpent set upon a cross is symbolic of this same theme. The Babylonians had inherited the stories and myths of Egypt and Sumer. And now they would reappear in a twisted form in the texts that would later become the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which together make up the Jewish Torah, were all written by the Levites, or under their supervision, during or after the captivity in Babylon when the Levites joined forces with the network of the Babylonian reptilian priesthood. 
So you find the Sumerian story of King Sargon floating on the river in a basket of rushes rehashed by the Levites in the account of the mythical character called Moses. And the Sumerian Eden, the abode of the gods, became the Garden of Eden in the Levite tales. The Book of Genesis is an edited version of the Sumerian accounts and it is a massive goddess symbolism. The manna from heaven, which the Moses-led Israelites were supposed to have received from God or YHVH, Jehovah, is actually a name for the goddess, Mana, who, like El, ruled the underworld. The Romans knew her as Mana or Mania. Her ancestral spirits were called Manes, as in the mane of the lion, so associated with the serpent cult, and of the horse, so connected with the Amazons or Valkyries. From the names Mana and Mania we get the word to describe crazed behavior. This is derived from worship of the moon goddess, as in moon madness or lunacy. Mantra, the Sanskrit term for projecting vibrations by chanting words or sounds, comes from the same root. Manu was the name for the Indian version of Noah, who survived the deluge with the help of the great serpent Vasuki. In earlier times Manu was the womb of the goddess. The Levites, those Babylonian mystery school initiates, invented an entire history for the Hebrews to hide the real story and create a fiercely imposed structure of religious control. The rabbis continue that tradition to this day. There is far more about this story in The Biggest Secret, where I have highlighted the way these texts were coded with esoteric knowledge and why the vast majority of people who we call Jewish today have no genetic connection to Palestine or Israel. They originate, as Jewish sources have confirmed, from the Khazars, a people from southern Russia and the Caucasus Mountains, who had a mass conversion to Judaism in the 8th century. The terms Jewish and Hebrew have become mixed up. Some people we call Jewish go back to the Hebrews of the Middle East, but most do not. They come from the Caucasus. It shouldn't matter where they come from, it's just a body. But if people are being told a fib they have a right to know. So much of the Hebrew knowledge also came from the Egyptian mystery schools and this is where the Hebrew language originated. The classic Hebrew or Jewish name, Kohen, comes from Kahan, the Egyptian name for priest and prince. And there are fundamental connections between the Hebrews in both Egypt and Babylon. After all, the people who became known as the Hebrews came from within the same Sumer Empire that included the lands we now call Israel or Palestine. They were just an expression of the same empire and doubtless the priesthood of the Sumerians. Egyptians, Hebrews, Sumerians, and Babylonians were connected by the same brotherhood networks going back to Atlantis and Lemuria. The Sumerian priesthood were the middlemen between the people and the reptilian gods and so, in the end, were the others. The invented story of the Exodus was written to obscure the truth of what really happened in Egypt and there is no historical record outside of the Levite texts, nor any archaeological evidence that any such exodus ever took place between 1967 and 1982 when the Israelis occupied the Sinai Desert. They instigated a massive search for evidence of the 40 years the Israelites were supposed to have lived there. What did they find? Nothing. The loss of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea is not recorded in any historical document and this is utterly ludicrous if it had actually happened. The Greek historian Herodotus, c. 485-425 BC, traveled and researched the lands and history of Egypt and the Near East and yet he heard nothing of King Solomon. The mass exodus of Israelites from Egypt, or the Egyptian army drowned in the Red Sea, neither did the Greek philosopher, Plato, Le, Waddell, a fluent reader of Sanskrit, Sumerian, and Egyptian, research that whole region in great detail. He concluded, There is absolutely no inscriptional evidence whatsoever, nor any ancient Greek or Roman reference, for the existence of Abraham or any of the Jewish patriarchs or prophets of the Old Testament, nor for Moses, Saul, David, Solomon, nor any of the Jewish kings, with the mere exception of two, or at most three, of the later kings. Nor was there any claim for the existence of any of these people until the Levites were taken to Babylon where the plot was hatched. The same stories that were told about Abraham, like the near sacrifice of his son, can be found in India. Earlier versions of Moses appear all over the Near and Middle East and the Mediterranean region under different names. In Babylon they said that God gave Nemo the lawgiver the tablets of the law on a mountaintop. After the Levites left Babylon, they turned Nemo into Moses. In Syria, they had a guy they called Messes, who did all the things the Levites attributed to Moses. Like the Sumerian king Sargon, Messes was found as a baby floating in a basket of reeds or rushes. Messes went on to part the waters with his magical rod and he was the guardian of the law written in stone. Another Moses was the Egyptian hero, Ra-Heralti, whose alleged life was also copied by the forgers of history. The Ten Commandments, so associated with Moses, are a copy of the laws known as the Code of Hammurabi. These were written at least a thousand years earlier. Of course they were. The Code of Hammurabi came from Babylon, but this Code of Hammurabi goes back even further to our old friend Indara, Thor. St. George, the first king of Sumer and his Ten Commandments of some five thousand years ago. These were called in the Edda the Hug runes with the word hug meaning affection, love, and good heart, hence hugging. 
the real Bible code. Another fact that is vital to understand if we are to see the forest for the trees is that these Levite texts were written symbolically in codes and parables. When we take them all literally we lose the plot. Before the prison religions, the ancients were worshippers of the sun and all three syllables in Solomon are different names for the sun. King Solomon's temple was not a real location. It is symbolic. The Freemasonic historian, Manly P. Hall, wrote that King Solomon's 1,000 wives and concubines were symbolic of the sun. Moons, asteroids, and other receptive bodies, within his house or temple the solar system 12 the stories attributed to Solomon and David can be found long before in India. And if there was no David or Solomon, then how can they have provided the bloodline of Jesus? Answer, they didn't. That genealogy was invented to serve a purpose, as were the Old Testament genealogies back to Abraham and Sumer. They were part of the manufactured history, some truth mixed with endless lies and deceit, which was created to hide what really happened. Edouard Dujardin, in his book, Ancient History of the God Jesus, Watts & Co., 1938, documents how Judaism or the Javahists took the gods of other nations and turned them into mythical Hebrew leaders, heroes, and prophets. Where Judaism fully succeeded, the ancient balls of Palestine were transformed into heroic servants of Javeh. Where it gained only a partial victory, they became secondary gods. Many of the old balls of Palestine were assimilated by Judaism, which converted them into heroes in the cause of Javeh. And in fact many scholars agree that the patriarchs of the Bible are the ancient gods of Palestine, the Hebrew gods, er, sorry, God. The idea that the Hebrew religion was based on one god is outrageous nonsense. They worshipped many gods and in the Old Testament texts they refer again and again to God in the plural. As with Elohim, the Jewish singular god, El, comes from the name Elohim, which is plural. The Elohim were the Anunnaki, and the serpent goddess, El, in the Edda relates to all this. But in the English translations the plural gods are turned into the singular god. The first line of Genesis in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth actually reads in the Hebrew. In the beginning the gods created the heavens and the earth. The word Elohim, plural, is used 30 times in Genesis and 2,570 times in all. These include the terms, and the Elohim said let us make men in our image. The Elohim said come let us go down in the story of the Tower of Babel. And behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil in the Garden of Eden. Also in Genesis we have, and Elohim said, Let us make Adam. Terms like Yahweh Elohim or Yahweh of the gods, is translated as Lord and Lord God to hide the truth. It was impossible to eliminate the gods when these texts were first written because the whole of the world was worshipping a vast range of gods, representing the Anunnaki and others under different names, and the sun, moon, planets, stars and natural forces. The move from gods to God advanced rapidly with the advent of the Illuminati religion, of Christianity and when the Bible was translated into English. The King James version of the Bible, the most used translation of them all, was sponsored by King James I, the first king of England and Scotland, who took the joint throne after the death of Elizabeth I in 1603. Even most of the new Bibles are only updates of the King James version. The King James removed a lot of marginal notes included in its predecessor, the so-called Geneva Bible, published in 1560. The king wanted to revise the Bible text because, like his mother, Mary Stuart, he believed totally in the divine right of kings in which the monarch answered to no one except God, the gods. The Geneva Bible included phrases he did not like in relation to this divine right and so he had them removed. James was a Satanist and reptilian bloodline. Going back to the Egyptian pharaohs, his sexual desires preferred young boys, as recorded in numerous books and public records, and his lust for blood appeared insatiable. When he killed an animal he would literally roll in its blood, and he was responsible for the death and torture of thousands of witches. He suggested many of the tortures himself. This is the man who decided what the Bible does or does not say. I am sure that the mass slaughter of witches by King James and the Christian Church is connected with destroying certain bloodlines passed on through the female DNA. Sir Francis Bacon oversaw the translation of the King James Bible. He was from the reptilian bloodline and a high initiate of the Secret Society Network. As Grand Master of the Rosicrucian Order, he was a Knights Templar, an inspiration, behind the creation of Freemasonry and the Royal Society, and a key member of the team of initiates under Lord Draconis, Edward de Vere, which compiled the Shakespeare plays, out of Babylon, to Christianity. The Old Testament was joined by the New with the founding of Christianity a religion that was based on the same Levite fables. In fact, there was no New Testament until the 4th century ad. That's a long time for the text to be formulated for a religion that's supposed to have been started 300 years earlier. And who arranged for all this? The Roman Emperor Constantine the Great after ad 325. He was the official head of a Roman Empire controlled by the very same forces that had earlier controlled Babylon when the texts of the Old Testament started to be written. 
Just a coincidence, a. Vendel Indiana Jones, the director of the Institute for Judeo-Christian Research in Arlington, Texas, points out that primal Christians had only the Hebrew Torah, the first five books of Moses, the twenty-two books of the prophets and holy writings that included Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and the two books of Chronicles, plus the fourteen books of the Apocrypha, there was, they met and worshipped with the Hebrews in the synagogues and had no testament of their own. Jones stresses that when we see terms in the New Testament like, dot 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 the scripture saith dot 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 it is written dot 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 what saith the law. Thus saith the Lord, or, as the prophet said, they are referring to Old Testament writings. The first Christians based their faith on the texts of the Levites just as they still do today. As Vendel Jones says, the writers of what he calls the Newer Testament viewed the Older Testament of the Hebrew Scriptures as the supreme authority. Much later their writings became the Newer Testament. Their authority was in the Torah primarily. This was enforced by the prophets and holy writings. Their Newer Testament writings never showed or claimed supremacy over the Older Testament. They did all their writing in the Jewish mindset. This attitude always concedes all authority to the Torah. It never irritates or challenges the authority of the Hebrew Scriptures. The Big C is a big lie. Christianity was just an add-on to the texts and laws decided by the Levites and their successors during and after the Babylon captivity. So what is Christianity and where did it come from? If you are a Christian, I should sit down and strap in. Christianity is largely a sun religion and Jesus is not the sun, but the sun, or at least that is part of his symbolism. We have already seen the similarities between Jesus and Baldur of the Serpent cult also. Of course, the ancient sun religion of Berner, and throughout the ancient world, was written down as a symbolic story which Christians have been told to take literally. I hope you are ready for this, vicar. The main form of communication in the ancient world was symbolism and parable. And to understand the ancient sun symbolism is to understand the major religions. They use the symbol in figure 32 to symbolize the sun's journey through the year. Or, more accurately, the earth's journey in relation to the sun. This is the so-called sun cross. It can be found throughout the ancient world. They drew a circle and a zodiac, a Greek word meaning animal circle and added a cross to mark the four seasons, and the solstice and equinox points. At the center of the cross they place the sun and this is where the theme of the sun, or symbolically the sun, on the cross originates. A similar symbol was used in Lemuria relating, James Churchward says, to the primal forces of creation. A long list of pre-Jesus deities were given the birthday of December 25th because of this sun symbolism. The winter solstice, the lowest point or the sun's power in the northern hemisphere, is on December 21st divided by 22nd. This was the time when the ancients said that the sun had died and gone down into the dark place. By December 25th, three days later, they said the sun had begun its journey back to the peak of its power in the summer and so they said that on this day the sun was born or born again. The ancient sun gods were given this birthday, three days after the winter solstice, for this reason. These deities didn't exist, as everyone now accepts. They were symbolic of the sun and so was Jesus, along with much other symbolism. The Christian Christmas is an ancient pagan festival under another name and so is Easter. On March 25th, the old date for Easter, the sun enters the astrological sign of Aries, the ram or the lamb, and they sacrifice lambs in their rituals at this time to appease the gods and ensure a bumper harvest. Put another way, they believe the blood of the lamb would encourage the gods to forgive their sins. The story of Samson in the Old Testament is the same sun symbolism. The ancients symbolized the sun's annual cycle as the life of a man. They would portray the sun as a newborn baby on December 25th and he would grow up to become a big, strapping, very strong man at the summer solstice. This is the peak of the sun's power in the northern hemisphere when it dominates the darkness at the longest day. At this time, the sun man would be given long golden hair to symbolize the powerful rays of the summer sun. As the sun entered the house of Virgo the Virgin, the house of Delilah, at the start of autumn, this sun man would have his hair cut shorter as the power of the sun began to fade. This is the real story of Samson. He was not a real person, but symbolic of the sun. Samson, like Jesus, St. Paul, and many other biblical characters, was said to be a Nazarene or Nazarite. Here we have the true meaning of the term Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the Nazarene. The town of Nazareth did not exist during the alleged life of Jesus. There is no mention of it in any records or on any maps, even though detailed Roman records were kept at that time. It was founded after the gospel stories were circulating. The Nazarite sect banned the cutting of hair, except in certain solar rituals because the hair represented the rays of the sun. This could be the real origin of this custom that still continues today in the Sikh religion. The Nazarenes or Nazarites wore black, as did the Babylonian Brotherhood. And this was inherited by the Christian Church. Today the Arabic word for Christians is Nasrani and in the Muslim Quran they are the Nasara or Nazara. This comes from the Hebrew word, Nazrim, 
which derive from the term Nazare Habrit or Keepers of the Covenant. The Anunnaki Covenant, it seems to me, Christianity was created by rehashing the ancient symbolic story of the sun, together with mystery school allegory and serpent cult symbolism presented as a literal story in an historical context. The elite priesthood and other initiates knew what the story really meant, and still do, but they tell the people it is literally true, and damnation will befall them if they don't believe it. Some 1,200 years before Jesus, the following was said in the east of the heathen Savior. Varishna, he, was born to a virgin by immaculate conception through the intervention of a holy spirit. This fulfilled an ancient prophecy. When he was born, the ruling tyrant wanted to kill him, and his parents had to flee to safety. All male children under the age of two were slain by the ruler as he sought to kill the child. Angels and shepherds were at his birth and he was given gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. He was worshipped as the savior of men and led a moral and humble life. He performed miracles, which included healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, casting out devils, and raising the dead. He was put to death on the cross between two thieves. He descended to hell and rose from the dead to ascend back to heaven. Just a coincidence, Archbishop. Well how about these, then? They all predate Jesus, often by thousands of years. Adis, the son of God of Phrygia, he was born on December 25th to a virgin mother. He was called a savior, the only begotten son, and died to save humanity. He was crucified on a Friday Black Friday and his blood was spilled to redeem the earth. He suffered death with nails and stakes. He was the father and son combined in an earthly body. He was put in a tomb, went down into the underworld. But three days later, on March 25th, his body was found to have disappeared from the tomb and he was resurrected as the Most High God. His body was symbolized as bread and eaten by those who worshipped him. Krishna, Christ, the son of God of India. He was born to a virgin mother on December 25th and his father was a carpenter. A star marked his birthplace, and angels and shepherds attended. The ruler slaughtered thousands of infants in an effort to kill him. But he survived and went on to perform miracles and heal the sick, including lepers, the blind, and the deaf. He died at about the age of 30 and some traditions say he was crucified on a tree. He was also portrayed on a cross, rose from the dead, and was considered the savior. His followers apparently knew him as Jesius or Jesius, which means pure essence. It is said that he will return on a white horse to judge the dead and fight the prince of evil, Dionysus or Bacchus, the son of God of Greece. He was born to a virgin mother on December 25th and put in a manger and swaddling clothes. He was a teacher who traveled, performing miracles. He turned water into wine, like the sun, and rode in triumph on an ass, so did the Egyptian deity. Set. He was the ram or the lamb, god of the vine, god of gods and king of kings. Only begotten son, bearer of sins. Redeemer, anointed one, Christos, Alpha and Omega. He was hung and crucified on a tree, but rose from the dead on March 25th. During the first century BC, the Hebrews in Jerusalem also worshipped this deity. J.M. Roberts writes in Antiquity Unveiled, Health Research, 1970. That wise, the Phoenician name for Bacchus, offers the origin to Jesus. He says wise can be broken up into I, the one, and ease, fire and light. Taken as one word, wise means the one light. He goes on, this is none other than the light of St. John's Gospel. And this name is to be found everywhere on Christian altars, both Protestant and Catholic, thus clearly showing that the Christian religion is but a modification of Oriental sun worship. Attributed to Zoroaster, the Christians read the same letters IHS in the Greek text as Jess and the Roman Christian priesthood added the terminus us. Here are some of the other pre-Christian deities of whom the Jesus story was told. Apollo, Hercules, and Zeus of Greece. Adad and Marduk of Assyria, Buddha Sakya and Indra of India and Tibet, Salavahana of southern India and Bermuda, Osiris and Horus of Egypt. Odin, Baldr, and Frey of Scandinavia, Crit of Chaldea, Zoroaster of Persia, Baal and Tata of Phoenicia. Bali of Afghanistan, Zhao of Nepal, Watoba of Bilinganese, Zamalxis of Thrace, Zor of the Bonzes, Chuchulain of Ireland, Divatat, Kodam, and Samanakedam of Siam, Alcides of Thebes, Mikado of the Sintus, Bedru of Japan, Hesus or Eros, and Bremerlam of the Druids, Thor, son of Odin, of Gauls, Cadmus of Greece, Hill and Fida of Mandates, Gentot and Quetzalcoatl of Mexico, Universal Monarch of the Sibyls, Iski of Formosa, Divine Teacher of Plato, Holy One of Zaka, Fohai, Io, Laokim, Changtai, and Tain of China, Ixion and Quernus of Rome, Prometheus of the Caucasus, Mohammed or Mohammed of Arabia, Dasbog of the Slavs, Jupiter, Jove, and Quirinius of Rome, Mithra of Persia, India, and Rome. The cult of Mithra originates thousands of years before Jesus and yet again tells the later Christian story in fine detail. It is even said that gold, frankincense, and myrrh were offered to him. By the time that Jesus was invented by the Anunnaki priesthood, 
the Mithraites and religion were widespread throughout the Roman Empire. When they founded Christianity in Rome, they used the symbols and myths of the Mithric rituals. Mithra's sacred day was Sunday because he was, like Jesus, symbolic of the sun. Mithra worshippers called this the Lord's Day and they celebrated the main Mithra festival during what is now Easter. Mithra initiations were held in caves adorned with the signs of Capricorn and Cancer, symbolic of the winter and summer solstices. He was portrayed as a winged lion standing within a spiraling serpent. The lion and the serpent are, of course, major symbols of the serpent cult. Illuminati. The Roman Church encompassed the Mithra Eucharist into its Christian rituals. Mithra was claimed to have said, He who shall not eat of my body nor drink of my blood, so that he may be one with me and I with him, shall not be saved. The very site on which the Vatican was built was a sacred place of Mithra worship. It still is. They just call him Jesus. As I have written before, the cult of Mithra simply became the cult of Mithra. Christianity. Mithra was a symbol for the sun and so was his Christian version. Jesus was the light of the world, the sun, he will come back on the clouds and everyone shall see him. The sun, Jesus walks on water, the sun's reflection does that. Jesus performed his father's work in the temple at the age of twelve and started his ministry at thirty. The sun reaches its daily peak at twelve noon when the ancients, like the Egyptians, said that the sun was the most high god. The sun enters each sign of the zodiac at thirty degrees, hence he starts his ministry at thirty. Jesus is claimed to have turned water into wine because that is what the sun does by making the grapes grow. There is much zodiac symbolism in the Bible, as with the two fishes, Pisces, and the twelve baskets, zodiac signs, into which Jesus places his multiplied loaves during the feeding of the five thousand. Jesus was the fish and fisher of men perhaps because the earth was entering the sign of Pisces the fish at the time he was supposed to have lived. But there is so much fish symbolism with regard to these solar deities throughout history that we cannot ignore a symbolic connection with the tales of fish gods and amphibious beings. The Nama or Anadoti etc. of Sirius. Remember, too, that the Dogon recount the story that the amphibious Namo said that one of them would be crucified. The translation of the end of the world comes from the Greek eon and refers to the end of the age and not the world. The end of the age is the end of the 2160-year cycle, during which the earth passes through an astrological sign. Today we are nearing the end of another age, as we leave Pisces and enter Aquarius. Here are some more of the Jesus myths decoded. Jesus, the historical character. Outside of the New Testament texts there is no sign or record of Jesus whatsoever. A mention in the works of the Hebrew historian Josephus is an obvious later addition in the priesthood's desperation to cross-reference their meal ticket. More than forty writers are known to have chronicled the events in Israel, Palestine at the alleged time of Jesus and not one of them mentions him. The writer Philo lived throughout the life of Jesus and wrote a history of the Judeans, which covered this whole period. Philo lived in or near Jerusalem at the time that Jesus was supposed to have been born to a virgin mother, made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, and was crucified and rose again. In this same period, King Herod is also claimed to have killed all those children trying to eliminate the Savior. What does Philo say about these amazing events? Nothing, zilch, the big round circle. It is the same with the Roman records and the work of every contemporary author. There is a simple explanation for this. These events never happened because there was no Jesus. Jesus the Christ. The word Christ comes from the Greek Christos, which simply means anointed. The anointing was performed with the fat of a crocodile, menstrual blood, and goodness knows what else. The term was used for any Israelite king or priest and could be applied to anyone who has been anointed. The Babylonian Tammuz was called the Christos or sacred king and the same or similar terms were applied to many of these pre-Christian Jesus figures. The name Jesus is also a Greek translation and if he did exist which he didn't. His name was certainly not Jesus. Jesus was born to a virgin. The virgin mother of the sun god is an ancient theme found all over the world. This could relate to the solar myth that the sun was born in a new or virgin moon and at certain times the constellation of Virgo rose with the sun. It is also far from impossible that the artificial impregnation of women by the gods may have been an ancient origin to this concept. 2. So many heroes like Merovi and Alexander the Great were said to be the result of their mothers being impregnated by a non-human entity and not by intercourse with their husbands. Albert Pike, a notorious Illuminati operative in the United States, wrote in The Morals and Dogma of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, L.H. Jenkins, 1928, of the Egyptian myth from which the Christian themes originated. At the moment of the winter solstice, the virgin rose, with the sun, having the sun, symbolized as Horus, in her bosom. Virgo was Isis, virgin mother of Horus, and her representation, carrying a child, Horus in her arms, exhibited in her temple, was accompanied by this inscription, I am all that is, that was, and that shall be, and the fruit which I brought forth in the sun. Writer Gerald Massey reveals that on the walls of the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Luxor, Egypt, 
are portrayed scenes that are mirrors of the far later Jesus story. The God, that, the Annunciator of the Gods, can be seen hailing the Virgin and telling her she is going to give birth to the coming Son. Another scene depicts the God, Nept, impregnating the Virgin with the Holy Ghost or Spirit for the Immaculate Conception. Then the child is seen enthroned and receiving gifts from three spirits and he is adored as the incarnation of the Son God. Even the story about Jesus being born in a manger comes from ancient Egypt, as Massey explains. The birthplace of the Egyptian Messiah at the vernal equinox was figured in Apt, or Apta, the corner. But Apta is also the name of the crib in the manger, hence the child born in Apta was said to have been born in a manger. And this Apta or crib or manager is the hieroglyphic sign of the solar birthplace. Hence the Egyptians exhibited the babe in the crib or manager in the streets of Alexandria, the bright star and the three wise men. A bright star marked the birthplace of Jesus, the Bible says. This is the same story told in Egypt about Sirius the brightest star we can see from Earth. The Egyptians said that the rising of the three stars of Orion's belt, the three kings, wise men or magi, marked the arrival of Sothis or Sirius, the star of Osiris and Horus. Further symbolism of the three wise men is that the magi were sun worshippers. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh were the traditional gifts given by Arabian magi to the sun and that's why they were given to Mithra in that version of the myth. The birth of Jesus in a stable or cave is repeated throughout the solar myth stories because the cave represents the dark place where the sun is said to go between the winter solstice and midnight on December 24th. Thus we have the three days in the tomb between the crucifixion of Jesus, the sun, and his resurrection or rebirth on December 25th. The cave may have other symbolism, too, however, because the Jesus story can be read on different esoteric levels at the same time tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. This is another common theme for the solar gods. Author and researcher Albert Churchward says the Egyptians estimated that it took 40 days after grain was sown before it appeared through the soil. This was a period of fasting and scarcity, he says, and so Jesus is depicted fasting in the wilderness and Satan challenges him to turn stones into bread. The battles between light and dark, and when Jesus defeated the darkness, is symbolic of the time in the sun's cycle when there is more light every day than dark. The 40 years the Israelites were supposed to have spent in the desert was similar grain symbolism turned into a manufactured historical text. The words of Jesus. The words attributed to Jesus are quotes from earlier saviors and deities. Horus delivered a sermon on the mount in Egyptian myth and the Jesus version is simply sayings from earlier texts. Like the books of Enoch, weave together into a narrative. Several of the Jesus parables came directly from Buddhism and Jainism. The Lord's Prayer derives from sayings in the Jewish Talmud and much older Egyptian prayers to Osiris and earlier it was a prayer to the goddess, the giver of bread or the grain mother, the Marys. Mary is an ancient name for the goddess that miraculously gives birth to the Savior Son God. Its forms include Mary, Mary, Maradu, Mara and Maryham. On one level, these names relate to the sea, Mer or Mar, and Mary represents the feminine, the moon, the queen of heaven, to balance the masculine sun but they also relate to the dragon queens. Isis, the Egyptian moon goddess and virgin mother of Horus, was known as Mother Mary or Mata Mary and called the Queen of Heaven, Our Lady, and Mother of God. El in the Edda text was also known as Mary. The Hebrews worshipped a god and goddess deity called Mariel or Mary God, and the Mother Mary of Christianity is just another name for the ancient goddess known as El, Isis, Ishtar, Barati, Artemis, and Diana. The Christian religion, like its bedmate Judaism, sought to remove the feminine principle from the public domain. And the ancient trinity of father-son-mother became father-son-holy ghost. The grotesque suppression of women would follow, justified by the invented words of the mythical Saint Paul, Wives submit to your husbands for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now if the church submits to Christ so should wives submit to their husbands in everything. And, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Such words were written by the priesthood and initiates to introduce the institutionalized suppression of the female. This attitude can still be seen today. Anne Whittacombe, a very mixed-up British politician, even left the Protestant Church of England and joined the Roman Catholics when women priests were allowed by the C of E and this lady claims to be intelligent enough to run the country. The Illuminati set out to close down the feminine, intuitive, energy that connects us all, including men, to our higher levels of being. The unrestrained male energy is out there, expressing itself outward into the physical world and, without the feminine, it becomes isolated from its deeper self. Macho man is an extreme expression of this. They are lost little boys who have symbolically lost touch with their inner mum. But while suppressing the female among the masses, these religions have continued to covertly worship the Illuminati goddess, symbolized as the dragon queen or queens and the snake mother. There has been increased pressure in the last few years to increase still further the role of the mother goddess. 
Mary, in the Roman Catholic Church. Millions of signatures have been received from 157 countries pressing the Pope to make Mary a co-redemptrix. They want Mary to be recognized as equal to Jesus, in effect. All prayers and petitions from believers would have to flow through Mary who would bring them to the attention of Jesus. A bit like a doctor's receptionist. Really, she would also play the pivotal role in the Trinity as daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I know it's all bollocks, but it emphasizes the scale of goddess worship within the Illuminati's Roman Catholic Church, which, at the same time, acts as a major suppressor of the human female. Mary Magdalene, the reformed prostitute or whore, is another version of the goddess symbolism. She portrays the great whore of Babylon, the goddess, Mariana Ishtar. The ritual of the sacred harlot or priestess anointing a savior king goes back to Sumer and further to Atlantis. And, no doubt, Lemuria. It was a pagan priestess who announced the resurrection of Osiris, Adiz, Dionysus, and Orpheus, just as Mary Magdalene was the first to see the resurrected Jesus. It's all symbolism from the ancient mystery religions and it was used to create a mythical hero for a manufactured prison religion. As I have mentioned, Mag also appears to be code of the reptilian DNA passed on by the female line. The mitochondrial DNA, Jesus was crucified. Many of these mythical solar deities like Jesus were crucified for the sins of the people. It is an ancient ritual. Jesus, the sun on the cross, is the sun at the spring equinox on one level and the dying balder on another. The crown of thorns is symbolic of the halo, which the ancients portrayed around the head of all of their sun gods. The points around the head of the Statue of Liberty and other Illuminati deities are the rays of the sun or crown of thorns. The words attributed to Jesus my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, were taken from the Passover ritual at Jerusalem, according to some researchers. The cross itself is not a uniquely Christian symbol. It was used as a religious symbol for thousands of years before Christianity. And Jesus told his disciples to pick up thy cross and walk before the crucifixion cross even entered the story. Indeed, the man on the cross was so widely used by the pagans that the early Christians rejected it. The Central American god Quetzalcoatl was depicted nailed to a cross. The cross is symbolic of the equinox when day and night are equal and the sun is about to win its victory over the darkness. At the moment Jesus died on the cross, according to the gospel narrative, the land became dark. So it would if the sun had died, as it was symbolically doing. As for the resurrection after three days, this is more sun symbolism. In Persia, long before Christianity, they had a ritual in which a young man, apparently dead, was restored to life. He was called the Savior and his sufferings were said to have ensured the salvation of the people. His priests watched his tomb until midnight on the equinox and they cried, Rejoice! O sacred initiated, your God is risen, his death and suffering have worked your salvation. The same was said in Egypt of Horus and in India of Krishna thousands of years before Christianity. And Jesus could not have been crucified between two thieves because crucifixion was not the Roman punishment for theft. The two thieves are possibly symbolic of Sagittarius and Capricorn, which cross over at the winter solstice. Thus the sun dies between them, John the Baptist. This guy was invented from the stories of Anup, who baptized the ancient Egyptian son of God, Horus. Like John, Anup lost his head. Thor, Indara, the first king of Sumer, was known as Bill the Baptist on Sumerian seals and he was Ad or Autumn baptizing the infant crown prince in Egyptian sculpture. Baptism was introduced by the Sumerians, not the Christians, and appears to have originated, at least in the post-cataclysmic era, in the Phoenician, St. George Center of Cappadocia. John the Baptist, and his association with water, further symbolizes the water sign of Aquarius, through which the sun travels to be baptized. According to myth, the sun enters Aquarius at 30 degrees and Jesus is baptized at 30. The zodiac circle was renamed the crown of the circle of the holy apostles, zodiac signs, by medieval monks and they placed John the Baptist in the position where Aquarius is located. King Arthur and the twelve knights of the round table are also sun and zodiac symbolism. In the Roman Julian calendar John the Baptist dies on August 29th and John Jackson points out in Christianity before Christ. American Atheists 1985 on that day, a specially bright star, representing the head of the constellation of Aquarius, rises whilst the rest of the body is below the horizon, at exactly the same time as the sun sets in Leo, the kingly sign representing Herod. Thus the latter beheads John, because John is associated with Aquarius, and the horizon cuts off the head of Aquarius. The reference to the man carrying the water pitcher in Luke's Gospel is more Aquarius symbolism. John the Baptist was an almost exact copy of Balarama the foreigner of Krishna, the Hindu son of God, Jesus and the twelve disciples. Is there a universal law that all deities must have twelve disciples or followers? Jesus had them, so did Horus, Buddha, King Arthur, 
Mithra, Dionysus, and so many other symbols of the sun. We also have the twelve sons of Jacob, twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve gods of the Greeks, Egyptians, and Persians. This fixation with twelve derives once again from sun symbolism with their disciples and followers representing the months of the year and the signs of the zodiac. The Romans openly symbolized the sun as a living man and the signs of the zodiac as his disciples, and the Christian religion was created in Rome. Mark, Luke, Matthew, and John, the names carried by the Gospels, represent the four cardinal signs of the zodiac. These are also symbolized in Christian cathedrals as a man, Aquarius, an ox, Taurus, a lion, Leo, and an eagle, Scorpio, together called the four creatures of the apocalypse. Joseph Wellis says in Forgery in Christianity, Health Research, 1990. The Holy Twelve had no existence in the flesh, but their cue being taken from Old Testament legends, they were mere names. Dramatis Persini, mask of the play, of tradition, such as Shakespeare and all playwrights and fiction writers create for the actors of their plays and works of admitted fiction. In the ancient mystery schools, long before Jesus, the spokesman for the god was called a Petr or Peter. This means the rock. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the name of the doorkeeper to heaven is Petra. Peter rushing into the water to greet Jesus is part of a ritual from ancient Egypt. The title Peter was also given to the high priest in the Babylon Mystery School. Peter further relates to phallic worship. The cock was a symbol of Saint Peter and the very name Peter comes from Peter and Petra. The cockerel, which can be seen on so many church steeples, is an expression of this and the Christian churches are full of ancient sexual symbolism. The countless references to pillars and groves in the Old Testament are also penis and vagina symbolism. Jesus said that Peter would deny him three times before the cock crowed and this is another theme of the solar mystery cults. The cock crowing three times was an omen of death. The symbolism of the gatekeeper, Peter, denying the sun permission to rise before its due time was a ritual found in a number of solar cults. The crow of the cock also announces the arrival of the sun. Remember, too, that basilisk, the mythical king of the serpents, became interchangeable with the term cacatrus. It was said that the basilisk was born of the cock's egg and in decorative heraldry the basilisk had the head and legs of a cock, a snake-like tail, and the body of a bird covered with serpent scales. The Roman god Janus, who held the keys, was fused into Peter when Christianity was founded in Rome in the form we know it today Janus was Enos, a name for Nimrod in Babylon. Even in the early years of the Roman church, which was supposed to have been founded on the rock of Peter, there is no mention of this guy. He was added to the story as the priesthood continued to put the whole fantasy together. The name Andrew, another disciple, has the same basic meaning as Peter, Petra, or Peter. This is why the mythical Andrew is said to have been crucified at Patras in Greece, where Andrew was a local god. James, the so-called brother of Jesus, is a rehash of Amset, the brother of the Egyptian sun god, Osiris. Amset was a carpenter and James was a carpenter. Amset was a great purifier and James was a great purifier. Disciple John, the favorite of Jesus, is a repeat of Arjuna, the favorite disciple of Krishna. John is actually known in Tibet as Arjun. John was the cousin of Jesus and his original, Arjuna, was the cousin of Krishna. Thomas was the disciple who insisted on touching Jesus after the resurrection to prove he was in the flesh, hence the term doubting Thomas. But Thomas is Tamas, that other savior god with the Jesus credentials. The Christian church dedicates the winter solstice, the day the sun dies, to St. Thomas. The Hebrews still have a month they call Tammuz. Thomas the twin is also symbolism. Thomas means twin in the Aramaic and Syriac languages and the name Didymus, also associated with Thomas, comes from the Greek Didymos, which was their name for the Roman Gemini, the twins of the Zodiac. Acharya writes in her superb work, The Christ Conspiracy. It is said that Thomas preached to the Parthians and Persians, but what is being conveyed is that these groups were followers of Tammuz or Dumuzi as was his Sumerian name. Although it was alleged that Thomas's tomb was in Edessa, tradition also claims that he died near Madras, India, where two of his tombs are still shown. This tale comes from the fact that when Portuguese Christian missionaries arrived in southern India they found a sect who worshipped a god named Thomas and whose religion was nearly identical to Christianity. So disturbed were the Christian missionaries that they created elaborate stories to explain the presence of the St. Thomas Christians, claiming that the apostles Thomas and or Bartholomew had at some point traveled to India preached and died there. The missionaries were bewildered by the fact that the religion was Christian in virtually every aspect except one. They did not worship Jesus and had never heard of him. The Thomas they were worshipping was Tamas, the hero of the Jesus story for thousands of years before Christianity. Signs of Tamas, Thomas worship have been found in India where, Acharya tells us, he was apparently considered a reincarnation of Buddha. The villain of the Jesus story is Judas, who represents Scorpio, the backbiter the time of year when the sun is weakening and appears to be dying. He was portrayed with red hair, the color of sunset, and so was the Egyptian figure, 
Set, who sought to kill Horus. Judas is supposed to have betrayed Jesus for thirty pieces of silver. This represents the thirty days of the moon cycle and it was the same amount paid to the great goddess in Jewish temples for each sacrificial victim. St. Paul. Here we go again. The only record of the existence of St. Paul or Saul of Tarsus is in the New Testament texts. It is the same with Jesus, same with all of them, and the same with the key players in the Old Testament stories. The Roman historian Seneca was the brother of the proconsul of Achaea when Paul was supposed to have spoken there. But, although Seneca wrote about far more mundane matters, not a titter is recorded of Paul's public crusade. Who am I speaking about here? He lived in Tarsus in Asia Minor as a youngster. He went to Ephesus where he spoke to vast crowds and performed miracles, and traveled to Athens and Corinth. From there he went to Rome where he was accused of treason, moved on to Spain and Africa, and returned to Sicily and Italy. He was summoned to Rome and thrown in prison, from where he later escaped. Sounds remarkably like the story of the Nazarene, St. Paul, but these events were from the life of the Greek figure Apollonius of Tyana, called the Nazarene in some account. He was also known in Latin as Apollus and Paulus. Long before the stories about Paul, the Jewish historian Josephus wrote of a terrifying sea journey he experienced on his way to Rome. His story turns up again in precise detail in the New Testament, claiming to be an account of what happened to Paul. The story of Paul, and a story is all it is, also shares many detailed similarities with the myths of the Greek hero Orpheus, who, like Paul, had a missionary called Timothy. The writer H.G. Well said that many of the phrases used by Paul for Jesus were the same as those used by the followers of Mithra. The liturgy of Mithra is the liturgy of Jesus. When Paul is made to say they drank from the spiritual rock and that rock was Christ, he is using exactly the same words found in the scriptures of Mithra. The author of an internet article called The Other Jesus picks up this theme, that the names of the close associates of Paul seem to be an exact match with great figures associated with the mysteries of Demeter in general and with Orpheus in particular, is yet another of those issues that bothers people much less than it should. Let us examine the parallels, Orpheus, as a result of the pre-Christian Son of God having appeared to him, mounted a highly successful campaign to spread his version of the mysteries of Samothrace home of the Amazon female serpent tribe from Atlantis. To mainland Greece, Paul, we are told, because the Christian son of God, Jesus, appeared to him, mounted a highly successful campaign to spread his version Christian Jesus worship beyond Palestine and westward to mainland Greece. This is an excellent example of my theme here. The initiated priesthood took the symbolic stories from their mystery schools and presented them as historical fact to create prison religions for the people. The rituals, rites, and themes of the Orpheus cults were the same as the later Christian ones. There is so much more to tell about this story and I recommend The Christ Conspiracy, Bible Myths, and other books listed in the bibliography if you want more detail and sources. The Bible has controlled the minds and lives of billions and has held much of the world in mental and emotional servitude for thousands of years. Christians laugh at the idea of reptilian bloodlines, and yet believe that their God would send his only son and make him suffer vicious torture and a horrible death to forgive the sins of everyone else. At the same time, we are told this is a God of love. It's nonsense, of course it is, but the writers knew that. It was not the truth they wished to communicate. The idea was to manufacture strict religions, which would frighten people into obeying and believing. The whole thrust is that if you don't believe their truth you will end up in hell. However, to avoid the problem of everyone being nice to each other, the last thing the Anunnaki want, they emphasize that you do not get to heaven through good works, but only by belief in Jesus as your Savior. You could cause untold death and suffering during your life and still book your place in paradise, as long as you believed in Jesus. Also, Jesus was the only one born without original sin and there was no way we could be perfect like him. You are born a flawed, soiled piece of shit before you breathe your first, so know your place. The priesthood parked their backsides between God and the people and made themselves the middlemen for messages between the two. What the priesthood told the people to do was really God speaking through them, they claimed. This is why the Pope is called the Vicar of Christ, the deity's representative on earth. I look in some detail in the biggest secret at how the gospel story was written and how the Christian religion and the Bible were created. So I won't repeat it all again here, except for some key themes, which are important for new readers to know. There are two main theories for how the original gospel, God's spell, narrative came to be compiled. One is the Paizo theory. This was detailed by Abelard Ruchlin in the true authorship of the New Testament, first printed in the United States in 1979. There is also a website called the Paizo homepage, which focuses on this story and the Illuminati bloodlines. Ruchlin tells of an inner circle or inner ring, the most exclusive club in history, who knew the great secret. In this circle, he says, are the religious, political, and literary leaders who knew the truth about Jesus but didn't want anyone else to know. He writes, The New Testament, the Church and Christianity, were all the creation of the Calpurnius Piso, pronounced Peso, family, 
who were Roman aristocrats, the New Testament and all the characters in it Jesus, all the Josephs, all the Marys, all the disciples, apostles, Paul, John the Baptist, all are fictional. The Paisos created the story and all the characters. They tied the story to a specific time and place in history. And they connected it with some peripheral actual people, such as the Herods, Gamaliel, the Roman procurators, etc. But Jesus and everyone involved with him were created characters. The Paisos were bloodline and were related to the King Herod featured in the Gospel story. As bloodline Roman aristocrats, they would have been initiates of the mystery religions and the symbolic stories that were used to manufacture Jesus and his life. The Paisos claimed descent from the founders of Rome, the wolf suckled Remus and Romulus. Ruchlin details the codes he says were used in the Gospel stories by the Paisos and their accomplice. The Roman writer and statesman, Pliny the Younger, the head of the family, Lucius Calpurnius, who was married to the great-granddaughter of Herod, was a close associate of the famous Roman writer. Seneca, both were killed by the Emperor Nero in the year AD 65. Ruchlin says, he suggests that the mythical stories of St. Peter and St. Paul being killed by Nero in Rome were inspired by these events. Ruchlin says that Lucius Calpurnius wrote his Ur Marcus, the first version of the Gospel of Mark, in about AD 60 and the others followed when the Paisos became very close to the Roman leadership. After his father's death, Arius Paiso, who used many names, including Cestius Gallus, became governor of Syria and took command of the Roman army in Judea. He was involved in the Judean revolt in AD 66 which Vespasian was sent to quell. Two years later Nero was killed by a Paizo agent, according to Ruchlin, and Vespasian became emperor of Rome with vital backing from the Paizo clan. It was Vespasian who ordered the sacking of Jerusalem and stole the temple treasures, including the Ark of the Covenant, whatever that was. Vespasian, as a Roman emperor, was an Illuminati frontman. According to Ruchlin's book, Arius Calpurnius Paizo wrote three of the Gospels in the following order. The Gospel of Matthew, at 70 minus 75, the updated Mark, 75 minus 80, and, with the help of Pliny the Younger, the updated Luke, 85 minus 90, he says that the Gospel of John was the work of Arius' son, Justus, and followed in 105. Ruchlin is certainly correct when he says that Jesus was a composite figure, and the stories include elements of the tales of Joseph in Egypt and other Old Testament characters, plus some writings from the Hebrew-Egyptian Essenes, the characteristics of various pagan gods and Balder of the serpent cult. He also says that the Paisos made changes and additions to some Old Testament texts and wrote most of the 14 Old Testament books known as the Apocrypha. Ruchlin contends that Arius Paiso was the real name of the Hebrew historian known as Josephus. This would certainly explain why a Hebrew like Josephus, who claimed to have fought the Romans, lived in Rome for 30 years while he wrote books on Jewish history and married into Roman aristocracy. Ruchlin says that St. Paul was manufactured in the same way as Jesus and it's interesting that Paul's hazardous sea journey was a repeat of what Josephus said happened to him. Paul was also portrayed as a Hebrew who became a Roman citizen and Josephus said the same of himself. Ruchlin writes that between 100 and 105, Arius, his son Justus, and Pliny the Younger, traveled with their family and friends to Asia Minor, Greece, and Alexandria in Egypt, to encourage the poor and the slaves into joining their new faith. Pliny created the first churches in Bithynia and Pontus, Ruchlin says. Pliny had visited these places a number of times in the year at 85 and this, he claims, was the origin of the first name of Pontius Pilate. The Roman procurator was only called Pilate in Matthew and Mark, the first gospels written by the Paisos. But in Luke, the one said to be written with Pliny, Pilate suddenly acquires the name Pontius. Luke was written in the very years that Pliny began to visit Pontus. According to Ruchlin, Pliny's letters, written under his own name, say that Justus Paiso was in Bithynia in the years 96 and 98 using the name Tullius Justus, and that the Paisos also located in Ephesus, home of the great temple to the goddess Artemis. Diana. Ephesus was also one of the birthplaces of the Christian religion. They visited all the locations claimed for St. Paul, and Ruchlin says that Justus Paiso and Pliny the Younger, Military name, Maximus, introduced into their St. Paul letters and stories many of their friends and codes indicating their involvement. Paul refers to Greet Herodian my kinsman, a code of the family connection to Herod, Ruchlin, says, It is a notable coincidence that the Paisos had extensive estates in Provence in the south of France, the very region where, the myths claim, the Jesus story, continued after the crucifixion thanks to Joseph of Arimathea, Mary Magdalene, and the Savior's offspring. Other researchers, like Acharya in the Christ Conspiracy, suggest that the Gospel stories more likely came from the writings of a guy called Martian of Pontus, who was not a believer in the literal existence of a Jesus in the flesh and wrote the Jesus story symbolically. Martian was a Gnostic, a word meaning knowledge, and they wrote widely in symbolism and allegory, Gnostic texts referring to the Jesus story. 
which were found in 1945 at Nag Hammadi in Egypt, have been used as proof that Jesus existed, but they are not. First, they were written long after the event, and second, the Gnostics were allegorical writers. Moses Maimons, the Hebrew philosopher and Gnostic of the 12th century, wrote, Every time that you find in our books a tale, the reality of which seems impossible, a story which is repugnant to both reason and common sense, then be sure that the tale contains a profound allegory veiling a deeply mysterious truth. And the greater the absurdity of the letter, the deeper the wisdom of the Spirit. Whoever wrote the original Gospel texts, it certainly wasn't the disciples. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as so many people believe, not even the Christian church claims that, but by using those names they can give that impression. And the human mind is manipulated and guided through images and impressions at the expense of fact. It is a staggering thought that not one writer of any biblical work is known or, as in the case of Paul, shown to have been a historical figure. I am convinced myself, pending further evidence, that the Paizo family were, at least in some way, involved in the creation of what became the Christian religion. They certainly provided a number of the early popes after the Illuminati's Roman Empire founded the Roman Church, the naked and poor, the man most responsible for the emergence of Christianity as a global force of control and suppression was Constantine the Great. He became Roman Emperor in Ad 312 after slaughtering his way to power. Constantine, the architect of Christianity, was the same bloodline as the Pisos. In one of the battles for the Roman leadership, at Milvian Bridge near Rome, the Christian legend claims that Constantine saw a vision of a cross in the sky with the words by this conquer, a pig in the sky, would have been more likely. The next night, so it is said, he had a vision of Jesus, who told him to put the cross on his flag to guarantee victory. Constantine is claimed to have converted to Christianity as a result of his visions. But the truth is that he never did, except perhaps on his deathbed as a bit of insurance. Constantine, wait for it, was a sun worshipper. His deity was Saul Invictus or the unconquered sun and he remained to his death the Pontifex Maximus of the pagan church. Saul was the name of an ancient sun goddess. C.F. Oldham in the Sun and the Serpent says that all solar dynasties were also serpent dynasties. He reads the meaning of serpent differently to me because I think it has a double meaning. But the connection between the two can always be found whichever way you interpret the symbol of the serpent. The worship of the sun goes hand in hand with the Illuminati's serpent rituals. Constantine threw his backing behind the Christian religion because to him it was no different to the sun cult he followed. Christianity began to pick up many followers of Mithra for the same reason and many pagans attacked the Christians for stealing their religion. So similar were they to each other. James H. Baxter, former professor of ecclesiastical history at St. Andrews University in Scotland, said, If paganism had been destroyed, it was less through annihilation than through absorption. Almost all that was pagan was carried over to survive under a Christian name. Deprived of demigods and heroes, men easily and half unconsciously invested a local martyr with their attributes, transferring to him the cult and mythology associated with the pagan deity. Before the fourth century was over the martyr cult was universal. Pagan festivals were renamed in Christmas Day. The ancient festival of the sun was transformed into the birthday of Jesus. The defining moment in Christian history came in Ad 325 when Constantine called together 318 bishops of the Christian church to his palace at Nikia, now Iznik in Turkey, for the infamous Council of Nikia. I say Christian, but in fact there were representatives of the sun and moon cults of Apollo, Osiris and Isis. Demeter, Ceres, Dionysus, Bacchus, Jupiter, Zeus, and, of course, Saul Invictus. So Jesus was naturally given the birthday of December 25th, the birthday of the sun. Nikia was the moment when Jesus and Christ were brought together for the first time in the way of the other anointed sun gods. The council was convened to end the conflict and squabbling between the followers of St. Paul's Jesus, a supernatural god, and those who questioned that Jesus could be the same as God. The latter were called the Arians after their leader, Arius a churchman in Alexandria, Egypt. Amid fistfights and mayhem, it was decided, on Constantine's insistence, that all Christians must believe in the supernatural Jesus. Or else, this belief, which is the foundation of Christianity to this day, was defined in the so-called Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Maker of all things, both visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, only begotten, that is to say, of the same substance of the Father. God of gods and light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both things in heaven and things on earth, who, for his men and our salvation, came down and made flesh, made man, suffered and rose again on the third day, went up to the heavens, and is to come again to judge the quick and the dead, and in the Holy Ghost. That's what they said about Nimrod and Tammuz Ninnis in Babylon. 
and goodness knows how many other deities in the pre-Christian world. The delegates at Nikia were told how to vote and those who refused were banished to remote islands. From this time, the Nicene Creed waged war on humanity as tens of millions were slaughtered in its name and the order went out to destroy all evidence that exposed their manufactured story as a scam. Native cultures and their records of history were destroyed in an orgy of genocide and inquisition lasting centuries and spanning the world. The Holy Inquisition of the Roman Church was not officially disbanded until the 19th century and today it is known as the Holy Office. The Great Library of Alexandria City of the Serpent's Sun and other centers of priceless ancient knowledge and records were destroyed under the banner of this vicious, arrogant creed. When the library at Alexandria was destroyed in Ad 391 by the order of the Emperor Theodosius some 700,000 scrolls, codices and manuscripts were lost forever. The force behind all this knew exactly what they were doing selling the masses a myth through which their agenda of suppressing knowledge and rewriting history could be justified. Behind Constantine, the Pisos, and the Popes were the Babylon Reptilian Brotherhood, by now located in Rome. Their rituals, temples, and symbols were the origin of those used today by Freemasons. These include the black and white squared floors, white gloves and aprons, secret signs and handshakes. Elite secret societies like the Order of Comachine Masters grew rapidly under Constantine. See the biggest secret. The Christian bloodlines. The bloodline theme continues with the creation and expansion of Christianity. The major players in the history of Christianity have been the same bloodline, the reptilian bloodline. Among them were the Paizo family, Herod the Great, Constantine the Great, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of what we now call Spain, who launched the Spanish Inquisition and supported Christopher Columbus, and King James I, who sponsored the translation of the King James Version of the Bible which, according to a survey in 1881, contains 36,131 translation errors. All of these people are the same bloodline. So are Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, the founders of the Mormons, and Charles Taze Russell, one of the founders of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Give me the statistical chances of that. It was these very forces that created the Bible and decided what would be in it. They brought together the texts of the Old Testament with the texts they wrote, or chose, to form the new. They translated it into Latin, English, and other languages. Even the original versions of the biblical texts continued to be changed and new phrases added whenever it suited them. The philosopher, Celsus, wrote to the church leaders in the third century, You utter fables, and you do not even possess the art of making them seem likely. You have altered three, four times and oftener. The texts of your own gospels in order to deny objections to you. Celsus said that the church leaders were forever telling their followers not to examine the evidence but to simply believe wisdom is a bad thing in life. Foolishness is to be preferred. He also wrote, they openly declared that none, but the ignorant fit disciples for the God they worshipped, and he said that the rule was let no man that has learned come among us. It was, and is, a religion to hijack the minds of the masses and to remove all those who knew the truth. But it is not the only myth religion that has been taken literally. So are all the rest. Even Buddhism, which is claimed to be more enlightened, came from the same source and was sold as historical fact. Look at Buddha's background. He was born on December 25th to the Virgin Maya, with a star and wise men in tow. He was a royal bloodline and the ruler was told to kill the child to avoid being overthrown. He taught in the temple at twelve, was tempted by the evil Mara, and baptized in the presence of the Spirit of God. He performed miracles, healed the sick, and fed five hundred people with a small basket of cakes. He died and was resurrected to Nirvana or Heaven. His tomb was miraculously opened and it was Buddha was the light of the world. The, the usual CV. In India, Buddha's consort is said to have been Ila or Ida and this was a name in the British Edda for El. The serpent goddess of the Edenites. Group sex. The Illuminati strategy can be seen so vividly in their religions. First, you create the original belief, like the belief in Jesus. This triggers division and conflict with the other religions around that time. Then you shatter that original belief into an ever-expanding list of sub-beliefs and offshoot churches. Now you have division between the belief and other beliefs, and within the belief itself. What a perfect situation for divide and rule. This has happened with Christianity, and the major fault line was the work of an Illuminati frontman called Martin Luther. In 1517, this professor of theology at Wittenberg University listed 95 complaints against the Vatican for selling pardons to raise money to build St. Peter's Church. Luther was excommunicated, but he burned the decree along with copies of Roman church law and launched his own Lutheran church. Protestant Christianity was born and it was used to engineer untold war and yet more slaughter. Countries fought each other and justified it as defending the faith, defending the agenda, more like. Ironically, the English King Henry VIII first supported Rome and was rewarded with the papal title, defender of the faith. But Henry, when he wasn't killing his wives, changed his mind and supported the Luther Revolution. 
He kept the title, though, and this is the origin of the term defender of the faith used by British monarchs to this day. The British crown is supposed to defend Protestant Christianity, but carries the title awarded by a pope. It's all such a farce. Martin Luther, who used a rose and a cross as his personal seal, was an agent of the Rosicrucian order. That ancient strand in the Illuminati web, Luther's Protestant creed was subdivided into countless sects. One was Calvinism, which later became the sickness of the mind known as the Puritan faith. This was used most effectively to instigate and justify the genocide of the Native Americans. The real name of John Calvin, the man who started all this, was Jean Cohen. He came from Noyons in France and was educated at the Illuminati's College du Montagu. This is where Ignatius Loyola, the Catholic, founder of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, was educated. The Jesuits go very high. In the Illuminati network, Cohen moved to Paris and then to Geneva, Switzerland, where he was known as Cohen. This name comes from Cahen, the name for priest, or prince in the ancient Egyptian mystery schools. In Geneva, he developed, or, more likely someone else did, the philosophy known as Calvinism. He changed his name again from Cohen to Calvin to make it more acceptable to the English who now became the prime target of this new religion. Calvinism was a designer religion for the next stage of the plan. It focused rigidly on the Ten Commandments of Moses and the literal interpretation of the Old Testament text, and it achieved many goals for the Illuminati. Up to this point, the Christian religion had banned usury, the charging of interest on loans, but Calvinism allowed it. This was perfect for the Illuminati bankers maneuvering at this time to take over England. And, when interest on loans became the norm, thanks to Calvinism, one of the greatest beneficiaries was Switzerland, where this religion was devised. Another role for Calvinism was to insist on the burning of witches and, in so doing, take more of the secret knowledge out of circulation, along with many DNA lines passed through the female that the Anunnaki wished to eliminate. The Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are two other Illuminati religions, which have emerged from the Judeo-Christian fantasy. I must stress again here that I am not challenging the right of anyone to follow any religion. Good luck to them. And there are many lovely, genuine, people involved in Christianity, Judaism, Mormonism, the Jehovah's Witnesses and all the rest. I am merely seeking to expose the manipulation of the hierarchy and the background that the rank and file are never told. Joseph Smith founded the Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter. Day Saints, after he claimed that an angel called Moroni appeared to him in 1823, this Moroni guy, he said, told him of the existence of a book of gold plates, containing the fullness of the everlasting gospel and an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the sources from which they sprang. The location was revealed to him and in 1827, with help from two magic stones called Urim and Thummim, he translated the plates into English. Urim and Thummim were, in fact, the names of knucklebones or dice used by Levite priests and the kings of Israel were said to follow their prophecies. These knucklebones were used in the mystery school holy place known as the tabernacle. Here we have yet another religion originating from the same source and another perpetuation of the Jesus myth. The gold plates, Smith said, were written in Reformed Egyptian. From this came the Book of Mormon two years later and his followers became the Mormon church in 1830. The pillars of the early church were Smith, his brother Hiram, and another guy called Brigham Young. They were all high-degree Freemasons and all from the Merovingian bloodline, the same as Piso, Constantine, James I, etc., etc. It is no surprise, therefore, to find that the Rothschilds, through their Kuhn, Loeb, financial operation in New York, funded the expansion of the Mormons. Kuhn, Loeb also helped to fund the Russian Revolution and the First World War. See, and the truth shall set you free. The Mormons were an Illuminati creation. Mormons recognize the Bible, but believe that Smith's writings are equally divine. They set up communities called Stakes of Zion and eventually settled in Salt Lake City, Utah. The Mormon city from where its sacrificial rituals and mind control programs are orchestrated. Another sacrifice and mind control sect to emerge from the Judeo-Christian scam is the Jehovah's Witness or Watchtower Society although as always. The vast majority of its advocates have no idea this is so. This worships the Hebrew angry god Jehovah. One of its leading founders was the pedophile and Merovingian bloodline, Charles Taze Russell a high-degree Freemason. Russell was close to the Rothschilds and, again, Kuhn, Loeb and company funded his operation. Islam was created to further polarize the religious divides and in the biggest secret I show some of the connections between the secret societies behind Christianity, including the Knights Templar and those at the heart of Islam. Among these were the assassins, from whom we get the term for politically motivated murder. The Muslim faith and the creed of Islam were inspired by the story of Muhammad or Mohammed. This was very similar in theme to the official version of how Joseph Smith inspired the Mormon religion. In 612, it is said, Mohammed had a vision and was told to start a new faith. Just as Smith later claimed, 
The date is interesting because some ancient peoples were told to expect an incarnation of God every 600 years and Muhammad came 600 years after Jesus. Once again the Muslims encompass elements of the Judeo-Christian fantasy. Muslims see Islam as an updated continuation of Judeo-Christian themes and they, too, trace their ancestry back to Abraham in the Old Testament. The alleged origin of the Hebrew belief system. Muslims believe that Abraham built the Kaaba, the sacred shrine of Mecca, and the focus of pilgrimage for Muslims all over the world. But it was originally a pagan temple to goddess worship featuring the famous black stone. W. Wynne Westcott, a founder of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, wrote in his work, The Magical Mason, that the black stone was first used for pagan rituals. A stone is ancient symbolism for the penis and for this reason many religions were founded on a stone or a rock. As with Peter the Rock and Christianity, in the Old Testament tale of Jacob, he anointed his stone with oil. Which sounds like great fun. Must try that one. The Quran, the Islamic holy book, which is supposed to have been inspired by God, mentions Jesus in 93 verses and treats him as a living person when clearly he was not. Allah, the Islamic God, is the same God, the Muslims say, as the Judeo-Christian Jehovah. They give credence to the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses in the Old Testament, but in truth the books of the Levites. Muslims say that Muhammad was the latest prophet, apart from all the others since and therefore, the most valid. As such, all Christians and Hebrews should convert to Islam, the Orthodox Muslims demand. The term jihad is the holy war that Muslims are urged to wage against all of those who will not accept the law of Muhammad. The very word, Islam, means to submit or surrender and Muslim means one who submits. Islam was another Illuminati creed that was to cost the lives of hundreds of millions in the bloody wars waged with Christianity and Judaism. These are three prison religions ultimately controlled by the same force. Islam, like Christianity and Judaism, was also a vehicle for the systematic suppression of women and the feminine principle. Again we see the connection to Freemasonry. After earning the three Blue Lodge degrees of Freemasonry and completing the Scottish or York Rite degrees, Masons can petition to become a Shriner. These who swear a blood oath and confess Allah as God. Allah is a moon god. This is why you will see a crescent moon at the top of mosques around the world and why the Shriners have the crescent moon on their Fez hats. This symbol is on the flags of various Islamic nations and Muslims fast during the month that begins and ends with the appearance of the crescent moon in the sky. I liked your face. The city of Jerusalem, the ironically named city of peace, is the myth capital of the world. I went there in 1993 to see this most sacred of shrines to Christians, Hebrews, and Muslims. What a summary of how religion has gripped and manipulated the human mind for so long. The old city, although not very big, is still broken in quarters for Christians, Hebrews, Muslims, and Armenians. After all, we don't want to set a precedent in life together. If you want to buy a myth or misunderstanding, this is the place. They've got hundreds of them. On street corners and at every church or monument there they are, lying in wait. Those spiritual used car salesmen, the tourist guides, many of them wear black leather jackets like some extra from The Godfather. These are the silver-tongued repeaters of make-believe who will sell you a myth tour of anywhere. Even at 7.30 in the morning, as I walked through the Jaffa Gate and into the near-deserted streets of the old city, I was not safe. I felt someone touch my arm. Hello my friend, a voice said you're from England. I know many people in England. They come from Glasgow. You know Glasgow. I knew his game immediately, but I decided to stick with him and see what happened. He said he approached me because I liked your face. As he had approached me from behind, I had clearly witnessed the latest recorded miracle in Jerusalem. I have no doubt that it has by now been added to the tourist itinerary. He said he wanted to show me around because he liked me. The money he would demand at the end had nothing to do with it, of course. He showed me the Wailing Wall, or Western Wall, that most sacred of places in the Hebrew religion, where they think they can speak to God. This ritual goes back at least to the Wailing for Tammuz in Babylon. Jews leave little messages for God in the cracks between the stones and they now offer a fax service to believers all over the world. You fax your message to Jerusalem and someone goes along and sticks it in a crack in the Wailing Wall. My next stop was Bethlehem, a short bus ride from Jerusalem. If you have never been there, forget the idea of O Little Town of Bethlehem. It's a right dump and an extension of the sprawl of modern Jerusalem. I walked with my guide through Manger Square to the Church of the Nativity on the site where Jesus is supposed to have been born. It is built over the cave where the Babylonian and Hebrew son of God, Tammuz, was also said to have miraculously entered the world. Popular place. The travel guide to Jerusalem and the Holy Land is in no doubt, however. It states categorically, this church is situated above the Grotto of the Nativity, a small subterranean chamber, in which a silver star marks the place of Jesus' birth. At the height of the tourist season, people stand in line for hours to see this grotto. Such is the power of myth and mind control. But this, luckily, 
was the off-season and I walked right in. What a performance unfolded before me. A small group of tourists watched as three men dressed up in various regalia were wailing away at each other. The only word I could make out was the odd hallelujah. One man in a black hood was leading a ceremonial sing-song, while another put on a crown and drank from a goblet in a manner that suggested he had just returned from the desert. The third man, who looked in urgent need of a good laugh, swished around with some object on a chain, which puffed out smoke occasionally. The one with the crown finished his drink and proceeded to read loudly and earnestly from a big red book. In Britain, the most famous big red book belongs to a television show called This Is Your Life. Personalities appear in front of a studio audience to have their life stories told by a man reading from the said. Big red book. The book in the grotto was a sort of Jesus Christ. This is your life and if the television show presented the lives of the rich and famous as inaccurately as the church has with Jesus, they would be sued or laughed out of existence in a month. Outside the grotto in Bethlehem, the guide introduced me to a friend of his. He likes your face, my guide informed me, and he invites you back to his home for a drink. We arrived at his home after a few seconds' walk. It was a nice home, but strange in a way. It had a large front window, credit card signs, counters, a cash register, and lots of shelves with things on. If I didn't know better, I would have said it was the image of a big souvenir shop. As I looked around, I didn't know whether to laugh or scream. You could buy holy this, holy that, holy anything. I didn't see any holy toilet paper, but it must have been there. In fact, given all the crap spoken about religion, I would have thought it essential. Among my favorites were little crosses made from holy earth from the holy land. In case I thought this was a con, the rapper assured me, each one inspected by a genuine Catholic family. Phew, that's a relief then. But nothing could surpass the plastic models of Jesus. In all sizes to suit all pockets. If you bought the small version, your Jesus only had a bit of wire for a halo. But really go for it and buy the deluxe model and you too. Could have a plastic baby Jesus with three genuine, gold-painted prongs sticking out of his head. As I surveyed this wondrous sight, the shop owner made his move. They are genuine, he said. Genuine. A genuine baby Jesus. They are made by local priests. Ah, that kind of genuine. I returned to the old city and the guide who liked my face wanted his money. Anything I gave him would be acceptable, he said, and then he tried to double it. We said goodbye and I walked around the outside of the city wall to the Garden of Gethsemane. Another Jesus sight. When I was close, I asked a passer by the way. He was most helpful and offered to show me. But hold on a minute, wasn't that a black leather jacket he was wearing? Suddenly he shape-shifted from passerby into tourist guide. This is the very tree where Jesus was arrested. These trees have been here for, excuse me. Thank you for your help, but I only want to stand here on my own, if it's okay with you. You mean you don't want me to show you the church and the tomb of Marion? No, thanks, all the same. I give you good price. By the end of my trip, I had this nightmare of leaving my physical body at the end of this life and a spirit in a black leather jacket touches my arm. Hello my friend, he says are you from planet Earth? I know many people on planet Earth. I show you heaven. I like your face. A Muslim taxi driver summed it up when I asked him if he believed all these stories about Jesus. He had no idea, he said, but Jesus is very good for tourist buses and taxi drivers because he moved around a lot. Religion is a whole bloody industry ripping off genuine people. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. Millions are on the payroll. Bishops' palaces, tourist guides, tacky gift shops, entire economies and political systems in some countries. All depend for their survival on this perpetuation of make-believe. From the Vatican to Bethlehem, from Jerusalem to Salt Lake City, the cash registers go on dancing to the music of myth. The Vatican and the other bastions of mind control know the information exists that would bring them crashing down. That's why they have worked so hard to suppress it. Unless they do, the party's over. No wonder there is so much opposition to information that will expose this global con trick when the economic and personal power of church and state depends on deception of monumental proportions. I must be one of the few people on the planet who can bring together in mutual condemnation all these conflicting religious dogmas. And a few more besides. I have been called anti-Semitic for my exposure of Judaism and people like the Rothschilds. I have been shunned and condemned by Christians for exposing the historical background to their religion and its present-day hypocrisy. From South Africa an Ike alert was sent out across the internet warning that I was anti-Islam. And many New Agers condemn me for being too negative of saying what is really happening, and for exposing the spiritual charlatans and the Illuminati manipulation of the New Age mentality. The reason I can unite such apparently opposing groups is that they all have one thing in common. They each have a dogma to sell or defend. As I am challenging all dogmas, impositions, and suppression, I can bring them together as one indignant voice. They are apasamas, the same attitude with a different frock on, but more and more people are freeing themselves from these prisons of the mind. The Illuminati Anunnaki could not care less which religion or mind prison you choose, so long as you choose one of them.
My philosophy on this is simple. If you can put a name to what you believe, you have built a wall around your mind. It doesn't matter what ism or entity it may be. Once you can give it a name you are closing the door on infinity where everything just is and we all just are. There are no names for infinite knowledge. It encompasses all that is, and once we succumb to an ism we disconnect from all that is. But then that's the idea, the whole point for religion in the first place, slamming the door on human consciousness. Even those who claim to have rejected conventional religion continue to be caught in its illusions. In the New Age, which does not believe in the Christian view, the myth of Jesus goes on. The Son of God of Christianity has become the New Age Sananda their name for Jesus. To them he is a spiritual master channeling wisdom from another dimension and, in other versions. He was an initiate of the Essene community in biblical Israel. Others who reject the official interpretations of the Bible stories also believe that Jesus existed in some form and they seek to construct their own thesis by reinterpreting the texts. They can read massive implications and revelations in the most innocuous word or phrase. Now the latest spin on Jesus is that his bloodline was continued through his children conceived with Mary Magdalene and became the true royal bloodline. Yawn, the veil only lifts when you realize that most of the Bible is pure invention, the symbolic made literal. No matter how you seek to interpret the words, it will almost always end up as bollocks because you are trying to literally interpret texts that were bollocks to start with. Only when we have a blank sheet of paper in our minds, free from this intellectual and spiritual pollution, can we possibly have the clarity to see through the game. Religion has been a curse on the world, and humanity will never know freedom until this curse has been exercised. It is the curse of ignorance, which has cast its dark shadow over thousands of years of human suppression by the Anunnaki and their bloodlines. More than anything, religion has been the driving force behind humanity's suppression of itself. Chapter 12 Serving the Dragon, the Present, 1. In war, the truth must be guarded by a bodyguard of lies. Winston Churchill If, as I have outlined here, the world is controlled today by the reptilian shapeshifters and their bloodlines, we should be able to find evidence of their modern activities that supports the accounts of the ancients. And we can, lots of it. Since 1990 when I began to consciously investigate what was really happening in the world, I had heard mention of reptilian beings. But naturally it seemed so fantastic that I put the information on the back burner until I could make some sense of it. That started to happen in early 1998 when I was traveling around the United States. In a period of about 15 days one met 12 separate people in different locations and from very contrasting walks of life, who told me the same basic story of seeing a human change into a reptilian form before their eyes. The people who told me these accounts included two television interviewers who saw their guest, a supporter of the New World Order agenda, shapeshift during a live interview. Afterwards one said he had been shocked to see the man's face turn reptilian and the other, equally shocked, said that she had seen his hands take on a reptilian look. Given that the viewer saw nothing, most of them anyway this had to be a case of psychically connecting with the fourth dimensional level of the guy rather than seeing a physical shift. A friend of one of these presenters was a policeman in Denver, Colorado, a major Illuminati and satanic center, where reptilian gargoyles, an Illuminati code, adorned the Denver airport. The policeman had made a routine visit to an office block in Aurora, near Denver, and commented to an executive of one of the companies there about the high level of security in the building. She said that he should look at the upper floors if he wanted to see some real security. She pointed to a lift that only went to the higher floors and she told him of an astonishing experience she had some weeks earlier. The lift had opened and a strange figure emerged. He was albino white with a face shaped like a lizard and eyes with pupils that were vertical like a reptile's. The highest level of the Draco royalty are albino white. This white lizard figure had walked out of the restricted lift, she said and into an official-looking car. The policeman was so intrigued by the story and the building that he made investigations into the companies in the upper floors. According to his friend, he said he found them all to be fronts for the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA, another man I met in that 15 days used to take large quantities of LSD in the 1960s and around the third day of a five-day trip, as he put it, the same thing always happened. Some people began to look like reptiles and it was always the same people. It never changed. He also began to observe that his friends who appeared lizard-like in his trips always seemed to react the same way to movies, television programs, and so on. We used to laugh and say here come the lizards, he told me. Drugs take people into altered states of consciousness and this can cause them to retune their dial to the lower fourth dimension. At this point, they will see that level of the people around them. Looking back from a perspective of greater knowledge, he believes there is what he calls a morphogenetic field, transmitted to the DNA of the lizard people and this aligned the cell structure to the Reptilian genetic blueprint. The more reptilian DNA a person carries, the easier it is. For this to happen, 
and the ones with most reptilian DNA are the hybrid bloodlines, of the Anunnaki designed specifically to occupy the positions of power. Interestingly, the Almec people of Central America, whose whole culture was based on serpent worship, used to take hallucinogenic psilocybin mushrooms that they called the flesh of the plumed serpent, and this took them into a fourth-dimensional awareness. The serpent frequency, in their rituals to the serpent sun, Dionysus, another Jesus, the Greek initiates would drink strong wine and take mind-altering drugs and mushrooms to unite with their son of God. At the end of those 15 days in the United States, when I was speaking at a whole life expo event, in Minneapolis, a gifted psychic lady told me how she sees people in power. Like Henry Kissinger, George Bush, and Hillary Clinton, turn into reptilians all the time. Once again she is accessing their fourth dimensional frequency. There are few more glaring examples of cold reptilian eyes than those of Hillary Clinton. One trait I have noticed in these shapeshifters or possessed people is that their eyes don't change, no matter what their mouth or the rest of their face are doing. They might be laughing, for instance, but their eyes never do. They have a fixed, cold stare. Next time you see Hillary Clinton, watch her eyes. I recalled at this stage that I had read something about reptilians in the book, Transformation of America, which details the life of a remarkable woman called Kathy O'Brien, her satanic father, who had abused her violently and sexually from the time she was a baby in Michigan in the 1950s, handed her over to Gerald Ford, later President Ford, for use in the Illuminati's now vast mind control operation, which I expose at length in The Biggest Secret. Kathy is blonde-haired and blue-eyed, the usual story, and I recommend her book to anyone who wants to know what is happening to literally millions and millions of children around the world. I looked through the index to find the reptilian references and, although she rationalized the experience as a mind-control illusion, what she describes is the same experience that so many others have been reporting. I explained earlier about Miguel de la Madrid, the president of Mexico in the George Bush years in the White House, and his story of the extraterrestrial shapeshifters he called the Iguana Race. These were the ones, he said, who were perfect for transforming into world leaders. In the book, Kathy reveals how George Bush, one of her main controllers, shapeshifted. She says he was sitting in front of her in his office in Washington, D.C. when he opened a book, depicting lizard-like aliens from a far-off deep space place. Bush claimed to be one of them and she said he appeared to transform like a chameleon into a reptile. Kathy tells in the book of how Bill and Bob Bennett, two well-known figures in U.S. politics, gave her mind-altering drugs at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center Mind Control Laboratory. They told her they were alien to this dimension, two beings, from another plane. Yes, the lower fourth dimension. Kathy continues, the high-tech light display around me convinced me I was transforming dimensions. With them, a laser of light hit the black wall in front of me, which seemed to explode into a panoramic view of a White House cocktail party, as though I had transformed dimensions and stood amongst them. Not recognizing anyone, I frantically asked, who are these people? They're not people and this isn't a spaceship, Bennett said. As he spoke, the holographic scene changed ever so slightly until the people appeared to be lizard-like. Aliens, welcome to the second level of the underground. This is a mere mirror, reflection of the first, an alien dimension. We are from a trans-dimensional plane that spans and encompasses all dimensions. I have taken you through my dimension as a means of establishing stronger. Holds on your mind than the earth plane permits Bill Bennett was saying. Being alien, I simply make my thoughts your thoughts by projecting them into your mind. My thoughts are your thoughts. This is another way that people are controlled and manipulated by thought. Transference. The reptilian mind becomes the human mind and you can see this happening all the time as the reptilian hive mind becomes the human hive. Mentality. Soon after returning from the USA and the rapid escalation of my reptilian research, I went to see a woman in England to discuss her knowledge of satanic rituals involving people like Ted Heath, the former conservative prime minister of Britain from 1970 to 1974. He signed the UK into the Illuminati's European community, now union, and persists to campaign for our further absorption into this centralized fascist state. As I was finishing this book, government papers were released after 30 years, which showed how Heath knew that entry into the European community would eventually mean the end of British sovereignty. But at the time, he denied this because the reptilians and their clones will say whatever is necessary to achieve their ends. Heath comes up often when you speak with the victims of these rituals, those who survive, and their torture as children by the satanic rings. This lady was brought up by a Scottish family and was sexually and ritually abused by the highly significant Scottish Illuminati network. As a result of this background, she became the wife of the warden of an area of woodland called Burnham Beaches, a few miles from Slough, west of London. It is an ancient site mentioned in the Domesday Book of the 11th century, and it is not far from both the British Prime Minister's country residence called Chequers. Chequers equals black and white squares of Freemasonry and the former Wycombe, 
Wicca, home of the Hellfire Club, Elfire, the Fiery Owl, with its human sacrifice rituals involving royalty, and the American, founding father, Benjamin Franklin, see the biggest secret, Burnham Beaches is, owned by the City of London, the globally important financial district, and one of, the most powerful Illuminati operational centers on the planet. For those who don't, live in the UK, the City of London does not mean the whole of the capital, it is the, area surrounding St. Paul's Cathedral where the original city stood and it was rebuilt by initiates like Sir Christopher Wren after the Great Fire of London in 1666. It is now a district within the vast sprawl we call London. The coat of arms of the city of London, an image you find all over Burnham Beaches, is dominated by two flying reptiles holding a shield adorned by the red cross on the white background. The Atlantean Sumerian Fire or Sun Cross, also used by the Knights Templar. When you enter the city of London you pass two flying reptiles on each side of the road and where the city of London meets the area called Temple Bar. Named after the Knights, Templar, there is another flying reptile in the center of the road. Temple Bar is the headquarters of the global legal profession and includes more elite secret societies per square mile than almost anywhere else on earth. It is from this Illuminati center, then, that Burnham Beaches is administered. The lady who told me about this area said that her husband, the warden in charge of the place, was a Satanist. She said he had to be to get the job. They lived in a big house in the woods and part of his work was arranging satanic rituals there. She said that one night in the early 1970s while Ted Heath was prime minister, she was walking through the woods after dark when she saw some lights. Quietly, she moved forward to see what they were and to her horror she saw a satanic ritual involving Heath and his chancellor of the exchequer, Anthony Barber. There is an artist's impression of the scene she saw in the picture section. She said that as she watched, hidden among the trees and undergrowth, Heath began to transform into a reptile and she said what staggered her was that no one in the circle looked the least bit surprised. He eventually became a full-bodied reptiloid, growing in size. By some two foot, she said, this is a common description by witnesses. She said he was slightly scaly and spoke fairly naturally, although it sounded like long distance, if you imagine the short time lapses. I met Heath once in a television station before I knew any of this and I never forgot the coldness of his eyes or how. They appeared to go on forever like two black holes. I have heard many people describe a similar experience with people they claim to have seen shape shift. The woman told me that she had seen other reptilian figures in Burnham Beaches at dusk or after dark, wearing long robes with hoods. You can see an artist's impression of two of the reptilian forms she has seen in figure 34. Shortly after I met her, I was introduced through a third party to the healer, Christine Fitzgerald, a close confidant of Princess Diana for nine years. You can read the full and amazing story of what she told me in The Biggest Secret, but I want to hold focus on the reptilian connection in this book. Christine Fitzgerald knew nothing whatsoever of my then unpublished reptilian research, but a little way into our conversation she told me that Diana called the Windsors the reptiles and lizards. Diana also used to say they're not human. Christine went on to tell me that the Windsors were a reptilian hybrid bloodline and how they had treated Diana in ways that were beyond the imagination. At the center of this circle, she said, was the Queen Mother. Christine told me that Princess Diana used to call the Queen Mother evil. I can think of no one on this planet, maybe even in history, whose real persona is more at odds with her manufactured image than the Queen Mother. If people only knew the truth, those sickening celebrations to mark her 100th birthday would never have happened. Christine said, The Queen Mother... Dot 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 now that's a serious piece of wizardry. The Queen Mother is a lot older than people think. To be honest, the royal family hasn't died for a long time. They have just metamorphosized. It's sort of cloning, but in a different way. They take pieces of flesh and rebuild the body from one little bit. Because it's lizard, because it's cold-blooded, it's much easier to do this Frankenstein shit than it is for us. The different bodies are just different electrical vibrations and they have got that secret, they've got. The secret of the microcurrents, it's so micro, so specific, these radio waves that actually create the bodies. These are the energies I work with when I'm healing. They know the vibration of life and because they're cold-blooded, they are reptiles. They have no wish to make the earth the perfect harmony it could be, or to heal the earth from the damage that's been done. The earth's been attacked for zeons by different extraterrestrials. It's been like a football for so long. This place is a bus, stop for many different aliens. All these aliens, they could cope with anything, including the noxious gases. They're landing all the time and coming up from the bowels of the earth. They looked like reptiles originally, but they look like us when they get out now through the electrical vibration. That key to life I talked about. They can manifest how they want to. All the real knowledge has been taken out and shredded and put back in another way. The Queen Mother is chief toad of this part of Europe and they have people like her in every continent. Most people, the hangers-on, don't know, you know, about the reptiles. They are just in awe of these people because they are so powerful. 
I know it is hard to imagine and grasp the scale of the Queen Mother's involvement through her life because your mind tells you she is a little old lady. But, as with all of these people, what you see is just the front image, not the real being. It is an extreme version of an agent in a foreign land operating behind a cover story of why he is there and what he is doing. It's just that these people have cover bodies. Also, Christine Fitzgerald was able to see what was going on because of her work with Diana and the aristocracy, and her understanding of energy, vibrations, and frequencies through her healing center. I have had to study an unbelievable number of subjects and research so many different strands of information before it was possible to put a picture together and that is one big reason why it has rarely come to light like this before. There is so much to know before you can see how the pieces fit together. The Illuminati have suppressed all information that is necessary to see the picture and you have to do so much work to overcome that. You also need a mind that is free, or freer and willing to go anywhere the evidence leads. A few weeks after my meeting with Christine Fitzgerald in 1999, my scientist friend in California, Brian Despero, told me there was a woman that I had to meet as soon as possible. This was Arizona Wilder, a recovering victim of the massive Illuminati Mind Control Network, who had worked for them at a very high level. She said she had conducted sacrificial rituals as a mother goddess for the British royal family, especially at Balmoral Castle in Scotland and at a notorious center for satanic ritual called the Mothers of Darkness Castle in Belgium. This is located in the same region as the headquarters of the cult responsible for the widespread pedophilia, murder, and child sacrifice that came to light amid enormous public anger in 1994. The ring involved famous pillars of Belgian society and a massive cover-up has ensued to keep it quiet. Belgium is a major Illuminati satanic center and that's why the European Union and NATO are based there. Arizona Wilder's original name had been Jennifer Green. She is a blue-eyed blonde from a French aristocratic bloodline with significant Irish blood, too. When her mind and her memories began to return after the death of her controller, the Nazi, Joseph Mengel, she changed her name to Arizona Wilder and dyed her hair to cover the blonde in an effort to break some of the programming related to that. Illuminati Mind Control Understanding the mind control network and its techniques is vital to appreciate the ways that the reptilians manipulate human society. Joseph Mengel was the angel of death in the Nazi concentration camps, who performed the horrific experiments on twins and others. There he developed a technique called trauma-based mind control in which they manipulated a mechanism of the mind that shuts out memories of extreme trauma. This kicks in when people have a serious road accident and can never remember the impact or the immediate aftermath because their mind puts an amnesic barrier around that memory. This means we don't have to keep reliving such a terrible event. My mother was hit by a car and suffered some awful injuries a little while ago. To this day she cannot remember from 30 seconds before impact until some 20 minutes after. On that level this mental defense mechanism is a good thing, but the Illuminati, particularly Menjo, perfected it for their own reasons. In fact, they have known about it for thousands of years, it's just that its widespread global use began to return in the 20th century. It is known as trauma-based mind control and they take children before the age of 5 and 6 and put them through the most unimaginable violent, sexual, and emotional abuse. Again they are chosen by bloodline. A lot of pedophile rings are set up and protected to serve this agenda. And when genuine people expose them, as in the North Wales scandal in the UK, the famous names involved are never allowed to come to light. These names include the pedophile Lord McAlpine of the famous British construction company. He is a former chairman of the Conservative Party and heavily involved in secret societies like the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. The unbelievable trauma these children are subjected to including satanic ritual, splits the mind into compartments, amnesic barriers that imprison the memories of the trauma and do not allow them to enter the conscious mind. In the Illuminati mind control centers like the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations in London, these compartments are known as altars. You might imagine a mind broken into a honeycomb of self-contained compartments, each holding individual memories of trauma. At the front of this honeycomb is the part that directly interacts with the world. They call this the front altar. This is completely unaware that all the other compartments exist and those compartments are unaware of each other. Therefore, the front altar, the one we take to be the real person, has no memory of what has happened to them or what is still being done until the barriers begin to break down and the memories they contain can enter the front altar. The conscious mind. Using hypnotic keys and triggers, mind controllers like Mengel move these different compartments around pushing the front altar into the unconscious and bringing forward one of the back altars. The victim is then sexually abused by a famous person, like George Bush or Ted Heath for instance, or programmed to carry out a future assassination or task. Afterwards that altar is returned to the non-conscious mind and the front altar, oblivious of what has just happened, is brought forward again. Those programmed for assassinations will not have a clue what has been done to them. Their assassination program, to kill a famous person or dangerous researcher, 
will lie dormant in the compartment until the trigger is given. This could be a word, phrase, or sound. When that happens, the dormant compartment swaps places with the front altar, takes control of the body, and carries out its programming. This is the true background to the mass killers like Thomas Hamilton, Dunblane, Scotland, Martin Bryant, Port Arthur, Tasmania, and the stream of similar cases in the United States, including Columbine High School, where crazed people have slaughtered the innocent, or at least been blamed for it. They are programmed multiples given a cover personality and background of being strange, which can then be used to dismiss the murders as the act of nutters. It is no accident that Timothy McVeigh, the man convicted for the Oklahoma bombing, was, according to the USA Today newspaper, given a mental assessment after his arrest by a man called Louis Jollyan West, a psychiatrist at the University of California. What the paper did not say was that West is one of the most notorious CIA mind controllers in America and the University of California is one of the leading mind control centers. It was West who made a mental assessment of Patty Hearst of the famous newspaper dynasty when she came out of the Symbionese Liberation Army. This was a terrorist gang in California in the 1970s and a creation of the Illuminati. In, and the truth shall set you free, you can read the evidence that McVeigh was not the man behind the bombing. But after his assessment by West, and no doubt a list of threatened consequences, he offered an almost non-existent defense when a very substantial one could have been mounted. The government appointed his lawyer. Later McVeigh conveniently asked to be executed. The reason for horrors like Oklahoma and the mass shootings, and why they are increasing, is to traumatize the collective mind and justify legislation of many kinds. More basic freedoms were removed from American society in response to Oklahoma and Bill Clinton called for an easing of restrictions of the military's involvement in domestic law enforcement. This is the technique I have called problem-reaction-solution. Covertly create the problem, get the public to scream something must be done, and then openly offer the solutions to the problems you have created, solutions that advance your agenda. One aim of the mass shootings is the removal of guns from public circulation. I don't believe in violence of any kind, but the Illuminati know that many people have no problem using guns to protect themselves and they want as many weapons as possible out of circulation by the time their masters are openly revealed and their fascist state is in place. Adolf Hitler introduced gun laws before he began to fill concentration camps. People subjected to trauma-based mind control suffer from what is called multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder. Some are now beginning to recover memories of their trauma and involvement in the Illuminati projects and who is behind them. Some very famous names are coming to light with compelling consistency. George Bush, Henry Kissinger, Dick Cheney, Al Gore, the British royal family, the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and a long list of others documented in my other books. This is why the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was hurriedly created to discredit the memories that these victims are now having. It is a gigantic cover-up, which, as usual, the media has bought hook, line, and sinker. Claiming the victim is suffering from false memory is now the easiest way for those accused of abusing children to walk free from the courts and the media reports these cases as if those accused are the victims. Are some people falsely accused though malice? Yes, of course that is going to happen from time to time. But are most of these cases untrue? No way. Just look at some of the people behind the creation of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. The leading lights were Ralph Underwager, a Lutheran minister and psychologist from Minnesota and his wife, Holida Wakefield. Underwager has been called as an expert witness in child abuse cases. This is the same couple who were interviewed in the winter 1993 edition of the Dutch pedophile magazine, Pedica, and were supportive of pedophilia. Also involved with the creation of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation were Pamela and Peter Freyd, who present themselves as falsely accused parents. Their daughter Jennifer Freyd is now professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. She is adamant that her accusations of parental abuse are true and she has spoken out against the motives and methods of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Shirley and Paul Eberl are two more experts who spend their time rubbishing claims of child abuse, Satanism, and recovered memories on behalf of the Foundation. They wrote The Politics of Child Abuse, a book that accuses mothers, mental health professionals, and prosecutors of feeding children stories about sexual abuse. Since then they have been called as experts in abuse trials. But their real expertise appears to involve running and contributing to pornography magazines. The Ebrels edit a soft core magazine in California called The La Star, which contains promotion for their book The Politics of Child Abuse. In the 1970s they were also involved in hardcore pornography with a magazine called Finger. The Ebrels were featured nude on one cover holding two life-size blow-up dolls named Love Girl and Play Guy. Donald Smith, a sergeant with the obscenity section of the Los Angeles Police Department's Vice Division, followed the couple for years. The police were never able to prosecute for child pornography, 
but Smith said, there were a lot of photos of people who looked like they were underage but we could never prove it. Among the articles that appeared in Finger were Sexpot at 5, My First Rape, She Was Only 13, and What Happens When Niggers Adopt White Children. One letter to the magazine says, I think it's really great that your mags have the courage to print articles and pics on child sex. Too bad I didn't hear from more women who are into child sex. Since I'm single I'm not getting it on with my children, but I know of a few families that are. If I were married and my wife and kids approved, I'd be having sex with my daughters. Another says, I'm a pedophile and I think it's great a man is having sex with his daughter. Since I didn't get finger number three, I didn't get to see the stories and pics of family sex. Would like to see pics of nude girls making it with their daddy but realize it's too risky to print. The Eberls have since produced a further book for their family friend, Carol Stewart, of publishers Lyle Stewart, in which they dismiss all claims of child abuse in the famous McMartin preschool case, which I will outline in a later chapter. Yeah, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation is certainly to be trusted and has the best interests of child at heart. Any real journalists reading this, a former Illuminati mind controller told me how they have their placement throughout psychiatry and key education establishments in general to ensure that the lid stays on. She said that the George Washington University campus was a hotbed of Illuminati professors and teachers when she was operating in the 1970s. She said that a Dr. Timothy Brogan, her main Illuminati trainer, was a behavioral scientist on the faculty. This is also affiliated, she said, with one of the main pediatric neurological specialty groups in the U.S which researched brain development and manipulation. At night, she said, they were experimenting with brainwave programming on the children who were taken there. This former Illuminati source told me that Brogan was a co-founder of Delphi, the Illuminati head trainers group in the United States and the partner to Oracle, the main training group in Europe. With this network of Illuminati agents working in psychiatry and medicine, they can, a, do their experimentation and trauma-based mind control and discovered and, b, produce endless eminent professors of psychiatry and therapy to tell the media and the courts that multiple personality disorder does not exist and that the memories of endless people telling the same stories and naming the same names are false. Arizona Wilder is one of those who are breaking down the compartments and remembering their unimaginable experiences. In the biggest secret in the video revelations of a mother goddess, she tells her story in detail and names the famous names involved on both sides of the Atlantic. She says she was chosen because of her bloodline. The Illuminati reptilians literally breed bloodlines to conduct their rituals for them. The people of these bloodlines are very psychic and able to connect easily with energy, and therefore manipulate its vibrational state or draw desired frequencies into rituals. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed people turn up again and again in these bloodlines. From the moment a child of these psychic bloodlines is born, in fact even in the womb, they are subjected to trauma-based mind control. The idea is to turn them into compartmentalized people who can be triggered to conduct the rituals as programmed, but then forget everything they did until that compartment is accessed again for the next ritual. Unfortunately for the Illuminati, Arizona's compartments began to break down after the death of her controller, Joseph Mengel. In the 1980s, although another infamous mind controller, Guy de Rothschild, was brought in to take her over, it did not work. This often happens because the victim's mind worships the one who originally programmed them especially if it was over a long period of time. When I met her, Arizona had escaped from mind control, though there were many compartments still to be accessed, and Brian Despero was helping her with that painstaking task. Clinton, Gore, and the elite Satanists. Support for Arizona's theme comes from Philip Eugene de Rothschild, another recovering mind-controlled Satanist, who tells part of his story on an excellent website highlighting ritual abuse and mind control. After I contacted him, we have also communicated directly on several occasions. Philip who uses another name in daily life, explains how his front altar or presenter personality was that of a good guy Christian, but beyond that he was programmed as a Satanist as the unofficial son of a French Rothschild. His mother was Lula Vieta Paulin Russell Campbell, who was born in 1917 in Farmersville, Texas, and died in 1977. But, he says, his real, biological, father, was not the man he had known as his father before his compartmentalized mind began to heal and remember. His genetic father, he says, was Baron Philippe de Rothschild of the Mountain Rothschild Wine Producing Estates in France, who died in 1988 at the age of 86. Philip Eugene told me, My father was a decadent altante as well as a master Satanist and hater of God, but how he loved the fields and the wines. He used to say it brought out the primitive in him. The estates are now run by Baron Philippe's daughter, Baroness Philippine, who, Philip Eugene says, is his half-sister. He was, he writes, conceived by a cult incest and was one of the hundreds of thousands of both legitimate 
and illegitimate offspring of this powerful financial and occult family. Much of this is done artificially through Illuminati sperm banks. What Philip says is confirmation of my own research, as outlined in The Biggest Secret. That the main reptilian bloodlines conceive countless children to perpetuate the bloodline and only a few are given the bloodline name as official children. The others are hidden behind other names and brought up by other parents. Later they find themselves in significant positions, often not knowing why they got so lucky. But their bloodline allows them to be more easily possessed by the fourth dimensional entities and by placing these bloodlines in power they are really giving that power to the fourth dimensional reptilians and other entities. Philip Eugene says that for most of his childhood and adolescence he lived with his Rothschild father on his estate in France. They had a physical relationship, he says, and he was held fast in the emotional power of incest which, in this culture, was normal and to be admired. He said he observed his Rothschild father's lust for power and began to desire the same. He also confirmed the way the occult bloodlines are controlled by demonic entities. Being a Rothschild descendant, he said, I was maximally demonized. He continues, I was present at my father's death in 1988, receiving his power and the commission to carry out my destiny in the grand conspiracy of my family. Like their other children, I played a key role in my family's revolt from God. When I watch CNN, it startles me to see so many familiar faces now on the world stage in politics, art, finance, fashion, and business. I grew up with these people meeting them at ritual worship sites and in the centers of power. Financiers, artists, royalty, and even presidents. All these dissociated people work and conspire today to bring in a new world order. These people, like me, are SRA, DID, satanically ritually abused and dissociative identity disorder multiples. The last non-dissociative president of the United States was Dwight Eisenhower. Except for him. Everyone since Teddy Roosevelt has had some level of dissociative disorder and some level of involvement in the occult. President Clinton has full-blown multiple personality disorder and is an active sorcerer in the satanic mystery religions. This is true of Al Gore, as well. I have known Mr. Clinton and Gore from our childhood as active and effective Satanists, like the hundreds of thousands of this occult family's other biological children. I had my place and function within this clan's attempt to control the world. My efforts and my family's efforts strove to have a member of the European nobility of the Habsburg family assume the preeminent position over humanity a position called the Antichrist by Christianity. While others were seated into government, academia, business, or entertainment, my place was within the body of Christ. I was to be a focus for spiritual power and controller of a cult within this church. In this church have lived people who I have known all my life to be the controllers and power centers of both the Rothschild family's false prophet and the Antichrist. Many dissociated Christians in the body of Christ hold similar corporate spiritual occult positions as part of the satanic new world order. In my being I embodied the Luciferian morning star within the church. I represented the presence of all the other Satanists who were related to me in the morning star. Their spirits were present in me in the church, constructed through ritual but empowered by legions of spirits. I was a human and spiritual focus of corporate satanic energy into the body of Christ. Philip Eugene de Rothschild, like Arizona Wilder, talks of the involvement of Joseph Mengel and the overwhelming memory that most of his victims have is his eyes. I'll never forget his eyes, they say, one after the other. Having looked into the eyes of Ted Heath, who is nowhere near as high in the hierarchy as Mengel was, I know exactly what they mean. Philip de Rothschild says he saw Mengel giving a tongue lashing to his Rothschild father and this confirms my own research that shapeshifter Mengel was very high indeed in the Illuminati. I'm sure there are those who will be extremely surprised by the claim that long after the war Joseph Mengel, the angel of death in Nazi Germany, programmed Arizona Wilder, in America, in, and the truth shall set you free, I present the documented fact that all sides in the First and Second World Wars were funded by the same Illuminati sources. Wars are highly effective ways to advance the reptilian agenda and that's why we have so many of them. They create enormous fear, kill vast number of people, force countries into massive debt to the Illuminati bankers, and change the face of a society forever. But you also need to protect your key personnel from the consequences of their actions in those wars and this is what happened with Mengel and the other leading Nazi geneticists, mind controllers, scientists, and engineers. They escaped from Germany as the Allies arrived thanks to a British and American intelligence operation called Project Paperclip. This has even been occasionally exposed even in the mainstream media here and there. A German television documentary in late 2000 exposed the secret life of a former Nazi war criminal who spied for America's Central Intelligence Agency after the Second World War in return for a fake Jewish identity. He was Gunter Rienemer, an SS lieutenant who commanded death squads at the Treblinka concentration camp. He was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Jews. The documentary said that he was given the identity hands Jorg Wagner by the CIA. 
He later married a Jewish woman, lived in Israel and was buried in a Jewish cemetery. His story might have been buried with him had he not felt the need to confess in 1988, shortly before he apparently committed suicide. His statements form the basis of the documentary Wagner's Confession. He says that after agreeing to work for the CIA he spent several months at a U.S. military base at Frankfurt Hotchst, where he learned rudimentary intelligence techniques and was circumcised. He was given a Jewish identity and sent as a Holocaust survivor to Kalb, East Germany, where he spied on old Nazis and new communist technologies at the local power plant. Rienemer was small fry compared with people like Mengel, but his is one example of Project Paperclip and its offshoots. How many other Illuminati Nazis have been masquerading as Jewish since the war? One wonders. Mengel was taken to South America and the United States where one of his main bases was the China Lake Naval Weapons Center in the California desert. He was he who masterminded the notorious and publicly acknowledged CIA mind control project called MK Ultra. MK stood for mind control, but they used the German spelling control because of the Nazis who created it with funding provided through people like John Foster Dulles, the U.S. Secretary of State, and his brother, Alan Dulles, the first head of the CIA and the man President Kennedy had sacked before his assassination. Dulles later served on the Warren Commission investigation, which decided that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin. According to one researcher, Ultra is T-name for a very high security classification dealing with alien interaction and a secret arm of the U.S. National Security Agency dealing with the same subject. It operates a joint alien-human network in an underground base in the notorious Dulce Los Alamos area of New Mexico, and is also the name of a secret Nazi team in the Second World War that handled security for an alleged German underground base in Antarctica. You may recall that researcher Morris Doriel claims to have seen evidence that the reptilians were once based in an ice-free Antarctica during their high-tech wars with the Nordics. Shape-shifting queens. Arizona Wilder told me how she had conducted sacrificial rituals involving the British royal family. Tony Blair and famous American Illuminati names like George Bush, Bill and Hillary Clinton, Henry Kissinger and many others. The highest operative she knew in the Illuminati, she said, was a guy calling himself the Marquis de Libox. His codename was Pindar, which she says means penis of the dragon. Arizona told me how the queen and queen mother regularly sacrifice babies and adults at many ritual centers, including Balmoral Castle in Scotland where they were all staying at the time Diana was ritually murdered in Paris. The royal family involved in human sacrifice was fantastic enough. But here again came the constantly repeated theme. She described how, during the rituals, these people shape-shift into reptiles. Diane Good, head of the U.S. organization, Mothers Against Ritual Abuse, also confirms this theme. In a telephone conversation about ritual abuse, Diane asked me if I could explain why many of her clients reported that participants in their rituals had turned into reptiles. People might want to dismiss all this, but they should know that, while they close their eyes and their minds, children are being sacrificed all over the world this very day by the reptilian bloodlines. Many thousands of them on the main ritual dates. Arizona talked about some of her experiences with the queen and queen mother. The queen mother was cold, 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 a nasty person. None of her cohorts even trusted her. They have named an altar, mind control program, after her. They call it the Black Queen. I have seen her sacrifice people. I remember her pushing a knife into someone's rectum the night that two boys were sacrificed. One was 13 and the other 18. You need to forget that the Queen Mother appears to be a frail old woman. When she shapeshifts into a reptilian, she becomes very tall and strong. Some of them are so strong they can rip out a heart and they all grow by several feet when they shapeshift. This is what the lady said who saw Edward Heath among endless others. Of the queen, Arizona said, I have seen her sacrifice people and eat their flesh and drink their blood. One time she got so excited with blood lust that she didn't cut the victim's throat from left to right in the normal ritual. She just went crazy, stabbing and ripping at the flesh after she had shape-shifted into a reptilian. When she shape-shifts, she has a long reptile face, almost like a beak and she's an off-white color. This fits many depictions of the gods and bird gods of ancient Egypt and elsewhere. The queen mother looks basically the same, but there are differences. She, the queen, also has like bumps on her head and her eyes are very frightening. She's very aggressive. I have seen shape shift into a reptilian and do all the things the queen does. I have seen him sacrifice children. There is a lot of rivalry between them for who gets to eat what part of the body and who gets to absorb the victim's last breath and steal their soul. I have also seen Andrew participate and I have seen Prince Philip and Charles' sister at the rituals. But they didn't participate when I was there. When Andrew shape shifts, he looks more like one of the lizards. The royals are some of the worst, okay, as far as enjoying the killing, enjoying the sacrifice, and eating the flesh. They're some of the worst of all of them. They don't care if you see it. Who are you going to tell? Who is going to believe you? They feel that is their birthright and they love it. 
They love it. Arizona has been viciously attacked for what she said in The Biggest Secret and on her video. A campaign of character assassination has been waged, at one time almost daily on the internet, to discredit her evidence and the reptilian connection in general. Among the critics who have dismissed her information is the publisher of Nexus magazine, which gives so much unchallenged space to Sir Lawrence Gardner, publicist for the Imperial Royal Dragon Court, and order. Another vehement critic of Arizona is a researcher who appeared for several months to spend his entire day on the internet trying to undermine the content of the biggest secret and especially Arizona's contribution. His desire to discredit the idea of the reptilian connection to the Illuminati took on the appearance of a raging obsession and persuaded many people who should have known better to dismiss all that she said. One of the points made to undermine Arizona's claims was that victims of multiple personality disorder have a photographic memory. And Arizona did not have that because there were names she did not immediately remember in the video. This revealed a fundamental lack of understanding of mind control. The back altars that hold the memories of trauma have photographic recall because the mind always records anything surrounding trauma in crystal clear detail. But the front altar, the one doing the video interview, is not photographic because it has not experienced the trauma. It is the interface with the world and it there is a cover for all the other compartments to suppress the memories of abuse. It only accesses those memories when the compartments begin to break down. Because the critics did not seem to understand that, they used this lack of knowledge to ridicule what she said. The attacks made her wonder why on earth she bothered to go public when those claiming to be seeking the truth treated her in this way. However, as the months have passed, evidence gathered from sources all over the world has pointed again and again to the accuracy of Arizona's theme. I had people telling me she's crazy, she's an Illuminati plant, and don't believe her. Yet many of those same people are now accepting the foundations of what Arizona was saying, and they were dismissing. In 1999, Arizona is an immensely brave woman and one of the few who will speak openly about her experiences. Most keep quiet because they think no one will believe them or they want to remain publicly anonymous because they fear the consequences of speaking out. The critics try to present the idea that my only source for the reptilian shapeshifters is Arizona Wilder. Again, a breathtaking suggestion when you look at the evidence. And I would stress here that for every person I name, like Arizona, there are many, many, more who confirm the story on the understanding that their identity and location will not be revealed publicly, although I know the details. One such case is a 57-year-old former chief of police, special agent, and member of the U.S. military. He says he has guarded two presidents, two secretaries of defense, and two chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the head of the U.S. military. He contacted me just as this book was being completed to say that he knows from his experience that aliens exist and that the government is lying about the Roswell alien crash in New Mexico in 1947. He also told me of a crystal skull in his possession. But his main reason for making contact was to tell me of an incident that showed to him that shape-shifting reptilians are real. When he arrived at a friend's house in Texas, he was told that two women guests were coming from New York. They traveled around the country performing hands on healing and they had asked if they could drop by, he was told. This former chief of police told me in personal correspondence what happened next. Well, I arrived before the New York people and had already started showing my crystal skull when they arrived. They immediately went crazy because of the skull and started holding their hands up before their eyes and screamed get her out of here over and over. I can tell you that everyone was shocked by their actions and I was extremely upset. I carried the crystal skull out to the car and left it there. After about an hour everyone seemed to get over the uproar they made and things settled down to discussions. Everyone introduced themselves and the two from New York volunteered to heal someone. Well everyone started telling them to do it to me because I had heart trouble and was recovering from a heart attack. I hesitated, but finally relented and said okay. They sprang over to me so fast that it startled me. One got behind me and one straddled my legs in front of me. They did this without touching me and they both started running their hands around my body again without touching me anywhere. This went on for about a minute then my eyes met the eyes of the lady in front of me. That was some experience, our eyes meeting. Pay attention to what I say here. I could see immediately that she knew that I knew and it broke her concentration. She lost control and changed into a reptilian right before my eyes. No sooner than she lost control, she regained it and shape shifted back into a human. All this took place in the blink of an eye. They immediately jumped up and said that they had to leave and left within 30 seconds of this happening. He said he did not say anything about what he had seen. But when everyone began to leave, two guests stayed behind and would not move. Eventually they asked, did you see what we saw? He asked them what they meant and they said they had seen the lady change into a reptile and then change back. People all over the world, and from countless walks of life, have repeated this same experience to me. This is the modern version of the experience the ancients constantly described. A regular source of information about reptilian activities and rituals are those who have been involved in religious organizations not least the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
better known as the Mormons. A lady called Diana Huston told me of her experiences in the society. She joined them in 1969 because, after going through the Vietnam War with her husband, she was attracted by the message of paradise on earth. She was okay for a few years, but then they became more demanding and controlling. In 1987 she said that subliminal drawings began to appear in the artwork of their books and magazines depicting bizarre faces and strange messages. Some of these are detailed in the symbolism archives on my website. At a small convention in September 1988, she spoke privately to one of the governing body elect. At that time she thought they were the good guys. The man was about fifed and with dark hair and was powerfully built. She said that she looked into his eyes and was startled and terrified to see a thin membrane drop over his human eyes. She didn't know if the membrane came from the bottom of his eyelid or the top. I'd never heard of lizard beings, but I remember thinking how much his eyes looked like those of a lizard. She recalled, the membrane dropped over his eyes when he looked at her and he seemed to recognize her although at the time she couldn't imagine why. The sense of terrible danger that she felt, and the need to get away from him, was overwhelming. She went on, Eventually I came to understand that the leaders are not fully human, but are the offspring of something alien to this earth. They are too cunning, lethal, and intelligent to have originated from here. And there has to be an over-race of beings guiding them from some dimension. They are here for one reason only. They look at humans as a source of enslavement for their enjoyment to torment and abuse to misuse power and to cruelly punish and kill. As she researched the religion's documents and books, she said she began to uncover a frail of arms and drug running, which the Illuminati globally controls, and plots to destroy the world and take it for their own. Diane took her mountains of evidence to the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency and met with them. They said that she was either a genius or totally insane. She said she learned that the Watchtower Society had hidden rooms under the streets of Brooklyn, New York, where they have their headquarters over the now-abandoned old Brooklyn subway. There they practice satanic ritual, including the sacrifice of human infants, she said. And here they also keep women who are used as breeders for babies to be sacrificed. This happens all over the world because the babies are never officially registered and therefore never reported missing. To the system, they have never existed. The main Illuminati bloodlines conceive children in the rituals. Also, Diane wrote that this Watchtower satanic operation is totally self-sufficient and even uses blood in the ink of the magazines. She said that she and a friend tried to warn people through the media with no success and her friend had a nervous breakdown from which she has never fully recovered. One of a number of accounts to come from former members of the Mormon church was sent by a woman who claims she suffered in a Mormon mind control project from the time she was a young child. Kathy O'Brien says that the Mormon Church and especially the operation at Salt Lake City is a major mind control center. Former military sources claim that the Mormon Temple in Salt Lake City, which is covered in Illuminati symbols like the all-seeing eye, stands over a large underground reptilian base that can be accessed from the temple site. This woman, I will call her Jane, said that she saw her babies sacrificed in Mormon rituals. In her pursuit of the truth, she spoke with another victim of ritual abuse by the Mormon and Roman Catholic Church. This other lady told her that the Mormon prophet had taken her baby from her at a ritual and eaten it. Two other women raised as Catholics told her that they had seen the abuser's shape shift into reptilians and eat a human sacrifice. Jane said that Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, was from the occult bloodlines and the whole official story was a lie. The leaders are mostly reptilian, she said. One witness says that only one of the twelve, Mormon, apostles did not shape shift at the ritual. She goes on, I was so mad to find out that the alien abuse was connected to the ritual abuse in the church when I had believed the church was true. Now I know that, our families are from occult bloodlines of England and Europe. This has gone on for hundreds and thousands of years. For certain, satanic ritual goes on within the Mormon church. In fact what they do deny, however, is the scale on which it happens and that it goes right to the top. In fact, it is orchestrated from there. There are a number of websites exposing this, including a site set up by former Mormons, one of whom is the same bloodline as the Mormon hero Brigham Young, Rothschild Bauer Bush. The connection between the hybrid bloodlines and shape-shifting is constantly confirmed. Here is one excellent example. The Rothschilds are an Anunnaki shape-shifting bloodline and before they changed their name to Red Shield when the Rothschild banking dynasty began in Frankfurt, Germany, they were called Bauer, and the Bauers were a notorious occult family of Middle Ages Germany. The word Roth also developed into Rhodes, Rhodes, or Rhodes, the name of Cecil Rhodes, the infamous Rothschild placeman who brought devastation and genocide to Southern Africa. On Rhodes' immense memorial in Cape Town, South Africa, there are lines of lions, a symbol of the serpent cult, Illuminati. Another reptilian bloodline is the Bush family in the United States. 
which has provided two of the last three U.S. presidents. Father George has been named perhaps more than anyone when people recount their shape-shifting experiences. I should stress that I am not saying that everyone called Bauer or Bush throughout the world is like this. Certainly not. I am talking of these Anunnaki bloodlines that have taken the name Bauer and Bush. I was sent a letter to my website from a source that did not wish his name to be published. It pulls together the names Bauer and Bush in one story. Before you read it, you need to know that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States, is a major Illuminati operation. It will take control of every aspect of American life, by law. Whenever the president calls a state of emergency. Anyway, here is a fascinating story connecting FEMA, the Rothschild, Bauer and Bush bloodlines, and shape-shifting. A few years ago I became acquainted with a lovely person with the surname of Bauer. We had many varied and wide-ranging discussions. During one of these talks, the subject of schizophrenia came up. She said it ran in her family. Asking for more detail, she told me her mother and great-aunt had been afflicted by it. It was the vision hallucination type. The odd thing is that the hallucinations were incredibly similar. Their hallucinations were of people of royal blood turning into giant lizards. I was at FEMA training headquarters in Fredericksburg, Maryland, attending a radiological defense pilot course in 1982 for the Washington State Department of Emergency Services. During the orientation, Louis Gifreda, one of the head, honchos and a cousin of George Bush, came in to observe. When he sat down I noticed a dark haze around him. I kept looking at him to see if my eyes were playing tricks on me, but it stayed the same. I was up in the seats alone, as I like to be in. These things. Soon, I noticed he was staring at me. This unnerved me. I closed my eyes and tried to relax. When I opened my eyes again, I saw him coming toward me. He sat down a few rows behind and to the left of me. I glanced back and saw him, leaning forward with his eyes closed. I figured he was just tired and decided to take a rest with me. While sitting there trying to relax, I heard a strange hissing and swishing sound come from behind me. I opened my eyes, but was afraid to look around. I saw a woman in our group looking up in our direction with a look of astonishment and shock. On her face, she kept looking up nervously in our direction. Eventually, Gifford left, with his bodyguards, waxy face suits with sunglasses. And the presentation continued. After the orientation, I walked outside and found this woman sobbing and shaking in the arms of another participant. I intruded and said I wanted to know why. She was looking up with that look on her face. She didn't want to say, but with repeated assurance from me she told me. She had seen Gifreda turn into a lizard. The other guy said Gifreda had the nickname of Lizard Man in the circles around. Fema and he has a skin disease that makes his skin look like scales. I had forgotten about this experience until I read David's book. It was just one of those odd things that didn't make sense. Now it does. I was in quite a bit of shock when I finally made all the connections. So, what more can I say? I don't just believe it's real, I know it is. Unless, of course, I want to deny my own experience and senses. Sex and the shapeshifters. Here is another example of the way the bloodline names come up all the time with the stories of shapeshifting. As I mentioned earlier, members of the Oppenheimer family are the bloodline branch managers for the Illuminati reptilians in South Africa and this is a story from a correspondent there. I was born in South Africa and years ago got to know an old lady in Johannesburg who had for many years been the lover of Sir Ernest Oppenheimer, the founder, with Rothschild backing, of the gold and diamond corporate cartel. She told me that Sir Ernest used to visit her in the afternoons at her flat in Parktown. On one occasion as they were about to make love, his body took on the form and proportions of a giant lizard with scales and she said the experience had been one of the sexual highlights of her life. The story which was so strange at the time has been in the back of my mind for years and came back to me when I recently read your book. Sexual activity seems to be a time when shape-shifting can happen as the hormones, blood, and energy are affected dramatically. A businesswoman in Canada told me of her reptilian experiences. The first was with a Portuguese man who treated her terribly and she was little more than an imprisoned slave. She said he shape-shifted into a reptile. She described how he was stunningly ritualistic, even with the time and day of the month he washed his clothes. She later had a relationship with another guy who, she said, was nice on the surface, but had a very dark side he was constantly battling with. She bought the biggest secret when it was first published because it exposes in great detail the reptilian story she had experienced. One time when they went into her bedroom the book was lying on a shelf above the bed. The man became very wound up and took a serious aversion to it. She told me, when they began to have sex, she said he began to go crazy, becoming violent and rough. And amid this anger, he began to shape shift into a reptile. Her hand was on the bottom of his back while he lay on top of her and she felt her hand being pushed up as the guy began to sprout a tail. She screamed, threw him off, and he began to switch back to human form. She told him to get out of the house immediately and, at the time I met her, she had never seen him since. A Los Angeles jazz singer, 
Pamela Stonebrook, has spoken publicly about her sexual encounters with a reptilian being and the last I heard she was in the process of producing a book on the subject. When the very tall reptilian first appeared in her bedroom, she says she was terrified. The being forced her to have sex and seemed to get high on her fear. But she says that as these encounters continued she conquered her fear and started coming on to him. When her fear subsided, the reptilian did not seem to be so keen anymore. Pamela considers her reptilian experience positive overall and talks of a close connection with the being. But reports of women being raped by reptilians are far from rare. I met Pamela briefly at a conference in Los Angeles and she is quite a character. Very strong-willed, and that's just what you need in these circumstances. She wrote an open letter to the UFO community, most of whom are depressingly close-minded to seeing beyond their own official line. Reptilians are not a politically correct species in the UFO community, and to admit to having sex with one, much less enjoying it, is beyond the pale as far as the more conservative members of that community are concerned. But I know from my extensive reading and research, and from talking personally to dozens of other women and men, that I am not unique in reporting this kind of experience. I am the first to admit that this is a vastly complex subject, a kind of hall of mirrors, where dimensional realities are constantly shifting and changing. Certainly, the reptilians use sex to control people in various ways. They have the ability to shape-shift and to control the mind of the experiencer as well as to give tremendous pleasure through their mental powers. I have wrestled with all of these implications and the various levels of meaning and possibilities represented by my encounter experiences. I will say, however, as I have said before, that I feel a deep respect for the reptilian entity with whom I interacted, and a profound connection with this being. 13. She says that since she began to talk publicly of her experiences, she has been contacted by hundreds of people telling her of similar encounters with reptilian entities. Credo Mutwa tells of the scores of African women he has met who have reported the same experience of being forced to have sex with a reptilian or have been artificially impregnated during abduction experiences only for the resulting pregnancy to end suddenly when the fetus disappeared with no explanation. Most women stay silent because of the obvious public ridicule that would follow. And whatever people may think about Pamela Stonebrook, she has the very couldn't give a shit attitude that is vital to making suppressed information known to the wider public. In fact, here we have a golden example of the way humanity polices itself and, in doing so, suppresses the very information that would give us a fix on what is really going on. I have experienced it myself for 11 years. When you say anything that is different to the norm, the masses either ridicule or condemn you without doing any research whatsoever to establish if what you say could be valid. They dismiss it and often direct their bile at the messenger for no other reason than it is different to what they have been programmed to believe. The media, as an expression of the collective mind, and vice versa, takes the same line. Pathetic. Most people when faced with the truth, or a more accurate version of events, just laugh in its face or condemn it as evil. Even those who have opened up to some aspects of the truth still can't expand their mind to encompass the exploding evidence of the reptilian dimension. One writer, in an otherwise very interesting book about ancient extraterrestrials, acknowledges all the serpent symbolism, names, and references surrounding the Anunnaki but suggests that this could have been because they wore reptile clothing or kept snakes. I think there is another reason, somehow, 